Hello and welcome. My name is Lino Tados. I'll be the, your instructor for this course for Test Complete um, using Python in the scripting. Uh, I'm hoping that you will spend a few hours with me. We would like to, to start with an introduction to Test Complete with the IDE, the Integrated Development Environment, talking a little bit about all the different windows and how to deal with the Project Explorer, the Object Spy, the Object Browser, all the important windows, of course, inside of Test Complete itself. And then we're going to be spending some time with the Python language itself. If you know Python pretty well, you're just new to Test Complete, you can actually just pass on this uh, chapter and move forward. But if you would like to get a, a crash course on Python and all the important features that you can use in Test Complete as well, I definitely recommend for you to take it. There is about 12 videos inside of that. Uh, a specific chapter. And then we will talk about name mapping, which is a very, very important piece in, of, in Test Complete that you really need to understand as well. And then we'll spend about seven or eight different videos on checkpoints to see how to compare images, files, properties, um, and a lot of other things as well um, inside of Test Complete, including databases and content of grids and applications and so on and so forth. And then we will have a chapter about project management. This is important to understand in the project management itself. How do you deal with organization of files? How do you deal with variables, uh, global variables, local variables, and also project variables, which are very, very important in the, in the product as well. We'll spend some time in a chapter about low-level procedures to see how we can actually test uh, X and Y coordinates on the screen, which is um, considered to be a weak part of testing because we do not want to base everything on X and Y coordinates on the screen because when, of course, the resolution changes, that can make the test fail. But sometimes you don't have a choice. You have to actually record the mouse movement on the screen based on their location. I'll show you how to turn that on and how to use a low-level procedure testing inside of Test Complete. And then we're going to spend about maybe 10 different videos on web testing from web comparison to web accessibility to Google Lighthouse for uh, web audits to recording a test in Chrome or Edge or Firefox and also how to deal with Python code to change some things to make your test even better. And we'll explain the difference between name mapping and also using XPath and CSS selectors inside of web testing in Test Complete, which will make it extremely powerful as well. Then we will go into a chapter about user forms in case you ever need to have dialogues created in Test Complete to help you with your test as well. And then we will spend some time also on event interception to show you how you can create events and how to subscribe to events inside of Test Complete. There are five different categories of events. We'll show you how to implement things like on log error, on log message, on log nodes, and so on. Also, we'll talk about on unexpected windows and on overlapping window, and we'll show you an example on how to use those as well, with the parameter being passed to the log params variable and parameter inside of Test Complete. And overall, there would be a lot of tips and tricks to show you how to deal and be successful with Test Complete. I've been using the product for a little bit over uh, two decades now, from the beginning of Test Complete when the product was called Automated QA. And I have received an awards, actually uh, uh, become uh, the community hero on Test Complete. And I'm very grateful for that from Smart Bear. And we have a very, very strong relationship with them for, uh, for over two decades now. And I hope that my experience with Test Complete, not only in training or about writing eight books on Test Complete over the years, but also consulting on the product in the United States, Europe, and in Australia over the last 20 years, uh, will also show during the training and being able to help you reach um, the point where you would like to be to be an expert in the product as well. I wish you best of luck and I hope you enjoy um, the course. Thank you. Well, first thing first, uh, if you already yourself or your company have a purchase a license of uh, Test Complete, you might want to go to a website called my.smartbear.com and log in using the credentials that you have or your company gave you. And from that point on, you will be able to see your license. You can download Test Complete and apply the licenses during the step-by-step -step installation of Test Complete. If you do not have this kind of information and you are brand new to Test Complete, taking this course to learn everything about Test Complete, you can still go to the main website, smartbear.com, all right? And then from products in here all the way at the top, you can look for where Test Complete is at 
and you will notice it's the third one here on the left let's click on that and you will not notice a blue button all the way at the top it can change colors of course i mean as of the writing of this uh, um, of, of uh, recording of this video it is a blue button at the top says start my free trial click on that put your email address first name and last name and the company you are associated with and your phone number and click on the start trial uh, within a few seconds it will start downloading uh, a pretty big download which is the test complete trial for 14 days as you can see here on the screen uh, it also might be able to send you an email uh, to explain exactly how to do it. But in reality, you don't even need the email. The executable that you're going to be receiving, um, if you double click on it, it will start the installation on your machine. And then at the end, you'll have to click on a button that says activate your 14 day trial. And from that point on, for 14 days, you can use fully test complete to learn more about it. And you definitely can use it for this specific course hopefully that makes sense and that will get you started on the right track whether you have a license or not to be able to be successful with test complete after installing test complete on your machine let's go ahead and double click on the icon for test complete and start it for the first time on your machine probably and take a look all the way at the top when we see the file menu and all the menu items all the way at the top and also the toolbar button right underneath it so let's take a minute to explain what you're going to find in there. There is probably between 80 to 90 different functionality available in this menu and toolbar button. Like you'd expect from filing to be able to create a brand new project or a project suite. And of course, we're going to explain the difference between the two uh, very soon here in the next video. Uh, also, I can open up an existing project or an existing project sweep. If I already have some things open uh, or created earlier, I can actually go ahead and get the recent. The stuff that you are used to from any Windows application, really, the saving and the closing. Also, if you have a source control system like Git or a subversion or something similar to that, and you'd like to use it with, your, with the rest of your team, you can configure your source control. We will have a video on that as well. Um, you can install extensions. Um, there are a lot of different extensions that you can get. You can take a look at the community forums for Test Complete to learn more about it. Um, also, you can print if you need to print one of your scripts, for instance, in Python that you'd like to show a manager or a team in a meeting and so on. You can do that as well. From edit, as you expect from any Windows application, all the different stuff that you can do from an edit, uh, finding and replacing and deleting and copy and pasting and all that great stuff. In the view, you can actually always get back to the page that you're looking at right now, which is called the startup page, just to be able to see the latest and greatest from the community, latest information that they uh, want to let you know from SmartBear themselves. Also, one important thing is the version number of what you're running. Instead of having to go to the help about, the version number will always be on the startup page. I'm currently running 50, 1553. Uh, but by the time you get this, probably um, there will be a different version. But I would say 99% of the course will not change uh, from one version to the other. Test Complete has been uh, definitely a very, very powerful testing tool for a lot of years. And every few years, we definitely get a major addition. And in that case, I will always update the course for that as well. Under test in here, we can actually start the recording. Rarely would use the menu for that. There is always a big red button here in the toolbar that people usually like to click on to start the recording. The recording could happen in a keyword test, which is a non-coding way of doing things, which is great. Um, also, if you are going to concentrate on scripting, whether it's Java, uh, JScript or JavaScript or Python or any of the seven languages that Test Complete supports, you are more than welcome to start with scripting. In this course here, we're going to focus on Python because a lot of testers all around the world are definitely focused on Python uh, nowadays. So we'll, we'll do that for this course. Uh, also, with the debug, you can enable debugging so you can set breakpoints and take a look and, and step into specific functionality that you created in Python and step over them. Stuff that you are used to probably from any development tool that you are used to, like Visual Studio or Eclipse, depending, of course, on the language and the platform that you support as well. Under tools in here, this is an important piece uh, where you can actually set the options for the entire uh, test complete environment, or you can actually set up for a specific um, project or all the projects going forward inside of test complete. We definitely going to be spending some time on these first three, the options and the current 
project properties and the default project properties that will affect all future projects as well. We will also talk later on in a video regarding uh, how to do bug tracking, issue tracking, whether you have Bugzilla or uh, Azure DevOps or something similar to that, how to set up the connections between two so that you can easily report a bug, for instance, to the rest of the team uh, from inside of Test Complete as well. And finally, of course, from the help, all the stuff that you expect from a professional testing tool, a very, very good documentation has been in the making for so many years, almost 22 years now, and it's, a, it's an excellent uh, documentation system. You can check for updates, which usually happen um, uh, pretty much every few weeks. You will get an update, uh, maybe for uh, Chrome or Firefox or Test Complete itself, and I would recommend for you to always be on the latest and greatest if you can. The next part will be the uh, toolbar. And a toolbar mimics pretty much what's available inside of the menu, but it makes it much easier with just one click. So instead of saying file and new and click again on new project, you will notice here in the toolbar is the same thing. You can click on new, new project or project suite, and you will create it much easier this way. So it's a matter of preference, whether you want to do it from the menu or easily clicking from the toolbar. That's up to you, of course, how you would like to do that. Of course, these are not the only functionality available in the toolbar. These are the most important ones, and we're going to go through all of them through the course, I'm sure, like recording, and the Object Spy is an extremely important button in here as well. Also, generating data, um, uh, random data, might be very useful for data-driven testing. We're going to see later on. But sometimes you do things in Test Complete that is not available in the toolbar, and because you do it every single day, you might want to actually be able to add your own button or two in here in the toolbar to make it very accessible right at your fingertips. And that's not a problem at all. You can go to any area on the toolbar, especially a gray area like this, and right click in here. And you will notice all the way at the bottom it says customize. Click on that. The dialog that will come up, that dialog will contain all the different toolbars. Not all of them are turned on. So you can turn on, maybe you do a lot of uh, source uh, control. So right now there is nothing about uh, like pulling and pushing and committing. But if you do that all the time, turn on the source control. But what I would like to show you here is the commands tab, the one in the middle. Every single command possible inside of Test Complete is available for you in here. So you can drag and drop the command and put it inside of the toolbar itself. So if you do a lot of, for instance, git uh, in here. So maybe you, would do, you do a lot of clone repositories or create repositories. A lot of people will end up coming in here and say, I do a lot of pull and push and commit. And I want to make it easy for me to be available in here. No problem. Click on the pull and drag that and put it right here, maybe at the end. Okay. And maybe the push as well. I'll put it right next to it. Okay. And maybe the commit and I'll put it right next to it as well. Uh, okay, so you can take a look at all the things that you do all the time and you do not want to look for it in the menus and so on and just find it in the commands in here, drag and drop it and put it anywhere. It doesn't have to be at the end. It could be in the middle. It could be anywhere you want to in here. So it could be logging, load testing, keyword testing issues that you do, uh, object browser things that you do all the time. Maybe you do a lot of ready API testing for, for, for REST APIs from inside of Test Complete and you would like to actually have this specific one like run a test from uh, ready API straight here so you don't have to look for it all over the place in the menus as well so this could be very very useful to be able to have that and of course later on if you'd like to get rid of those just click on them and drag them and throw them away outside of the toolbar and they will disappear see if i just drag them outside anywhere it doesn't matter it will disappear as well if you ever want to get them back make sure that right click and go to customize commands and find out exactly which commands you're interested in and place them on the toolbar now let's go ahead and take a look at the left side of the window called Project Workspace. Very, very important window, of course, in Test Complete. This will show you the hierarchy of all the different projects and project suites and files associated with your project that you're working on at that point. And of course, like everything else in Test Complete, there are so many different ways to manipulate the Project Explorer, whether from the menu by saying File, New, Project, or Project Suite, or you can do it from the toolbar menu and say new, new project or project suite that will do the same exact thing. Or go into the project explorer itself 
and click on the plus sign all the way there that says create a new project or the one next to it to create a project suite so you can see there are three different ways to do exactly the same thing you're going to see that in test complete a lot uh, it's all based on your preference. So don't get confused and think that one of them does more than the other. It really doesn't. It's just a matter of preference. Some people like to work from inside of the Project Explorer. Some people like to have a, a consolidated area in their uh, toolbar or the file menu to be able to do that. So it's definitely up to you. Not only that, there is even a fourth way. If you are on the start page, notice there is a, a link in here called new project. If I click on it, it will end up creating the project exactly the same way like the other three that I just showed you right now. Let's go ahead and click on new project and take a look at what the project explorer will do for us. When we say new project, a dialogue will come up and the project will the, the dialog will ask us what is the project name that you'd like to create let's go ahead and create for instance calling 01 we'll say tc uh, course this is for our training course for this one and then i get to uh, choose where i would like to place that in my uh, location as far as the hard drive in here remember test complete only runs on windows you cannot run test complete on mac or linux for right now test complete is a windows only tool of course, you can run some web testing and so on, on on different machines later on, and we will see that. But as far as the tool itself, the IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment, that can only run on Windows for right now. Does that make sense? So I'm going to leave it here in the Test Complete 15 Projects folder that got created for me during the installation. And then I get to choose between which scripting language do I want to use. I'm going to leave it at Python, but I just wanted to show you there are three in here. It is not 100% true that there are only three different languages available. There are seven of them available, but these are the most used ones. Of course, if you would like to use one of the other ones like Delphi script, which is based on Pascal, or if you want to use C Sharp or C++, uh, or JScript, which is the older version of JavaScript, all of them are available for you, you just have to enable them, but uh, that's complete in trying to focus on the three most used languages. JavaScript till today actually is the most used language for test complete by a mile. And it's one of the two languages that uh, started test complete almost 20 years ago. It was VBScript and JavaScript. Actually, uh, it was VBScript and JScript. And then we moved to the latest versions using JavaScript. Python was added a few years ago, and that's based on demand of the uh, uh, definitely testers all over the world because Python is an excellent language for testing and for scripting in general as well. And this is the one we're going to focus on in this course. The three optional pieces in here, uh, this has been available for a couple of years as well, the use of the XPath and CSS selectors. Usually when, uh, when test complete trying to recognize objects, uh, whether in an application, Windows application, or a website, or even a mobile application, it's trying to use something called name mapping. Don't worry, we have a full-blown videos on name mapping to explain how that stuff works. With name mapping, it, sometimes it might make uh, cause some problems when the application objects are dynamically created and keep changing name on every refresh like a website or a dynamic application and so on. So it, they found out that it's a much better way, especially for a web application, to use something like XPath and CSS selectors so that even if something changes, it will still have multiple ways of trying to find the same object. Don't worry about it. We have whole chapters and lots of videos on explaining how all the stuff works for the web and for Windows application as well. The next one in here would be test, uh, tested application. That means if you are trying to test your application, let's say your application is called xyz.exe uh, or maybe Notepad or Excel or Word, you want to test this application. If you turn this on, that means we would like to make sure that we add into the project where that executable is on your machine so that you can actually manipulate that executable from inside of your script. You can tell it to start, to close, move on the screen, do whatever you want with that executable as well. So you definitely can turn it on just to enable it right away. With BDD files, this is uh, something that will connect to Cucumber Studio project. Uh, or you can import the local features uh, from Cucumber Studio as well. And that for, for doing behavioral um, uh, testing as well. So you can define your behavioral test. So a lot of times you would be able to write in English what you're trying to do with specific uh, English format, uh, maybe three or four of them. And Test Complete can pick it up from there and try to create the, the test suite 
uh, for you or the test case itself for you. Alrighty, so these are the things that you can do and I'm, at this point I'm just going to say finish. And right now test complete will go ahead and create me a project that I told it's called 01 uh, TC course and that's the name of the project we're going to be creating. And there we go, we have a 01 TC course project got created and we have a lot of different things underneath it. These are called project items, okay? They are not called files even though they will have files on the hard drive that mimic exactly what we're trying to do. But in test complete, everything underneath the name of the project here, which is bolded in black right there, these are called project items. So I can actually have a project item as a keyword test, a project item called name mapping, a project item for scripts, and I can have as many scripts as I want inside of there. Uh, and these are not the only project items. There are tons more project items that you can actually have in test complete. These are the ones uh, we call them the default project items that every project gets. If you'd like to add more project items, usually that is done by going and clicking on the name of the project, uh, 01 TC course in here, right click on it and we'll say add a new item. The dialog that will show up contains all the missing project items from the left side. So you will not see script or name mapping or keyword testing because they are already in there. So this dialog only shows you the missing um, project items. That's why say it says create project items. So it could be an Android gesture collection, events, image, repository, low level, all of these things in here. And we're going to talk pretty much about all of them during this course as well. But they are not available by default when you create a project. Of course, if there is something that you always do, maybe every single project will always have a store. So you can change that in the tools options and the tools default project uh, properties and say, when I create a brand new project, always have a store created here on the left. You can do that as well if you want. But for right now, we we'll leave it as a default. So you might ask yourself, what is this project suite thing at the top in here? What's the difference between a project and a project suite? So the difference is um, a, few, a lot of years ago, we only had projects. We did not have project suite. And the problem that that caused is that nowadays projects are made out of a lot of different pieces, front end, back end, database. And you will notice uh, testers will create a project for each piece. You will have a, a project in here for the front end and another project, for instance, for the back end and a completely separate project to test the database itself, whether you're using Oracle or My Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL or Postgres or something like that. And then they were kind of annoyed because every time they want to go from one piece of testing to the other, they have to close that project and reopen another project and so on and so forth. So opening and closing all day to go back between different projects was uh, time consuming and annoying for a lot of testers. So what, uh, what SmartBear decided to do is to create what we call a project suite. And the project suite, think of it as a container of projects. So you can actually have multiple projects open at the same time. So you can move between different project items in each project just with one click. All right. Uh, and also you can pass things from one project to the other. So you can actually have variables, which we will definitely talk about in another video at the project suite level. And you can set a variable that all the projects, whether it's one, two, three or four projects in here, Sometimes you'll have 10 projects part of a project suite and you can share the same value of your variables between all of them. So you don't have to repeat yourself in every single project. Does that make sense? That's the main idea. Just think of it as a container of projects. That's what a project suite is all about. And finally, for this video, I just wanted to share with you that there is this project suite logs. Every time you're going to execute something or run something, whether in development or a full blown execution plan, the results whether it's successful, whether it's uh, unsuccessful uh, errors, or even successful but with warnings, all of them will show up in the logs in here. And under the project suite logs, every project will have its own log. So if I open this up, you'll notice there will be a child element in here. It's called 01TC course logs. So everything from this course, as far as running, uh, executing, will happen under this logs in here. So if it takes hours, maybe I can come in the morning after it ran all night and I can see what succeeded in green, what failed in red and what had warnings in yellow in here in the logs as well. So this is uh, really a quick way of explaining what the uh, Project Explorer is all about. So you can understand the different project items, what the relationship between a project and a project suite is, and also where the logs are going to appear inside of your test complete uh, Project Explorer. 
let's go ahead and start a recording session to see how that works in uh, in test complete as well you will notice for instance i'm right now in a keyword test which is the default in test complete but i don't want to record or actually do anything with keyword test in this course this is a different course uh, not to write any code whatsoever whether in python or javascript or vb or anything like that but we're going to focus on python in this course so uh, the way to do it usually there is a button all the way at the top in the toolbar is the red big button right there and the default will always be to record in keyword test we're going to change that to make it into record script instead also remember from the workspace there is always a button that says record because it has a key in it that stands for the keyword testing so if you click on it it will start recording in keyword testing which we do not want so the main idea here is that i have to go all the way to the top and say i'd like to record in script and because i chose to use python in this uh, 01 tc course it will always record in python for this one and by the way in test complete we cannot change our mind uh, and choose a different language so maybe you started the course in in python halfway through it says i would like to record or i would like to actually write some javascript or vb code you cannot do that in test complete once the course has been created once the uh, the, the project itself called tc course has been created in python this project is python okay the good news is for the project suite even if you have two or three projects, they do not have to be the same language. It's only in the project itself that has to be the same language. So I can have one project called 01TC course in Python and another one open in the project suite as using JavaScript. There is nothing wrong with that. But just remember in one project, only one language is uh, being used inside of there. I'm going to start up note, Notepad <coughs> on my machine. Let me bring in Notepad here to this screen. That is my Notepad. I'm running Windows 11, but it could be Windows 10 or whatever version of Windows. Remember, Test Complete only runs on Windows. Okay, it does not run on Win on uh, on Linux or on Macs. Uh, even though you can test some things in Safari on Mac as for a web test and so on, but as far as running the IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment, that IDE that you're looking at right in front of you is only a Windows application. All right, so that is my notepad under Windows 11, and I would like to start recording session to be able to record something inside of there. So to do it, we'll go all the way to the top. We'll not use the default. We're going to say record in script. Once you click on it, test complete will minimize itself. It will just take itself out of the way, and it will show you whatever is available on the screen at this point. Notice there is a recorder that will show up at the top just to let you know what is it doing. So there is a, a flashing red button just to let you know that we are testing right now that we are recording and notice my mouse is moving right and left on the screen that is not recorded by default in test complete all right otherwise that will generate thousands of messages every few seconds because the mouse movement will cause x and y coordinates on the screen mouse up mouse down mouse move all of these things so by default this is not recorded if this is important for you in the future there is a feature in test complete called low level procedures which will have its own chapter later on to show you how to do that maybe you're using an application like autocad and you're trying to draw an engine or a house and every single mouse movement is important to be recorded so we can turn it on if you want but by default this mouse movement that i'm doing is not recorded all right so the first thing i do just in case another window has focus i'm going to click inside of the notepad uh, white area in here which is the rich, te rich text editor of notepad i'm going to click right there so now notice the cursor will show up and it's blinking okay do you think that click actually was recorded absolutely that's an action every action is recorded inside of test complete also if you leave the mouse on the object for a couple of seconds it will try to recognize the object and notice there is a red rectangle around the entire rich text editor and there is a plus sign that shows up right there so if i go to the plus sign you will be able to do something that we will see later on called checkpoints to be able to take the w text value of that rich text editor right now it's empty because there is no text in it if it's a list box or a combo box i can figure out what the selection is i can actually see that is enabled and i can create these checkpoints so i can actually test them later on as well don't worry about that we'll get into checkpoints as a whole chapter on that later on as well so now that i actually clicked inside of there so maybe what i would like to do is to start typing we'll say good morning all right and i'm going to be pushing enter in here all right that's good enough for our first test let's go ahead and say stop the test and now test complete will come back up again and is now creating my 
a Python script that will be available for me. And it will always create a function for me. So this is the way to create a function in, in, in Python. Don't worry about the Python um, uh, syntax. If you're familiar with Python, of course, you'll, this will be very familiar to you. If not, don't worry. The next chapter, I'm going to be spending some time for introduction to the Python language itself. So you can have a pretty good idea on how to use Python inside of Test Complete. But the name of the function will start with defining, which is called dev, and then we'll give it a name test one, open and close parentheses, and we put the famous column for functions inside of Python. And then you'll have to indent. Indentation is very important in Python as well. And then we'll start uh, noticing what the recorder did. The first thing the recorder did is what we call name mapping. Don't worry about that. We have a full-blown multiple videos in that chapter for name mapping. But test complete had to look into the memory, okay? And that's a, a power of test complete is to be able to see all inside of the memory uh, on your Windows machine to be able to find out what object is running where in memory. So it was able, able to find out that I have a process which is the application itself called Notepad, okay? And that's a non-visual. The process itself is non-visual. And then there is a child element of that process called W and D Notepad. And that's a visual piece. That's the main window of the Notepad process itself. And then underneath that, there is another child, which is the text box in Notepad itself. And in Windows 11, they've actually changed the way Notepad works. Now I can have multiple tabs, for instance. So there is a rich edit d2dpt which is the name of the object itself so if you're running windows 10 or so on this will be just notepad edit in here after the main window and that's it but in windows 11 they made it much fancier and <laughs> now we have um, a full-blown um, uh, tabbing capabilities in notepad and you can do a lot more in notepad than what you used to as well that's okay and then there will be a line in here that says, okay, on this rich edit D2DPT, which is, by the way, the name in memory, so you will you might find out why the test complete call it that, that was the name it found in memory. So whatever the name is, um, that is what it's using. We will see later on in name mapping, if you don't like that name, how you can change it um, in the name mapping itself so you can actually have more meaningful name in your Python text as well. Remember that first click that I did just to give it focus? Well, Test Complete recognized that click and it did a click with an X and Y coordinate. All right, so it went 73 pixels from, uh, from the left and then it went 51 pixels from the top down and this is what I clicked. Do you think this is important for Test Complete? Well, it was important for recording, but I bet you it is not that important for running. And the reason for that is... Test Complete has no idea why specifically you had to click on 7351, the X and Y coordinate in Pixel. Well, there was no re reason. I just wanted to give it focus. Because I'm using the object in here, this is useless. I can delete this line completely and I will not make any difference at all in the execution of that test. Some people definitely will leave it alone. Just, there is no reason to actually change anything in the text. Um, in the test itself that was created and it will work just fine but some people are very picky saying if it does not mean anything I want it out of my my uh, my script and you can definitely remove it and it will not affect anything in your uh, script whatsoever alrighty and then finally it uses that rich edit d2 uh, dpt and it's using a function called keys and keys has to do with the keyboard okay and it's entering the words good morning and push the enter key the thing about keys it will actually use the string and it will try to use one letter at a time. So it does not take good morning and poof, it puts it into uh, the rich text editor. No, keys means I want you to type in G. And then after 50 milliseconds, put an O. And then after 50 milliseconds, put another O and so on and so forth until there is something in bracket. And these are special characters like enter, tab, shift, control things like that and it will do one at a time and if you want to give it more time than 50 millisecond between one we will see that later on in tools in the options and in the uh, default project properties you can change the timing between each and every single click on the keyboard during the run of the test but by default it's a 50 millisecond so it's very very fast as if you're typing it's just mimicking exactly uh, what you're doing does that make sense so just really quickly, I would like to run this test to make sure that we uh, we have recorded correctly. So I'm going to come in here, we'll delete the good morning. And if I leave it open on my screen, I would like to run this test. 
And like everything else in Test Complete, I can actually run it so many different ways. So I can come in here to the code and right click on anywhere in the code and we'll say run this routine. That will do it. That will run test number one. Okay. Or I can actually have my cursor somewhere inside of test one and click on this green button right there in the toolbar, the first one on the left. If you do it, it's exactly the same thing as right clicking and saying run this routine. If you don't want to do it from the editor, you can do it actually from the left side. So I can go to my unit one in here, right click on it, and we can say run test one. All right. All of them do exactly the same thing. We'll run this function called test one. There are other ways, including this green button all the way at the top that we will talk about later on. But for right now, during development, whether you want to actually right click and run it, click on the button and run it, or right click on the unit in the project explorer and run it, all of them will do exactly the same thing. So what do you say? Let's go ahead and run it and see if it will work. Notice because it's very simple things, it's just a couple of things happening. It will take less than half a second for this to run. So I just want you to notice, let me use my marker. I want you to notice this area of the screen. See this area? This is called the indicator area. Alrighty. So when I say to the test one, go ahead and run, it will open up the indicator and it will run the test and it will bring in test uh, notepad to the front and hopefully it will do a click and then it will do um, a keyboard function, which is the action for good morning and push enter. Let's go ahead and do it. All right click in here. We'll say run this routine and we'll give it a second. Now I'm not touching anything. There is the indicator all the way at the top. You will notice notepad um, will receive now um, the... Uh, the execution one line at a time it will recognize the object and notice it's actually doing each and every single letter good space morning space and then it will push the enter key and then when it's done it will try to create a log in xml format and it will put the log in here if it's in the green that means it was successful if there were warnings it will be in yellow and if any errors occurred it will be in red in here so right now it's writing out the xml file to my disk and there it is it's in the green it was 100 percent successful notice the first thing it clicked in 7351 and after that the keyboard input the next element of the uh, test result it actually says good morning enter was sent as a keyboard input to the following window and we are successful and we are in good shape as well another thing that you might be interested in is to understand what this uh, visualizer means so let's go back to the script and here we'll click on unit one do you see this window it's called test visualizer at the bottom in there every time you took an action on the screen it could be a click a double click middle click right click or a keyboard actions like the good morning Test complete during the recording takes a screenshots and puts it all the way at the bottom in here in test visualizer. And this is something again you can turn on or off. By default it's turned on, but of course you can turn it off if you want to and I'll tell you why in a second. So the first one on line number three, notice there is a, an icon in here that got created as a picture. Just to remind you, uh, and by the way this, this gray area here on the left is called the gutter. Okay, we call it the gutter in test complete. And there is a lot of things that can show up in here. It could be a breakpoint, it could be an image, it could be a search, it could be a lot of different things, a bookmark. Um, this gutter area can be very useful for so many different things. So when I see here a click 7351 and there is an image, that means test visualizer took a screenshot when this click happens. And there it is, it shows you exactly why you clicked. Alrighty. The next one, I did a keyboard, or it could be other things than keyboard as well. It could be a W text value, which we will see later on. Uh, but this one is entering one letter at a time, but it doesn't show the words good morning with the enter key. And the reason for that is you can actually uh, not have this hard coded. So you can remove this string and maybe use a variable later on or change the word from good morning to good evening. And we don't want the test visualizers to fail. So whenever there is something like this, uh, keys being in, it will take a screenshot and put a red rectangle around the object itself, but it will not show the value inside of there that is being entered. And that's to actually continue to be successful. What do I mean by continuing to be successful? When I ran the test, see the script here that was successful in the previous video, what it did during the run, it took another picture. So it took another picture on line number three and took another pictures on line number four. And then the two pictures were compared to whatever happened during the recording. If they are identical, great, that's a success. If there is something difference between the picture that was taken during the run versus the one that was uh, available during the recording, it will let you know. So for instance, in here, I notice Notepad says file, edit, and view. Maybe in Windows 12 or 13 in the future or whatever, they will add another menu. Maybe there is a menu, fourth menu here called uh, utilities, for instance, or something like that. It will not change 
the fact that this test will succeed. But when they take the picture, there will be the word in here utility showing up that was not there during the recording. And I want the system to let me know about it, even though if the test was successful as well. Does that make sense? So the test visualizer is an excellent way visually to really quickly take a look at all the image. You might get 20, 30 of them right next to each other. And it's almost like watching a video. So you can actually scroll through them just to understand what you're doing during your session for test one itself. Makes it very easy to understand what's going on, having a red rectangle on the object that you're dealing with as well. My last thing I wanted to show you or to actually mention in here is that why would you want to turn off something like that? The thing is that you might be running this test a hundred times, okay? Especially if it's you're brand new into creating test one, you want to test it so many times and then it runs by itself at midnight uh, as part of the, uh, the, the test suite that runs at midnight automatically and so on. And if you're going to leave test visualizer turned on by default, every time you run, you are creating more images that will need to go on the disk Alrighty, so uh, after maybe a few months or six months or so, <laughs> you might actually fill up the disk with gigabytes worth of images because every time test one will run, there will be more and more images created and saved on the disk. And some people will say like, no, I, I don't want to do that. So let's go ahead and, uh, and turn it off after a while. So we will leave it on maybe for the first months just to get a pretty good idea. And maybe we can turn it on whenever we need it, but after a month we'll turn it off so we don't actually run out of disk space on the network for our team, for instance, and so on. Does that make sense? So that is what Test Visualizer will bring um, to us as well. All right, let's take a look at these three windows that show up at the bottom. You see bookmarks, search replace results, and the to-do. These are great windows that can help you as a test developer um, in, uh, in the system as well. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. I would like to create another test, but I'm going to copy all of that. All right, we'll say Control C to copy that into the clipboard. And I'm going to go down in here. We'll say paste. Oh, let me go ahead and fix this. <laughs> You have to be very careful with the tabbing. It's just four spaces or the, the tab key. That's how Python likes to do it. And there is an error in here because you cannot have the same function name test one. So we'll call this one test two, for instance. And for the second one, I'm going to remove this click that I told you is not very important at all because we're getting to things through the object name. So I don't need to know that it's focused or not. I'm just still going to find it in memory by its name and I'm going to um, use the keyboard to get to it. So that's not a problem at all. So now that I have these two in here let's first of all check out the keyboards if you put the mouse over it it will open up this window called bookmarks and then if you move away it will actually collapse itself again but what does it mean to have a key a bookmark sometimes you have so much code written in your unit files in in python and you'd like to move between them without having to scroll for half an hour right so i mean this is easy here because i have only two functions with a couple of lines not a big deal but sometimes I'm in test one in here and then test 25 all the way at the bottom. I have to scroll and it sometimes takes the concentration away from what you're trying to do. So sometimes I want to put bookmarks on what I'm trying to do. So maybe right here before the C of click, I'd like to put a bookmark where the cursor is so I can get back to it at any time. Okay. How do you set a bookmark? There are a lot of different ways you can do that. Most likely you're going to use the keyboard to do that, but also you can actually use the mouse as well. Usually programmers uh, and testers, developers, they do not like to use the mouse for a lot of things. For speed, they like to use the keyboard, but both of them are available. So if I go here right before the C and you can choose anywhere on that line, I can right click and notice all the way at the bottom it says toggle bookmarks. You are allowed to use 10 bookmarks per unit. It's per unit. Be careful with what I'm saying in here, okay? So if I say toggle bookmark, do I have to start with the first one, which is number zero? No, you can actually start with seven if you want, or eight or nine. You can do whatever you want, right? You just have 10 different slots that you can actually choose at any time, even if they have not been used before. So if I want to actually create a bookmark number seven, even though I don't have anything between zero and six, I can do that if I want to say bookmark seven, click on it and notice what it will do. It will put the number seven. Let me zoom in so you can see it better. There you go. I don't know if you can see it better or not, but uh, it is seven in here. Just to remind you, not only do we have an image on this line, part of the test visualizer, but there is a bookmark seven on this line right before the C as well. If I go to good morning and the test number two, right before the M, for instance, I can right click 
and I can say create a toggle bookmark. And one of the things that you need to learn probably as a cheat sheet of Desk Complete are the keyboard shortcuts. So if I say uh, Shift Control 7 or Shift Control 8 or Shift Control 9, it will create it using the keyboard. And with time, you will learn all these uh, shortcuts and you will be able to actually do this really quickly with your keyboard instead. Does that make sense? Let's go ahead and put a shift, uh, uh, a bookmark on number eight, for instance, right before the M. We'll click on that. Notice the eight will show up in a yellow bookmark right there, just to remind you of that. That's great. So now, if I my cursor halfway uh, down, maybe 200 lines down, and I want to go to um, bookmark number seven. Again, I usually like to use the, the the keyboard to do that, but in the beginning, if you don't remember the shortcut, you can always right click anywhere in the code and you can say go to bookmark and notice all of them are turned off except the ones that are filled in. So I can actually say go to seven. Alrighty, and that notice you'll move the cursor right away right before the C. Or usually I will use the keyboard, we'll say control eight, for instance, and notice it moves right before the M. So control seven, control eight, and it moves very, very fast. And even if it's two, three hundred lines below, the bookmarks will take you exactly where you're trying to go. So bookmark can be very, very useful as well. The nice thing about it also, it creates a window at the bottom of the screen. See, if I go now to bookmarks and put the cursor over it, you will see there is a seven and an eight for the bookmark. It tells you which line number is it on like three, line number three and line number eight. And we'll tell you what the location is, which in my case right now would be unit one. So I can actually click on it. So I can actually click on this guy. It will go straight to it. Or I double click on the eight, for instance, and it will take me straight there. So again, very rarely we'll use the windows, maybe in the beginning, because you're not going to memorize all the different shortcuts in Test Complete. So you can use the, the, uh, the, the mouse to actually say go to bookmark, or you can actually use the menu at the at the bottom for bookmarks window to get to it. Once you you uh, give yourself a few months of being an expert in test complete, you will always remember Control Seven, Control Eight, Control Nine, and you will move to that right away. And by the way, you might want to ask why did Lino choose to use seven and eight, for instance, instead of going from one, two, and three? Well, because remember, Control One, Control Two, and Control Three, I have already things mapped in Windows. I have a product called Zoom, which I can actually do. If I say Control Two, I can actually do this, and it will conflict. <laughs> that's why I cheated a little bit and chose a bookmark seven and eight. So, if that's important for you, you might actually want to change some of the keyboard mapping. Um, in your products I like zoom it and so on that I'm using in here to do that as well control one will do a zoom Alrighty, so we'll do a zoom like that. That's why I didn't use those So I actually ended up using seven and eight <laughs> for me to cheat a little bit to show you how bookmarks work it makes sense The next one I would like to show you is the search replace results Let's say for instance I have a big file with maybe a thousand lines of code in it in Python for instance and I'm looking for something I'm looking for something that says the word good and I have it available twice in here so what do you do actually usually in Windows on under any product usually control F will bring up a, a search and this is one of the things that you have to do to be able to get us as a certified Windows application you have to have specific keyboard shortcuts to do this or you can go to the edit and you can say fine but it has to map to a control f for instance so i usually do it with the keyboard like everybody else will say control f and that window will come up and i can actually say good i'm looking for the word good you can look actually in the current document or panel in the entire project suite whether the file is open in the editor or not or maybe you have an open document that is not part of your project but you'd like to look into it as well or you have a selection. Maybe I just highlighted three or four lines and I want to look or search right inside of whatever is highlighted, whatever is selected in the screen, not the whole document. You can do that. I would say 90% of the people in the world will do it based on the current document or panel and will say find next, for instance. We'll say find next and it will find good. All right. So I just want to make sure you understand that it will find it right away. What happens to the window at the bottom for search and replace? Absolutely nothing. It does not affect that. So whenever you do a find next, this has nothing to do with the window at the bottom in here because it's going to go to the first occurrence and we'll have no idea that it's occurring again somewhere else. All right, so now let's go ahead and do it again. We'll say Control F. And this time I would like to say good 
but I want to find all of them, okay? We'll say find all. Now it will be able to find every single one in the search in the place. So it says uh, in unit one, I found on line four and line eight, there is the word good morning in here, and there is the four and eight right there. It found all of them, okay? If I click on or double click on the first one, it will move to the first good. If I go back in here and double click on the second one, it will find out. And the nice thing about this is that it will remember. This will not be deleted until you decide to right click on one of them, for instance, and say delete, but it will always be there. So if you're searching for something and then you get distracted by going in somewhere else, you don't have to restart the search again. It will be persisted for you in here in the project itself. So it can remind you that yes, you do actually have two occurrences of good and they will always be there. So I can go back and do a control seven and a control eight and you know, do bookmarking. And then all of a sudden, okay, what was I working on? I was searching for good. Let me bring up this again and double click on it and we'll still remember what you're looking at. It's a small thing, but it's available in all IDEs, whether it's in Eclipse or Visual Studio or other uh, products as well. And it's available for you in case you would like to do that as well in Test Complete. All right, let's go ahead and do the last one, which is the to do. Uh, and this is a very nifty, very small feature. We call it uh, poor man's project management, all right? Because usually you will have other major tools that you're going to be using to uh, to enter information for the other team members. Things like Jira, for instance, or um, Zypher, or you can actually use something like Azure DevOps or Jenkins. Or, there are a lot of tools out there that definitely are professional tools. But sometimes you just want to share something in your code with the rest of your team. So for instance, I would go right before of test one in here, all right, and I'm gonna put a, a comment, we'll say slash slash to enter a comment, for instance, and I'm gonna actually say to do colon, and I will say, um, oh, this dash dash is, is uh, for other languages. <laughs> so in here would be, <laughs> it would be um, um, the hashtag. If you put a hash, that's a comment in Python. So if you're using JavaScript, it would be slash slash, C sharp is slash slash, Java would, would be okay. But for uh, definitely for, uh, for Python, you'll have to use a hash to put a comment. And you'll have to put a directive after that. So when you put a comment, usually the compiler, uh, when you're trying to compile this, will not care what's happening in the comment. That's for you. But if you put the word to do right after the hash, not only it's a regular comment, but it's called a directive. That means you're telling the system, I'm going to tell you something about what I'm trying to do in here, So please pay attention. So put the word to do and a colon right after it. And then after that, you can actually come and say whatever you want, saying, uh, for instance, John, please fix this function before Friday, for instance, okay? That's very important for us. And now I can save my project and that will be there. So when I check in this file into my source control system, John can come in the morning on a Monday morning, for instance, and uh, first thing they will do in their own test complete instance, they will go all the way down to the to-do and they will notice that there is something available in here. And there might be tens of them, okay? Uh, so you might actually wanna click on owner uh, click on it to actually be able to sort it descending and click on it again to make it descending so you can actually see um, the priority the owner the category and what's going on so the description john please fix this function uh, before friday um, i can actually do it from here as well to set the priority so i can come in here and say priority one this is the highest priority in the company it means this has to be fixed before anything else the owner for instance i might actually put john in here okay oops sorry let me click here to see a cursor, we'll say John. And then the category will uh, will make it, for instance, we can come up with something, we'll say stop ship. This is a very, very dangerous, something that we cannot keep going. We have to fix our script for doing that. And I just want you to notice, oops, I uh, did not push enter, my bad. <laughs> we'll say stop ship and we'll push enter. All right, notice what I'm doing these things is changing the, uh, the, uh, the line of text being put inside of the code. So now it's still a comment, and there is the hash, and it's to do, but there is no colon yet. It has a one in here, and that's a priority. And then it has a dash C, that's for category, stop ship, dash O for owner, that's John. And then we'll have the colon. Everything after the column will be the description. But before the colon, you can actually set the priority, the category, and the owner as well. So I can go maybe before um, or after, it doesn't matter. I can come in here. Let me go ahead and steal this line. I'm going to say Control C in here. And I'm going to go right before this guy and we'll say this to do maybe priority two. Uh, maybe this is uh, cosmetic. All right, we'll say um, 
cosmetic all righty and this is for john or let's say this is one is for lino we'll say lino and then we'll say lino please uh, fix uh, this before uh, next year <laughs> all right so we'll say save all the stuff and then if i go back to my to do notice that is both of them are in here based on the owner the priority one and two so i can actually go ahead and click on owner notice uh, i can actually make it um, descending or the, uh, or ascending for the sorting i can do it also based on the priority ascending or descending the category clicking once clicking twice will go between ascending and descending as well so again this is a poor man's project management um, usually whenever people are done so maybe lino come in the morning uh, and i was able to read this and i fixed the problem so i will come in here under the second one and i will click done so when i click on done it changes the word from to do to done it doesn't delete it because we would like to find out what's going on so so actually uh um, the owner the person that actually uh, did this can come in here on the next day and can verify that it has been fixed and if they don't understand what's going on and the bug did not go away for instance they can actually turn it back on again so by unchecking it it will go back to to do and they might actually put a message in here saying i tried it on uh, on monday morning and uh, the bug is still there the only problem with this of course with other bigger tool like jira and azure devops and jenkins and all that stuff will do a much better job it will keep track of the history all right there are no history here in uh, in, uh, in test complete unless of course using a source control system and you can actually do a rollback to a previous version or something like that but in the code itself it will not keep history for each one so once you change this and save this is it this is what the file will have so it does not remember what yesterday or two days ago what is the line of course unless source control is being used as long as you're okay with that this is just a very simple easy way to leave a comment or to communicate with your team members from right inside of their code as well now we get to the most exciting window in test complete this is the window I love the most because it's the most powerful window in test complete and you probably see it on the screen maybe didn't notice it yet but it is right there it's called the object browser this is pretty much why you you purchased uh, test complete is the power and the brain behind everything in test complete so if I click on the object browser in here folks it will open up and it will try to go to the memory and read everything so doesn't matter what you have visual non-visual services uh, any kind of application or any kind of process running inside of there will show up right there uh, right away I'm going to keep it on basic view which is the view that you get when you first install test complete I always try to change that right away to say advanced view but by default you'll get it as a basic view and the part that I want you to notice on the left side there would be two pieces in here one is called mobile which we will not gonna attack in this course but the other one would be system sys sys here sys means the system that doesn't mean just the operating system but part of the system also is the hardware where you're running test complete as well so if i click on it notice it has the windows 11 logo next to it and then on the right side i can see all the basic view and that is the default in test complete you will see what's available in the clipboard right now with what cpu are you running i'm running an amd um, ryzen uh, threadripper 2950x and 16 cores and everything like that i have 32 different cpus on this machine um, i have a desktop of course it has an ellipsis which is the three buttons that means this is a complex property it would not be able to explain the desktop in just one property so i have to open it up with the ellipsis so i can so see all the properties of just the desktop itself I can see what the name of my machine i called it lino desktop for instance i can see os info but again it's an object it means i cannot explain that property in one line so i have to click on it uh, click on the ellipses or double click on the os info so i can get the information who's the username that is logged into windows right now that's me lino for instance and so on these are not the only properties by the way on the system so that's why i always like the first thing i'll do when i install test complete on a new machine is to click on advanced view and then i'll get a lot more properties in here even the ones that are kind of weird <laughs> but they can be very useful for you as well 
It will still say the clipboard, the CPU, and the count, but notice there is one called CPU usage. This 6 means 6%. That means my CPU currently is 6%. Notice it went down to 5 because there is something in the background that just shut down. So it gives uh, freedom a little bit to the CPU. So every few seconds you will notice this will go down from 2 to 5 to 6 and come back. But there is a delay of a few seconds, of course, because otherwise it will keep refreshing every second and that would be a little bit too much. Uh, also, the memory uses. There is 36% of my memory on this machine is being used. And I have a significant amount of memory on this machine. I have 128 gig of RAM on this machine in here. 36% uh, of it is being used. So that's uh, pretty good as well. Let's take a look, for instance, if I want to see the OS info. See, if I click on the ellipses in here, even though I'm on the sys, which is the system itself, if you click on it, it now it will move you deeper into sys.os info. And these are all the properties of the inside object called OS info. I can see that I'm running the pro version of Windows 11 64 bit. And I can see all of these different things available in here, including where my system directory is on this machine, where my temp directory is, where my Windows directory is. Um, so this could be very useful, for instance, if I would like to log this for my R&D team when, when I find a bug. So maybe, um, can you imagine, for instance, what will happen if I found a bug and I report it, for instance, into my bug reporting system for R&D and tell them, hey, every time I click on uh, that button, uh, the system uh, crashes, so please fix the problem. Wouldn't it be nice for you to take a snapshot of all this information and let me know that memory usage is at 99%. So R&D doesn't have to waste their time. They will tell me, Lino, please fix your machine. You have way too much stuff going on on your machine, too many applications, and you don't have enough memory. So of course you're crashing. It's not our fault. You're at 99% utilization. So the system doesn't have any memory for us to do what we need to do. So try to bring it below 70 at least, or hopefully even 50, so that we have enough uh, memory to be able to do whatever we need to do in the app. But we will not fix a bug where your memory usage is at 99% or something like that. Does that make sense? So this could be very, very useful as well. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what's going to happen when I open up the system in here in the tree view on the left side. Let's go ahead and click on that. And that will open up the system and will show you all the processes running on your machine. Can you believe I have all the stuff running on my machine right now? And I don't have to count them one by one. I can tell how many do I have. If you go to the child count in here on the sys, it will say 295. And again, it will keep going up and down because some things will, uh, Windows will run in the background as a background task for just a few seconds, or maybe to clean up something or whatever, and will shut it down. So don't worry if you see that number going up and down. That's very normal on a Windows machine, okay? So right now it's telling me I have about 290 different application or processes. Well, that sounds like a little bit too much. If I look into my task bar, I pretty much have like uh, six or seven applications running. I have test complete. I have uh, the video recorder that I'm running. I have Notepad. Uh, Chrome is running on my machine. My Outlook for my email. So like six or seven only. So what the heck is 283 for? Well, some things are running, but are not visual. For instance, Dropbox is running always in the background. A Google Drive might be running. Um, um, things like, for instance, the, the Java VM, it's an application, it's a process running in memory. I have Nginx, for instance, for my, uh, for my Docker container running on my machine. Even though it's not an application running, it's still running in memory. So there are a lot of different processes running, as you can see in here. Um, Zoom is running, even though I don't have a Zoom session going, but Zoom is running in the background anyway. So all of these things, you can actually take a look at them. Even my WCL for Linux, I have a Linux subsystem on Windows, and that has to be running as well, so I can actually get to it from my Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code and stuff like that. So um, if it's in the memory, Test Complete will see it. And that's the beauty of Test Complete. That's why we pay money for Test Complete, because how strong and how fast it is to be able to see everything running in memory, not just what you see on the screen as well. So this is great. So if you remember earlier, we started Notepad, right? So let me bring on Notepad on the screen in here. Uh, there it is. Remember this guy? So I would like to find out where Notepad is here. Ah, there it is. It says Process Notepad. And it has the logo for Notepad as well. And notice it keep refreshing every few seconds. So I'm going to open up, uh, click on, let's click on the process for Notepad. And of course, the properties in here will change right away. So now I'm seeing the advanced view properties of Notepad itself as a process, not as a window, as a process. 
all right it says child count five all right that means this notepad process there are five objects in memory associated as a as children of this notepad okay put that in mind as well right now there are zero percentage being used on the cpu for notepad and that might change but right now there are no background threads for notepad running so nothing is using the cpu right now this is the file version 11.2302.260 uh, that ships with windows 11 as well uh, handle count this number might scare you a little bit um, everything has a handle anything you can see has a handle like a button has a handle a text box has a handle a menu item might have a handle and what it's saying right now is that for the process notepad and all the windows underneath it there is almost 1400 objects available can you believe it i mean if you take a look at notepad it looks so benign it looks like a very small thing uh, uh, a main window a tab a couple of uh, menu items at some text and maybe this thing well everything you see in here and sometimes you don't see has a handle uh, the developers that wrote notepad uh, created so many objects in the background so this little gear in here has a handle the uh, the the dash for minimizing and maximizing an x each one of them has a handle that dot or x both of them have a handle okay so that's why uh, you would be surprised to say that notepad has 1400 handles available on that amazing and there will be other for instance the memory users is 94k so there is almost 100k worth of memory being utilized by notepad it's not a lot but again you'll be able to tell that this is being taken care of right there as well all right all these properties are non-visual these are based on the process of notepad itself very important to understand that so now i want to find out what are these five objects so the way to find that click on the arrow right next to the process and it will show me all the five children notice four of them are grayed out and only one of them uh, is in regular black text in here so what does that mean that means these four are real objects in memory that are uh, children of the process but they are all non-visual okay the only visual one is the window that says notepad notepad one what does that mean it means if I click on this window for notepad notepad one it will open up notice here to take a screenshot to show you this is what I'm looking at right now and that is the main window of notepad these three parameters in here might be very important for you when you start writing Python with uh, against test complete in here to understand that the first one this is the name uh, of the object in memory and in our case that's the process for notepad so it will probably mimic exactly what you have in the process notepad in here the second one is the uh, the caption of the window so in my case the main window is also going to be called notepad and the one in here means this is the first instance of the main window under the process notepad so if you for instance can create multiple instances of the main window under notepad the first one will be one and the second one will be two and the third one will be three so that you can differentiate between all of them in notepad you can't actually do that you cannot actually have multiple uh, main windows so you can only have one main window under the process for notepad but other uh, applications might allow for this but notepad doesn't does that make sense if i actually go ahead and click on this main window you will notice here we have also all the properties of just the main window alone and now it says child count is 10 that means under the main window we have 10 different windows some of them might be uh, visible some of them will be hidden but in memory there are 10 different windows that are children of the main window of notepad itself and then i can see all the rest of this uh, available in here i can see the screen left screen top um, unicode visible visible on the screen these are all great properties to have to be able to check with an if statement in python later on if i need to okay you probably notice that there is this little um, donut right next to the window caption in here what is this donut in here folks see all these properties do not have that donut that means these are read only properties it means you can get their values but you cannot set it anything that has this little donut in here next to it that means this window caption doesn't only allow you to read the value but the donut allows you to write the value that means i can actually assign the window caption um, using python or do it right here by clicking inside of notepad and changing it right in here as well if i want to that's excellent now let's go ahead and, and, and go take a look at our 10 windows if i click on the uh, tree view in here 
Notice some of them are grayed out that you cannot see, okay? These are probably objects that will facilitate something in the background like content bridges and stuff like that. And one of them will be very important for us, which is the window notepad text box. That's the white area inside of here. Let me click on this guy. And then in the notepad uh, text box, you will notice here, it has its own set of properties and there is only one child underneath that object. So if I want to see what this object is, let's click on the tree view next to it. And there will be a rich edit D2 DPT in here. It has no caption and it has it's the first instance underneath the text box. If I click on it, I will, again, I will have my own set of properties. And it takes a screenshot of it just to tell you this is where good morning is, uh, is there. Notice there are two different properties that have a donut next to it, the window caption, and there is a very, very famous property, and it's called WText. WText will show you the value for good morning. So if I click inside of here, you have to do it very fast, all right? So let's go ahead and click in here with, say, Lino, for instance, and push enter. Oh, see, I did it. I took too, too long. So if you take me too long, the refresh will bring in the value of good morning. So I want to actually be able to do that instead of trying to do it too fast. Maybe I will end up using the W text because it has a donut and I can assign it in Python in the code itself to change the value of W text inside of that uh, window rich text D2D PT. Wouldn't that be cool? So let's go back to our code in here just to show you what I'm trying to do. So uh, in this uh, function, the second function in here, I'll, let me delete what's inside. And I would like to steal this, uh, this line in here. It says alias notepad, uh, window notepad, notepad text box, all the way to the rich text editor. And I'm going to actually go ahead and push tab and paste that line. And I'm going to put a dot right after that. Now I will see all the properties and all the functions and the events and everything associated with the rich text editor. So if I say, for instance, I would like to see W text, just start typing the first couple of letters and there is W text right there. So if I double click on it, I can come in here and say, Lino was here, for instance, something like this. What happens, for instance, if I run this code now, let's go ahead and save this. And let me make this a little bit smaller so that you can actually see what's going on side by side. I'm going to Go ahead and in here, uh, there you go, <laughs> righty. And I'm going to bring up Notepad here on the side as well. Uh, make this a little bit smaller. Okay, let me go ahead and run this line of code, uh, which is running the, uh, the test tool. Right click on it and say run the routine. Look what will happen in here. Now it's not going to work like the keys when I said good morning. It will actually assign Lino was here, poof, all at once. You see what happened to, to Notepad? And it's in the green. It's successful. Lino was, was here. But it didn't enter L-I-N-O space. No. Uh, when you do a W text, you're taking whatever the content of the entire rich text editor and poof, all in one shot. So that's not a real test, by the way, because that's not how people are going to be entering tests in Notepad. Usually, you're going to use a keyboard. And these are two different tests. Some people ask sometimes, should I use W text or should I use keys? Well, there is no such thing as which one is best. You have to do both, right? You have to have two tests, one to mimic entering line, uh, letter by letter uh, to make sure that this will work and the validation will work based on entering text. And the other one, W text, to find out if the data comes in from an API, for instance, or something, it will still behave correctly and the validation will happen as well. So these are not or. These are two different tests and might be very, very much needed for both of them uh, to be tested. Does that make sense, everybody? The last thing I wanted to show you in here for the object browser as well. Now we talked about the donuts and all these properties and how to, to deal with the children from the process to the main window to the rich text editor and so on. I just wanted to be able to tell you that you can also right click on any object and ask test complete to highlight it on the screen. So for instance, if I want to find out where that object is, Notepad is easy. I only have like three or four things in front of me, but sometimes your application has hundreds and hundreds of buttons and text boxes, and you don't know which one is which. So you can right click on the, uh, on the rich text uh, editor, for instance, and you can say highlight on the screen. See, if I click on that, it will flash it three times in red just to show you this is the, uh, the window I'm talking about. And if I do this, on the previous one, which is the, the parent of the rich text editor. Let's go ahead and try it out. We'll right click and we'll say highlight on the screen. And now it, it seems the same, but it's the container behind the rich text editor. If I go to the notepad, this is the main window. Let's click on it and right click and we'll say highlight on the screen. And now notice the whole window have flashed three times, not just the, the text editor. 
So my question to you is what happened, for instance, if I go and try to highlight something that is invisible on the screen? Because these are all windows, right? So if I go, for instance, let's say to this content bridge, right click on it and right click and say highlight on the screen. What do you expect will happen? Let's do that. And it says, I can't. This is something I cannot highlight because it's not available on the screen. How about the status bar? See, the status bar is grayed out. So when I right click on it and I say highlight on the screen, guess what will happen? It cannot see it. That means what? That means the, the status bar is implemented in such a way that it's only when it's, uh, it's needed, it will be brought in uh, into visibility just to make it faster for Notepad. That's not the case for previous version of Notepad. Notepad uh, for Windows 10, for instance, the status bar will show up aut automatically. Let me bring up the window to show you what I mean in here. Oops, there is Notepad. There it is. You see that uh, window at the bottom? That's called the status bar window. Right now, it is just almost think of it as a bit blit image. Um, so it's not real. Until you click inside of it and try to do something with it, then this guy will not be grayed out anymore. They only did this in Windows 11. Previous Windows um, versions will have this available um, all the time in memory as well. So uh, visibility is very important, whether you can highlight it or not. Again, it all depends on how the application you're, tested, you're testing has been implemented. Does that make sense? So we talked about processes, windows, the, uh, the donut in here for making it read and write. Um, and also we talked about all the different properties that you can get to and also how to highlight things on the screen. So Object Browser is an extremely powerful piece that you can actually investigate your application under test and get a lot of information uh, from what you're about to do. So nothing can be hidden from you on your application. And this application could be written in C++, in C Sharp, in VB, in Java, whatever it is. If it's running on Windows, Test Complete will be able to get you all this information in here as well. All right, the last video of this section uh, for talking about the IDE will be one of my favorite buttons in Test Complete, and that would be this guy right over here. See this guy where my red uh, circle is going? It's called the Object Spy. Uh, the Object Spy can be extremely helpful because Notepad so far for us have been easy enough. There's not too much stuff going on in Notepad. I have a main window, I have a tab, a couple of menus, and one rich text edit. So you're not going to get lost very much in there. But sometimes, like I said, when you have uh, tons of menus and toolbars and uh, hundreds of windows, sometimes you don't know which one is which and you have hundreds of things in here on the left side under the process in the main window and you get lost. So Object Spy is your friend. So let me, for instance, go ahead and collapse this on the side in here for Notepad. And I would like the system to help me finding out the other way around. Instead of finding it in the object browser and highlighting it in the application, I want the application to highlight it in the object browser, okay? So let's go ahead and click on the object spy. Once you click on it, test complete will end up minimizing itself, all right? There it is. And then this object spy window will show up. And there are two ways to using object spy. One of them is to click on this button and not let go of the mouse, keep dragging. Drag it to any window on the screen, okay? Until you see a red rectangle and then you let go of the mouse and then it will try to recognize what this uh, object is. Sometimes, unfortunately, the, the object that you're after cannot be dragged into. For instance, let's say I would like to do it based on the file uh, new tab. I want to get to this object, okay? But the file is not open. I can't use the, this uh, drag and drop object because once you start dragging, there is no time for you to open up the file menu. It's too late. It will, it will pretty much freeze the screen. So it has to be available right now. So if you'd like to actually find out, for instance, where is this new tab or new window object is in memory, you cannot use this, uh, this uh, first one, which is the drag and drop. You'll have to use the second one, which is point and fix using the keyboard, shift, control, A. So when you click on this guy, it will still give you time to click on file and then have this open, have the, the cursor right over it and now go to the keyboard and say shift, control, A. And now it will find the object right underneath the mouse at this point. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes with pop-up menus, like right-clicking in here, for instance, you see this, um, this menu. You cannot use the first drag and drop in here. Okay? You have to use the second one because this will not be available when you start dragging and dropping. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Let's go ahead and use the drag and drop. I'm going to click on it. Notice I did not let go. I am moving it until I get to the main window. We'll wait to see a red rectangle around the main window. If I go down a little bit, there is be another object, which is the file menu with the menu toolbar. 
And then if I go down a little bit, now I'm on the rich text editor itself. So now I can release the, the mouse. And now test complete will say, I found it. I found the object that you are dragging the object spy to. And these are all the properties and everything that we've seen before. And the, the magic here, folks, is this button all the way at the top right in here. Let me put the uh, this guy in here to show you. There it is. Oops. Let me do it again. Right there. Oh, I cannot do it with this object. Okay, sounds good. But this is the guy. It looks like a tree view. It's a very, very powerful button. If I click on this tree view, what I'm saying is... This object that I just helped find using the object spy, please show me where this guy is inside of the object browser itself. So I'm going to click on it. That will uh, reopen test complete itself. And it will highlight the object exactly as it is. Now I don't need this object spy. I can close it down. I don't need it. But you'll notice the rich text editor will be highlighted. Does that make sense? So if I want to do this, for instance, on the main window, let's keep this highlighted as the rich edit D2, D2. And let's do it again. We'll click on the object spy. I'm going to drag this guy until I see a red rectangle on the main window and we'll let go. And that is the main window. If I click on the tree view again, it will open up test complete. Now I can close this window. I don't need it. But notice that the main window is the one that is being highlighted right away. Let's do it with the file system. This is the last time just to give you multiple examples. If I click on this guy, we'll go and see the red rectangle on the file system uh, menu. We'll let go. And there it is. There is the main window. Okay. I'm going to say Show me that in the tree view uh, of the object browser itself. And I can actually close this down. I don't need it. And notice this is the window of the menu. I wouldn't have found out this information because there is nothing in the name of the window that tells me that this is the file menu. Okay, But now I know that the uh, desktop Windows ML source uh, instance number 5, that is the file menu inside of the notepad for Windows 11. Does that make sense? So again, uh, these object spies are extremely, extremely powerful inside of uh, Test Complete. So I hope you, uh, you enjoy using that. I use this the most every day in Test Complete as well. Let's start our journey with an introduction to Python language itself. Uh, you can, of course, do it right inside of Test Complete, or sometimes just when you're brand new to Python. You might want to actually do it in something that will compile uh, outside of Test Complete just to learn the language itself and the ins and outs. So I'll show you two different ways of doing that. The first one, if you go to the web, for instance, you can download uh, Visual Studio Code. So if you open up another tab in here, we'll say Visual Studio Code. All right. And then click on the first one you see in there and you will be able to download for Windows. Um, <clears throat> Again, if you are a Mac user or Linux user, you can actually download it for any of the platform. Uh, it's not necessarily has to do with Test Complete, but it will make it much easier to, to learn about the, uh, the language of Python itself. Make sure also you go to the Python website uh, for the organization and download the latest available. Uh, I think it's 3.12 is the latest one as of the recording of this video, but you can download just the latest to have that interpreter available on your local machine as well. Does that make sense? So I'm going to go ahead and open up Visual Studio to give you an idea, for instance, of what I'm trying to do. So I created a, a folder on my eDrive called Python Introduction, for instance, and I can create files, I can create folders in Visual Studio Code. So if I click in here and I'll uh, give it a name, we'll call it main. And you have to call it PY so that the system knows what we're talking about. So PY for Python. I notice the logo changes to Python. And it's going to actually, okay, well, Visual Studio wants to do uh, machine learning, but that's not what I want to do right now. And then you can actually start using the language inside of here right away. Notice at the bottom is going to tell you select an interpreter. Just because I have multiple Python interpreters because I use them for data mining and also um, for machine learning and AI. So I get to choose which one. Do I want to use the latest one on my machine 3.10.7 64-bit or the 3.95 64-bit? Or if I go right now and install the brand new one, which is 3.12 that just came out, I can install it. Now I'll have three different interpreters. So I'm going to use the latest currently on my machine, the 3.10.7. Okay. So now we'll notice at the bottom in Visual Studio Code that Python is running 3.10.7, the 64-bit version. So now I can come in here, for instance, and I would like to do something. Can I do something like um, one plus one, for instance, like that? Well, 
you if if this is what you want to do probably having a python file might not be your your best friend i'll show you how to to uh, to be even faster than um, running something with an interpreter so for right now to be able to do something like this we'll use a function in python called print and the print i can say one plus one for instance something like this okay and i'm going to say Control s to save it and now i can go ahead and open up the terminal we'll say terminal new terminal so it's almost like the command line with a cls to clear it up and i would like to go ahead and use python we'll say python space uh, remember i'm in the directory where the main.pi is you have to be in that directory we'll say python and we'll say main.py okay that means i would like to compile this file and see what the outcome from print one plus one so if i run this notice two is the answer does that make sense all right if you do not want to actually keep saying print and you would like to actually see everything in front of you there is even a better way to learn python really quickly as well and that's in uh, in visual studio code on the side there will be an extensions button here if you click on it there are thousands of different add-ons and plugins that you can actually bring into Visual Studio Code. The one I usually use is called Jupyter. Jupyter. Jupyter, right there. I have it installed already. And that's what we call a notebook. All right, a notebook, that means you'll have cells in the same window to be able to, to run a Jupyter notebook. Okay, so let me go back to files. Let's create another file in here in the same folder. But this one, we'll call it, for instance, main. The, and the extension for a Jupyter is uh, IPYNB, okay? So I'm going to say enter that. Notice the, 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 uh, the logo changes to a Jupyter notebook. And you see what happened in here? That becomes now cells, okay? And it's using the, uh, the, the Python. I can tell it which kernel I would like to use, all right? So I'm going to say Python environment. I want to use the 3107. So we'll use the same thing like the other one as well. So it's up to you whether you want to use Python with an interpreter using from the terminal or for speed, you might want to actually bring up a notebook uh, and do all your coding inside of here. So right now I don't have to say uh, print. I can just say one plus one. OK, and to run this cell, you push the shift key and the enter key. Or if you want to do it with the mouse, there is buttons in here to say execute above cell, execute below cell, or the one that you will probably always use is the first one. That means execute this cell in here. You can also push F10 that will run it. Usually people that uh, write a lot of code, they like to use the keyboard for these things. So I can come in here with a shift enter and that will run it. Notice the interpreter automatically give us the answer too. Okay. What happens if I say, for instance, uh, would we'll say hello space and then i'm going to say plus uh, and would we'll say world okay um, what happens if i run this shift enter notice it will print out hello world it will be able to concatenate two uh, strings together okay what happens if i come in here for instance i would like to have a one um, uh, dot two plus uh, 2.3 um, these are not integers anymore these are floats so notice the answer will be 3.5 as a matter of fact, you don't have to put something after the dot. I can come in here and say point dot plus, and I can say two. All right, just because I have a dot after the one, I'm telling the system when you do the addition, don't take one and two as integers. I want you to make it as a float anyway, even if the answer is three. Um, in here, let's do a shift enter. Notice it will say 3.0 just because it saw a dot. So these things might be important for you as well. If I would like to find out what the type is, so maybe I can create a variable, but for right now, I'm going to say type. That's a keyword in the Python and we'll say one plus one. That means I'm not looking for the two. I'm looking for what type this is. So if I say shift enter, for instance, it will tell me this is an integer. But if I do the same thing, we'll say type and I'll say one dot plus two. I'm not interested in the three. I want to find out what type that is. Shift and that would be a float. You see the difference between the two? You might not really uh, care much, but again, this could be very important uh, when you're running this type of code inside of Test Complete later on as well. So put that in mind. I can make this fail, for instance, if I say, uh, let's change this and make it, for instance, hello, like we do the hello world. Oops, <laughs> hello, there you go. And um, we'll put a space in here, we'll say plus one, two, three. What do you think will happen if I'm trying to add a string with an integer? So let's say shift enter and we'll have a type error in here in Python. The Python interpreter from 3.10.7, the version number I'm using, it will tell me you cannot add a string with um, 
an integer that's not going to happen of course i can put the one two three in here in double quotes and then well, i can do a shift enter and that will work some people ask when should i use double quotes and when should i use single quotes so what happens if i change this to a single quote for instance like this instead of double quotes like that we'll say shift enter would it make any difference sorry <laughs> And notice it works right away. Hello, one, two, three. As a matter of fact, what they say is if you're going to use double quotes, use it everywhere on that line. If you're going to use single quotes, use it everywhere. And sometimes you want to have a string inside of a string. Maybe on the outside you have double quotes, on single quotes on the inside of the string itself. That's fine. But just don't keep going back and forth um, on the same line for, uh, for uh, single quotes or double quotes. Okay? Uh, also, notice I can actually uh, try to find out, for instance, if it's something that is true or false. So if I say if 1 is equal to 2, that requires 2 equals. I'm not assigning, I'm just saying is 1 is equal to 2? You're asking a question. So if I say shift enter, that will evaluate to false because that's not correct. All right, you see, if I say 1 is equals to 1 and I run this, that is true. So you will notice, for instance, that I can do this. I can say uh, true. Notice the word true in Python has no meaning because it has to be a capital T. Remember that in test complete as well. You have to put a capital T for the system to understand what you mean. So true here with a capital. And I can say or um, false. And it has to be a capital F if you want Python to understand what you're trying to do. So if I say true or false, uh, what do you think this will re return? It will have to return something that is a boolean. So will it return true or false? Because we said true or false, this will come back true. Because true is one of the options. If I change this and make it true and false, that will come in false because it's not correct, right? So hopefully you've done some coding in other languages before. If you're brand new, again, hopefully you understand that uh, the definition of the first one is true. And you're saying and the second one is false. Both together will end up being false. But if you do an or, at least one of them needs to be true for it, the whole thing to be true. I can also come in here with say not false. And if I run this not false, that is also true. <laughs> right? So let me do this. Not false is equal to true. And not true is equal to false. Hopefully I'm not confusing you. But these small things on the first video are important to understand how to deal with uh, integers, floats, strings, um, booleans, and assignments, and an or. Simple enough, hopefully, that makes sense for us in here. All right, so let's do the same thing that we've done here in the main pie and also in the in the notebook itself. Let's go ahead and do it in Visual Studio. Oh, I'm sorry, in Test Complete, so you can actually see what I mean. I'm going to go ahead and create another script file by clicking on the plus sign right next to the word script. Let's click on that. And then we will create, let's give it a good name, for instance. We'll call it, for instance, uh, something like uh, uh, Pi Intro, okay? That, so we can remember that this is for the Python intro uh, for the language itself. Okay, let's go ahead and create this guy. And you'll notice Pi Intro will be created right here under scripts. And now I can write some code. Unfortunately, in test complete, I cannot come and say one plus one and then try to run this. It will not understand what you're trying to do. I cannot also say print like I did before one plus one um, in here. You can't do that. Everything in test complete will require a function to do the job. So we'll have to create a function by saying dev space and we'll give it a name. We'll call it calc, for instance. You can call it anything you want. Open and close parentheses. And then you have to put a colon. And then you push enter and you have to put four spaces or a tab. So once you're tabbing in, now I can actually say print uh, one by one. You will never see this in test complete, even though it will be totally legal in Python. But in reality, I would like the test result to show me uh, the one plus one. So instead of saying print that we are used to in a in a, a Jupyter notebook or a Python Pi file in Visual Studio, now we'll have to use something called the log. We'll say log, which is an object in test complete itself and log dot and then you'd have a lot of properties and functions and events available on the log one of them would call message right there and it, it takes actually uh, the text that you'd like to pass in my case i'm going to say log one plus one okay like we have done before uh, now i have a function called calc okay and if i run it it will log in the uh, in the uh, 
in the suite logs in here under the TC course logs, it will actually put in the value of two. I'm expecting that to happen. So let's go ahead and right click on this and we'll say run this routine. Notice the indicator shows up and it will be very fast and hopefully we will get something in the green as well, no errors. And it will be able to show me that the value will be two. There it is. It is uh, successful. And the message that would be written out at this point will be two. So it did the one plus one and the interpreter of Python inside of test complete worked just fine. Does that make sense, folks? So again, it will not be possible to do a print because print will still work, but it will not be available in the logs. That's why I started showing you things in the uh, in the in the Python notebook using Jupyter and also in the dot the main.py file because I just wanted to show you how this will work inside of test complete and we will get back to it but I really want to finish the introduction of the language itself in Visual Studio or in uh, in a notebook so we don't have to always create a function and do a log dot message uh, we want to do it the easy way but once we're done with introducing all the features of the language I'll come back in here in test complete uh, to be able to create functions and use the Python language as well make sense all right let's talk about variables so variables like any other language are uh, essential very important for any language for instance and python is no different but python is a weak type language okay so you don't have to actually specify that the variable that you're creating is an integer or a float or a string it's not like in java in c sharp and so on which is a very strong uh, type languages so python is a scripting language so it makes it easy for people to use as well but there is a weakness in there regarding the type so i can come in here we'll say for instance um, a b and c will say a is equal to hello for instance like that and then i will say b is equals to good morning all righty uh, and c is equal to 100 okay so if i have these th three variables a b and c each one is is, uh, is equal to something i can come back right after that and i can say print uh, and I can pass A, for instance, in here. And I can do the same thing. We'll say print B. And finally, I can say print C. In, in test complete, that will be a logged up message for each and every single one of these variables. So if I want to run this entire cell, again, shift, enter, will run it for me. And you'll notice that hello, good morning, and 100 has been printed out. My question to you is if after I do this, for instance, what happens if I go at the end and this A now that has the word hello in it, what if I say A equals to 200? What happens in my uh, print? Uh, this is something that you will not be able to do in other languages like C Sharp or, uh, or uh, Java and stuff like that because A, as soon as you do an A equals hello, that means A will end up being a string and then you come back and give me an integer in A and that will be a type mismatch. It will not work. But as a matter of fact, it will not complain at all in Python because it's a brand new assignment. And now when I say print A, it sh should say 200, then good morning, then 100. Let's go ahead and see if that's the case. If I run this, it's no problem whatsoever. So be careful, <laughs> all right, because now hello is gone forever and A is only pointing to the value of 200 in the memory uh, and that's the way it's going to work. So you can go back and forth. Some people like that, the flexibility, and some people think this is horrible because I want to count on A always being a string and I don't want somebody pulling the rug from underneath me. That's why people choose languages like C Sharp and uh, um, and Java and so on because they are strongly typed. Once you say that A is a string, it's going to be a string. You can you cannot assign something and change its type behind my back kind of thing. Make sense? <laughs> also, remember, I can go to a new cell and I can actually add A and C together. We'll say print, uh, we'll say A plus C. So that should give us 300, right? We'll say shift enter and 300. It was able to figure it out. Can you imagine what will happen if I say a plus b uh, anybody could guess try it out and see what happens you're going to get an error you cannot add a string uh, and an integer the same thing happened before so the variable is just a continuation of what you've already learned about how to do arithmetic inside of um, of python make sense all right well this is what i want to talk to you about variables and one thing i wanted to tell you professionally about variables as well especially in test complete but in python in general um, there is a naming convention that everybody likes in Python. So you do not want to create a variable called, for instance, uh, first uh, name like this, for instance. Oops, <laughs> I'm typing somewhere else. We'll say first 
uh, name variable equals to Lino for instance okay even though this will work with no problem that is not something uh, that is liked in the industry for variable in Python so try to actually match it no uppercase letters in the naming actually what they like in Python is a snake uh, case snake case means that the first here would be always a lower case and then bet between the two words I'm going to put an underscore and we'll say name so this is a legal snake case for instance for creating a variable always put a an underscore uh, you cannot use a number in the beginning you cannot come in here and create a variable called the uh, nine that will not work all right it has to start with a letter you can have numbers but you cannot have special characters like a dollar sign or a percent sign or whatever underscores are okay so try to always when you create a variable in test complete in python to always use lowercase um, in, the, in the snake case in here and the underscore between the different words to make it more readable of course if you create it like this it will be fine but sometimes uh, the variable needs to indicate the separation between the what you're trying to do uh, try also not to have your your name too long okay you don't want to say my uh, uh, first name is going to be <laughs> that's that's not a good variable name you want to make it as short as possible not too short but something meaningful as well for other people to use okay all right let's go ahead and talk about um, let's create another cell in here let's talk about the control flow which is pretty much the if statements inside of python we have to learn that if you're new to python again again and if you know python just you can skip the entire chapter and go back to test complete and from the next chapter as well but this is just to make sure everybody's on the same page uh, for python we will start with an if statement like this and we'll say for instance if uh, let's see how big is a right now a is 200 okay we'll say if a uh, is um, um, larger than 200 and then we'll put a colon in here all right colon that means we're going to go back and we'll put a, a tab right after the if statement and I would like to go ahead and say print and we'll say uh, for instance uh, a is um, bigger than 200 okay and that would be my string what if it's not and in our case it will not be so I'm going to come in here but you cannot do it right under the print you'll have to go back all the way to the beginning and say else all right and uh, in the else in here we'll go ahead and uh, push a tab oops uh, you have to remember also to put a colon right next to it and then in the tab we'll say print oops print like that and we'll say a is um, less than or equal equal to um, oops it has to be a string of course <laughs> we'll go ahead and do that and we'll say a is less than or equal to 200 and then we'll close it down all right so uh, what i want you to remember is that an if we'll have a colon at the end of the uh, of the evaluation of the condition this has to come back as a true or false so if condition has to be true or false and then if it's true it will run this line only okay if a larger than 200 is false then else will kick in in here and we'll print this one but one of them will run not both of them okay uh, just remember that as well if I run this and we know that a is 200 so it is not larger than 200 otherwise I would have said um, larger than or equal to that would have made it true but right now it was not true so the else will kick in and then print will uh, will say a is less than or equal to 200 let's go ahead and do a shift enter there and we'll say a is less than or equal to 200 just to be able to put an equal sign in there and run it again that time it will be correct a is bigger than 200 all right which is not not really true it's equal to 200 but you understand the point uh, which one is going to run based on the statement also remember please that anything you put indented like this if I come in here we'll say print again and we'll say hello for instance um, we'll say hello you can probably ask yourself what do you think is going to happen especially if it's indented in here under the if statement uh, if a is equal then or larger than 200 uh, do you expect both of these lines to be executed and the answer would be yes if I run this notice that a is bigger than 200 and hello both of them as long as this is indented as well you do not want to come in here and put print like that that will not make sense it will have to be part of the true if statements to be able to, to run same thing with the else if you put it indented at the same level as the first print everything that is in the else when it's false it will run automatically 
Another way of using if statements is something called the else if statement. So let me go back in here and we'll do the same thing. We'll say if a is less than 100, for instance. Uh, let me write it nicely so you can see it better. And we'll put the colon in there. And then if it's less than 100, we'll say print and we'll say something like a, a is less than 100. All right. But instead of saying an else right now, I can actually check more things. So I will go straight under the if, no tabbing, and it will say else if, E L I F. All righty. Oops. <laughs> Not in capital. I pushed the capital key. Sorry. So E L F like that. And then if E else, else F will say A is uh, less than 200. All righty. Um, I can do it this way as well. And then I can actually put something that will be true if it's only. Uh, less than 200 but it's uh, larger than 100 so if you take a look at my code in here if if the number let's say for instance was 150 okay uh, the first one will not hit it will go to the else f is it less than 200 yes it means 150 if a is equals to 150 this one will uh, will run will say print and we'll say a is less than um, less than 200 but larger then 100 for instance something like that so let's go ahead and put it in a string as well <laughs> alrighty and um, and now if I run this knowing that the a is equal to 150 for instance so we'll say a is equals to 150 right before it let's go ahead and run this and see if the else f the else f will work we'll say shift enter and then a is less than 200 but larger than uh, 100 does that make sense so I can go back in here and do another else f we'll say e l I F again and I can say A is um, uh, larger than 200 and then I will uh, do something like this I will say print and we'll say A is larger than 200 okay uh, what happens if everything fails this if is false the first else if is false and the final one you can actually come back all the way at the end and we can say an else in here and we'll say uh, print um, all is wrong <laughs> all right let's go ahead and put a string in here we'll say all is wrong <laughs> all righty so let's go ahead and uh, and run this knowing that the uh, the a is equal to 500 that means this one will run just remember that the first one will not run the third and fourth one will not run only this one will run okay uh, so it will go in the order as well okay so from the first else if, if if it ever becomes true then nothing else will run if it's false then it will keep going down the list uh, until it does not find anything that matches true as, at all then else will be run at the end does that make sense that is very important uh, to understand that as well so if I come back in here we'll say this is uh, 300 for instance then the the, the third else if will run in here and that is a larger than 200 this is the one that ran as well make sure uh, you understand how uh, if else work and also if else if else if and else if and then finally else because there are some times that you you're going to need to use this um, and there is something else for switch it's called a switch where you can do something similar as well if you have a lot of different uh, if else as well make sense Let's go on and talk about functions. Very important. We're going to use this a lot in Test Complete. So if I go in here, for instance, I want to define a function like we did before in Test Complete. We'll say define. We'll give it a name. We'll call it, for instance, my function. All righty. Open and close parentheses, and we'll put a colon. And then from uh, once you push enter, it will tab it in once for you. And then you can actually do whatever you want. We'll say, for instance, uh, um, we'll say uh, a plus uh, c okay which are uh, 100 plus 200 pretty much and then i would like to run this um, and i'd like to maybe put it in a print we'll say print in here and we'll say a plus c so that is my function i can run this and nothing will happen because this is just a definition of a function so if i say shift enter in here notice it is successful now i know what this is now if i can actually come and say um, my function 
and open and close parentheses. Now I want to run the function, okay? So if I say shift enter right now, it would come back and say 400. Uh, I think it's 1 plus 300 or something like that, alrighty? Uh, but uh, it did that for us automatically. Alrighty, so what happens now if I actually say, um, instead of saying just run the function, I'm going to say, for instance, uh, uh, lino is equal to my function, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and run this. We'll say run that. It did run it, okay? And if I come back in here, we'll say print lino. What do you think is going to happen in here, folks, if I come and say print lino? Anybody? Think about it. Try to run it and see for yourself. If I say that, it will say none. That means there is a null value in here. And it's very important to understand that, especially for test complete as well. When I actually define a function, I did not return anything. So this function does not return anything. The only thing it does on the inside is print the value of A plus C together, which ended up being 400. If it's important for you to return a value, you cannot use something like print. This has to be something like return, like this, okay? And we don't need the parentheses at this point. I can just define my function and then we say return A plus C. So when I say Lino equals my function, Lino will be equals to whatever is returning from that, which will be the 400. So let's go ahead and run this uh, cell again, shift, enter. All right, it did it. And now when I say Lino my function, let's go ahead and run it again. Alrighty, and now notice it does not bring any value because it just assigned it. Now I can print the Lino, we'll say shift enter, and now 400 will be coming back. It will, be, it will not be none anymore in Python, which is a null value because we did not assign anything. Does that make sense, everybody? All right, let's go on and talk about parameters. Right now we're making it very specific to A and C. That's a very limiting. So maybe if I go back to the my function definition itself and I can say X comma Y, for instance, okay? So these are going to be two variables being passed to it for the function. And what I would like to do is to uh, add them together. We'll say X plus Y. All righty, let's go ahead and, and run this again. All right, so now we are going to be passing parameters and it will return the two parameters. So if I go, for instance, uh, Lino, my function will say 10 comma 20. That should be 30. So let's go ahead and run this guy. Oops, what did I do? <laughs> Did I just not run this? We have to remember, you can change the code, but unless you run the, the cell, it doesn't know anything that you have parameters now. So we'll say shift enter on this guy. Yeah, now it's running. Let's go ahead and run this one more time. All right, good. Now we can pass 10 and 20. So this print cleaner should be 30 at this point. So yeah, it's working just fine. All right, the last thing I wanted to show you is that what happens, for instance, if I only pass 10 in here, not 10 and 20. What happens if I do that and I run this cell again? It's not going to be happy. It's still uh, missing one required optional uh, positional uh, argument or parameter in here. So for you to be able to make my function 10 work, I'll have to go in here after the y and we'll say equals to 20. That means this is a default parameter. Now I can call it both ways. I can say my function 10 or I can say my function 10 comma 20 or 30 or 40 or whatever. But if you do not pass a second parameter, then it will take whatever the default is. So let's run this one more time. Okay. And now we'll go back to, uh, uh, to this guy and passing only one. It will not be a problem this time. And then when I run this, it will still be 30. It will be okay. The final part that I would like to do is that what happens if I want to call it by parameter, because sometimes you have a lot of parameters and some of them have uh, uh, default values and some do not. So I can come here before the 10 and I can say equals e uh, X equals to 10. And I can come back right after this one and I can say y is equal to 30. Alrighty. So if I do it this way and I run the cell, this will end up being equals to 40 in here. But I can switch it as well. I can say first y is equal to 30 and then comma x equals to 10. The system will understand it. The problem is that you do not want to actually pass the, the, the opposite, uh, y first and then x, without saying x equals and y equals. So um, something you're going to see, especially when you get into working with data, is that it's a good idea to always specify the parameter that you're trying to pass by saying e x equals and y equals, so that uh, there is no misunderstanding at all of what this parameter is supposed to be uh, or anything like that. Does that make sense? Let's also talk a little bit about scope, which is very, very important. For instance, I'm going to go back into test complete and here in my uh, PyIntro uh, function called calc. 
And notice, for instance, in here, I'm hard coding a lock message for hello, but let's go ahead and, for instance, and go, um, and I will add a new line. We'll create, for instance, first name as a variable. We'll say first name, and we'll say this is equals to Lino, okay? Uh, and instead of actually calling a hard-coded value, I'm going to be passing the first name. Hopefully, you can actually tell that this is not a big deal. This is... Um, is going to actually putting out the word first name is going to get it. And this is called a local variable to the function itself. So if I come in here, we'll say, go ahead and run this. Um, I'm expecting Lino to show up in the test result in, um, in test complete with no problem. So we'll give it another second in here to write the XML file out for the, uh, for the log. And Lino will show up here in a sec. There you go. All right. So now what happens, for instance, if I come in and I create another function, let's go ahead and create a, a definition for a function, we'll call it test, for instance. And in this one, I'm going to say log.message, and I'm going to also try to use first name. Oops, first key name. <laughs> there you go. What happens if I try to run this function now? You would, if you are not familiar with programming, you might think because of the scope, I should be able to see Lino as well, even in the definition for function. But uh, the function test has no clue what first name is because it's outside of the scope of the function calc. So it's important to understand once it's local like this, only this function calc can use the first name. So sometimes we will need to do this as a global variable, for instance, so that both of them can use it. So instead of making it on the inside of the calc, I can actually cut it out of there. And I will go, for instance, way above, and I will put it all the way at the top. We'll say that this is a global variable to the unit. That means anything in unit called pi intro will have access to that global um, uh, global variable. And actually, as a matter of fact, I don't really like global variables like this in Python or any other language. Um, it's just too much out of scope in the file, but again, it will work. Now I can actually go to calc or test and both of them should work. So if I run this routine now, it will find out that we have a global first name variable and it should actually be able to put the word Lino out as well. Um, let me wait for it for a second in here to, uh, to write the XML file out to the drive. And there is Lino. Both of them now will end up working by having a global variable. The best way to do it, instead of doing it like this, I usually don't like that. <laughs> already. Um, so I can actually put it at the project level. So if I put it at the project level, now everything, not only the unit one, but everything inside of my entire project will have access to that first name. How do you declare a project-based uh, variable? You see what it says, 01TC course right there? Double click on that. And that will open up the execution plan. And we have... Um, uh, properties for the entire project for instance in there you can see I can get to all the project properties we will deal with that later but for the variable themselves in here folks I can create temporary variables will be available only during the run of the test or I can say persistent variables and the difference between these two is that if you change the value of the persistent variable even after you shut down and come back that value have changed forever when you change it during the run of the test with a temporary variable if x is equal to three and then during the test x is equals to five and then you shut down it goes automatically back to what it was before which is three but if it's a persistent variable x is equal to three during the run x is equals to five when you shut down x will stay five forever until somebody else changes it does that make sense so if I come in here, for instance, I would like to say I'd like to add a variable on the project level. Instead of var1, we'll give it first underscore name like this. And we'll make it a string. I have a lot of different options. I can make it a string, an integer, a double, a boolean, a table, a password, whatever you want. And then I can give it a default value if I want to. We can actually come in here. We say Lino is the default value. And I can give it a description. Maybe I want to document this for the rest of the team to know why I have a first name. So it's a good idea to give it a description as well. And then I'm going to save all that. And let's go back to my uh, Pi intro unit. So instead of uh, actually just saying first name, it will not find it this way because it will look for a local. And if it doesn't find it, it will go for a global inside of the same file. So it will not find either one of them. So how should I actually write first name inside of my log message for any of the functions to be able to get it from the project level? So there is a keyword in the test complete language called projects. So we'll say project with a capital P dot. 
And if you say control space on the keyboard, you will notice all the things that you can have access to on the project. One of them is variables. Let's double click on that. And then in the variables, I will say dot. And hopefully if I say control space, I will see first name right there. So if I double click on it, all right, I have it twice now. So I just need it once and will say project.variables first name. So if I run this, it will still log the word Lino in the system, but it will be getting that from the project uh, uh, variable, not locally or globally to the unit itself. But every unit, unit one and pi intro, all of them will have access to that variable I created on the project level, including the keyword test as well, if you ever need to use that as well. And there is Lino has been written out. Does that make sense? All right, let's go ahead and talk about collections or uh, to start with lists, for instance. So lists are very, very good in Python, actually. So if I go back um, right before this log in my, the, uh, my function calc, for instance, and I'll say uh, product, uh, product <laughs> underscore lists, for instance, in here, I can say it's equal to open uh, a brackets, and that means that we're going to be passing a list in here. And the first one will say test complete, for instance. All right. And then I'll put a comma. And the second item in my list will be, let's say, ready API. Uh, that's another product from Smart Bear. And then we'll put a comma. And the last one I'll put in here will probably be, let's say, Swagger, which is another product from the company as well. So now I just created a list that contains three elements inside of it. So if I would like, for instance, to uh, log a message of the first element, and in Python, like a lot of other languages, the first element is of sub zero. That means this is the zero element. Ready API will be the one element and Swagger will be the second element. So uh, don't think because it's one, two, three, that means each one of them will be a product list. Uh, one will get your test complete. That's not correct. Uh, product list zero will give you test complete. One will give you Ready API. Swagger will be two. So instead of hard coding this message, and I would like to get, let's say, to test complete, I will say print me the uh, the product list like this, and I will say sub zero, and that will be the first element in the list. If I run this right now, it should actually print out the word uh, test complete inside of my test result um, in the log itself of test complete. Let's give it a second here to finish up the XML, and it should be uh, right there. There we go, it says test complete and we are in good shape. Excellent. Now let's go ahead, for instance, after this line and maybe I would like to log, we'll say log uh, dot message and I would like to actually log the length of the list itself. So I don't know how many elements do I have in there. So there is uh, a variable um, or a method actually of the class for the string itself is called length for length. Okay, I can say length and we'll say product uh, underscore list. So this one will actually end up returning how big the list is. So if I run this right now, the first element should say test complete and the second line of the log message should say three. So let's give it a shot in here. Okay, it didn't like me. What did I do? Lens product list. Are we good? Oh, look at that. Message in English is only two S's, folks. <laughs> All right, it sounds good. Let me go ahead and, uh, and fix my typo. Uh, wait for it to load. All right, we'll, we'll uh, remove the, uh, the third S from here. Any of them will do. All right, and let's go ahead and run it one more time. Or say run this routine. I should be able to get test complete on the first line and the second line will say three. Excellent, that works fine. Test complete and three, it did the job. All right, before I keep going, I just want to talk to you about something. The difference between the, the word function and the word method. A lot of people actually think they are both the same and they are very close. So you will always uh, maybe hear people say this calculation, uh, this calc function, they can call it maybe the calc method or for instance, the len here could be a function len or a, or a method len. But in reality, it's not true. Uh, there is a very distinctive difference between what a function is and what a method is. For instance, this calc in here is a function. Okay, it is not a method. Method means there is an object, like for instance, there is an object called log in here that contains a lot of properties, a lot of functionality, a lot of events. This object in here has a method called message. Also, the strings, uh, string, uh, like an integer or a string or a float, these are all things inside of the Python language that are implemented as objects. So the string itself have a method called len. So I can actually find out, for instance, what the... Uh, 
what the number of elements inside of a list and so on. So um, you can also do a len on a string to find out how many characters in a specific string. So that's the main difference between what a function is and what a method is. Method always runs uh, on an object that it is associated with. So len and message, these are both uh, methods. Calc here is not associated with, a with an object. So calc is a function, is not a method. Hopefully that makes sense. In here what I'm saying so anyway uh, but don't worry about it too much a lot of people will uh, will look at function uh, on message and say this is a function and that's not wrong it will be okay but um, this is being finicky and trying to be able to be very precise what a function is and what a method is all right so now that I have created this product list are there functionality that can work on a list itself can I say for instance product underscore list and I would like to add a fourth element to it how do I do that well in Python, you will say append for the list, for instance, and then I can actually add another product with, say, uh, Cucumber, for instance, so, which is another product by Smart Bear as well. So what happens if I run this code right now? Well, uh, let me steal this line in here. And the first time it will put out a three based on line number four. But after adding cucumber, if I run the lens one more time, that should be four. So if I run this code right now, it should say test complete three and then it will say four make sense and then uh, at the end maybe i will go ahead and log a message and here we'll say log message and i'd like to show you the second element um uh, zero one two will be swagger that means the third element will be cucumber does that make sense so let's go ahead and run it i'm expecting test complete three four and then the word cucumber show up based on the product list now that i appended this to it make sense let's go ahead and give it a shot and voila see that's complete three and then we added cucumber it became four and then the third uh, index which is the fourth element but the third index it is cucumber and it's working just fine does that make sense so you can imagine actually you're writing a code and it keeps adding more and more elements so you end up from three to four to ten to fifteen to twenty and in the code itself you do not know how many elements and you don't want to write too much code to find out how many elements. So if you have 10 elements, then uh, product list 9 will be the last one. So there is a very, very nice feature in, uh, in Python, which is if you want the, the, the end of the list, the last one, which would be Cucumber, instead of having to count how many elements you have in the index, you can come in here and say minus 1. Minus one, that means we're going to start the count from the right to the left instead of left to the right. So minus one will still be identical to product list three in our case. So minus one and three will, will both return cucumber. This could be very, very handy sometimes when you keep adding data and you would like to make a loop through a data and you want to start from the final record. For instance, minus one will start from the end instead of from the beginning. So minus one could be very useful. Let's go ahead and run it one more time and let's see if minus one will give us exactly the same answer. Answer. and yes minus one still give us cucumber which is the last element starting from the right to the left to to understand that hopefully that makes sense and that's very useful for us the next one i wanted to show you instead of using a list like this which is very very popular in python sometimes you would like to have a, a key value pair and that is called a dictionary so let's go ahead and create another function in here so I can uh, leave the code in here for you to, to go back and forth. We'll say definite, uh, define, and we will say my uh, dictionary, for instance, in here, and we'll say open, close. And inside of there, instead of saying a product list, we'll say product underscore dictionary, okay? And instead of using brackets like an array, uh, as you can see here, I'm going to actually use the brackets like this. So inside of this bracket, uh, inside of there, I will be able to actually create a key value pair with commas in between. What does that mean? That means if I come in here, we'll say the first one is test complete, um, and I will close this, and then I put a colon next to it, and then I'll put a price, let's say, for instance, uh, $5,000, all right? And then I'll put a comma. Uh, that means the first element is a dictionary that has a key value pair. The key is test complete, and the value is 5000 Does that make sense? And then the second element will do the same thing. We'll say uh, ready API, for instance, in here, and we'll put a colon. That will separate the key from the value. And in here, we'll say, let's say 4,000. All right, and the last element in here, will say, for instance, uh, swagger. And we'll close, oops, I had too many double quotes. <laughs> um, 
swagger. All right. And then uh, after that, we put a uh, colon and we'll say, let's say this is a 2000. Okay. Um, and then we will stop there. So now my dictionary has three elements in it and each element has a key and a value. And that can actually be very useful. So you probably can see the difference between why would I ever want to create a list and why would I ever want to create a dictionary that contains key values for every single element inside of there. And there are really multiple ways in, uh, in Python to get the value of each and every single one of them. So I can actually go do like we did before. We'll say log.message uh, in here. And if I would like to get to the product dictionary for the first element for test complete, I, will, I can actually come and say uh, product underscore um, dictionary. And instead of saying uh, sub, I can say dot get. And inside of the dot get, I can say, um, get me the one for test complete. So I'm going to be passing this as a string. We'll say test complete. And there we go. So take a look at this code. We'll say product dictionary. We'll look at the whole thing and get me the one that has a key called test complete. If I run this right now, the answer, whatever is going to be logged into the message will be 5,000. Let's give it a shot. We'll say run this routine. And there we go, 5,000 will be written out in the log.message. But in reality, you don't see a lot of people do this .get. Actually, the way people usually like to, to, uh, to write this code is by coming here, removing this .get. And what they end up doing is actually they create uh, an index and pass the key right inside of the index itself. So I will come in here, we'll do this. Close this, and then we'll close the, the message. Uh, method itself. So we can say log.message product dictionary and inside of the index of the dictionary you just pass the key that you are interested in. So in my case in here let's go ahead and do a ready, a ready API instead for instance. So when I log this it should have the, the number 4000 inside of there. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. And there you go 4000 for the ready API is being logged out to our message. Make sense? So the million dollar question at this point is that what happens if I go back and I try to actually uh, just come in here right after this and we'll say uh, product underscore dictionary uh, and I actually end up adding a key that does not belong there. It's not there. <laughs> is that possible? Is it going to be very upset? Let's say, for instance, we'll say BitBar, which is another product actually from SmartBear. If I come in here, we'll say BitBar is equal to, let's say, uh, 3000. Okay. Um, if I run this right now, what do you expect to happen? Will this be an error? Well, the way dictionary works, if you're going to assign something that does not exist to the current dictionary, it will add it. So by doing this, this will add BitBar as the fourth element in our product dictionary right away. So now I can actually come back and say log message um, and I will do a product dictionary for BitBar and the value will be 3000. So let me take this line in here, control C. And this is a Python feature as, as well, not a test complete feature. Okay. So you come in here, we'll say uh, bit bar, for instance, and we'll say save. And let's go ahead and run it and see if it will be able to find that as the element inside of the, uh, of the product dictionary. And yes, it did. That is the first log message for Ready API. And that is the 3000 for the value of the key for bit bar. All worked well. And finally, I just want to let you know that there is a very nice feature. It's called the in operator uh, inside of lists and also in the dictionaries as well that you can actually ask to return a Boolean if a specific key is available in the dictionary or in the list. So the in operator can be very useful. I can say if, for instance, uh, in here, and I'll say if uh, um, uh, product, product underscore dictionary, um, and before you get to it, you can say if, and let's say, for instance, we pick up one of the products we haven't used so far, we call it a load ninja. We'll say load ninja, um, which is another product by smart bear as well. We'll say load ninja, and then I can use the in operator and in a product dictionary, just like that. So I'm actually checking right now if load ninja is one of the keys. We're asking for the keys, not the values inside of there. So if I do this, I can go in in the inside of the if statement and we'll say uh, log uh, dot message, and we will say uh, yes, uh, load ninja is part of is part of 
the dictionary. All right, and of course, if it's a if it's a no, I can actually come and say else, and we will do in here. We'll say log dot message, and we will say uh, let's say no go. <laughs> All right, that's no go. All right, does that make sense? You can use this actually in the in operator, whether it's a list or a dictionary, just to find out if there is an element with that name. For a dictionary, it's only looking for the for the key, not for the value inside of there. All right. So I don't have actually a load ninja inside of my dictionary, so it should say no go at the end. So let's go ahead and give it a run. Let's we'll say run this routine and we'll see hopefully no go being locked. And there you go. It says no go because it could not find load ninja inside of there. Make sense? All right, let's start talking about loops inside of Python, like for loops, for instance, which are very, very heavily used, of course, in any language and especially in Python. So let's go to our function called calc that we created earlier. Notice I created a list here, the product list that contains test complete, ready API and swagger as three elements of that list. Let me go ahead and remove all that code from here. All right, and instead of logging a specific element, I would like to create a loop that will go through every single element in the entire list without really knowing how many elements are in the list. I just wanna go through every single element and being able to, uh, to log a message with the name of the product inside of it. So the syntax in, uh, uh, in Python is to start with the word for, and then we can invent a variable name. You can call it whatever you want. In my case, I'm gonna call it product, for instance. That doesn't exist yet, all right? And in products, we'll use the in um, keyword in here. So we'll say for product in, and then I'll pass the name of the list that I would like to look into uh, like that, all righty? Then we'll put the colon like everything else in Python. And then I'm gonna go ahead and indent my log.message. And instead of saying product list with a specific um, sub value for the index, I can just use product like that, all righty? So take a look at what we've, we've done here. We say for product in product list, which of course it will find out we have three elements. That means this for loop will run three times. So the log.message will actually fire up three times. And if I end up adding more, let's say I have 10 different elements, nothing needs to change in the for loop. This will run 10 times and every time it will get sub zero, sub one, sub two, all the way till the end of the product list itself. Let's give it a shot. I'm gonna right click, we'll say run this routine and let's see it will, it will log three different messages Let's say test complete and then another one called ready API and then we'll say swagger and voila the test uh, finished and now we have test complete ready API and swagger all of them are correctly reported. I also want to talk to you about something that gets used heavily heavily inside of Python which is the range function. So let's leave, leave this for loop alone and we'll come in here I would like to create another loop for instance we'll say for and we'll say my number, you can create whatever you want, we'll say in, and then I'm gonna use a range, which is a function actually inside of Python itself. And in the range, uh, it takes two numbers. The first number is the starting point, so we'll say zero for instance, and then the second number after the comma will be how many times you want it to actually um, go through the range. So if I say zero to 10, that means it will be all the way from the number zero, all the way, till the 10th element of the array. That means 10 is not in inclusive, it's exclusive. That means it will go from zero to nine, as a matter of fact. So let me go ahead here and log it. We'll say log.message in test complete. And what I'd like to do now is just to go ahead and um, let's say for instance, my number, all righty. So what do you think will happen if I run this? Oh, I forgot the colon at the end of there, there you go. All right, so what do you think will happen? How many lines will be printed out and what do, will they say? Will it start with zero and will it end with 10 or what's gonna happen with something like this? Let's go ahead and give it a shot. Uh, I'm gonna actually, uh, let me go ahead and comment out these lines so we don't have to run all that stuff. So the way the comment, like I said before, you put the hashtag in here. So I'm gonna run the uh, function calc and let's see, it should say zero all the way down to nine, zero, one, two, three, but nine. 10 will not be included, okay? So let me go ahead and run this and I'll show you when it finishes. And there we go. It started from zero, like I told it to. It went all the way to nine. So actually we do actually have 10 numbers logged, but 10, the index then was not one of them because it's, it's exclusive, not inclusive. So what if I tell you, for instance, and I'm really interested in printing out from the number one and I want to see 10. What should you actually change in the range to actually start from one, not from zero, and see the number 10 as our last number? Well, that means that I have to change the range to start from one, 
and I'll have to add another one here to the range for 11 and that will start from 1 or go all the way to 10. Let's go ahead and run it again and voila that is my for loop it will start from 1 will go all the way to 10 and will exclude 11 out of the index itself. All right let's do something even uh, more powerful so uh, I would like to create my own list and he will say my number underscore list and I'd like to create a list based on numbers for instance we'll say for instance 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and 10 and there we go notice these are not strings these are an array or a list of numbers right after the each other here part of the my number list so instead of actually going through each and every single one of them, maybe I will come in here and say, let's do this based on my number underscore list. And I can actually print out the number that will do the same thing. It will actually end up writing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, say all the way till 10. All of them will be available in here. But what happens, for instance, if I want to write my for loop uh, in such a way that I would like to change the uh, the list itself. So in here, for instance, I will go to a new line and I'm going to say, for instance, uh, uh, modified list. OK. And in this modified list in here, we'll say, for instance, it's equal to an empty list. I'm going to start it off with a completely empty list to start with. And inside of this um, uh, for my number in my number list, instead of logging, what I would really like to do is to check if the number is bigger than five and if it's bigger than five i would like to append it to the modified list so let me just show you so you can actually be with me on 100 percent in here so i'm going to say modified um i'm sorry i'm going to put an if statement right we'll say if and we'll say if the my number underscore list uh let me, <laughs> there you go and uh, if my number underscore list is larger than five okay uh, what i would like to do is let me tab into the if statement what i'd like to do is i'd like to append that my number list to the modified list so i'm going to say uh, modified underscore list dot append like we did before remember this is how to add an element but the array is already empty there is nothing in that modified list so uh, as soon as we get into anything bigger than five all right so i'm going to miss up half i'm going to miss out on half of the array that i have all the way at the top there i'm going to say append and we're going to add the my number underscore list uh or, or actually my number itself that is being passed in and i think this is about it and if it's not so let's go ahead and do an else in here let's do uh at the same level as the if statement we'll say else and then I don't want to do anything. I'll just say pass. Okay, so let me go ahead and take this log out of here. It's not necessary anymore. But I want you to take a look at this code in here. I'm saying is that I'm going to have 10 different numbers, integers, inside of my list. And I'm going to create a completely separate list that is completely empty at this point. And then in my for loop, once I get into the for loop for each and every single one of the 10, that means this for loop is going to run 10 times. Okay, so we'll start with, it, for instance, for the first one. So I'm in. So I'm going to say if the number list is bigger than five, one is not bigger than five. So that means it will jump into the else. And pass, by the way, is a way in the if statement to say don't do anything. Just keep going to the next element in the for loop. So pass is just um, a keyword into the language to tell it don't do anything at all. Make sense? And then it will go to two and then three and then four and then five. All of them will end up pass because they are not bigger than five. Finally, when it gets to the six element, six will be larger than five. So that modified list will append my number. That means modified list now will have one element in it, which is six. And then we will go to the next one, seven, eight, nine and ten. Each and every single one of them are larger than five so that we will have a modified list that says six, seven, eight, nine and ten. Does that make sense? That means if I would like to see how it will look on the inside, I can create another for loop and say for uh, num in, and this time it's going to be the modified one, the modified underscore list, for instance, and we'll do it this way. And then I'm going to say log the message, and in here will be num. Okay, what do you expect to see in here, folks, if I run all that code, all the entire function called calc? I should be able to see something that says six, 
7, 8, 9, and 10. That's it. That's the only thing that would be available inside of this modified list. Let's give it a shot. I'm going to run this and we'll wait till it, uh, it finishes to show us 6 all the way till 10. Oops, did I make a boo-boo? Yes, I made a boo-boo. You're supposed to use the variable that you created, not the list. That's my bad. So I'm going to come back in here. We'll let it finish the XML reporting on the logs. And then when it comes back, I'm going to go back to my code. See, this guy is the, my number, not my numbered list. Sorry about that. All right, I'll even make it look nicer, if it do, even though it does not matter. But I'll say if my number during the iteration is bigger than 5, and then we will do that. Let's go ahead and give it another shot. We'll right click, we'll say run this routine. And voila, that's exactly what I was expecting. 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. That is our modified list. Everything looks very good in there as well. All right, so let's go back to the code and I would like to introduce you something new. This is something that happens all the time in Python, especially if you're using data analytics. And I'm sure also in Test Complete, you'll end up doing code like this, but it's too much code to do something that everybody uses all the time, <laughs> all righty? So there is a better way to do this, to be honest with you. So I'm actually going to uh, leave the for loop at the end. But in here for the modified list, let me take all the stuff out of here. See, there is uh, uh, almost uh, six different lines in here, but I can do the whole thing on one liner. And I'm going to do this because you're going to see a lot of code in Python written out there. And I don't want that syntax to be weird for you. But I'm going to write one, one line of code that will do exactly what you're seeing in here. Let me delete this guy from here. And I will create here a new list. We'll call it modified underscore list. And then this modified list in here, I will automatically give it what we call a list comprehension. List comprehension will start with the word, for instance, num. You can choose whatever you want. We'll say num. And we will say for num in. And then again, that will be in the list called my number underscore list. But right after it, I will actually put the condition. I will say if, um, uh, I will say if uh, num um, uh, is larger than uh, five. So we'll say if num is larger than five. See, that code right now is pretty much identical to what we had before. The only difference is I need to put all that expression, which is the list comprehension, num for num in my number list, if num is larger than five, in an array. So I can create a list out of it. So I will open it up with an open uh, bracket for the array and I will close it. So from that point on, when this runs, it will go through every single element in the number list, which there are 10 of them, and it will use the number in here to actually create that number. So for instance, one will not be there, two will not be there. Once we get to six, six is larger than five, that's the condition, it will add that to the array for the modified list. So this one liner will do exactly what the other six lines will do. I know it's a weird syntax, but you'll get used to it, uh, but it, it's very fast to be able to do it this way as well. And then I can say for num in modified list, and you can change that, it doesn't have to match this number, this could be number, for instance, like that, and then we'll say number, it's okay. All righty, you can say for number in modified list, and this will give us exactly the same thing like before, which is six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Let's give it a shot, we'll say run this routine. And voila, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. It all worked just fine. The part that a lot of people love so much is that you can run expressions on the num to start in here, for instance, which is really amazing. And that would have taken a lot more code later on because we have to create temporary variables and all that. But let's say, for instance, I want to double every element in this 10-digit uh, uh, array or list. I would like to double it. So you can come in here right before it and say 2 multiplied by the number. <laughs> so look at what this is doing now. So it will create a brand new list called the modified list and it will start from 6 to 10 but 6 the, the element will be 12 14 16 uh, 18 and 20. so you can actually run another function right before the num and can do whatever you want with this you can do it upper lower uh, split do so many functions you can multiply it do whatever you want on this guy in here but it's on a one-liner that it would end up uh, not only going through every single element based on a condition and then it will add it to the modified list but you can actually run your own arithmetic if you want on that number as well let's run it and let's see if it will do the job correctly 
and there we go it's awesome so you can see all from 6 to 10 all of them have been multiplied by 2 and these are the elements of the new array called modified list working perfectly for us all right let's go ahead and talk about a very very important subject and that is exceptions so let's go back to my uh, intro in here let's go ahead and create a new function so that we leave the other one so you can see them later on and in this one we'll say define we'll say kaboom <laughs> all right that is the kaboom function something is going to blow up <laughs> all righty and inside of there i would like to say for instance uh, log dot message and what i would like to do is let's say for instance one divided by zero <laughs> okay so this is will cause an exception in, uh, in like any other language for instance and it will not be able to to handle this so notice what happens for instance when i run something like this let's go into the kaboom we'll say run this routine uh, it will give it a second here but i'm expecting an exception to occur because it will not be able to um, do the one divided by zero that will not be something it can do and there you go there is an exception called zero division error the thing is that if I had other code underneath there, it will not have run because now it will exit the function called kaboom because this one caused an exception and we are in the bye-bye at this point. <laughs> Does that make sense? So how can I actually take care of something like this? I can actually come in here. Now let me go back to the my, my int, pi intro. There we go. And then I can actually use a block of code in Python and that's called the try except block. So I will go in here, we'll say try. And then we'll put the, the, the famous uh, column in here. And then I'm going to indent this, very important. And then in here at the same level as this try, I will say accept. All right. And we'll put the column and then we'll tab again. And then we will say, for instance, log.message. And we will say uh, can't divide by zero. All righty. So what do you think will happen if I run this code? It looks very similar to what we had before, except this time the interpreter is not going to actually really complain. What it finds out is that we did hit actually an exception. We are dividing by zero. So immediately it will jump into the accept block and then it will log out. Hey, you can't do that. You can't divide by zero. But the good news is if you have other code um, underneath this after the try except block it will continue to run nothing will cause kaboom to exit completely like it did before so this is a much cleaner way to handle errors and exceptions in your code uh, sometimes these have to do with dividing by zero sometimes you're using the wrong name uh, so it cannot find the name error for instance sometimes it's a database exception sometimes it's a memory exception it could be tons of stuff and of course you can go online and say show me all the exceptions that python can handle like every other language you will find the name of all of them but when i say except like this that means anything i don't care what kind of exception it could be divided by zero it could be name mapping it could be database whatever they will always come in here and say can divide by zero so it might not be really the best way to do it for everything under the sun but if i run this right now you will notice that it will work and it will not cause an interpreter message but the log message will say can divide by zero what if i'm trying to log a message one divided by one then the except will never hit this only gets executed this line number 25 it's only because we hit an exception if this is not causing exception except will never run let's give it a shot i'm going to right click we'll say run this routine and voila no interpreter problems from the compiler or the interpreter it's just the log message says can divide by zero and we are in pretty good shape and we'll go there make sense Let's go back now and say, what if I want to be very specific? I don't want everything under the sun to cause the can divide by zero. I want to only do an accept only on divide by zero errors. Is there a way to do something like that? And absolutely, right after the accept in here, I can be very specific. I can say zero uh, division error, division error like that okay that's the name of the exception again there is a whole list on the internet you can take a look at all the different python names of exceptions that you can handle yourself so if i do that and i have a different kind of error uh, or exception cause cause that means the can divide by zero will not happen and you will actually crash the interpreter you will get that red uh, text that says i cannot handle that but right now, if I run this, you will not see any difference. It will still say can divide by zero because one divided by zero is a zero division error. Let's give it another shot here really quickly. And as you can see, it did the job can divide by zero. So we are in a pretty good shape. What happens if I go right before the log in here? 
for instance, and I can say, for instance, log dot message in here, and I'll say, for instance, uh, I want to log a message that says my variable called uh, first name, <laughs> all right, first name, which I do not have, by the way. So what do you think will happen if I run these two lines? Uh, the second one is going to cause an exception, but the first one is going to cause an exception as well. So let's see if it will be handled with this. I'm going to right click in here, we'll say run this routine. We'll give it a few seconds to run, but we will see it will bring up something that will say, I have no clue what you're talking about. And that is the interpreter runtime error saying object has no attribute message. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's a log. It has to be a capital L. <laughs> you will get something very similar anyway, but that was my mistake. A log has to be a capital L. Otherwise, it will not know that this is the log message. So there is the log. Let's go ahead and run it again. We will still get an error. Uh, so let's give it a, a few seconds in here and then we will see it. All right, it's happening. There you go. That's what I'm expecting. The name of the exception itself in the Python runtime is called name error. Name first name is not defined. So I have no idea what you called about. But notice it did not jump into the except and says anything in it. So uh, in reality, if I want my log.message at the end in the except to work for both of them, what can I do? Can, I can remove the zero division error. I can just say accept colon and then leave a message in here. And it doesn't matter what kind of exception happened. I'm always going to jump into here to make it happen. But if I only want to support the name error and the zero division error, there is a way to do it as well. You can come in here in parentheses and you can say zero division error. Okay. And then you can put an, uh, a comma and we'll say name error. And if there is others, you can put another comma and you can keep going. You can have as many exceptions as you want. And then you close the parentheses and you say colon to end the except and then log message. And we'll say, for instance, something like uh, something bad happened. <laughs> All right. Um, and it could be the zero division error or it could be the name error. All right. So let me run this again and let's see if it will finish this time. We'll say log this routine. And notice we get a green check mark. Even though something really bad happened, I did not bail out on you. I did not cause an error. The accept ran and the entire test complete function is successful. It's in the green. Very important to understand that piece. And then something bad happened will be written out automatically because an exception occurred. Does that make sense, everybody? And now let's go ahead and talk about the big kahuna of every single language in the world. And that is creating classes. So let's go ahead and create another script. I want to start a brand new unit to make it clean. So we'll call it, for instance, spy classes. You can call it whatever you want, okay? And inside of the spy classes, I would like to show you the syntax of creating a class. And what is a class? It's an object. You're trying to actually create something that will end up being an object. There is a difference between the word class and the word object. A class is pretty much think of it as the blueprint of an object. That means that this object did not happen yet. It did not get created yet. But you have to have a blueprint. The system has to know what exactly your intention is for that object. That's what a class is. But once you instantiate the class and create an instance of it, now we got ourselves an object. So a lot of people go back and forth the word object and class. They feel like it's the same thing. And I understand why they feel that way. But there is really a very technical understanding that a class doesn't exist. It's the object that exists. All right. It's just that it's the blueprint of the object is called class. And the way to do this actually in, uh, in Python is very easy. You'll use the word class. Put a space in there and give it a name. We'll call it, for instance, like I remember every single uh, computer science class I've ever been to to learn a language. The instructor always started with the mammal class and the dog and the cat class and all the stuff. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to put a capital D in here. I'm going to talk about that in a second and then open and close parentheses like that. And then I will put a, a, a colon and then we can actually start creating the inside of the class itself. Remember when I said snake cases and being able to have all our variables in, uh, in lowercase everything? That is definitely um, um, an expected and something that everybody utilizes definitely in the Python wor world. So what is this capital D? Actually, that's another way a lot of people in the world, the majority of Python programmers in the world, is that when you're creating an instance or when you're creating a class definition like this, uh, the name of the class will always be in a capital letter, all right? 
So uh, the D will be capital so that when you see this somewhere when you, you create an instance you'll be able to tell this is not a variable this is an instance of a class alrighty so that's why they always do that and notice there is a red X in here because uh, this is not enough to actually declare uh, a class called dog so if you do not if you're not ready really to create any functionality for this uh, class called dog you can just say pass and that will be more than enough uh, to actually have a real class defined and you can compile this and it will work if you remember we saw this before when we did the uh, f else uh, if if else before we did not want to do anything we just wanted to pass so we said pass and that's a keyword in the python language to be able to say i don't want to do anything i just want to declare the class but i really do not want to do anything so i can right click i promise you i can say run this but it will not do anything at all because this is a completely empty class at this point make sense all right so let's go back and try to fix it i'm going to take pass out and now i'm going to go ahead and create my first function we'll call it for instance define uh, let's call it name for instance and then it will take two parameters this is one of the major difference between a regular function like we've done before and the one that will have to go inside of a class like dog for instance the first one will always be self to actually tell it who's actually going to be owned that specific function which is the dog class itself and the second one would be whatever arguments you're going to be passing inside of there so i'm going to say name for instance um name of dog for instance or something like that make sense so that's the first piece and then when we push enter again we have to indent again and then we'll return a value like we did before and maybe i will say for instance um, uh, name of dog is and what i would like to do oops name of dog in english <laughs> there you go name of dog uh, is and then i would like to concatenate that with the, uh, the the name of the dog that was passed so that means i'll have to go back all the way to the beginning in here and i'll have to add the uh, the f string like we did before if you remember in the beginning of the class i'll have to say f like that so that i can come in here um, and inside of this i'll say open and close brackets and inside of there we'll say name uh, name of dog all right um what else did i miss in here yeah i forgot the colon all the way at the top there there you go always do that all righty so now if you take a look at it there is my class dog don't forget the open and close parentheses try to always have a capital letter for the name of the class put a colon and then indent and create your first function you can have as many functions as you want inside of the class of course the difference between this this function and a regular function outside of a class is that the first parameter will be self to tell it that the dog actually uh, this is the, inside of the dog class itself and then we can pass whatever argument we want in here this function called name will return the string that says name of dog is and i'm going to use the argument name of dog put the f in here so you can concatenate the two together uh, in here between regular string and uh, interpolation of the name of dog as well make sense all right so how do i deal with this inside of test complete for instance so maybe in test complete what i will do i will create a new function outside of the class we'll say define test me uh, that's the name of the <coughs> function all right and inside of here i would like, like to create an instance of this dog so i would actually create a new variable called my dog all right and i will say equals and we'll say the capital letter dog and i will do it this way so if i do something like this i'm actually trying to create a brand new instance so my dog is the instance dog is the class does that make sense excellent so now if i go into a new line the second thing now that i have a class in memory there is an instance now being created called my dog i can say my dog dot and i'm hoping now to be able to get to the function called name we'll say name and then we will pass it uh i will use my my uh, my heavenese uh, dog her name is aida so i'm going to come in here we'll say aida like this all right does that make sense so if i do that for instance and that will return um the name of dog is aida maybe i can put the whole thing inside of a log dot message we'll say log dot message and then inside of there i will run the entire instance dot the name of the function and we run item let's go ahead and run this test me and see if it will end up putting the word the words name of dog is colon ida inside of there let's right click and we'll say run this routine and look at that it's a successful function call name of dog is Haida. so the instantiation of the class and the instantiation of the function inside of the class itself have worked perfectly 
All right, let's talk about constructors. So let's go back to the code. And so far I've created a function called name. I can create another function called def bark and I can actually say go ahead and and, uh, and uh, make the dog bark uh, smell or jump or do whatever you want to do. So you can have as many functions as you want. It would be the same thing. The first parameter will be self and then you can pass the arguments after that. What about this one line in here it says my dog equals to dog. Uh, when I ran this, what actually got instantiated? Actually, it was an empty constructor for this guy. Alrighty. So if I do not want an empty constructor, I'd like to create a constructor for the class. There is a very specific format you have to create that. Let me go ahead here inside of the dog itself and I will actually define a new function. But the function has to be called underscore underscore, two of them, init underscore underscore. So this is how you define a constructor in the language of Python. It's different from, of course, every single language. But for this one in here, it will be underscore two of them, not just one underscore underscore init underscore underscore. And then you can actually still pass self like everything else. And then we can pass a lot of different things. I can pass the name of the dog. I can pass, for instance, the uh, the color of the dog. I can also pass in the uh, the weight of the dog if I want to. And you can keep going like that. Alrighty. Inside of this function, let me put the colon in here and go inside. Oops. I made a boo boo. Okay, that's okay. Let me go ahead and fix that. I'm going to close this first and then we'll go in. Okay, perfect. Now in the constructor itself, I can actually, uh, first of all, say log, log.message, just to notify me that I am inside of the constructor. We'll say log.message. And inside of here, we'll say, I am inside of the constructor. Okay, that's a good way of learning that to be able to see the messages happening. And then the second one, I would like to create this name, color and weight and the way we used to call them variables. Okay, but inside of a class, they are not called variables. They are called attributes. Again, I know there is a lot of naming if you're new to, to uh, Python or programming in general, but remember variables inside of a class are called attributes. They, they actually serve the same thing. So I cannot come in here, for instance, and say name equals to Ida or color equals white or weight equals 12 pounds. So you'll have to go associate these variables with the class itself. So you will have to come in here and say self dot name. Okay. And I'm going to come in here with say, for instance, name, whichever you passed inside of the constructor itself. And then we'll say self dot, uh, I will say color, and that will be equals to the color that is being passed in. So this color, oops, what did I do? Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Sorry. There you go. And this is a lowercase n. It has to match this name. So this one in here has to match this guy. And this color in here has to match whatever you're passing in here as a, as the third parameter. And then the final one will come in here. We'll say self dot weight equals, and then we'll match the weight coming in from this fourth parameter being passed in here. Does that make sense, everybody? So I can run this right now, but instead of actually saying test me, my dog equals to dog, notice that I can, let me remove this line of code from here. I just can pass things. It doesn't have to be an empty constructor because I already have one that will take all these three parameters as well. It doesn't take the first one self, it's just to explain it that it's, it belongs to that dog class. So I can come in here, we'll say for instance dog, and inside I will say either, and then comma, and the second one will say it's a white dog. Alrighty. And the third parameter will say, for instance, it's 12. Alrighty. And that's 12 pounds. Okay. And you can put them in a string if you want to, or you can put it as an integer and the system will pick it up from there. So if I run something like this, how can I access the specific attributes of the instance of the class? So that would be easy to do. We'll say log dot message, for instance. And then I will say my dog. Can you guess what would be after the dot, dot? And I will actually come and say, I would like to actually log the name, okay? And I can actually copy and paste that line and do it three times. And uh, let's do it a third time in here. One will be the name, one will be the color, and the last one will be the weight. Hopefully that makes sense, so what we did in here. Let's give it a shot. I'm gonna right click inside of the test me function. We'll say run this routine, and let's see what happens. And look how nice that is. My first one inside of the class itself, I said I'm inside of the constructor and then either white and 12, all of them have been written out correctly. So if you take a look at the class, just to take a look at it one more time, 
you see inside of the class doc, I have my definition of the constructor, which is underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. The first one is always self. And then after that, we'll have name, color, weight, and you can add whatever you want uh, in here with a comma separated. And then uh, you will use self dot and the name of the attribute to be able to declare that um, what we call variable. But like I said, it's going to be called attributes in here. And then when you instantiate your instance in here based on the doc class, you can pass all the name, color and weight here. And then you can access each and every single one of them based on the self name, self color, self weight by saying my dog dot name, my dog dot color, my dog dot weight. Hopefully that is making sense, folks. So now I can actually change my other functions called define name. Now that I have a self dot name, color and weight. So instead of actually having to pass the name of the dog, I already have the name of the dog as part of the constructor, right? So I can change this code um, to not pass the name of the dog at all, just keep it self, which is the minimum required for this function. And in here, in the name of the dog itself, I would say something like self.name. All righty. Um, so hopefully that makes sense now that I don't have to pass it. The constructor already gave it that and set the attributes for name to Ida. So now in any other function, if I would like to access it, I don't have to pass it, of course, to the function. And I can actually use self.name everywhere inside of that class dog for all the functions themselves. So now if I go back all the way at the end in here, I can actually say log dot message. And inside of this one, we'll say something like uh, my dog dot name. And I don't have, oh, look at that. She knows that we're talking about her. <laughs> And as you can see here, of course, my dog, every time she hears her name, she has to bark. So that's OK. And then name is a function. So I will actually say open and close parentheses here as well. And when this actually fires up, it will be on inside of the class for dog itself. And the name function will return the self.name, which it has access to through the constructor that had to have already been run when we ran the my dog equals dog Ida white and 12. Let's go ahead and run this one more time and let's see what it brings us. I got an error. Anybody could take a look at the code and find out why did I get a type error? String object is not callable. I know that the, the error itself, the exception, is not very self-explanatory, but take a look at the code. You probably can figure it out yourself. Notice that it's to my dog.name. So actually, the name of the function is conflicting with the attribute we have created, and that's an issue. So you'll have to be careful with that as well because you do not want to confuse the interpreter what is an attribute and what is a function name as well so we do not want to do that so in here maybe we'll change the name of the function to dog name instead of just name and now i'll change this in here to dog name in here so that the attribute does not conflict with the name of the function makes sense let's go ahead and try it one more time we'll say run this routine and voila we still have I'm inside of the constructor, the Ida, the white and 12, and then the firing up of the function called dog name says name of dog is, and it passes the self dot name for Ida and everything worked correctly at this time. Final thing I wanted to show you what happens if you would like to update one of the built in attributes that you created in the constructor as well. If I go back in here, for instance, folks, uh, look what I will be able to do in here. I can actually create another function. Let's go ahead and do that and we'll say define uh, update uh, underscore name for instance okay maybe I have another one for update weight and update color but I'm just going to do it with the name we will also pass self and then we will add the new name let's say new underscore name and that would be the new parameter being passed in to that function we'll put the colon here at the end there you go and then inside of there what I will say is uh, I would do for instance self dot name which is available in the constructor is in equals to new name. And that's it. There is really nothing else I need to do. Now, if I go back inside of my function test me and I will end up calling the my dog dot update name update. Uh, what did we call it? Update name. Yep. Underscore name. And then I'll pass it in here and we'll say FIFO is <laughs> the name of the new dog instead of Ida FIFO. There you go. And then uh, uh, I can run that and I can actually do exactly the same line from number 18. Let me go ahead and paste that line again. So if I say log message my dog dot dog name, it will try to find out what is the new name for the self dot name, which will end up being FIFO and that which will be printed out. That makes sense. Take a look at the code. Try to understand what we're trying to do in here. 
Uh, very simple hopefully and then we'll right click and we'll say run this routine and let's see if it will go from Aida to FIFO <laughs> and look at that so Aida before we made the change on the calling the update and after the update the log message is saying my name the, the name of the dog is FIFO and everything is working well all right to summarize of course, we didn't go through every single cornerstone uh, or corner edge cases of the language itself for Python, but I'm hoping during the last maybe 11 videos, I'll give you exactly what you need to be successful with test complete. As long as you understood how to declare integers and floats and strings, and uh, also how to create variables, uh, the if statements and uh, the else if statements, how to do functions and how to use functions different between methods and functions. Remember the scoping as well, whether it's local to a function or uh, global, um, also the project variables and so on. We, we dealt with list dictionaries, which can be very useful in test complete as well. We did with for loops and we saw how to actually create for loops and use it very intelligently as well. Exceptions are very important. You probably saw how to deal with exceptions. And we spent the last uh, video talking about classes, how to create classes, how to create constructors, how to instantiate classes, how to do self with attributes and so on. And if you know that, you probably will need, that's probably more than 90% of what you're going to need to be successful inside of Test Complete. And of course, during the course itself, we'll add some cornerstones here and there that you need to be aware of in Python as uh, tips and tricks to, to make, you, make sure that you are pretty successful using Python in Test Complete. All right, in this chapter, we're going to talk about name mapping, an extremely important uh, concept inside of uh, Test Complete. So please bear with me. All the other um, chapters in this course will depend on your understanding of name mapping. So please pay attention to this one. I know you will. And uh, also make sure that you ask questions um, as well. Type them in uh, in the system and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Usually name mapping is the one that actually creates the most amount of questions whenever I train on test complete. But if you bear with me, I think it will be very clear. Um, the only time it gets confusing is that when you are trying to use name mapping without really understanding what is name mapping or how it works, you're trying to guess, then it becomes very confusing. But bear with me here in the next few videos, I think you'll be very happy with name mapping in Test Complete. So far, remember in an earlier chapter, we recorded the Notepad, okay? And when we recorded it, you probably didn't see anything about name mapping, but once you record the default behavior in Test Complete that everything you're going to click on causes immediately name mapping to happen. What does that mean? You see that project item on the left side is called name mapping right there. So when I started, as you can see from the test visualizer, I clicked and then I typed in something inside of an object, which is the, uh, the rich text editor inside of Notepad. Automatically, Test Complete says, okay, I need to name map that automatically without even asking the user that is recording right now. I'll just do it for them. And it will be based, all the name mapping will be based on the names of the object in memory. So you might not like them, but it will do it for you anyway. If I double click this name mapping, in this first video, I just wanted to explain the difference between the three windows of the name mapping. All the way at the top left in here is called the mapped object. In my opinion, that's the most important window for name mapping. This is where it's going to allow you to rename a specific object. Maybe it's not very clear and you would like to rename it to something else and you want to use the new name in all your Python script. This is the place you're going to do that. Okay. Right underneath it, there is something. It's not the most important, but it's the most used, which is called an alias window. The alias window does not have to respect the hierarchy of the object. So if you have a, a parent and then it has a child and the child have another child, in the name mapping here at the top, you have to respect the hierarchy. You cannot jump between parent and different children by ignoring some of the children in the middle. That is not going to work. But in aliasing, like we're going to see in the example, it will work. You, you might want to create an alias that when you mention that name, it will refer to whatever we have in the name mapping. I know this might sound gibberish to you for right now, but bear with me, we're going to make it very clear very soon. 
The right side, this is your workspace for name mapping. This is where you're going to pick and choose how you're going to define that object in memory from that point. So if I open up, for instance, system in here, all the way at the top, you'll notice that notepad got mapped for me. I'm going to click on that. And notice there is also something else called WND notepad, which is the main window for notepad itself, got name mapped for me. And if I click on it again, now I will see another object that got name mapped for me automatically called notepad text box. And finally, I will have the rich text box D2D PT that it sought in the memory as well. If I click on every single one of those in the workspace on the right side, it will tell you how the system made a decision to map that object in memory to that specific name. So if I click on notepad, for instance, let's click on that. Notice you should see a lot of different properties in here, but test complete doesn't do that. Test complete says I was able to recognize that name called notepad by looking into the memory and I found a process running called notepad. Well, this is not going to be very handy if I have multiple processes called notepad running, then this will not be enough. Uh, I will show you an example when this will not be a, a good thing in the future as well. All right, if I click on the WD, uh, WND notepad, notice it required automatically two different properties. And believe me, there is about 30 or 40 of them available, but it will not check on every single one. It will just, this is enough between the window class called notepad and the window caption called notepad. I was able to recognize that WND notepad. So every time now you're going to tell me sys.notepad.wnd notepad. I will be able to go to the memory and look for these two properties and if they say notepad i'm good i'm going to assign you to that object and we are good to go all right if i go now to the notepad text box notice the window a class is called notepad text box and finally for the rich text editor there is the only thing called wmd class in here that is also called rich edit d2d pt so these names might not be a very good names maybe uh, you're uh, as a test engineer you will look at this as like I will never remember what this WND notepad is. And I remember, I don't remember what the rich edit D2 to, to uh, PT is. So is there any way I can create my own stuff? Absolutely. You can go to the WND notepad. You can right click on it and you can say, I'd like to rename it. So if I rename that, I can call it, for instance, notepad. Uh, oops, in English, <laughs> notepad uh, main window. And this might be a much better name for everybody on our team to understand what we're talking about. If I push enter in here, it's going to ask you a couple of questions. The first one is, do you want to actually change it also in the aliasing? And let me click on that for right now. And that's the first question. Do you want me to change the name in, uh, in mapping? I will do that for you. But remember, WND notepad was used in aliasing. Do you want me to say yes? Some people make the mistake of always saying no. So like, no, I want this to be different between the name mapping and the alias. You're just trying to make your life hard at this point, okay? Uh, do not have the same exact option, uh, object named differently between the, the name mapping object and the aliasing. That is just confusing to me. So I will always say yes on that. We'll say yes there. And now if I open up the aliasing, Notice the notepad process is called the same thing, notepad. The notepad main window would be called the same thing. And the notepad text box will be named the same thing. And finally, rich edit D2D PT will be the same thing. And right now, I might just have confused you. What the heck is the difference between the one on the top and the one at the, at the, at the bottom? Well, the main thing is the one that really counts is the one at the top. It means if I want to get to this rich edit, there is only one way to do it. And that is saying sys.notepad.notepad main window dot notepad text box dot rich edit D2DPT. In Python, that is the order. You cannot just say sys.notepad dot rich edit DT. It will not know. You will have to include these two objects in the hierarchy. Otherwise, there is no way to do it. But in aliasing, you can actually use aliasing and you can now make it a lot shorter. So instead of saying sys dot this dot this dot that, uh, and that's a very long line, maybe I'm going to be using the rich edit a lot in my code. And I don't want to go through all six different objects like this in my hierarchy. That means I can actually grab this guy, rich edit uh, d2dpt, I can drag it down. See, I'm dragging it down right now. And instead of leaving it right here underneath the notepad text box, I'm going to leave it all the way at the root like this. So now I have two of them. I have one deep in the hierarchy and I have one at the root. So that means I don't have to go through the whole thing. 
All right, I can actually just say alias dot rich edit d2 dpt and I'm right there. The important thing is this guy. This is the correct one. This is the one in the name mapping. So whenever I'm going to use an alias called rich edit d2 dpt, it will always be pointing to where the name mapping is. So as long as this one is correct, then the aliasing can be great as well. Just so that I don't confuse you anymore, let me go ahead and try to use both of them to show you how we'll be able to use that in the code. I'm going to go back to my unit one that I've done earlier. You see this one in here that says alias.notepad.wndnotepad, notepad, blah, blah, blah. Instead of using aliasing, let me go ahead and choose the name mapping. Remember, there are two things now. There is name mapping way and there is the aliasing way. So in test complete, there is a keyword called name mapping. You see, it turns into blue to tell you that this is a keyword in the language. If I say dot after the name mapping, I will see sys right there. Let's go ahead and add it, put another dot. And now we'll hopefully be able to see that we have a notepad. So we'll wait for it to, to do that. And I will type NO and notepad will show up right there. I'll put another dot. And now it will look at all the children of the notepad. And now we'll hopefully have the notepad main window. There it is, notepad main window. I renamed it already. And then finally, I will say DOM. And hopefully here we'll say we have the notepad uh, text box right there. And finally, we'll say DOM. And rich text editor will be in here. Rich text, rich edit D2 DPT right there. So now I'm using the name mapping way. I can leave everything else the same in here and it will work just fine. <laughs> it will not be a problem at all. So let me bring up notepad, for instance, in here. And just to make sure that you believe me, let me go ahead and delete this from here. And I'm going to say good morning. Okay, let's go ahead and right click and say run this routine. And I'm supposed to say uh, to see good morning with an enter being clicked on the mouse uh, on the keyboard as well. So we'll give it here a second. And there is good morning being written out. And in a few seconds, the whole thing uh, will work and we will be in pretty good shape. So now my name mapping is working. All righty. Can I go back into that code? Let me wait for it to finish writing the XML log file. All right. Uh, let's see, you go in here. Can I come in here and say name mapping dot rich edit d2 dpt? No, it will give you an error right away because there are a lot of other objects in the middle. But now that because I went to name mapping and I created that alias all the way at the root, I don't have to respect that using aliases anymore. I can go straight to my rich edit d2 dpt. And how do I do that? So instead of using name mapping, I will remove all that. Let me remove the whole thing so I don't confuse you. We'll say aliasing. There you go, aliases. Notice it changes the color to blue. And I'm going to say dot right there. And you'll see, other than going through the notepad, I can go directly to rich edit d 2 dv And that's it. Now I can leave everything else the same. Nothing will change. Now if I go back to my uh, notepad, let me delete this. Uh, wording from here and let's go ahead and run it with the aliasing instead you will not see any difference whatsoever it will still work 100 percent correctly and the words good morning with the push of the enter will be written out and will be able to go into a, a very good state at this point does that make sense everybody all right, if you're with me so far about name mapping and aliasing, we are in a pretty good start. Let me make it just a little bit more complicated so that we can actually start having fun with this. So if I go back to, let's say, the unit one in here for the name mapping, uh, everything has worked perfectly so far because I have only one notepad instance running in memory. So I'm going to go to Windows 11 in here. I'm going to start another instance. We'll say notepad and let me go ahead and run that. And I'm going to actually start a brand new instance of notepad. All right, I just started another instance. I have two instances now running. Let me go to the first one. So notice there is two different notepads running, completely separate instance. One that still has the good morning that I did earlier, and one is the brand new one that I actually just instantiated right now. So I want you to take a look at the code that I have in here that says alias at rich edit d2 dpt. And tell me what will happen when I run the code right now if I right click and say run this routine. Well, test complete will actually scratch its head a little bit. We'll wait for about 10 seconds and then it will fail. And it will say the error will be ambiguous call. Ambiguous call because I have no idea which instance of Notepad I'm supposed to write this in. So uh, we need to find out the bottom of where this is happening. Let's go back to name mapping. If I go to name mapping, notice the first thing after this is the name of the process for Notepad. Let's double click on this guy. 
and if you double click on it it will bring up the name mapping object if you look behind it the only property that test complete is interested in from the memory is the process name but if you take a look in here for this dialog there is about maybe 20 or 30 different properties available on just the notepad application running in memory just test complete decided to use only one of them so if you take a look for instance in here go down and you will notice that process name has been moved from available to selected and that will be the only thing test complete will look for in memory so as long as it finds something that has a process name called notepad it is done and it will associate the word notepad in the name mapping with that process so now i caused it a major problem why there are two different apps running in memory completely separate and each one of them is called notepad so when i when it ran that code and i told it to only select the process name it's going to go into the memory and says hey do you have any process called notepad running and for my bad luck the memory is going to reply with two separate ones and test complete is not going to say like okay i'm going to take the first one i'm being handed i'm going to run with that no test complete is expecting only one to come back if more than one is coming back test complete doesn't like that it says okay this is an ambiguous call you did not tell me which one of these two i am supposed to hook up to so that's why this is not enough so if you have multiple instances running then the process name is not enough you need to move more properties from the right side into the left side being selected so that we can only get one back it cannot be more than one the instance has to be unique okay so let's take a look at the names in here let's go ahead and find out what we can do the file version how about this guy let's click on this one and move it using this blue icon we click on it so now we have not only the process name but we have the file version that means whenever i tell you notepad dot something you're going to run to the memory and now instead of only asking one question about the process name you're going to ask two you're going to say find me a process name called notepad and the file version has to be 11.23 blah 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 guess what this is not going to help us much at all under windows 11 both instances will have the same process name and the same file version info so this is not going to help much so i'm going to kick it out of there and bring it back to properties again let's go ahead and find something else this sounds like pretty unique which is the id 53904 whenever you start an application under windows that's from the beginning of time from the old windows to the new windows uh, it is the responsibility of windows to assign you an id so database running inside of the windows when it's windows starts every time you start something automatically it will give you a temporary id while you're alive that means if i shut down notepad and bring it back up again there is a 99 point a lot of nines that you will never get that id again this is just randomly randomly created during instantiation so if i move the id in here to the left side do you think this is going to work if i actually run it and for our bad luck this will work let me repeat that sentence <laughs> for our bad luck this will work because i do not have two instances with the same name of the process and the id only one of them has an id of 53904 the other one will have a different number completely so this is perfect this is gonna work well how long is this gonna work for folks only for today you shut down your machine come back run the same test tomorrow and you will never get that um, uh, that to work again why because when you started window this morning the id is completely different so this is a one-time thing it will work yes but it's a very very short-lived working so and that's the part that actually drives a lot of people crazy with dynamic names so we see a lot of people on the forums coming and saying i am testing a web application it worked great today but the following day all the objects are not found what's going on that's because whoever actually uh, the r d that wrote the website are using dynamic naming so today the name of the id was uh, ctl underscore o2 that's the name of the control but when we shut down and we brought it back up again before we did because we did not give it a name then the browser had to invent the name on the fly now it's not called ctl underscore o2 it's called something else so whatever i mapped it to that id will be bad so try to stay away from ids folks even though it will work it's a very short-lived working so never use an id because for dynamic application and dynamic websites this is a horrible thing to do it will make you very unhappy so kick it out of there well i will keep going down the list and there has to be something i can count on 
and in reality there is only one for processes only okay we're talking about the process not windows alrighty and that is called the index this guy in here that is going to be unique and it will never change what does it mean having a process name called notepad and index called one that means the first instance that got created in memory for notepad will have index one the second instance will have index two the third one will have index three and so on and so on and so on Alrighty. so in that uh, case i'm saying always run my test on the first instance that got created for notepad i don't care how many instances are in memory i'm only interested in the first one only and always run my test against that all the time does that make sense so whether you have one or ten instances of notepad we'll always run it on the first instance and that is how you get around something like this when there is multiple different instances running in memory hopefully that makes sense all right in this video i want to talk a little bit about uh, making a change to make it more readable to our team instead of having something like rich edit d2 d2p t uh, will do something else so let me go ahead and cancel this guy i'm gonna actually shut down the instance in here so we'll go back to only one instance that's fine but i'd like to rename this rich edit d2 dpt let me right click on it and we'll say rename this and we'll call it something like notepad text editor that is a lot better name for our team to understand even though that's not the real name of it in in memory but i'm going to change it to make this happen we'll say notepad rich text editor if you push enter notice it's going to ask you would you like to change the name in the aliasing as well and remember the aliasing is available twice so i'm going to say yes right there and notice it changes in both of them so now it's called notepad text editor now when i go back to my code folks will this code work anymore and the answer is no you're gonna get an error there is nothing under aliases called rich edit d2pt if you want to use the old name rich edit d2pt you cannot use name mapping or aliasing you have to use sys dot and you have to go through the real names in memory but nobody wants to do that it will be a very very long name uh, all right but in here instead of this guy i can remove it and now i have to fix my code by saying notepad text editor now everything else will work perfectly so I'm hoping that you can see a couple of values for using name mapping and aliasing. One of them is to be able to make it shorter, okay? So you don't have to have the very, very long name to be able to do that. And by the way, if I want to find out what is that very ugly long name that doesn't use aliasing and does not use name mapping, you can steal that name from the object browser. Let's go to the object browser and i am gonna go where is notepad let's uh, there it is and i'm gonna go to this window called rich edit d2 dpt just click on it in here and then there will be a property equal full name let's find what full name is right there and that is the real name in the in memory so i'm gonna click inside of there and we'll say Control c to copy it into the clipboard and let's go back to our code so if i go all the way at the top in here if i paste that line look at how ugly that line is but that will always work that is the real name of the object in memory it says sys.process notepad is being passed as a variable uh, as a as a hard-coded string in here for the process name dot window and then i'll have to pass the three parameters the name of the class the caption and the instance number dot window and i'll go into the notepad text box it doesn't have any caption first instance and I'll have to go back into the final window called rich edit d2 dpt no caption in the first instance so that line is really a long line with a lot of parameters with a lot of weird ones that nobody knows what this is so you don't want to use that uh, even though uh, it will work I can actually remove this aliases dot notepad text editor and paste that line and it will work exactly the same way but of course by using aliasing look at how much nicer that name will be inside of there so i'm going to delete this line so now you know at least uh, what does that mean for us so is that the only reason why we use name mapping and alias just to make our uh, our lines shorter that would have not been enough really to be honest with you but it's a it's a neat feature but there is something even more important let's say for instance after six months of development the people that are actually working with notepad the r d team at microsoft decided to change the type of control they are not using uh, the rich edit d2 dpt anymore they found out that there is a third party company that have a very beautiful and fast editor that is called the uh, the awesome editor okay and they throw away the rich editor and put that in and now i have like 10 15 or even 100 different functions 
in Python in test complete that is, is uh, testing the rich editor. That means I have to go to each and every single one of them <laughs> and change it from rich editor to awesome editor. But if you're using aliasing and name mapping, you don't have to do that. You just have to go to the name mapping and change it in one place only. You see, in name mapping, Notepad text editor is pointing to a window class called rich edit D2D. So if I go inside of this and click on the ellipses, I can tell the system it is no longer called rich edit D2DPT. So you can come in here and type the word awesome editor and say OK. And that will be the only change you need to make. You can leave your code in unit one alone. And even though they are pointing to something called Notepad Text Editor, because you changed the, the name of the type of the class itself, it will work with the new control or the new component that, um, that Notepad is using from now on. So that is a major reason because you know R&D changes their mind about controls and things like that during the, the development cycle between alphas and betas before it goes into staging and production. And you don't want to keep changing all the code in your test. It, it actually drives QA engineers crazy. So this is another feature that would be great for the name mapping as well. And hopefully that makes sense. Why would you want to use that? All right, folks, my final video on this section, and I'm hoping that I'm making it clear why name mapping is very important and how is Test Complete doing that behind the scenes. But in this final video on name mapping, I just want to let you know that there is something called conditional mode. Let me go, for instance, to the Notepad text editor, double click on this guy. And the same dialogue that we saw before on Notepad with different properties, of course. So we have about 20 or 30 different properties here on, uh, on the text editor. And it only chose the window class. So same again, if there is multiple of them, which Notepad does not have, I might have to come in here and move things from the right side under uh, properties available into the selected so I can actually pinpoint only one instance when it comes back. But again, sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes people write applications in such a way, it all depends on who you are when you logged into the application. You might see different user interface. For instance, I know some applications and some also web applications. If you're a regular user, you're going to get a text box. But if you're at the admin, if you logged in with admin uh, privileges, these text boxes become combo boxes, drop downs. So that's a problem because now I have to have two sets of, uh, of tests, one for admins and a completely different test for regular users because the components are different, right? Actually, with conditional mode, this button all the way at the bottom in here, let me put a red circle around us so you can see it. This I can tell the system, I am looking for a text box, but if you cannot find it, don't bail out on me. Don't give me an error. Don't tell me that the object was not found. Try something else. Try to find a drop down. So we do this a lot, especially for websites as well, because some things will change between different authenticated users on the system itself. So if I click on conditional mode in here, you'll notice the only condition, there are three pieces to it. There is the left side, which is the property name. There is the right side, which is the value. And then there is the condition in the middle. And the condition could be equal, not equal, less than, greater than, and or you can have any of those. So in this case in here, I can go back and do an AND or an OR. So I'll say, for instance, OR in this case, and the selected value, again, I can open up the dialog, and I'm going to look for something called WND. Let's see where it is, WND, WND class. There you go, and I will say OK. And then the condition will be equals. And then this one, instead of being a rich ed, maybe it's called drop down. Uh, uh, D to DPT. Oh, there you go. Maybe that's the name of it. Okay. Oops. What did I do? All right. Sorry. In here we'll say drop down D to DPT. I don't know what the name is going to be, but I'm just guessing that it might be a drop down with that name. Okay. It will be able to find that using the object browser in the application itself. It will tell you what the name is. So if you leave this right here, what I'm telling the system is. If you are trying to recognize the word notepad text editor and you cannot find a rich editor, do not bail out on me, okay? Do not give me an error saying object not found. Try something else. That's why this is an or, not an and. Or means, can you find another one called drop down? Oh, yes, I can find this one. No problem. Then this notepad text editor becomes the drop down and forget about the rich edit, all right? If I say and instead of or, that means both of them have to be um, correct 
and of course that will not make sense in this case it's or the one that will work look for this if you cannot find it look for this one and then i have another or and or maybe i have five or six of them and unless one of them is true is correct then we got ourselves an object notepad text editor will be able to latch on to it and we'll move forward so conditional modes are extremely valuable to be able not to bail out on the first error it will try other things to make sure that this happens make sense everybody let's go ahead and start a brand new chapter and we're going to talk about all the different checkpoints and stores available in test complete very very valuable features in test complete to be able to store and check and compare images and files and properties and objects and xml and a lot of other things databases and grids very 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 powerful instead of you having to write all the code for that yourself before i do everything this first video i just want to let you know where to go go get the samples of test complete which nowadays they do not come with the product so for the last maybe three or four years when you install test complete they used to actually install the samples as well but not anymore so now when you install the trial or the real product itself it does not come with samples so the first thing you want to do for instance in uh, google or fire um, firefox or um, uh, edge or any browsers that you want to use look for the words test complete test complete and space and we'll say download samples there you go download samples okay if you look for that it will probably be the first one coming back test complete samples from smart bear let's click on that and this page in the documentation uh, there are different samples for 15.5, 14.81, and there is a lot of them. I'm on the latest version, hopefully you are as well. And it will tell you where, what to do, how to install them. There is a button here called Download Samples that will actually download the entire uh, installation. It's an MSI that you'll have to run the installation. And after you run the installation, where will all the samples be? Be careful because a lot of people could not find it because of that. It doesn't go under your name under the documents, for instance, because my documents are under users Lino, for instance, but no, it will go under users public and then public documents test complete 1550 samples. So it's public, not your own username. That's why a lot of people cannot find them after they install them. And then finally, what's inside? And there is a whole list, whether you're using uh, common applications or desktop, web application, mobile application, there is, a there is a, um, an example and a sample for each and every single one. I definitely recommend for you to take a look at all of these to be able to run some of these things. I already ran uh, this uh, sample, and then I went to uh, users, public, public documents, test complete, uh, 1550, and I have all of these already installed. Before you do that, before you run this executable to install the samples, you do not have any samples after the installation of test complete. All right, I've installed it. So now if I go to C colon backslash users, notice I'm not going to go to my own name here, which is my documents. I'm going to have to go to public, click on that. And then you have to go to public documents. And then from public documents, we have the test complete 15 samples right there. And then I will have all the different samples, whether you're using mobile or web or desktop. I'm going to start with desktop first. And I want to go for the orders application. This is a really nifty application that was written in C Sharp or in Java or different languages. Double click on the orders in here and you'll see that they implemented the same exact application in so many different platforms like .NET C Sharp, Delphi for Pascal, Microsoft uh, Visual C++, Qt, Java Swing, WPF, all of them are available in here as well, which is definitely very nifty. So you get to choose. It doesn't really matter which one you're going to run, but if you wanted to make it very close to the platform that you are going to be testing for your own company and for your own application, you are more than welcome to do that. In my case for here, we'll use, for instance, the first one in .NET C Sharp. We'll double click on this guy. And then I will go to the bin. I have the source code for the whole app, by the way, but I don't need it. I'm just going to want to run the executable. And that is under release. There will be orders.exe. If I double click this guy, that is the application. It's just a, a .NET application running on my machine that has a menu, a toolbar, and a grid. So I can actually say file and we'll say open. And it even comes with a TBL file, which is a binary table to be able to... Uh, um, to, to actually open up some records in the grid. So I'm going to go back to the C colon backslash users again. We'll say users. We'll say public. There you go again. And we'll say public uh, down documents. Samples uh, 15. Desktop. Orders. 
and we'll go there it is my table.tbl it's a binary file so if I open up this guy it will dump in maybe about nine or def, uh, nine or ten different uh, records in the grid in here and that's all I wanted I just wanted to run an application that I can actually do some storing of checkpoints on all right so now uh, what is the first checkpoint we're going to do well for this video let's stop here so that you can actually be with me just make sure you have this application from the samples running on your machine like i said it doesn't matter if it's .NET or java or wpf or whatever it is choose whichever platforms you want to use just make sure you open up the executable file and you are where i am right now sounds good all right let's start with the first checkpoint and we will start very easy we will do the image checkpoint that means i would like to find out an object here on the screen in this application and i'd like to take a screenshot of it save that into the project of test complete itself so that tomorrow or next week or next month when r d gives me a new build of the application to test i can take another screenshot of that object and compare it to whatever i certified earlier to make sure that they did not change the look and feel of the application so let's say for instance i want to take a screenshot of this toolbar see it has about eight or nine different buttons and i want to make sure that i don't have to use my eyes <laughs> to be able to tell if they change something or not sometimes it's only one or two pixels that they have changed and i will not be able to figure it out so i would like test complete to help me with that so let's go ahead and do that i'm going to actually open up a brand new script here in python we'll call this one checkpoints you can call it anything you want of course and inside of there i would like to start doing some checkpoint but i don't want to write the code myself i just need to create a function to get it ready we'll say def define and we'll say the function is called for instance uh, check my um, my object or something like that you can call it whatever you want check my object we'll uh, do that and we'll go to the new line all right now I would like test complete in Python to help me out a little bit. Notice that check mark with the plus sign. That is a great help. That will allow you to create a checkpoint right in the code based on any of the checkpoints available inside of test complete, whether it's an image, a file, a property, an object, XML, uh, databases, grids, all of them are available. So let's click on the plus sign first. The wizard will start up and it's actually asking you to select a checkpoint. In my case, in here it would be an image checkpoint. We'll start with this one first. It's very easy. So I'm going to click on this guy and we'll say next. And now the system is asked. Oops, sorry, I clicked uh, uh, next twice. <laughs> my bad. And now the system is going to say, please use one of these methods to identify an object on the screen so I can take a picture of. So like we did before with the object spy, if you use the first one, you have to drag it. You cannot let go of the mouse. You have to drag it until there is a red rectangle on the object, and then you can take a screenshot of that. If the object that you're trying to take a screenshot of is not on the screen yet, then the first one will not really help you out. Maybe it's a pop-up menu that needs to be engaged. Then the second one will be the way we can do it with the shift control A where the mouse is, and it will take a screenshot of whatever is behind the mouse at that point. The third one I have to be honest with you I never use and I don't recommend for you to use because it has to do with the resolution on the screen it will use an x and y coordinates the reason why I never use it because I have a specific resolution on my screen okay and if I check in this into the source control system and another member of my team check out my code and maybe they are running a different resolution on the screen this will never work it has to be an identical resolution and I don't like that usually whenever there is something to do with x and y coordinates I try to run away from it I do not want to test my application based on coordinates on the on the screen that's a bad way of testing okay you want to make everything based on objects not on x and y coordinates that is the power of test complete as well all right what do you think will happen if I click on the object spine here and start dragging do you think test complete will get out of the way I hope so let's go ahead and do it I'm going to click drag and notice test complete minimizes itself and now if I stop on top of the grid for a while there will be a red rectangle if I go all the way at the top the whole up the whole main window of the application will have a red tag and if I go a little bit down till I have a red rectangle around only the toolbar buttons alone so that's an object by itself I'm going to release the mouse right now just for the toolbar button 
and now test complete will bring itself up again and it will try to recognize that object in memory so within a few seconds you will notice the line that says uh, object will be filled and it will also do the name mapping and the aliasing for you automatically i don't have to do any of that so it will say aliases dot orders which is the name of the process that's the application orders.exe dot main form and that's the main form in c sharp and then dot toolbar and that's the object that has all the buttons inside of the toolbar not only that but there is the image it took a, a screenshot of that object right there and it's going to tell me right now, I would like to store that in your 01TC course so that I can actually have it as a certified known good image. So I can actually come in here, we'll say toolbar, or I can give it another name. We'll call it, for instance, orders toolbar, whatever makes sense to you. Okay, I'm going to leave it as toolbar. All righty. So where is it going to save this in here? Right now, I don't have a project uh, item that will allow me to store this in so if I say next it will end up creating a brand new project item here called stores and it will go under images and it will add this to it automatically for me let's say next all right now it's asking about comparison masks what does that mean maybe there is a portion of the toolbar that I don't care if RMD changes or not okay Maybe not everything in the image is important for me. Maybe just a specific area of the image, if it changes, I want to be notified. If it changes on the right side of the gray area, I can care less about. So I can actually say, uh, create a brand new comparison mask, for instance, and it will show you the image right there. Maybe let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit so I can see it better. Not too much. There you go. We'll leave it like that. And maybe the gray area on the right side is something that I can care less about. I want to exclude it. So notice there are things here called exclude selected area and include a specific area. So if I click on exclude once and now I come in here, maybe I can put a rectangle around this area. You don't forget that you have to click on it one more time. So you click on it again and now it will put a black mask on top of this area. What you're saying is if R&D gives you a toolbar and they change something, maybe put the name of the company here on the right side or something or put a nice logo. I can care less i only care about the left side of the menu if one of these button changes or they add another button or something i want to be notified if it happens behind this area that i excluded don't let me know i i can care less does that make sense everybody all right i'm going to leave it alone for right now we'll go back to don't use comparison mass so it'll be only one image that i'm going to compare it to and we'll say next and then the final piece in here will be how much tolerance you're going to give it per pixel. So right now, for instance, there is a slider. If I leave it at zero, which I always do, by the way, that means even if it's like 10,000 pixels, <laughs> all right, I'm saying even if one pixel is different between the live image and the one stored, I want you to give me an error. I want you to notify me right away. If I move the slider all the way to the right, I will be able to find out that image of the toolbar, how many pixels are in it. 16,576. Of course, you will never leave it like that. If you leave it all the way to the right, you are saying to the system, even if 16,576 pixels are different, I'm still going to let you pass the test. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But most people will leave a little bit of leeway, like 5% or 10%. Why do they do that? Because on different versions of the OS for Windows, you might actually have shadowing under Windows 95 or Windows 7 or whatever. And I don't want to actually make it fail just because there is a shadow underneath it that is not available in, in the latest version of Windows or something like that. So again, out of 16,000, if I let go of 500, maybe it's not too bad. Does that make sense? In my case, I never do that. I always leave it at zero. Even if one pixel is different, I want to get notified. And finally, the color tolerance. Remember, my machine here is using 64 million colors. So I can actually base all the whole thing on 256 colors or make it, for instance, grayscale. That means just compare the grayscale. I don't care about every single depth of red or depth of blue or whatever. If I move this all the way to the right, notice 255. It starts from zero to the total is 256. If I do it like this, that means I don't care about the colors at all. But if I keep it at zero, that means the depth of the color is important for me as well. All right, I'm going to say finish there. And you will notice it created a brand new section. Notice it says stores here on the left side. Let me put a, 
uh, a red tag in here so you can see there is a stores that got created for me right here not only that but it knows that i'm writing the code in python it ends up creating the line of code in python for me so i don't have to even invent the line of code so i'm going to say copy that into the clipboard let's go into the the, the function called check my object and we'll say control v and there it is the name of the object in test complete is called regions and i'll say dot toolbar which hopefully is available in the store and i will say dot check against the toolbar live in the application itself and if they are identical between this toolbar and the one coming in from the application live i'm going to pass this test if they are different i'm going to actually be very upset and i'm going to let you know that this is not the toolbar i certified uh, last month okay if i want to see what this toolbar looks like go ahead and open up the store there is regions it's not called images in test complete all images and photos are called regions but it has the little image right here so you can remember this is about images let's double click on the regions and now it will open all the different objects that you have saved in the system so the toolbar is right there if i click on it the size of it is 592 by 28 pixels and that is the image right there it is using 16.7 million colors it's 24 bit image and the date i'm doing it right now is april 5th for instance and this is the one I am comparing against. So now if I go back to my code, what happens if I run this code right now? Remember, the application is still running. So if I run this line of code in my function called check my object, it will take another screenshot of this specific toolbar and it will compare it pixel by pixel to what I have in the store regions. And if every single pixel is identical, I will pass the test. Anything changes, I will not be happy. I will let you know about it. So let's go ahead and run this and see if it will work. We'll say run this routine. Let's sit back and relax and find out if the toolbar, remember there is over 16,000 pixels that they all have to be checked. And right now it just took another screenshot of that toolbar and hopefully it will be in the green. So we'll look for it here at the bottom and the test is right there. It's in the green. The region checkpoint toolbar passed. We are all good. Alrighty, and if I want to see what the picture look like, click on the picture here at the bottom and it will show you exactly. That's the one that is expected and this is the one that came back from the application. They are identical, nothing changed between the two and that's why we passed it. Let's try to do something to make it fail. All right, let's go for instance to the application itself and let's ch change the shadowing. So instead of having the last button click, let's click on the one right next to it, okay? That will, it's a different viewing of the grid, for instance. But if I run this right now, notice that blue background is different. So the, the, the pixels will be different. So I know it's not gonna work. So let's go to the checkpoint in here. We'll right click on this guy and we'll say, run this routine one more time. And this time it will take maybe another five or six seconds extra because it has to run the whole 16,000 pixels and it have to write out an xml report with the error it's going to be a red x it will tell you no go this is not the same image you told me about last month so let's give it a second in here and hopefully i will get a red yep you see it's a red it's an error it's not the same guy <laughs> it's not the same toolbar we'll wait for this to be written out and if you take a look in here this is an error and it says the pixel difference six percent and the color difference is 100 percent that means something went wrong of course, this is not enough for me to be able to tell what exactly happened. And that is the beautiful thing about the picture now. If I click on picture, now I can actually make this a little bit bigger for me and I can actually see exactly what's going on. I can see where the pixel difference. So one of them became not selected and the other one got selected. So I can see exactly what the difference is. So even if this was one or two pixels, I can easily be able to tell exactly what happened. And if I go all the way at the end in here, I can actually, depending of course on the colors and the opacity of the picture, I can choose different backgrounds between white, light, and dark. So if I can say white background, it will only show you the difference alone. If I say light background, it will do it, which is the, uh, the default one. And finally, if the, the image is too dark, I can say dark background, for instance, and I can show it with different way. But this will be very useful, so you don't have to use your eyes for this. Just run all your, uh, your tests at midnight. When you come in the morning, test complete will tell you, by the way, three or four objects change the way they look. They do not match what I have in my store. So you will get a full report. Now you can ask your R&D, hey, are we going with the new stuff? Or there is a bug that I need to report that the images are not the same. So what happens if R&D tells you, oops, sorry, we forgot to tell you it's going to look like this from now on. Does that mean you have to go and change the, uh, 
the, the the region checkpoint that means i have to delete this guy and take another screenshot of the of the good one that r d says they are moving to no you do not what you have to do at this point if come in here and click click on this update check mark right there very dangerous check mark by the way because when you check this guy what you're telling the system now the next time you do a check do not check just go ahead and do a forceful um, uh, replacement while this guy is checked if i go back in here and say region.toolbar.check this check will not happen what it will do whatever image coming back from the live application will end up being the region in the store so of course that's why i said it's very dangerous be careful don't keep that button checked because that means you will always succeed till the end of time even though they might be changing the toolbar every single release and you will never know so you want to do this only once and then uncheck it and then keep going but whenever this is checked we are not doing a comparison we're doing a replacement so i don't have to do this manually everybody with me do you understand what this is excellent by the way test complete has been very nice to us in the last couple of years when you check something like this once you run code to do a checkpoint it unchecks it for you automatically so just to make sure that you do not leave it checked so you have to literally go and check it again whenever you need to but it only runs it once and then it unchecks it for you automatically that only happened a few years ago with test complete as well hopefully that makes sense and shows you how you can compare images between what you certified inside of test complete and what's available live from the application as well all right let's do the second one which is the file comparison so so far we have dealt with regions and we were comparing pixel to pixel but now that we're going to move into file comparison the comparison is based on bytes so i'm going to do it with a text file so that you can see the difference but believe me because it's byte to byte comparison the file could be text file it could be a wav file it could be a, a video file it could be any type of file text or binary it doesn't really matter so let's go ahead and create a brand new section on the stores in here we'll right click and we'll say add a new item and these are all the different types of stores that i can have i already added regions so i don't need to see it here again i can do it based on database tables files objects tables web testing and xml for right now we're going to concentrate on files so let's double click on this guy and now files will be available for me so let's go ahead and create two files maybe we'll start by making them identical i'm going to go ahead and open up notepad let's go ahead and have a file that says good morning that's good enough for me we'll say file save as and i'm going to go ahead and save it somewhere on my hard drive so i can get to it in the python code later on we'll, we'll call it for instance good morning.txt it doesn't care what the extension is like i said it could be a binary file it could be a text file whatever you would like i'm going to go ahead and put it into my documents and we'll say save this file all right and now just to be able to compare it let me go ahead and save it again but this time with a different name so these two files will be identical on the inside so let's go ahead and uh, do a save as and this time i'm going to call this one good morning text. all right they are in the same folder good enough for me excellent let's go ahead and uh, minimize this guy for right now and what i would like to do first is to go ahead and save the file the one that i consider to be the good file into the store itself all right so i can compare against so again there is a decision that has to be made um, by you the tester or the engineer working on this to certify the good file to put it in the store itself so i'm going to put the first file without the two to be the good file okay the way to do that is to right click on files and we'll say add file and i will go ahead and find my file hopefully it will be right there it says good morning.txt let's go ahead and find it oh it's not there okay let's go ahead and go um, to all the way at the top where it says documents there you go and we will say good morning the one without the two this is the good file all right so now this good file will be added um, we will see it here in a second oh this is a very important dialogue that came up where is my file right now folks right now my file is under users um, lino uh, documents so it's a completely different folder completely outside of the structure of the 01 tc course project that i have for test complete if i say no right now all right it will still work but only on my machine so you have to be very careful because uh, if it works for me but i end up putting all that project inside of a, uh, a source control system and then my team actually uh, ends up 
uh, checking out my entire project they will not have that file that file will only be residing on my machine only they will not have it my recommendation to you is to always say yes that means take that file or make a copy of it from users lino documents or whatever you install it on your hard drive and make it part of this project so that when i check it into source control system everybody else on the team will have that file as well the good file goodmorning.txt all right let's go ahead and say yes there that's a good idea and there is the file that got copied it's now called good morning underscore text all righty it's done for today notice there are only 12 bytes instead of there uh, good space morning and the uh, final backslash n for the end of the line all of that stuff will be part of the 12 bytes on there and also on the right side you'll see a hexadecimal uh, uh, representation of the file and then a text representation called good morning we are lucky this is a text file so we can see good morning but if this is uh, if this was a wave file or a video file or something like that then it will all be mumbo jumbo hexadecimal values you will not be able to see any text values but this is good this is good to do it in text so you can see the difference when we do the compare in bytes not in anything else between these two files all right i think we're in good shape now let's go ahead into the checkpoints again and let's create another function let's leave this one alone uh, for the region i'm gonna say dev and we'll say check my file check my file all right and then we will go ahead inside of there uh, and i would like to uh, instead of me writing the code i would like to actually let uh, test complete help me out so again click on the plus sign with the check mark in the toolbar of the editor and now we'll say file i would like to do a checkpoint on the file let's click on that and the first thing is going to ask me for how do you want to do the comparison and every release in the last couple of years test complete keeps adding more and more features actually the first maybe 10 or 15 years of test complete we only had this one byte by byte that's it and that's what everybody's using and then they wanted to do it based on a schema so they allowed xml uh, so uh, they will actually even if things change from the bottom to the top as long as the data is still the same using the schema it will still pass the file and then lately in the last couple of years they've added pdf and excel i'm going to come back to those and i'll tell you why they are very special cases most binary files the like adobe pdfs and excel and word um, is a lot more than what you can see but for right now let's just go ahead and concentrate on byte by byte which is uh, the main way of comparing files anyway first of all it's asking to specify the file to check they're asking for the second file not the one in the store okay so i'm going to find out where my file that's called goodmorning2.txt is at so let's click on that and we will go ahead and uh, we'll select it from documents let's find out where it is uh, again we'll go all the way to the top we'll go to documents and hopefully good morning dot uh, good morning two dot text is right there we'll say open this guy all right it will uh, edit here in a second there we go and then i'm going to say next and now it's going to ask me a very weird question it's going to ask me would you like me to take that good morning two file and add it to the store or do you already have a file in the store that you would like to test against by default it's going to think that you didn't do the the step that i did already so it's going to try to create a good morning two and then it will add a one to it as the first instance of it but that's not what i want i already added good morning text so let's click on file from stores and then if i bring this down you will see all my files that i've added to the store i've added only one so far which is good morning underscore text like we did with the regions where i had actually some pixels that i can tolerate five percent or ten percent i can do the same thing with bytes i can say allow difference of five bytes or ten bytes or whatever but our file is too small it's only 12 bytes so i'm going to leave it as zero so even if one byte is different between the two files i would like to get uh, an error with information about that as well let's go ahead and say finish and uh, again test complete graciously writes the whole python code that i need to make this happen so i'm going to say copy and then inside of my own function it's called check my file i can paste that line of code and i am done so right now instead of regions for images there is another keyword in the language called files and we'll say files dot and then it will use the name that you added for the files called good morning underscore text and it will do a check and it will go against the good morning two dot text so this is the variable one the good morning one is the stable one that we know is good 
And notice because of Python, the backslashes mean something inside of strings. So every time you need to put a, a backslash, you end up putting two backslashes. Otherwise, if you only put one of them in Python and also in other languages as well, that will be an escape character and it will not work. So backslashes, two of them in Python are needed, okay, inside of a string. All right, folks, so what happens now if I run this uh, check my file? As soon as I run this, it will go ahead and open up the good morning too, get all the bytes inside of there, and it will compare it to whatever inside I have in the store under the good morning text. If byte by byte is identical, this will pass with no problem. So let's run it. We'll say run this routine and give it a few seconds in here, and hopefully it will come back and say we are all good to go and they are identical. And there we go. The files are both identical and looking good. Excellent. So how do I actually see what happens if something goes wrong? So let me go ahead and open up Notepad again. This is the goodmorning2.txt. And the content will be good morning. And let's say, for instance, hello. Alrighty. And then I'm going to have to save the file. It's not enough just to type it. You have to save the file. We'll say save that for good morning too. Let's minimize it. And I'm going to run the test one more time. So let's run this. And we'll say run this routine and we'll wait for a few seconds and see this failing hopefully and as you can see it's a red x this is a failure it actually ended up taking a, a picture of all my monitors i have a lot of monitors here but we are working only on the one on the right that's one thing test complete will do automatically every time an error occurs it always takes a, a snapshot of the entire screen so even if i have four or five different monitors it takes a screenshot of all of them all righty uh, not just the one that the uh, the test complete is running on. So notice here that uh, the file checkpoint failed and it's telling you exactly why it failed. It's going to come in here says the first file, the good file, goodmorning.txt is 12 bytes, but the new one for good morning 2 is 18 bytes. So that is obviously a difference between the two, six bytes different, and that's why I failed the uh, the whole thing in here. Does that make sense? So this is important. And also, I want you to notice there is a, a link in here in the result called detail. So if I click on detail in here, it will open up something in test complete to be able to see the two files side by side. The one that the good one, the one that I put in the store will be on the left side called the baseline file. That is good morning. And then on the right side, that, that will be the file that we're checking against. So you will see good morning. And then there is a space that was not there. And then the five letters of hello right there. So again, because it's a text file, it makes sense. We can see exactly what the difference, but you can imagine if this was a binary file, it will highlight all the stuff that was not in the baseline file and it might not make sense. But for text files, this is great because I can see exactly in a different green color, what is the difference between the two files and why it ended up failing the file. Does that make sense? All right. Can we go a little bit further to do something a little bit more complicated, but it's a lot of fun as well. So if I go back to my code, notice this check function or the method on the on the files object themselves. It does that for you automatically. There is not much you can do. I was wondering if there is another way to do a check, but actually using something called the hash of the file. That's a checksum on the file itself. So let me remove this check in here and do a control space to see what's available for me. And there will be um, good morning text. There is a check, check Excel workbook, check PDF test. That's all good and dandy. So there is a possibility that I need to go even before the good morning text. So let's go file dot and let's see what's available for me before that. Ah, there is a lot more stuff that I can do. There is uh, files you can programmatically add a file instead of the way we done it by right clicking and saying add file. That was a manual in the IDE, but maybe during the run and I can add the file programmatically. Uh, I can calculate hash values for the file. I can compare, contain, contain files, count how many files in a specific directory, for instance. There are a lot of things I can do. The one I'm interested in is this compare guy. Let's double click on this one and use the compare. All right, let me just move this a little bit to the side. We might use this name later on. And now I'm going to go into the function or the method called compare. And I would like to find out what type of parameters can be passed. Usually people used to click on compare and push F1 on the keyboard to go to the help and then read the help to find out what needs to be passed in here. But we don't do this anymore. Test complete is much better than that. If you put the cursor inside of the compare or any other method actually inside of test complete, you can use the keyboard to say uh, control shift space. If you do control shift and space, 
it will actually show you uh, this yellow window. We actually call it the kibitz window. So that's a geeky word um, in the development world. We call it the kibitz window. But it will show you actually all the different parameters that needs to be passed to be able uh, to call the compare. And the ones inside of uh, uh, the brackets, these are optional. That means you do not have to pass them. So in reality, notice there is file, file one, file two, hash value equals to zero, report difference is to true, and the message type is two. All of that stuff, uh, except file one and file two, are optional. So in reality, I just need to pass the two files. One of them is called, as you can see in files, if I double click on this guy, it's called good underscore morning underscore text. And the second one is the good morning two with a space in between. So let's go ahead and do that. On the first one, I'm going to use the one in the store. We'll say good underscore uh, morning underscore text. That's what I have in the store, comma. And uh, the, uh, the second one in here will be, uh, let me go ahead and delete this and use the second one, which is e colon backslash documents good morning to dot text. These are my two files in here. So if I do that, actually, it brings in a little bit more oomph to, to the check. Why is that? Because by default, if you remember the third parameter, control shift space again, the third one is calling something called hash value equal to zero. That means uh, what is a hash value? This text could be very small or a huge file, maybe a hundred page document, for instance. What it does, it actually reads the entire document and gives you a 32-bit value for that entire document. If you change even one letter in the document, you can never get back to that hash value. You're just creating a 32-bit number that it represents the entire content of the file. So was this hash value equals zero means what? It means I'm going to take a hash value of this file, okay? And I'm also going to take a hash value of this file. If these two files are identical, that means this one minus this one is equal to zero because they are exactly the same 32-bit value. And this is how I'm going to find out that these two files are identical and I'll pass the test. Does that make sense? Let's go ahead and run this guy. And I'm expecting this uh, not to pass because remember we added the word hello in one of them. So this will actually be an error. But there is something very special in the error that will come back. Ah, what did I do? Name error, good morning. Oh, yeah, it's not defined. Sorry, I need to put it in a double quotes. So let me wait for this to finish. But the good morning text is a string, not just a variable. All right, let's wait for this to finish. And I'll bring up the checkpoint. There we go. And this good morning in here will be in a string format like that. All right, perfect. Let's go ahead and run it again. And let's take a look at the result. Even though we know it's not going to pass because the good morning too has the word hello, which is extra byte, 18 bytes instead of 12. So let's wait for this to come back and it will show us the, uh, the issue right away. Uh, even though it will show you that it, they are not the same, notice it's not an error. And this is something Test Complete decided to do a long time ago, from the beginning of time when they implemented the files object. If the two files are not the same, they don't error out, they give you a warning. And there is a reason behind that. The, the fact that the two files are not the same, uh, as far as hash values, that doesn't mean this is not correct. That's why they are not going to error it out. What they are trying to say here is that maybe you have two files, one in binary and one in text format. So obviously they are not going to be the same, but as long as the difference between the two files is the same, that means I can certify that this binary file versus the text file are identical, even though the content byte by byte is different. So notice it will do the hash value. That means the first file minus the second file gave us this 32-bit integer, 1, 6, 8, 4, 6, blah, blah, blah. So what does that mean again for us? That means if I pass the hash value in the compare function, and I'm going to write it down here in Notepad so I don't forget it. So I'm going to open up Notepad. Let's go here, for instance, after hello, and I'll say 168, because I cannot copy it from right there. So 16846 uh seven six six nine two okay let's go ahead and take this uh, into the clipboard and i'm gonna actually uh delete it from like now and, and bring it back all right perfect so now let's go back to the code so guess what happens if i say good morning text versus the good morning uh two dot text and i will enter a third value which is the hash value like that okay what am I saying? What I'm saying is that if you compare these two files, knowing very well they are not the same, so the bytes will be different, but if the hash value between them is this, I want you to pass that test. That means I'm certifying that the difference between them is expected and I would like to pass that test. Let's go ahead and run it again. We'll say run this routine 
And you'll be shocked probably to know that these two files, even though one is 12 bytes, one is 18 bytes, because I have this hash value, it will pass. And how cool is that? We are in the green. And notice there is nothing that even being locked out because everything passed. There will nothing. The compare does not uh, type anything in the log message. Uh, check method will do. That will will something will will put something that says they are identical. But compare doesn't. It will just say in the green this passed. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. So be careful that the compare here with a hash value. You can make two files that are not the same still pass the compare by by adding this hash value inside of there. All right, let me complicate things a little bit. <laughs> All righty. I'm going to go back to file number two. All right. And I'm going to delete the hello and the space as well. And I'm going to say file save. What did I just do, folks? I just made the two files identical again. My question to you is, what happens if I run this file, uh, this check on my file again? What I'm saying is that uh, these two files, if the hash value between them is this number, it's not zero, it's not identical, I want you to pass the test. So my question to you is, what will happen now that the two files are identical and I'm, I'm going to run this function? Can you think about that for a second? I don't know how many of you know about checksum. This was implemented in a university here in the United States a long time ago. And it, it, uh, it was used in uh, military in the U.S. for a long time. And then it got hacked into, so they don't use this anymore for the military. But anyway, the idea here is that you will be shocked about the answer. Most people will say, of course, when they do this minus this, it should be zero. So this number will cause this to fail. And the answer for that is no. This will pass and will succeed 100%. Let me give you a second in here to wait for this to finish. And look at that. It's in the green and the files are the same. Are you confused yet? <laughs> Let me tell you how checksum works, folks. When you compare two files, if these two files are identical, it doesn't even get to the point where it needs to do anything uh, hash-wise. So that means this number can only kick in only if the file compare reports back that these two files are not identical. In our case, these two files are identical. It means I can care less what the hash value is. I don't even get to that step at all. I don't need it. These two files are identical. Nothing can make me fail the compare on the two files. So try to understand that having that number in here doesn't mean that you're going to fail if the two files are identical. That's very important to understand doing files compares as well. All right, let's go ahead and do the third type of checkpoints. And that's the one I believe is most used actually inside of test complete as well and that is a property checkpoint so let's bring the application that we started um, in a previous video remember this is one of the samples called orders orders.exe in here that comes with the samples and what i would like to do is uh, maybe just test something i would like to click on one of the customers inside of this grid let's say for instance uh, steve jones let's double click on that record another window comes up and this window contains a product name a quantity uh, date and all of that stuff. So for instance, let's say I would like test complete to help me identify that for a specific record the customer name inside of the text box The value of the text inside of that white text box. It should say Steve Jones at all time Do I need a checkpoint to do that? Probably not. You just need to create probably um, a Python function and you're gonna have to do the if statement and you're gonna check for that object by itself and find out that the W text value inside of that. So there is some work to be done. You'll have to write maybe a few lines of code in Python. And one of the things that Test Complete does, it actually will allow you to do all that without writing any code whatsoever. So they know exactly how to do a checkpoint for any property on any object. So what would be the object in this case? The, the, in this case, it will be the white text box, which will be probably the customer name text box. That is the object. That means that object will contain, let's say, 20 or 30 different properties. It all depends, of course, which framework this application was used for. Was it .NET, in like in C Sharp, or C++, or Java, or whatever application running on Windows at this point. In our case in here, it would be .NET, C Sharp, which is fine. It's not that big of a deal. But I need to get to one of the properties, maybe the 20 or 30 properties for that text box. And that property, like we've seen before, is called W text. That will contain the entire value Steve Jones inside of that text box. So let's go ahead and do it. I'm going to cancel this for right now, go back to test complete. And what I would like to do is to create another um, function. We'll say define and we'll create a check my property. All righty. 
and then we'll open and close parentheses, put the colon, and now we can go ahead and uh, ask Test Complete to install, to, to, to put in all the Python code for me. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, let me bring in the uh, Steve Jones, double click on it to bring up the dialog up, and then I'm gonna go back to Test Complete and I'll say create a wizard for one of the checkpoints, the plus sign with the check mark at the top. Let's click on that. And then we will take a look in here. And the first one is, like I said, this is the most popular one that most people will use. Uh, we'll say text or property. We'll click on this one. And that will actually take us to a window that will allow us to drag and drop the object spine like we did before. And if that object is not on the screen yet, we can actually do the point and press, which will contain the shift control A on the keyboard. And it will take whatever object is behind the mouse at that point. Does that make sense? Let's go ahead and click on this and once I start dragging, test complete will go away and hopefully we will wait till we see a red rectangle on the object that we're interested in. I just actually started uh, this morning test complete. This is the first time I do it. So uh, now the engine of test complete is running in the background and then it is. Usually you're not going to see the five or six seconds um, uh, if you start using test complete. But uh, when you start a test complete, sometimes it takes the first time you do an object spy, the engine have to be started. So you'll have to wait five seconds or so, but that's not the case once you have it at least once uh, done. And notice I can move from one uh, component, one object, to the other and as soon as you see a red rectangle that means it recognizes that object now i can release the mouse on this text box let's go ahead and release it and now test complete will come back up again and now the engine is trying to recognize what that object is in memory okay and there it is it even made um, a name mapping for it so now it's aliases and the order is the application itself the process order form um, is the new form. This is not the main form. Remember, we used to have orders.main form, but now there is a second form that have the specific details for Steve Jones, for instance. And then there would be a group, and then inside of the group, there would be multiple components like customer name and product and quantity and all that stuff. So this is the correct one. Also, the wizard will take a screenshot of the text box, which is the object that we're interested in. Don't worry about too much about this because this is uh, just for cosmetics. This is just to document this, but it will have nothing to do with the test itself. Okay, so you can ignore the fact that there is a screenshot taken of that object. All right, I'm going to go ahead and say next. And now something very interesting is going to happen. And this is uh, whether you're using .NET or Java or Ruby on Rails or WPF or whatever kind of framework you decided to use C++, uh, uh, Qt, there are so many different frameworks that your R&D team could have used. And all of them, Test Complete uh, definitely is aware of them. And uh, usually, like I said, that text box have about 20 or 30 different properties. But notice I don't have 20 or 30 different properties in here. Uh, Test Complete decided to show you only the most used properties that they expect from a text box. So they have something in a template internal to test complete that knows what a text box, what a button, what a combo box, a drop down, all of these things. What are the most used properties? And these are enabled window caption, W selection, and W text. I will say 99% of the time it will be W text for a text box. But let's say, for instance, you're looking, for instance, uh, for the value of left or right or top or, uh, or bottom or one of the properties that are not in here. How do I get to one that is not so popular? Notice at the bottom here it says more properties. It means this is not what I'm after. Show me everything. So if you click on more properties, now it will show you all the 20 or 30 different properties for the text box. And that's amazing. The background color, the auto size, true or false everything that is coming in uh, it will be able to show you that stuff um, automatically but in our case notice that uh, basic is more than enough for me because wtex is the way i want and wtex has a condition and the condition could be equal not equal contains uh, greater than all of these things could be part of the condition and then the value right now says steve job no, steve job steve jones <laughs> all right that's an apple reference right there and then in the category that's an extended property and we'll say select that's fine so if you're happy with this information we'll say finish and you'll notice like always Test complete will even save you from having to write the line of code yourself in Python. It will create that line for you right there. So I'm going to say copy to the clipboard, and then I'm going to go inside of my function that I created and we'll paste that line of code. All right. And it says AQ object. And sometimes people ask, what is this AQ thing? All right. 
um, a lot of people expecting this to be called TC object for test complete. But remember, the product has been available for 22 years. And when the company started, when this product was, was launched 22 years ago, uh, actually, it was not called test complete. Actually, it used to be called automated QA. That's the name of the product. But they didn't change the source code. That will not make sense to actually change the entire source code because the company got bought or something like that. So when you say AQ, try to understand that this is the uh, the two letters from the previous name of the product, automated QA. But again, it is test complete now for over 15 years. So we're all good. All right, so that the AQ object will do a check property and now it's going live after the customer property uh, as the, the customer object inside of the application. And it's going to look for a property called W text and the condition is compare equal and the value is Steve Jones. So my question to you is where in the store do we have the property? Uh, only before like I did the image compare in the regions and then the file compare. Shouldn't there be a property uh, in here or properties or something like that? But there isn't. Uh, and try to understand that only for properties, we do not need to store anything inside of the test complete project. The reason for that is that line of code contains everything it needs. It contains the left side, the right side and the condition in the middle. So there is no reason to save anything. I'm telling you that the object is called customer, the property is W text, the value is Steve Jones, and it needs to be equal to that so that you don't need to save anything. The line of code has everything. Make sense? If I run this right now, we'll say run this routine, for instance, it will take a couple of seconds and you will see that this will work with no problem and it will pass because Steve Jones will be in there. There you go, it's checking it out. And then when it comes back, we'll be in a good shape and it will say, yeah, it's in the green check mark right there. And it will come and say the property checkpoint pass W text equal case sensitive Steve Jones. And even at the bottom in the detail, it will give you the object name, the property that you're after, the condition, and then the actual value that came back and the expected value that is available in the code Steve Jones. That's why we uh, passed it with a green check mark will be good. All right, let's go ahead and do something to make it go bad. I'm going to come in here and we'll come and put a space, for instance, and we'll put a two in here. And I don't need to save or anything because it will get it live. So I just need to change the name somehow inside of the text box. Let's go back to the checkpoint. Let's run it again and let's see what kind of problems we're going to get this time. So right now it will take a little bit longer because now it found out a problem and it has to write out the full error inside of the XML file for the logs that we see here. And hopefully this will be a red X on the side in here as well. There you go. It's a red X. It did not pass that specific uh, uh, checkpoint. And if you take a look at actually the error itself, it will tell you the object is customer, the property was W text, the condition was equal with case sensitivity, the actual value that came in from the live object is Steve Jones too, but the expected value is Steve Jones and that's why test complete failed that property checkpoint. Does that make sense? It's actually very, very easy to use. Uh, you can do this on all your um, your object on a specific screen like the order screen or the uh, any input or data input screen will save you a lot of time so when you run your test at midnight it will tell you that if anything changed uh, that you need to be aware of maybe you can uh, recommend that as a bug or you bring it up in a meeting with R&D to find out what is going on exactly or this is something that you'll need to update your current tests based on that going forward make sense all right, this one coming up in this video is the table checkpoint. And I know the word table makes everybody think it's about a database and actually it's a little bit confusing. It should not have been called table checkpoint. It should have been called grid checkpoint. Let me give you an example of what's going on in here. Let me close this down. Take a look at the grid on this screen, for instance. And this could be actually coming in from a Java framework like Swing or .NET or C++ or Qt. So many uh, framework, of course, have their own grid. And there are huge third-party market for grids as well. So let's say, for instance, in this grid, I would like to, uh, to recognize the object on the third row or third column. It says Susan McLaren. How can I use the object spy to identify only the text box inside of this grid? Let's give it a shot. I'm going to go ahead and click on the object spy all the way at the top. That will end up minimizing test complete here in a second. All right. And then let me move this a little bit to the side. I'm going to use the object spy, drag it. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and wait on top of the Susan McLaren text box. And I can wait here another hour and nothing is going to happen. 
And you might be very annoyed by that, saying, okay, how come it does not see any of the text boxes or a specific cell in the grid? There is only one red uh, rectangle, as you can see, around the entire grid. And that happens a lot in a lot of different frameworks. Again, Java, .NET, C++, they all do the same thing. So now we have a problem. Now I actually uh, cannot find the value of a specific cell. I cannot do a property, for instance, on one of the cells inside of one of the columns and the rows inside of that grid. So what's going on in here, folks? Let me go ahead and get rid of this for right now. We'll say close this guy. Thank you very much. And I just want to give you a small lesson about how grids work in Windows applications, okay? This is not an issue for the web, uh, because in the web, you will end up getting an HTML table, for instance, and each row and each column will have its own markup. So this is not an issue for the web, most likely, okay? Unless they're using something like an ActiveX control, which is uh, not happening nowadays. Uh, people moved on from that technology already, alrighty? So what's going on in here? Well... Uh, this actually started with Excel, to be honest with you, having columns and rows. So you'll have to ask yourself, what happens if I have like 100 columns and 10,000 rows in here? Okay, there is a possibility. There are some Excel spreadsheets that do that. So the fact if I have 100 columns and 10,000 rows and I'm trying to display this on the screen, that will literally take several minutes for that grid to display this information. And you will actually get to the point where um, it's going very slow. You will see it filling in every row and then going to the next record and the next record. It gets very slowly and it can actually fill up your entire memory as well. So they don't do that anymore. And that's for, uh, for a couple of decades now. Okay. So what they end up doing, they do something in Windows called bit blitting. What is bit blitting? This is an API in Windows itself. That means they are going to um, draw all the columns and rows, all the cell values outside of the screen, not on the screen at all. And then they're going to almost like take a screenshot of what it's supposed to be and bit blit it in the grid itself. So in reality, folks, what I'm looking at right now, it it's the closest thing possible to pretty much an image, <laughs> right? So it is not real. There is no objects whatsoever. Otherwise, you can multiply the number of columns with the number of rows and you will end up, we probably have to create almost like 10,000 different objects in memory just to display this. And that will not be feasible memory-wise or speed-wise for any product, especially for Excel. They need it to be very, very fast. So this, what you're looking at here is a facade. And what they do, something is very clever, is that when you click on one of the rows, they will actually only um, instantiate the row value. So uh, you can double click on it and that will cause a click that will actually bring in that specific record into memory at this point, but not everything else in the grid. All right, I know maybe this is too much information, but that's a background class on, on how grids work. And that, uh, whether you're getting a third party company, for instance, like uh, Telerik or uh, Component One or uh, Sync Fusion, there are so many very famous companies out there that they make very good grids for Windows application that you can include um, in your application as well. Does that make sense? All right, so what does Test Complete do for us to help us out with this? What they ended up doing, they actually created something called the table checkpoint. And again, table here really means grids, all right? It doesn't mean anything else, all right? So let's go ahead and give it a shot. I'm going to go back here to the end of this line and let's go ahead and create a brand new function. We'll say define and we'll say check my grid, okay? And open and close parentheses. And right now, I would like to use the same wizard again instead of me writing the code myself. Let it do it for you. We click on the plus sign at the top in the editor. And if you take a look at this, it's called, it used to be called just table, but a lot of people did not realize table means grid. So they now they say table or grid. They actually both mean the same thing. So I'm going to click on that. And now the system is going to ask me, please use the object spy to point me to a grid. Okay. So I'm going to start doing that. Let's go ahead and start dragging. Test complete will minimize itself. <coughs> And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to wait for the red rectangle on the entire grid. And I'm going to release the mouse. All right, so far, so good. Hopefully now Test Complete will recognize the object. So far, it is just an object. Test Complete does not know yet that this is a, a grid. It just takes a screenshot of the entire grid and we're good at this point. All right, great. Now what happens when I click on Next? All right, well, this is the million dollar question. Will Test Complete recognize this grid as one of the grids that it supports? Because 
Test Complete cannot support any grid ever made in the world, uh, especially if your company have created their own grid called My Grid that you implemented it completely yourself. We might not know how to actually traverse the columns and the, and the rows. So reality is that there are 13 grids that Test Complete have been uh, educated to learn how to do um, cell recognition inside of these grids. And I'll show you how to find out what are these 13 grids as well. One of them is the Microsoft Grid View, which comes in automatically part of the VCL of the C Sharp uh, and so on. So this is, so if I click next in here, I have two options. One of them is to get an error. <laughs> the error is I don't recognize this grid. You're gonna get an error and, and Test Complete has no clue what you're, what you're pointing at. This is not a grid that Test Complete supports. In our case in here, this will succeed because this is one of the grids coming in from Microsoft that Test Complete knows about. There's a grid also coming from Java for Swing, there's one from Qt, there's one from uh, Borland Delphi, for instance, and so on and so forth that you can actually do. All right, let's go ahead and say next and let's see if it will succeed. And it comes back and it said, yep, I know exactly what grid that is. And I was able to dissect the entire thing. So now I can see that we have a customer name, product quantity. It, were read, it read all the different columns in that grid. And it gives you a chance now to decide which ones of these are important for you to know that they have not changed values. So all of them by default will be stored and that will be stored in the stores here on the left side in the, in the project itself. But sometimes we have... Uh, columns, for instance, that says last modified or uh, first modified or something. And these usually you want to turn them off because these can care, we can care less what the value of the date and time inside of there. So we don't want to fail every time somebody touches one of these columns. So, But for right now, these are all good ones. I'm going to leave them all stored. There is another column here called keys. And keys in here usually works on an identifier. Sometimes you will have an ID that is a GUID or an integer or something like that. And that, if one of those, I don't have any of those in this specific one, but usually we, we will have the first one called ID, for instance. And you will make that one the key. And, oops, <laughs> I pushed actually the, uh, the escape key by mistake. So let me bring it up again. We'll say table grip. I'll do it really quickly. All right, let's move it on the side. Grab this guy, recognize it, um, and we'll bring it back. All right. So what I'm saying was when you say next on this guy and it will recognize everything, the key will allow you that even if something gets inserted before a specific record, it will not fail because it will know by ID that it moves down, but it's still the same record will still be okay. Otherwise, if you don't use any keys, if you, insert, if you have like five records and you insert one all the way at the top, so you don't append at the end, that means all five will fail because they are not in the same place and we don't want to do that. Keys will actually make sure that even if something got inserted in the middle or at the top, it will still work for all the other records as well. Make sense? It also will tell you that there are eight records inside of this grid. And if you'd like to see the records, you can click on the preview tab in here. And these are all the different values, including Susan and Charles and Steve, like we've seen before. Now I can save that object inside of the stores itself and you can call it whatever you want. By default, it will be called with the name of the grid itself, which is orders view. And that's good enough for me. We'll accept that and we'll say finish. And notice tables got created right here. See that on the, in the stores on the left side and the code will be created in Python for you. I'll say copy that and we'll go into the code and we'll say control V for pasting. And the name of the object is tables. That's a keyword inside of the test complete language at this point. Orders view is the name of the object and we'll say dot check. So it's interesting to find out what got saved exactly in the table store. So let's go ahead and open up the tables and there is my orders view for this specific grid. Let's double click on it and you will notice all the columns and rows are right there. And that will be the snapshot of the good data that you're certifying saying that this grid, no matter when I bring it up, it will always have these values inside of it. If something uh, uh, you know is not going to be the same, you can turn off, for instance, the credit card number for a couple of them, and that will not be checked. So even if these two records change in the credit card number, it will not cause a problem. Does that make sense? But most likely, you're going to leave all of them turned on to check it out. Now, let's go back in here and run this uh, function. We'll say right-click and say run this routine, and we'll take a couple of seconds, and I'm expecting it to succeed 100%. And there we go. It is successful and we're in good shape. All right, let's go ahead and make it fail. Let's go back in here. Let's go ahead and double click, for instance, on Susan McLaren. And I'm going to uh, change Susan McLaren. We'll say Susan McLaren 2. Okay. 
And let's change something else. I'm going to say quantity equals to 2 as well. All right, and we'll say OK. So now notice two different columns um, have changed on the specific record for Susan McLaren, the name and the quantity as well. Let's go ahead now and run this test again and let's see if the system will be able to figure it out by itself on the grid right away. So we'll run that. I'm expecting now it will take a little bit longer, a few more seconds, because it has to write out a failure. An XML log will have to be written out. As you can see here, it's a failure right there. And it will be very nice because it will tell you exactly what the errors that happen in the grid. So you don't have to figure it out. See, all the way at the bottom in here, the value Susan McLaren 2 of the cell in column customer name, or row 2 differs from the store value that should have been Susan McLaren. And also the value 2 of the cell in column quantity, row 2 differs from the stored one uh, as well. Isn't that cool? I can actually even do it on the other side. So your um, your test does not have to change, the, 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 the value coming in does not have to change. You can come in here in the orders view and you can change the value in the good stored value. So I can go to, uh, for instance, Steve Jones and I can change the name here and I click on save and it will still find it. So it doesn't have to be only on one side. Changes on both sides will be figured out and will be reported automatically using a checkpoint. And notice we just copied and pasted a line of code in Python. We did not have to write that code ourselves, but it's pretty easy as well. Make sense? And for this chapter, I want to do one more checkpoint with you. There are more checkpoints that we will take care of when we get to the web testing and the SOAP testing and so on. But for this specific chapter, chapters, we did the region, we did the files, we did the properties, we did the tables. And there is one more I wanted to show you how to do a checkpoint on a database. And that could be Microsoft SQL Server, it could be PostgreSQL, it could be MySQL, Oracle. Uh, you name it. Anything that will actually you can have a driver for running on your machine for Windows, you will be able to do a checkpoint using that database. And that can be very, very handy. Heavily used in test complete as well. Alrighty. So how do I do that? Let's go ahead and create our final function for this uh, chapter. We'll say define and we'll say check my database. All right. And inside of there, I'm going to click on the plus sign at the top. To help you create that and notice one of them is called database right there let's go ahead and click on that and this is a little bit different this one will require what we call a connection string so usually R&D will give you access to the configuration files for their database so you can copy and paste this very long and ugly line that's called a connection string that contains the provider the, the driver the name of the database, the username and the password, and any other properties you would like to pass for the connection string. So usually you do not want to write that on your own because you can make mistakes uh, in, the, um, in the typos uh, for that. So usually you're going to copy that from a, a configuration file that R&D gives you access to. Alrighty, so in here, for instance, we'll go ahead and give it a name. We'll call it, for instance, uh, my connection. All right, you can call it anything you want, of course. You can give it a description if you like. All of these are good, but the most important one is the connection string line. So you can paste it right in here. And a lot of times you do not have access to these configuration files. So you'll have to do the connection yourself. So instead of trying to give it a shot and try to type this very long, ugly line, um, there is the ellipsis button in here. What this ellipsis button will do when you click on it, it will actually make an API call into Windows and it will request the... Uh, the, the connection dialog from Windows control panel to pop up. So when I click on that, this is not a test complete that is going on right now. It happened on a different monitor. Let me bring it in here. This dialog that you're looking at, this is not a test complete dialog. This is a data link properties coming in from Windows. And you will probably have different drivers than what I have. For instance, I have some things like ODBC drivers, Microsoft SQL Server, .NET Client, and all that stuff. Maybe if you have Oracle, you will have Oracle in here. If you have MySQL, you will have lines that say providers for OLADB for MySQL or Postgres. Alrighty? So don't worry if you don't have the same uh, amount or the same uh, kind of uh, drivers that I have here for these providers. So in my case in here, I would like to go to the one at the bottom here called SQL Server Native Client. I'm going to click on that. And that is a .NET driver written for Microsoft SQL Server, which I have installed on my machine. All right, I'm going to go ahead and say OK there. And then the control panel. Oops, what did I do? Sorry. 
<laughs> didn't need to do that let me bring it back up again all right so we are okay so we started at the provider i shouldn't say okay i should say next <laughs> all right so we'll go ahead and click on this guy and we'll say next all right and now we get to choose what the ip address or the domain name where the database is at so you'll put your ip address in here for instance whatever machine has the database or maybe it's on the local network or something like that in my case in here this is local so i can actually use 127.0.0.1 which is a local host or i can say the word local host or i can say local all of them will work so it's definitely up to you so we'll say local in here for instance but in my case in here there is a very something very special about what i'm doing so let me go ahead and open up for instance this is the Microsoft um, uh, SQL Server Management Studio. It's a tool that if you're working with databases, you're probably going to be uh, installing that separately so you can actually manage your databases. So uh, I have a, a specific instance called SQL Express. This dot that you see all the way in the beginning there, that means localhost. So you can put the word localhost or local backslash SQL Express to get to that specific instance. But for brevity, a lot of people just put a dot. Dot means localhost. And under databases in here, folks, I have a lot of databases. I created one just for testing called Test Complete. And if I right click on it, let me go ahead and open up Test Complete. I have a couple of tables I've created, one called uh, DBO Personal and one is called Info. So I have, for instance, both of them open right now. The personal have only two records in it, an ID, a first name, last name, and an email address and the info will contain some id name street city state it doesn't really matter we're going to choose the personal for instance to find out if we can work with that sounds good knowing that there are two records inside of there so i'm going to minimize this and now this is not enough i will need to give you the instance as well so we'll put a dot backslash sql express all right dot is the local host or the ip address backslash and the instance i'm going after for the server is called sql express all right would you like to put the username and password in here or would you like to use the windows mt integrated security i'm going to use the windows mt because i'm already logged in uh, if these two are correct now when you go to the selected database you should see all the databases up oh, succeeded but database information could not be retrieved okay let me find out why that is maybe i made a mistake Huh? my bad i went and looked and the uh, the browser was uh, the agent for the browser was turned off so i just turned it back on in sql server so now when i come in here i bring up and now i can see all my databases on this machine live from sql express all right i'm going to go to test complete let's click on that i can test the connection let's click on that and it's successful so everything i entered in here is correct and it helped me a lot i didn't have to write that ugly line myself the good news is when i say okay at this point now the control panel in windows will take all this information and will create the connection string for me so i don't have to do it so we'll say okay and poof that is the ugly line i was talking to you about it has to say provider equals sql nci cli 11.1 .1, integrated security sspi and then there is a lot of other stuff that you will need to enter in here as well make sense all right i'm going to say next and now it's going to open up the connection and if it's successful it will show you okay i found two tables in that database one is called personal one is called info i don't have to just choose one of those i can actually click on a view it doesn't have to be a table it could be a view in the database or i can actually create my own custom query so i can come in here with say select star from uh, personal Alrighty, and I can actually enter a where clause with an order by, and I can do inner joins, outer joins. You can do whatever you want. If you're not a SQL person and you have never seen that stuff before, the designer in Test Complete can help you out as well. So let me remove this from here, and I'm going to click on Design, and then a designer will pop up on the screen directly from Test Complete to help you with that. These are the two tables. I can drag personal here into the Canvas service and I will actually see all the different fields. Maybe I'm on, only interested in uh, ID, first name, and last name. Notice the SQL statement gets created for you automatically. In my case, I wanna say everything. Let's click on the star, and then it will have select every single one of the uh, column inside of this database and from the DBO personal. All right, if there is a relationship between the tables, I can bring in info here as well and if they have an id for instance i can actually join these two ids together so i can actually click on star and this id i can actually hook it up to this id so now i can do an inner join between the two based on the id field in both tables 
I'm not going to do that for right now, but you can tell that even if you don't know SQL, this designer will help you create the correct SQL statement if you want to. Does that make sense? So let's go back to table and I will choose my personal table in here. Alrighty. And I'll say next. And now it's opening up that table and it will found out that I have four columns, ID, first name, last name, and an email. Same thing like we did with the grid before. I can store the ones that I'm interested in. I can even make key in here to be the ID, which is a great idea as well. If I would like to see the data, let's go ahead and click on preview. And these are the only two records inside of there, okay, for Lino and Tim. All right, let's go ahead and say finish. And it will even write the line of code for you right there and we'll say copy. And I'm going to go ahead and do a control V and I'm going to get my, so there's a difference. See, the grid one is called tables, but the database one is called DB tables. So don't get confused. That's why I wish the grid ones was called grids, not tables, because it's more accurate. But again, the database one is a DB tables object. And then you give it the name of the correction and then it will be a check. Let's go ahead and write this uh, to make sure that it will be successful 100%. And yes, as you can see, the database table checkpoint, my connection passed. If you'd like to see what got stored exactly, go to the DB tables one right there, open it up. And there is my connection that I created. If you can double click on it, it will look like the one we did with the grid. See the first name, last name, email and ID. And because we chose the ID to be a key, there will be a yellow key here just to remind you that there is a key on the ID for this one as well. Isn't that great? So let's go ahead and make a change in one of them so that we can actually make it fail. Let's go to Tim, for instance, and let's say instead of Boo, let's uh, double click on the uh, um, on the Boo and we'll be Foo. <laughs> all right, we'll say Foo.com. All right, don't forget to save. It has to be saved because that will have to be persisted into the project itself in XML format inside of the store in here. All right, let's go back to the checkpoint. Let's run the database checkpoint again. When I run this, what exactly is happening behind the scene? This code right now is going live to the database, finding out a, a table called personal and it's getting all the records and it's comparing it to where I have all my store here for my connection. And it's going to fail. As you can see, it's a red X right there. So it's going to fail. It's going to tell me exactly why it's not passing this. So if you read in here, the email field of row one, remember row zero is the first record. Row one was the second record. Contains a value tim at boo.com that differs from the stored one tim at foo.com as well. And it will do it on both sides. Whether the changes happen in the database or the changes happen in the store, it will figure it out and it will tell you exactly what's happening between the two. Does that make sense? It's very easy to do checkpoints and it gets used heavily inside of Test Complete. And I hope that you can start using uh, these uh, checkpoints, whether it's properties or databases or grids to make your life easier for Windows application and for also for the web as well. All right, let's start a brand new chapter, which is data driven testing, something probably the most used feature inside of Test Complete. Very, very powerful and probably the easiest product on the market for uh, functional testing that will allow you to use data driven testing. You'll be amazed on uh, what it would take to actually be able to use outside data to feed it, to feed in your testing for data entry and so on. Extremely easy in Test Complete. So to start, let's go ahead and create a brand new uh, script file in here. And this one we'll call it data driven testing. Okay, you can call it anything you want, of course, like usual. And inside of this file, I would like to create, um, um, let's go ahead and let, for instance, the recorder do something for us on this first video. I just want to go ahead and open up the same sample application that we have used before. And I would like to create a brand new record inside of this grid. So let's go ahead and go for it. I'm going to click on the recorder and just make sure that it's not using keyword test. It's using the Python script right there. So we we'll click on the record script that will minimize test complete. And the first thing it will do, first of all, it will ask you, hey, I found out that you have five different units. Which one do you want me to record in? So I'm going to say use the data driven testing right there. Or I can actually start a brand new unit of testing if I want to with using the new, the new item. I'm going to say OK on the data driven testing and now test complete will minimize itself. And now I can actually start recording here in a second. Excellent. So how do I do that? Well, if I click on orders, that is automatically got recorded. And now I'm going to click on the sub menu called new order. Let's click on that. That's also got recorded, by the way. And now I can actually change the product, the quantity, do whatever I want in here. I'm going to click inside of the customer name that click got recorded as well. And I'm going to say, for instance, Lino. Tadros, that's the name of 
uh, the customer and now I can actually click in street or I can push the tab key both of them will move me to uh, to the next text box so I'm going to click right inside of there that got recorded as well and in the street will say one two three street for instance that's good enough for me I'm going to click again that gets recorded again and will say I'm actually in Orlando today in Florida and the state will be FL for Florida zip code will say 32123 is fine with me and then we get to choose from the radio button which credit card do I want I'll leave it as visa and the credit card number will say 4123456789 that is my credit card number sounds good and I can change of course the expiration date and everything else I'm going to say OK and that record got added to our grid so everything looks good all right let's go ahead and say stop and let's see what test complete is going to do for us in Python at this point I am hoping that it will create a new function called uh, define the test one for the function also the test visualizer has been turned on so you can actually take a look at all the images for every single action I did so you're pretty much looking like a video so you can move to the right and see every single action you've taken during the session is right there okay uh, let me minimize this for right now so I can concentrate on the code and now we can see in the test one a lot of things got recorded in here so it's important for us in this first video to just understand what test complete did uh, first of all first of all it uses the aliasing automatically that means name mapping happened behind the, the scenes right away and it actually using a process called orders that's the executable that's the name of the application and then it noticed that I've actually clicked twice once inside of the menu where it says uh, new order for instance or orders and then when it opened up the pop-up for the menu I clicked on new order but you will not see two different lines here in test complete they will do both in one line and that's called piping see that pipeline symbol right there this is the pipe symbol right here by the way so what it did is, is orders.main form that's the main form uh, inside of uh, the application for orders and then the main menu.click and instead of just saying orders and then create another line to actually get into the pop-up and say new order if you put a pipe like this in test complete and that will work for .NET for Java for C++ they all work the same way you can actually put the name of the main menu and then pipe and then put the sub menu that you'd like to get to as well and the nice thing you will learn that by just using the recorder the recorder will do that for you but if you ever want to write code in python to get into sub menus use exactly the same style the main menu pipe and then the sub menu but the sub menu has to be identical you will notice for instance in the application it doesn't say just new order it says new order dot 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 you have to enter the dot 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 as well otherwise it will not recognize you see if i go back to orders it says new order dot 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 so you'll have to remember that otherwise it will not find it all right and after that it will actually take a handle will create a variable that is pointing to the order form that popped up and then inside of there there is a group and the group is a combination of multiple controls like the customer the street the city they're all in the same group so I will go to the customer and then remember when I moved from one cell to the other inside of that dialogue I had to click and I told you also you can tab is this important for us these line that says click 1811 this is something that test complete had to record because I did this I did click inside of there to give it focus but I actually don't need it most people will leave it alone will not touch anything and it will just be an excellent test and it will work but I personally do not like to leave anything in my Python code that is useless and this is useless okay the reason for that is if I want to enter the words Lino Tadros for instance in the text box I'm already using the object and I'm setting the text that doesn't that doesn't require me to have to have focus on that text box because set text will write Lino Tadros in the text box even if there was no focus on it but of course visually I had no choice I had to click so that's why I just want to make sure you understand sometimes the recorder will do something that you would like to delete because it is useless so I'm going to delete this line and every time I will see something that has to do with clicking I will always try to move away from it as well what happens folks if I go to one of them and instead of saying click uh, 21 7 which is the x and y coordinates inside of the text box let me go ahead and do this would that work do you think if I leave the code like this by saying textbox.click I'm not telling it where to click so you also have to remember how test complete works if you do not give me the x and y co coordinates of where I should click inside of this text box uh, that means empty means you're telling test uh, test complete 
in this test box, go ahead and find out what's the width and height and click right in the middle. So if I was having, for instance, let's say 200 pixels is the width of the text box and 100 pixel is the, is the height, it will click at 150. So right in the middle pixel of that. So that's what it means by leaving it completely empty. All right. You're more than welcome to uh, leave it as is or remove the pixels or just remove the line altogether. It will not mean anything for us whatsoever. All right. Let's go ahead and remove all the different clicks so that our code gets a little bit tighter and it will work exactly the same way. Like I said, it will not make any difference in the execution of that test. All right. So it will enter, enter uh, the Lino Tadros, the 123 Street, the Orlando, all that stuff, all the way to the credit card number, all right? And then at the end, it will click the button to say OK, and then everything else will, uh, will be taken care of uh, by entering this into the grid. All right, so let me, let me find out if this will actually really work or not. Let me go ahead back to the application. I'd like to delete this record, the Lino Tadros record. We'll say delete the order. Yes. And what I would like to do now is to run this test. And if, I'm, if test one is successful, I should see Lino Tadros in the grid anyway. So let's right click in here and say run this routine and give it a few seconds. And hopefully uh, we will end up with a brand new record. See, it's doing all the stuff automatically. And now it's going to be in the green. And this will be a successful test. We'll give it a second here to finish. And there it is. It's a green uh, check mark. It's a successful test. And it will come in here and will show us everything got created perfectly for me uh, one at a time inside of the test log itself. And if I go back to the application itself, you will notice that uh, Lino Tadros has been added to the end of the grid. So the test is successful. All right. And now in this video, we'll start doing some data driven testing on the uh, on the uh, video that we actually did right before this one, just to test a uh, record a testing scenario. The one that added the Lino Tadros here to the end of the grid. So if I open up the code for data driven testing again, you will notice that the main idea here is that I hard coded all the values for Lino Tadros, 123 Street, Orlando. So let's say I want to actually maybe enter 50 or 60 records to test with. I'm not going to copy and paste test one and create 50 different tests and just go ahead and change the values inside of it. Of course, you can do that, but it's a waste of time. What I would love to do is actually use the test one as is but actually change it a little bit. So instead of hard coding the value for Lino Tadros or 123 Street, I want it to feed it automatically these values from maybe a comma delimited file or an Excel spreadsheet or a database. That would be great and it will save you a lot of time as well. So let's go ahead and start with this video. We'll do the CSV one, which is the comma delimited files to see how it works. So let me open up something like Notepad or WordPad or whatever you want. Let me make this a little bit smaller on the screen. And I would like to create a couple of records just to show you how you will create a CSV file that you can actually use. So the first line usually is the header. So we'll say, for instance, name, uh, comma, and we'll say address, comma, we'll say city, comma, state, comma, zip. And we will also have a credit card, right? Credit card. All right, so there, is, there are five different uh, commas and six different fields in here. Once you push enter, you can have one, two, or a thousand different lines. As long as all of them have five commas inside of it, of each line, that would be a legal CSV file. You cannot actually have the first line having five commas and any of the lines after that with less or more than five, that would be an illegal CSV file. So you have to be very careful with that, okay? So I'm going to come in here with, say, Lino, for instance, comma, and we'll say one, two, three, street. And then we'll say Orlando, comma, and we'll say Florida, and we'll say three, one, two, three, four, and we'll put some numbers in here for the credit card. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see them all on one line. And then I'll create only one more record, and we'll say, for instance, uh, Joe, okay, and we'll say four, five, six, drive, and we'll say New York. New York is the state, and this will be 10021 or something like that, <laughs> alrighty. And then we put a master card like, like this, for instance, okay? That's good enough. Um, and you can keep going. I'm just going to keep it two in here just to make sense of the whole thing, but you can have two, three, ten, a hundred different records. As long as all of them have five commas, we'll be in good shape. All right, let's go ahead and say file, save as, and I'm going to go ahead and save this file somewhere on my hard drive. We'll leave it under documents is fine with me and we'll call this one we'll call it um, course data okay course data does it have to be a .csv file 
test complete doesn't care so you can leave it as a dot text file most likely so that you can make sense of the file especially for the, the rest of the team members that you have on your team try to always call it csv in here uh, but test complete doesn't care this could be course data.foo as the extension and it will still work all right so i'm going to leave it as a csv we'll say go for it right there and now I'm going to minimize this. Maybe I need to change it later. I'm going to keep it uh, open, but I'll minimize it. And I would like to make changes to this uh, test one that I've already recorded. Instead of having hard-coded Lino Tadros and 123 Street, I wanted to get it from the, uh, the CSV file itself. So how do we do that? Very easy in test complete. First of all, you're going to create another function um, above this one or below it or even in a different file. It doesn't matter. And this one, you can call it anything you want. We'll call it drive my function alrighty again this is just the name that I'm gonna call it drive my function and inside of there you're gonna start using a data driven test keyword inside of test complete itself that does pretty much 99% of the heavy lifting of all the work and it's called DDT once you put the word DDT notice it changes to blue that means test complete knows what that is if I put a dot after this, notice I can use a database using an ADO driver, I can use a CSV driver, or I can use an Excel driver. Let's start in this video with the first one, the CSV driver. Very easy. When I use a CSV driver, you will notice inside of it's a method, so it actually takes just the file name. So I need to know what the path and the name of the file that I would like to bring in. All right, let's go back in, uh, in here. I'm going to open up the Explorer one more time because I want to cheat a little bit and find out what is the path. So we'll, uh, we'll open this up. There we go. And I am going to go to the C drive. Let me just come in here and put the C in there. And I'm going to say, go to users and we will use Lino and documents. Documents. There you go. And hopefully we'll get to see, oh no, it's not in here. All right, let me see if I have it under the E drive, maybe. I moved some things. Ah, oh, yeah, there it is. E documents, and we'll say last modified. And there it is. That is our course data. So in reality, if you click all the way at the top, it will tell you exactly where that is. So I'm going to copy that into the clipboard. Just remember that the name of the file is course data.csv. All right, let's minimize this guy. And inside of here, I'm going to be putting a string. So open up the double quotes, and we'll paste the e comment and uh, before I actually close it I will say backslash and we'll say course data dot csv all right and then we'll close this and we're done all right that is my function so I'm going to actually do a little bit of a quiz for you if you take a look at this line based on what you've learned in the previous videos will this work or will this cause a problem for us inside of test complete Think about this for a second, maybe pause the, the video and, uh, and think about it. But in reality, these backslashes are problematic in Python. These are escape characters, so it will not work. So if you, whenever you really need to put a backslash, you really need to put it twice to tell Python, no, this is not a regular escape character. I really mean backslash, so I'm going to be putting it twice in here as well. This line by itself will do so much for you. It's really amazing. The first thing it will do it will open up that file for you automatically and then it will read all the headers and then we will find out how many records you have in there in my case there will be two and then it will position the cursor on the first record it will find all that stuff will be done just by having this line executed isn't that great so the only thing now left is to tell the csv driver that i just pointed to to go ahead and use test one to run it for as many times as i have records in the course data.csv and that's done very easily inside of test complete we'll say ddt dot and then we will say uh, current driver okay that means the driver i just opened um, and then we'll say dot and then we would be able to say drive method. You see this drive method right there? And then it takes a parameter. So usually it's asking for the name of the function. A lot of people will come in here and say test one. Um, and that makes sense why people would do that. All right, that's the name of the function. But don't make the mistake of coming test one and uh, putting uh, an open and close parenthesis because it's in a function. Don't do that. We, we're not calling the function. We just want to point to where it is. That's all. So we do not put the open and close parenthesis. As a matter of fact, you need to be aware also in Python or in any other language that you're using for test complete 
the test one is not enough because they don't have to be in the same unit right now we're lucky because the drive my function and the test one are both in a unit called data driven testing but this could be in a completely different one so this is not enough you have to go right before the name in here and you have to concatenate that with a dot in between of the name of the unit that you're coming from so we'll say data driven testing dot all right so the name of the unit dot the name of the function that you're trying to get to even if it's in the same file so that's why if in the same file people think test one will be enough you'll have to put data sorry data driven testing dot the test one anybody would like to guess what else do i need to do nothing <laughs> this is it this is all the work okay except of course even if i run this uh, function now it will still be hard coded for lino tadros and one two three street and orlando and that's not what we want so we need to go now into test one and remove all my hard coded values i'm going to remove this and i'm going to start using the ddt object the data driven test object we'll say dot and we will find also the current driver and we'll say dot and then we're going to use a function called value so we do the value in here and then in the value notice in python we'll use a bracket and inside of there we'll put uh, one of two things we can put an integer like zero one two and three to specify for instance which column okay so for instance for the name for the customer name i need the first one i put a zero in here and that will work that's the first column in the system and that's going to be very fast as well i don't like this because a, a colleague of yours in the company if they open their code and you can see, they can see ddt.currentdriver.value0 they will have no idea what zero stands for or what column that is or what value or anything like that so even though this will work i encourage you not to put indexes in numbers like this inside of the value so instead come back in here and we'll we'll go ahead and put name that's a much better code and yes zero is faster than putting a name string but remember this is not the speed of the application this is the speed of testing the application it will be running in the middle of the night when you're asleep so even if it takes a few extra millisecond it's not gonna it's not gonna be the end of the world it's not like you're uh, reducing the speed of the application itself but this is more readable code for a tester and the rest of the team as well try to always do it this way all right let me go ahead and uh, steal this line and i'm going to actually duplicate it multiple times let's remove the one two three street from here we'll put a, a ddt and instead of name this will be street street there you go and we'll do it again for orlando let's remove this guy and put the, the same line but this time will be city and then florida for the state let me remove that and we'll put state in here hopefully you understand what i'm doing and now that i'm removing all the hard-coded values and that would be great so hopefully we'll say zip and the final one this one in here will put the credit card we'll say credit card all right let's save this file uh, so another quiz for you what do you think will happen now oops i did not need to do that let me go ahead and put a bracket in here okay good um, oh did i do that for all of them good for me <laughs> all right let me fix all those uh, there you go and there you go all right there you go all righty uh, anybody would like to guess what will happen if i go anywhere instead of test one right click and say run this routine uh, pause the video if you'd like think about it and find out if this will uh, do something or it will cause an error if i do a, a run this routine on test one right now it will run the first few lines until it gets to line number 11 that says ddt.current driver and it will fail it will give you an error saying i don't have a current driver in reality folks if you are going to use ddt this function cannot be run anymore you cannot cause test one to be to be run it has to be driven by something else that means we will have a, we will never right click and say run this routine anymore you will go to the drive my function right click on this one and this is the one that has to be uh, run from that point on and the system will find out from the first line that we have two records or 10 records or 20 records and then when it says drive method it is the responsibility of this ddt object to call test one however many times i have records in the course data.csv in my case i only have two records that means drive method will call test one twice with two different records inside of there does that make sense let's give it a shot and see if it will work i'm going to right click and say run this routine uh, give it a second in here when you'll notice that the application will show up in the front and then it will start entering oops i have made an error let's see what i did i cannot be found in the collection corresponding to the requested name or ordinal all right let me fix that 
All right, I think I called it address, not street. <laughs> All right, I always use street this time for some reason in my notepad in here. I called it address. Ah, yes, it has address. You see, so that's the errors you're going to get if you misspell or you use a different name for one of the columns itself. So let me go back in here. We'll, we'll fix that. Instead of street, we'll say address. All right, let me do this and we'll save everything and we'll come back and run it one more time. But at this time, let me also go to the app, make sure we cancel this. We do not want to do it anymore. I can even delete the Lino Tadros. I don't want that anymore. That's fine. All right, let's go ahead and run it again. We'll say drive my method, run this routine, and we'll wait here and we'll hopefully it will enter two records for me in the application. There is the first one. It's going to say Lino, 123 Street, and then it will do the second one for Joe for New York, and it will be successful, and hopefully it will be in the green, and there you go, it's in the green, and then you will see everything um, on top of each other right there. Let me uh, go ahead and wait to see the whole thing. There we go, we have all of them. But one of the things that you might not like is that I only have two records, but it ended up putting everything at the same level like this. So if I have 100 records, I will end up with probably like almost 800 different lines and I will never know which one starts where and which one the second record starts where. Everything will be at the root in here. So in the next video, I wanna spend some time to tell you how you can clean up your test logs to look much better than the way they're looking right here. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, in this video, I want to spend some time to clean up this uh, this look and feel because I don't want all the records to be at the root of the logs like this. I would like to separate them to make them have organizational level so it can be easy for our team to read the logs. So let's go back into the data-driven testing in here. And there are a couple of uh, objects and a couple of uh, functions and methods available in the DDT as well that I can actually use. So how can I actually do that? Let's go ahead, for instance, uh, let's say right inside of the uh, of the test itself, I'm going to push enter and I would like to write my own line of code. Remember, every time you say the word log dot, you are actually talking about the logs right here, the logs um, that will show up. This is the test result itself. And you'll notice one of the, the methods available on the log object is called append folder. If I double click this guy, it will write me an append folder and it takes a lot of different parameters. It takes a message, it takes a detailed message, it takes a priority, attributes, and an owner folder ID. But the only one that is actually needed is just the first one. Everything else is optional. So if I come in here, for instance, and I say I would like to hard code it to the word Lino, for instance, what exactly does that mean? That means when you start this test, go ahead and create a folder called Lino and anything that comes after this line, all these test results will go in the folder called Lino. But remember, test one will be called multiple times, right? For every single record. That means when it finishes the first record, yes, everything will go under Lino, but the next record will create another folder called Lino, which is a subfolder for the first Lino. They will be inside of each other. And that's not what I want. So one of the things I want to do after I click on the button, I would like to pop the, uh, the log folder back out. So I'm going to say log dot pop log folder and i don't have to pass it anything it will know exactly how to pass it back out to where it came from so remember if you append folder twice and you want to go back to the root that means you have to pop the log folder twice in my case i'm only appending once so the pop will happen only once does that make sense everybody so let me go ahead and run this and show you what it will look like so i'm going to right click in here and say run this routine and the uh, the test log will look much more organized, even though I hard coded it for the word Lino, but that's okay. We'll keep it la like as is, and I'll change that in a minute as well to make it even more meaningful. And there is the second record for Joe in New York. And then that did not affect the test at all. What I've done here has no effect on the test, but it does have an effect on the test results. See, it's in the green still, but I don't have all the different test logs all at the same level. We'll give it another second here to show up after the XML file has been written. And notice here, it's not as many as before, but now I have two folders called Lino. So if I open up the first one, that is everything for the first record. And if I open up the second one, that's everything for the second one as well. Isn't that cool? To that now, let's go back in here. And I don't want to call them or Lino. So what do you think we should actually change this Lino with? So I'm obviously going to not create a folder called Lino in here. But what I will do is maybe I will borrow this line that has the name and we'll copy that. And I'm going to go ahead and put it in the append folder itself. Let's we'll say go ahead and create it this way. Let's go ahead and run it one last time to show you what the append folder have done for us. 
now I have I should have two different folders one's called Lino and one is called Joe and that should be in a pretty good shape here in a second there we go it's in the green that means it was successful and we're going to end up seeing the test result one is called Lino so if one of them has a red X maybe we have a hundred different records that you tried this with all of them are good except one maybe Joe has a red X you can just concentrate on that open up Joe and Joe and, and see exactly what value from the CSV file caused the problem maybe there is a, a Swedish character or you missed a comma or something so you can find out for instance what happened on that record when they are all at the same level it's very difficult when you have hundreds of records to find out where a specific record is this is a much better way of doing that does that make sense all right in this video you want to find out what if we do not want to use a csv file and we'd rather use excel for instance which a lot of companies actually in the industry um, we prefer to use excel because their business analysts are more comfortable with excel than anything else let me go ahead and open up excel here on my machine there we go and i'm going to create a brand new um, uh, worksheet let's go ahead and, uh, and come in here and do the same thing we did with the csv pretty much i'm going to come and say name and then we'll uh, go to the b cells in here and we'll say address okay and then we'll say city uh, state zip and we'll do also cc so instead of saying the word cre credit card like we had before we're just going to call it cc and let me just add a couple of records we'll say for instance uh, kyle in here and we'll say 234 drive and the city will say for instance boston all righty and we'll say the state is massachusetts zip is uh, 12345 is good for enough for me and then the credit card will put for instance an american express number right there is good enough for me all right and then we'll add just one last one we'll say joel for instance in here and we will say 456 drive and we'll put this one in new york new york and 10012 is good enough for me and then we will put a credit a visa credit card number in here doesn't matter and of course i can keep going down uh, but the main difference here um, you can definitely create hundreds if not thousands of different records after that but in uh, in excel it's not enough what the name of the excel um, workbook will be notice at the bottom we can have multiple sheets so if i click for instance here on the sheet i can click plus plus and i can have multiple sheets notice the the information i did is in one of the sheets called sheet one that will be important for us when we do that inside of the python for uh, test complete as well all right let me go ahead and save this file we'll say file save as and i'm going to actually go ahead and give it a name we'll call it for instance uh, course data and um, notice i can save it as an xlsx file which is the new format uh, for the last few years now uh, if some of your teammates are still running an old excel this is not going to work they will have to have the xls file so i always tell people try to make sure uh, if you don't need any of the new features to save always your excel spreadsheet as an xls xls files not xlsx files that doesn't mean that it, the xlsx files will not work it all depends of course which version of test complete they have and which version of office they have installed on their machine and because i'm not using anything special i'm going to go ahead and end up and uh, using this as um, a regular xls it's up to you definitely how to do it all right we'll say save and now that file is being saved remember in notepad i didn't close down notepad i just minimized it so if i minimize excel and leave it running and then go do my thing inside of test complete it will not work folks so there's a big difference between using excel spreadsheets and csv files so you have to be careful about that because excel requires an exclusive lock on the file that means if excel has that file open in excel nobody else can use that file so that means the driver mm -hmm. inside of test complete cannot do it so i have to shut down excel completely or at least close down the worksheet or the workbook for the course data on excel itself i'm going to go ahead and shut down excel all right so let's go now down to my uh, drive my function and instead of using a csv driver i would like to comment out that line i'm not going to use a csv driver and let's create another line to tell the system i want to use excel so we'll say ddt like that and we we'll see dot and notice that it will be excel driver available here all the way at the bottom let's do that and if i put the cursor inside of there you will notice that the kibitz window is telling me that the excel file including the path to it is is required 
Also what's required is the sheet name that means sheet one, sheet two, sheet three, whatever even if you change their name it's not enough to give me the name of the XLS file you have to tell me what which sheet I need to actually read from. There is an optional uh, comical <laughs> uh, parameter needs to be passed at the end and it's called use ace driver I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, hoopla about ace drivers or not but this is a company that Excel bought several several years ago if you don't pass anything the default is false that means it's going to use the Excel driver built into Excel and it's known to be very slow okay uh, but again for our use I only have like six different columns with a couple of records you will not see any difference whatsoever but if that Excel spreadsheet had 50 columns with a thousand or two thousand different rows the built-in Excel driver is known to be very very slow so they bought this company and it became part of Microsoft but uh, for legal reasons you cannot they could not actually install the ace driver from that company immediately into excel itself don't ask me why so actually if you want to use the ace driver which owned by microsoft now you have to go to the website from microsoft and you have to install the 32-bit or the 64-bit ace driver for excel and only then you can actually go in here we'll do Control shift space again so that we can get the kibitz window and now we can actually say um, the last parameter could be true that means do not use the excel driver built into excel i want you to use the ace driver which is much better and much faster all right so that's why i said this is a comical parameter but again at least you know why it exists at this point all right let's go ahead and make sure also that we have access to our files let's see in here oh it looks like i put it in somewhere else let me go ahead and find where that file with the xls is available okay I found it I think I put it all the way to the top under my uh, OneDrive and the file is right there course data.xls let's go ahead and and um, find out exactly how I can get to this uh, folder for instance uh, let me go ahead and and found out the location of it all right so now we'll go ahead in here the first parameter will be and I already pasted the path to that file let me go ahead and put it right inside of there oops only need one of the double quotes alrighty let me delete the second one it's going to be under the e drive one drive one drive dash the training bar slash course data dot xls that's where the file is and again don't forget to add another backslash otherwise this will not work very very important to do that piece as well and also there is a second parameter I believe we left it as sheet one for instance so we will leave that okay and I don't have to pass the third one I only have two records it will not make any difference whether I'm using true or false it will still be very fast it only gets slower in the built-in driver when you have thousands of different records inside of that excel worksheet make sense do I need to change anything else regarding the drive method or anything inside of test one itself you'll be amazed to know nothing needs to change this will work just fine for Kyle and Joel um, straight out of the box let's go ahead and give it a shot I'm going to right click in here and we'll say run this routine and let's see if it will work and there you go Kyle is being added from the excel spreadsheet and I made a mistake so now it cannot find the collection corresponding the request let's see why ah that's I'm glad I made that mistake so let me go ahead and and stop uh, test complete and go fix the problem first of all I'm going to have to go ahead and cancel this leave it like that let's go ahead and also clean this up I'm going to uh, remove all the records that we created earlier and I'm going to show you what the problem is here in a second there we go we'll take this one and we'll right click on Lino and we'll say delete this order yes and we'll delete all of them so when we run it again we'll have a clean grid so we don't have anything else in there we'll say yes yes and yes and the last one is a yes as well for the delete all right good so what do you think was the problem in here folks so let me go ahead and open this up again all righty so notice that uh, when I created the uh, the excel spreadsheet I made a change in one of the uh, of the names so it's called name address city state zip but it could not find something called credit card because I changed the name in this in the column so it's called cc and this is the one it failed on so I'm glad just so you can see what will happen if you have something like this all the others were entered correctly except the last one so let's go ahead and save this file now and run it one more time we'll right click and here we'll say run this routine 
and this time I'm expecting it to finish for both for Kyle and Joel that is Kyle and now Joel and it will be 100% correct and it will still respect the same uh, a pen folder and pop-up folder will still both work see Kyle is right there and Joel is right there in the log and it will work just fine so hopefully you can see how easy it is to work with Excel and also we've seen CSV as well the third one in the next video I want to show you what if you we would like this to be run from records inside of a table inside of a database which a lot of companies will use as well which is the fastest way possible to do it let's go ahead and do that all righty let's do it the uh, the final way which we will do databases based on that so let me go ahead and minimize the test visualizers as well and I'm going to comment out the excel I don't want to run it based on excel there we go we put a comment right there in the beginning and what I would like to do now I would like to do a ddt dot and we'll notice the first one all the way at the top is called ADO driver so we're going to use this one all right and the question really is what are the parameters for an ADO driver let me put the cursor inside of there do a control shift space on the keyboard and the kibis window will tell me that it takes two parameters the first one is the connection string remember that connection string when we talked about uh, the DB table stores when we created our own checkpoint for the database that's the same thing the connection string right there and then the second one it's unfortunately named pretty poorly it's called table name it should not say table name that parameter should be called um, 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 query <laughs> right it can be a table name it could be a view or it could be a select statement with an inner join and outer join so when people see this as a table name they think the only thing that they can pass in here is a name of a table which is not true it could be a table a view or a query as well so this should be a data set not table name that will be a lot more meaningful for people not to to be confused by that anyway let's go ahead and, and steal for instance our connection string from the sql server database that i did earlier alrighty let's go ahead and say oh, go to the stores open up my connection remember this if I would like to see the connection string click on the edit button right there on the right side we click on that and that will bring up the old dialog that I have this line right there so I'm going to go ahead and copy this entire line we'll say control C and we'll say thank you bye bye Co close this down and let's get back to our code so I can actually paste it right inside of there but usually because it's a very long line I don't like to pass it to the ADO driver I'm going to create my own variable we'll say my connection oops my connection equals and I'm going to go ahead and add this in a string so open up the double quotes and we'll put this entire line inside of it okay let's go ahead and clean up this line as well so that is my provider that is the integrated SSPI that means I'm using NT authentication persist security is fine let's keep going to the right side find out what else okay I'm not using a user ID I'm using NT so I can actually delete this guy from here I don't need it the initial catalog the name of the database is test complete the data source in here do you see something you don't like something that is worrying you all right that's localhost with a dot slash SQL express that's not a good thing so I need to put another backslash otherwise uh, Python will not ha be happy with that backslash let's see what else is being asked I'm not going to use any of the initial file name properties or attributes and also the server SPN is not needed either so I'm going to delete all the stuff just leave the last double quotes to create the connection for me automatically sounds good all right so now let's go ahead and uh, use the second parameter and the second parameter after uh, oops let me go ahead into the ADO driver the first parameter will be my variable called my con we'll say my con that is the connection string oops what did I do <laughs> all right sorry let me go ahead and open this we'll say my connection comma and now I actually can uh, pass um, the second parameter so if I open up SQL server one more time instead of using the personal table I want to go to the other table called info info have an ID name street city state zip and C card so I have to remember these names because that's what I need to tell test one to change its values to name street city state zip and C card let's go ahead and close this down again and I'm going to come in here we'll call it its info that is the name of the table okay so that's one way of doing it is there a different way I can do this it will mean exactly the same thing absolutely I can say select star from info that means exactly the same thing so it doesn't have to just be a, a table name it could be a query like this and it will work just fine as well I'm just going to keep it as a table name and it will work
All right, I'm done, folks. Nothing else needs to happen except maybe fixing some of the names in here. So instead of address, I know it's called street in the database. And the C, C is actually called C card. All righty. So I just fixed actually the names as well to match whatever I have in the database. And let's give it a shot. Now I'm going to right click and say run this routine. And drums rolling. And I'm hoping to actually see there is the first one. Oops, I made a mistake. Let's see what it is. It's an ordinal as well, so I'll probably use the different. Oh, <laughs> if you spell street correctly, I think you'll be much happier. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and open up the app. Cancel this guy. I'm going to delete Joel. All righty. Uh, let me open up the uh, app in here for data driven test. And instead of street with the two R's, <laughs> and we'll say street with uh, two E's, I think that would be much better. And also for the app itself, let me go ahead and delete uh, Joel and Kyle from the previous run. All righty. And let's go ahead and give it another run and see now that we fixed street if everything will be okay. Right click and run this routine. All right. Another drum rolling. <laughs> and hopefully we'll have a couple of records. That is the first one for Lewis. And then there is another one for Bob. And there is a third record for Molly and it will finish successfully and now we're driving everything from data coming in from a SQL Server database and it could have been a MySQL, Oracle, PostgreSQL, whatever drivers you have to have and there is Lewis, all successful, Bob is all successful and finally Molly is very successful as well. Makes sense? Hopefully in this chapter you've seen how to do data driven testing it's extremely easy and again whether we're going to do that with the web testing later on it's exactly the same thing it doesn't care whether this is a, a web test or a desktop test or a mobile test it would be the same exact thing as long as you know how to create a function that will drive the method and whether you're going to use a csv driver excel driver or ado driver you will be able to do exactly the same thing driving your methods to enter data into a data entry application, for instance. All right, the final video in this chapter, I want you to uh, take a look at some of the Python code that we can write in case we do not want to drive the method automatically. What does it mean, drive method automatically? Remember, if I have a hundred records in a database or in a CSV file or in Excel, when I say drive method, you cannot filter which ones are going to run. All of them will run. Sometimes you do not want to run the function test one on every single record inside of your CSV or Excel or the database. So that means this drive method cannot work. So I'm going to go right on this line and I'm going to put a comment in front of it not to run it. And that means now when I initialize my driver, again, it could be ADO, Excel or CSV driver. I want to be in full control which ones will work and which one will be skipped, for instance. So I can come in here. I will use a while loop inside of Python. We'll say while and I'll say DDT dot current driver like we did before but this time i would like to ask if you are at the end of the file that means we started from the beginning we keep going one down and we're we're done we finished all the records so i'm going to say if you're at the end of the file that means i want to ask you if you are not so you'll put the the, the python keyword not so what we're saying while not at the end of the file let's go ahead and put a colon in here and I'm going to indent it. And now I would like to ask a question. We want to ask, while you're on the specific record, is the name of the record is Molly or Bob or any of the records? So I want to skip all the ones that are not Molly. So I can say if, and we will say ddt.currentDriver.value, like we did before. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. And inside of there, we'll put name, for instance. And then we will ask a question. So it's not only only one equal it has to be two equal signs because we're asking a question well this is true or not and I'm going to check if the name is Molly that means the first two records in my database will be skipped uh, they're not correct oops I forgot to put another uh, double quotes here after the name there we go let me fix that and then we'll put the colon for the if statement and then I will indent again inside of the if what do I want to do when the record name is Molly I would like you to run test one and now we're going to do pass the open and close parentheses because I want to run this test one. Anything else, I do not want to run test one at all. But of course, if I just run it just like that, it will be stuck on the first uh, record. And I know that I have maybe 100 records. So don't forget, now we're not calling drive method. That means you are in charge of moving the cursor to the next one. So don't forget in the, uh, in the, in the if statement, for instance, to come in here and we'll say ddt.com 
current driver oops dot current driver dot and there is a, a something that will move the record it's called next let's double click on that and then we'll call the next and this is it you don't need to do anything else there is no else nothing what you're saying is we have a hundred records while we are not at the end of the file we are going to check if the name is molly and if it's not first one the, the first record is bob that means it's not going to call test one but I wanted to also move it to the next record. That means this now is in the wrong place because it will only move the record forward always only when the name is Molly. That's not correct. That means I need to unindent this and put it right under the if. That means every record will, will move the, the record for, uh, next. So this is something in Python that you'll have to really be very careful with. Okay, The fact that the indentation can completely change the meaning. So Bob, for instance, on the first record uh, will not hit. That means the if statement will fail and will not do anything, but we'll go ahead and move the record to the next one. So it will go all to the beginning. And the second one was also not Molly, if I remember correctly. And it will skip test one and it will move it to the next one. And then the third record is Molly. That means test one will run. And then it will move the next one. It will not find any more. That means we are at the end of the file. The while loop will exit and we are done. Make sense? Let's give it a shot. I'm expecting if I run this code now, instead of the drive method um, introducing three new record this should only create one record only and then it will finish successfully let's give it a shot we'll right click and he will say run this response now run this routine and the application should start right now and you should see molly is the only one that will be created let's give it a shot did i misspell molly <laughs> there is a possibility i did that let me check this out so that's weird. Something did not work. That means it did not go through all of them. So this is maybe a good way to show you how to debug something like this in test complete as well. So I'm actually glad that this happened. It did not do it. It did not go through the molly. So I need to find out why. Let's go back to the code. And if you go to the gutter here on the left side, let's go ahead and put a breakpoint on line number maybe eight. Okay, let's go ahead and click here. And that will add what we call a breakpoint. It will be in red. And right now, I would like to run this code and I'm going to stop on the first record. Let's go ahead and right click in here and say run this routine. It will start everything and then it will stop in line number eight the first time it hits that line. You see the arrow in here for playing. We're stopped right now. Uh, and I'm going to remove this from here so that you don't actually um, see it. I would like to show you how to do the whole thing from the beginning. All right. So right now I would like to find out what exactly is the value for this DDT current driver dot value. So I'm going to highlight this line like this. I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to say add watch. See that? That's a debugging technique. If we say add watch, it will add it to the window for, uh, for the watch screen. And if because I closed it myself because I was working with it earlier, if you go all the way to the top for view debug, there is something here called watch list. Let's click on this window and the watch list will show up all the way at the bottom. So now it will say ddt.currentdriver.value name and notice Lewis is the first value coming in. Excellent. So now I want to go further. I would like to click on this button all the way at the top. See that in test complete, this button is to step into, which is an F11 on the keyboard. The one right next to it is to step over. If you don't care for, for stepping into the, the, the function itself, you can do F10 or F11 if you need to actually step into it. So I'm going to click on F11 or step into so I can see if test one will be called or not. Let's click on this once. Notice test one will, was not called just because Lewis is not Molly. So it will actually move us to the next record. Great. Let's go ahead and do it again. And now it's going to start again on the second record. And we click on it. And you will notice now that the value is Bob. And Bob is also not Molly. So I'm going to click on it again. It will skip test one. And we will get into the next record. And this will be the last record. So let's go ahead and, and notice now it's called Molly. Now I can see why it didn't work. Excel added some spaces after the word Molly in the spreadsheet. I'm checking for Molly, which is five characters. And Molly in here, notice there is a space between the Y and that. So it's very difficult to find this bug because if you open Excel, you won't see it. But the debugger and the watch list will tell you why this is not hitting because these are not the same strings. One have three or four extra spaces and one doesn't and these are two different strings completely so it will not match so when i say keep going for instance in here notice it will uh, skip that and now i'm at the end of the file so if i click one more time 
you will notice end uh, of file is true so if I actually keep going it will skip the while loop altogether and now it will finish the test and that's why I didn't write, write anything out so let me go ahead uh, and fix that uh, I think we did it with the database so I'm going to open up the database in here and we'll go to Mali and notice yeah there is so many spaces in here so I'm going to actually have to to uh, delete all that so one two three four five there was five spaces in there okay let me move away from the test from the uh, name oh it keeps going back to Mali <laughs> wow uh, that's something in, the, in SQL Server um, is doing that all righty so I'm going to push enter and I just want to make sure that uh, it keeps bringing it back all right I guess the only way to fix that is to add the, the five spaces that is one two three four five okay let's leave it alone then and I will come back into my code in here and we'll fix that we'll say one two three four five okay let's go ahead and save this and now we'll run it one more time and let's see if this time it will work just to match what's available in the database itself uh, maybe I should have actually do a trim function Python has a trim so I can actually trim all the, the white spaces as well there is Lewis and even Lewis have extra spaces that's fine we'll say step over it and we will go to the next one and this one is Bob with extra spaces that's fine and then we'll step over it and I'm hoping now with Molly if I go step into it um, it will be exactly the same yep you see now I added the spaces and there are five spaces and now it, it will find out the test one needs to be run let's click on this guy and notice it's going to do the whole thing now I can tell it to continue running uh, I can remove the this and I can actually just uh, let it run so we'll say go for it step out uh, out 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 and it will do everything like we're expecting it to one at a time there we go I actually can see it's probably doing the job at this point which would be fine couple more and you can debug not only for just one value you can have multiple watches and you can see at the bottom the debugger to have a very good idea why something is not working like I said with these extra spaces without the debugger that would have been a really difficult bug to find out why it's not working but with the debugger it took us only a couple of uh, seconds to figure out yep there is extra spaces after Molly in the database and that's why it's not working does that make sense and now at the end if I go ahead and say go uh, it will finish up but now hopefully you can see that there will be something written out for uh, for test complete there will be at least one record written out and that will be Molly let's wait for it to finish in here and there it is there is Molly Molly was written out but none of the other record was written out hopefully that made sense uh, to show you how to deal with that and also I'm glad we get to show you a small little piece about debugging uh, with breakpoints and watch lists as well and now we start one of my favorite chapters in this entire course and that's web testing we will have a lot of different videos in that chapter the first one I just want to talk to you about uh, how does test complete look at a page in a website for instance uh, in any browser whether it's Chrome or Firefox or Edge and so on and so forth so let's go ahead and create a brand new uh, script unit in here and we'll call this one uh, my we'll call it my web testing you can call it again whatever you want and that will be our Python file that we will write code inside of there right away okay uh, before I even jump and write or create a function or do anything like that I would like to create uh, a web page let me go ahead and open up a website for instance I'll bring it here to this screen there we go I'll maximize it right there and there is the smart bear website it could be any website don't worry about it even by the time you get this uh, video and this course maybe they would have actually changed the look and feel it doesn't really matter we don't really care what the website looks like it could be your own company's website what I'm interested in is to be able to understand how can a browser reads a web page like this obviously there is a lot of HTML there are some JavaScript there are some CSS and all of these get together to be able to see what I'm looking at right now and that could be any browser they will probably end up doing the same thing to show you this information HTML JavaScript and CSS and so on make sense so for instance if I want to find out for instance where is that uh, word that says uh, let's say the confidence maybe it's a picture and maybe it's just a text maybe I can get to it maybe the word this just in 
Uh, this is text. I'm pretty much sure this is not a, 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 an image. This is a text, but maybe the confidence behind your code, that is an image. And there is a way to find out even before we get into test complete itself. There is something in the HTML world is called DOM, Document Object Model. And I want to be able to traverse that entire DOM to find out where every single object is. If I bring the scroll bar down in here, you will notice there is a lot of imagery, a lot of text, a lot of coloring, a lot of different things in here. And I want to find out how much of HTML that is. So the, the page is not that huge, but you'll be shocked to know that this page will hopefully will probably have around a thousand different objects available in the HTML itself. So something has to load all the stuff really fast and start rendering it on the screen. If you're using Chrome or you're using something like Firefox for Firebug or Edge, all of them have a development tool that comes with it that can be invoked with the F12 key on your keyboard. So if I click anywhere inside of the page, for instance, if I push F12, you will notice for Chrome, for instance, it shows up all the way at the bottom of the screen in here. And it has a lot of different things that you can do. You can actually find out how fast it is, what exactly are the JavaScript files being loaded, what are our CSS file being loaded, what is the HTML element for everything. So this is really, really powerful, especially if you're doing debugging. All right. You do not have to be a, a super duper developer in HTML and CSS and JavaScript to be uh, very comfortable with this. Um, the first one is the, bot the button here all the way at the left in the toolbar of this uh, Chrome debugger. If I click on on it then when i move the mouse it's trying to identify every single one of these thousands of objects inside of the html see there is an image here it will put a, a, a background dark background to understand what this is if i go to this window notice this window here is a div okay and inside of the div probably there is an image this is not just text oh it is text look at that there is a text so when i say for instance the conference behind your code this end up being a text in here which is great that means we'll be able to to modify it if we want to also at the bottom it says go bear get going in here that's also text it's not an image that is great news same thing for the menu see the word products solution resources it always shows you what this is so i'm going to go to the go bear get going let's click on it and then it will highlight it right in here inside of the html of the code itself so now if i go ahead and uh, and click on that let's click on that and you will notice go bear get going so there is a hyperlink that will take us to products and then inside of the hyperlink there is text that says go bear get going if i double click on this go bear got going i can say lino was here <laughs> all right and i push enter and look at that i changed this value in the page itself for smartbear.com don't worry i did not hack into <laughs> the smart bear website this is only on my machine only i can change the text i can change the images i can change the css i can change even the javascript on this page but as long as i don't refresh because if i click on the refresh button all the stuff is lost and i will go get a fresh copy from the server and it will go back to what it was before but if i don't refresh or there is no ajax or a javascript function that fires every few seconds for instance to to bring it back to what it was then i can leave it i can actually test it based on my own text if i want to but notice if i refresh in here lino was here uh, was gonna go away and it will bring go bear get going again so this is very very powerful as well not only that i can also be able to tell the coloring the uh, the javascript behind everything so right now for instance there is a class in here if i click on the a class right click on that on the right side of the screen let me make it bigger so you can see it. i will see for instance the text white what color is being uh, used um, and also the media if using print or uh, um, uh, the screen or whatever the inline block again i don't expect you to be an expert in css but if you're interested there are a lot of different courses out there to explain what a css and javascript and html is all about but the, you can definitely take a look at all that stuff and see uh, maybe you can change the color see the nice thing about these debuggers for firefox and edge and chrome they all work pretty much the same if you go click on the color instead of saying fff okay i can actually come in here double click on the uh on the uh, FFF in here and we'll say for instance 030 or, or 130 see there is a different color right now for the go bear get going or if I can say for instance uh, 00, uh, zero um, uh, FF00 
that's green okay so if i do that this will become green if i want to take the color completely out just go right next to the color in here and actually tell it to turn it off and that will be the default link which is blue usually in my browser it will be the default link if i bring it back in again it will be that so spend some time playing around with these things finding out how can i change in whatever site Maybe you're not testing SmartBear, but you're testing your own company's website and you would like to see what it will happen if I change something here and there uh, live on the site itself. Makes sense? If I want to change the word login, for instance, uh, instead of doing it in here now, I would like you to show you how to do it from SmartBear itself from Test Complete. That would be very interesting as well. Let's go ahead and close this guy down. We'll do another refresh so we can get a fresh copy of this Go Bear Get Going. And we're back to normal now. So let's go ahead and open up Test Complete. And this time, what I would like to do is to use the Object Spy. Let's click on the Object Spy like we did earlier with the desktop application. But this time, when I drag this guy, as soon as it sees that I'm inside of a web browser, it's going to try to run the engine. And now there is a red rectangle on every single object. So you see the behind your code and even the Go Bear Get Going, there is a red rectangle on that. That means it was able to find, read the entire 1,000 objects in the tree of that page, and it was able to recognize everything so whether is this is chrome or firefox or edge it will do the same thing now when i release the mouse it will find the object in the html dom and there it is there is a name mapping says browser page and it found out the page is called smartbear.com that is the the url of the page and then it will find an element that has a hyperlink that has a value of it is go bear get going and the values inside of this is every single property available inside uh, of this just one piece the go bear get going there is about a hundred different properties available uh, on just this piece alone isn't that amazing so if i go down a little bit i am hoping that we will see something in here that we can actually use right now i'm looking at the basic view so maybe there is like 10 or 15 properties always click on advanced view so you can get the whole 120 different properties on just this text that says go bear get going so there will be tons and tons of them right inside of there. Does that make sense, everybody? You with me? So let's go ahead and find something that has the little donut like we learned from the first chapter. So I want to find something that has something called inner text, inner HTML. See this guy with the dot? It says go bear, get going, and then it has a span inside of it. I wonder what will happen if I click on this go bear, uh, get going, and I can say Lino was here, and I will push enter. Look what happened. I did exactly what Firefox or, or Chrome or Edge did from the de debugger. So I was able to change the value right inside of here as well from test complete. So, but the only thing that is even better about this inside of test complete is that I can now do this programmatically in Python. I don't have to do it visually like this, like I did right now. That means if I click on the inner HTML, the entire line will be written for me all the way at the top. The, from the moment when I'm using sys.browser and the page name and everything all the way to the property called inner HTML. It would be nice if I click on copy this to the clipboard. Let's click on it and I'm going to shut this down. That means let me get my test complete back for a second. All righty. And now I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new function. We'll, okay, we'll say define and we'll say uh, uh, change value in browser. Alrighty, you can call it whatever you want, of course. And inside of there, I'm going to paste the line of code that I got that I got from uh, from the uh, Object Spy, and it's a very long line. But again, name mapping, sys, browser, and then the page in here for Smart Bear, and then find element. And we will talk about all of these things later on. I just wanted to show you that now I can get to the inner HTML property, and I can say equal, and here we'll say uh, that is way cool. Okay. And we'll leave it at that. So guess what will happen if I run this code right now? So let's go into the, uh, the new function that we just created and run this routine. And if everything goes well, when I open up the Chrome browser at this point, I should see uh, this is way cool uh, instead of the uh, go bear get going. So it's running this right now. And you'll notice at the bottom, it is gonna be successful. It's gonna say, oh yeah. <laughs> Awesome. It's not going to work. And I would love for you to find out why it is not going to work. See, it took a little bit of time and now it's a red X and it came back and says, I could not find an element that says go bear, uh, get going and I could not change it. So there is a problem. The find element failed. Did you uh, recognize why this happened, folks? This is a very important piece 
of the class at this point is because before I ran that code, I changed it to Lino was here. To, so go better get going is no longer in the anywhere in the page or even in the source code of the page. I, I changed it. So for making this work, I have to refresh the page first to go get the old go better get going so I can find it in the HTML. Otherwise, it will never find it again. Does that make sense? So let's go back in here. We'll go to the code for the my web testing and let's run it one more time. And this time I believe it will find it and it will be able to change the value after it finds a hyperlink. It has a text value of go bear get going and we will get it in the green and it will be able to change it. And look at that. It's in the green. That means if I open up Chrome now, you should be very happy to know that this is way cool has been written out by Python directly from my test complete on the page. You can imagine the amount of things that you can do on the website that uh, you're going to be testing, for instance, to move things around, not only for text, for images, CSS, JavaScript. You can actually uh, be in full control of what goes in and out of that page at any time whatsoever. Does that make sense? All right, in this video, I want to show you something very valuable as well. A lot of people use called web comparison for pages. So to do that, I want to go to my store in here and I would like to add a brand new project item under the stores. So it's not going to be a database or files or regions or grids. It's going to be a web testing store. So I'm going to right click on this guy. We'll say add new item. And then the, uh, the dialog will show me what is missing. So I already added most of them, so there's only three missing. And the one I'm interested in right now is web testing. We can keep it named web testing. I can change it if I want to as well. We'll say OK. And now web testing is available in this. So when I right click on that and we'll say I'd like to add a brand new item for my web testing, what exactly are the options available for me? We're going to start in this video, we're going to do web comparison. The next video, I'll show you the web accessibility one, but I'm going to start with the web comparison in here. And then instead of call it web comparison one, let's call it, for instance, the smart bear homepage. Okay. So that's an important piece as well. Uh, we'll, we'll give it a name so that it can actually be easily identifiable that this is going to be the homepage for smart bear. And we'll say, okay, there. And now when we get to the web testing, it's going to ask me, what is the source page? How can I get to it? And you don't have to remember actually how to put the entire URL for the homepage. There is an object spy right there available for you. Of course, if you know the URL, please, by all means, copy and paste it right there or type it yourself. That's fine too. But if you're not sure, click on the object spy and then come in here. You will notice there are some red rectangle that will happen around different objects. Don't get confused by that. Remember, this is looking for the page. So as a matter of fact, it doesn't matter where the red rectangle is. I'm only interested in the whole page. So don't waste too much time thinking which object should I have the red rectangle about around. Once you release the mouse, it will ignore all these objects and will just return the page itself. So you will notice, for instance, all the way in here, there it is. It's aliases.browser.pagesoftware.testing.monitor.dev. That is the name of the page. And the question is, how did Test Complete know that this is the name of the page? Well, it really didn't. It looked into the header and it took the, uh, the title of the page and it made it the name of the page in Test Complete. That's about it. So if the, if the name looks weird to you, that's probably because whatever the title said it's going to be, it's just copied and pasted that, removed all the spaces and made that the name of the page. Okay, that's about it. So there is no uh, deeper meaning of what how the, the page creation um, got created. What do you think is going to happen inside of this uh, uh, code in here for the store? That might be, like I said, the page probably have about over a thousand different objects. The entire HTML of the page is right here saved inside of the store. So this is going to be huge because everything, including the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, everything will be in here. So I know it's going to be a lot, but again, you do this once, you save it. And what you're saying right now, this is how this page should always be. That's why I'm, I'm saving it in the store and this will be the known good page for Smart Bear. Okay. Now I would like to run a test to maybe a week from now. I'd like to take a, a snapshot of the HTML of live of the page and compare it to what I have in the web testing in here for Smart Bear homepage and find out if something changed during that week. Maybe R&D released a new page, homepage for Smart Bear. 
and it will not pass because maybe they change something a hyperlink or a div or a span or an image or something then it will not work so i want to make sure that the application i'm testing every time i get a new build from r d i can run my test to make sure nothing have changed unless they've told me about it from r d first so i can pass it otherwise i don't want to actually spend all my time trying to figure it out myself a test like this would be much easier to do to find out if something changed so what exactly can it do um, for me on the right side of the screen in here there are three different things that you can do you can say compare the entire page i'll have to be honest with you that is rarely rarely used because nowadays there are no such thing called static web pages nobody creates static web pages anymore this is in the early 90s maybe right? but nowadays everything has animations and javascript injections and ajax and you will never get the same page again twice so you will always fail the test so uh, not a very good test to be honest with you the next one is to compare only tag structure what does a tag structure mean that means i want to tell the the test that i have a a div all the way at the top inside of that div i have six objects an image and five hyperlinks what the image looks like or what the text is i can care less I only care about the div image, div, 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 link, link, link. <laughs> Does that make sense? As long as the structure of the page have not changed, R&D can change images, can change text, all the stuff, I don't care. That's a much better um, uh, uh, test that you can run, of course, all right? Because we don't want to actually cause an error every time somebody changes uh, text or image or whatever. I just want to make sure that the structure of the page have not changed. Make sense? The third one is the most used one in all of them, and that is to compare only specific tags. So I'm going to click on this one, and automatically it goes from grayed out to availability in here. Links, images, and input elements. So you might actually come and say, from all these thousands of lines, I'm only in interested in hyperlinks. That means in this page, I probably have about 80 different hyperlinks, and these are the only ones I care about. I don't care about divs or spans or tables or anything else. Only A's. The greater than A, that's a hyperlink in HTML. And if one of them even changes, I want you to give me an error and tell me which hyperlink or which hyperlinks did not pass the, the, uh, the test. Does that make sense, everybody? You're with me? Or I can actually say for images as well. So not only do this for A's, but only do it for IMGs. So if there is a greater than IMG, and there is probably about maybe 50 or 60 of them on this page, there are a lot of images on the homepage for Smart Bear. And you can come back and tell me, okay, somebody changed the, uh, the, uh, the HTML for the image itself. And the third one, you can open it as well and you can say input elements. Input elements could be text boxes and also they can be buttons. Both of them are considered uh, input elements in HTML. So if somebody changes the caption on a button or uh, some of the values or attributes on a text box, that will automatically be an error and it will tell me exactly what happened. Does that make sense? For right now, let's go ahead and just do it on the links and see if that happens. You might think that this will be no problem. This is a page that I just saved right now and it should actually uh, pass with no problem. And it will, unless, of course, SmartBear is doing something uh, using Ajax or using JavaScript injection that is changing some of the attributes on the fly every time the page uh, refreshes. For instance, it might cause a problem. We'll find out. We'll, uh, we'll find out together. So, okay. So, how can I run this test now? First of all, I'm going to save all that and I'm going to go back to my web uh, testing and we will create a new function. We'll call it define and we'll say uh, uh, compare page. You can call it again, whatever you want. And inside of here, I'm going to say web testing. Uh, let's do web testing. That's the name of the object in test complete. That's why it changed in color. And we'll say dot. And we'll say smart bear homepage. That means it was able to read that from the store right away. And we'll say dot. And I can do a check like we did before with the properties and with the regions and the files. We'll do the check. And inside of there, guess what will be in there? That will be the URL for the page itself. So I can come in here and we'll say uh, aliases. Um, there you go. Dot. And browser dot and hopefully in here in the browser we will find out exactly what the name of the page is we'll say page software testing monitor dev that's it so if i run this uh, function guess what it's going to do it's going to go to this alias browser space software testing monitor dev which is open right now in my browser it will take a, a snapshot of the entire html of that page and it will compare it against the smart bear home page 
Is it going to compare everything? No, because I told the Smart Bear homepage I'm only interested in links. So it will only go through the 80 or 90 links on that page alone. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. I'm going to save this and we'll right click and we'll say run this routine. And we'll give it a couple of seconds. It's going to have to go through thousands of objects, find out only what the links are, and it will come back. And it might pass and it might not. It all depends on the website from, uh, from Test Complete if it has anything to do with the JavaScript and injection. Actually, in our case, it, it did pass. So they are not using any injection or any Ajax on links. They might be doing it on images or input elements, but we know for right now that definitely they're not doing it on the links. So it passed. All of the links are identically the same. Can I do something to make it fail so that we can actually test it? Sure, we can do that. Let's go ahead and open up this page. And I need to find the link, for instance. This is a link. Uh, that is way cool. That is a link. I'm going to go ahead and do an F12 on this page. Um, and we will go to the this way is way cool right there. And uh, instead of saying this way cool, we'll say uh, great test all right did i just change a, a hyperlink and yes this is called the uh, inner html or, or the inner text of the specific hyperlink so it has to start with an a that will make it a link and the great test now is part of the hyperlink that is the inner text it's one of the attributes of the hyperlink i can come and change the class instead of saying mt4 mt blah 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 i can actually come and say class equals to lino i just made a change in the hyperlink and that will cause a problem as well i can change the href that's another attribute i can say href is equal to hello it will still not pass because I changed something in one of the attributes of the hyperlink. All right. So let's go ahead and leave this alone for right now. We'll leave it as great test and we'll go back to our uh, test complete and let's run it again. And I'm expecting it this time not to pass. Let's go ahead and say run this routine and the web uh, comparison for the web testing might not be happy with me. I should get a red X. But I'm hoping that it will tell me exactly which one of, out of the 80 or 90 different links that is actually not happy with. So let's give it a second in here. And I'm expecting a red X at this point. There you go. Red X. Excellent. It did uh, fail like expected. And let's see what test complete will give me back as far as the result. And hopefully it will pinpoint exactly so I don't have to waste my time going through a thousand objects. And there it is. You see, it says the following element exists in the stored document. And then it will give you the entire hyperlink. It says that is way cool. That is coming directly from the store, by the way. But it says what I was able to find is something that says great test. So this one hyperlink is not the same. I am going to go ahead and flag it as an error. And uh, you, get, you have now to figure out whether this is supposed to be like that or this is something that is unexpected and you need to report a bug about it. What if it's something expected? What happens if the R&D says, yes, yes, it's going to be great test from now on. It's not going to be that is way cool. So I don't have to redo the test. Remember, there is a hyperlink in here called update the smart bear home page checkpoint. If you click on this hyperlink, I will get into the store and change it from this is way cool and it will be now great test and it will be saved in the store. So we don't have this error again. But of course, if this was a bug and it should not be great test, then I can report it as a bug and hopefully they can fix it in the next build and so on. Does that make sense, everybody? All right, let's do one more. So we've seen in the previous video how to do a web comparison on a specific page to find out if something changed. Now we want to do something very different, which is web accessibility test. So this is something we used to pay a lot of money for in the old days, which is called the 508 accessibility test. Right now, at least here in the United States, we have rules and laws that government and medical websites, for instance, have to be read by people that cannot really see very well or completely blind because they will have a specific device uh, that they can actually use their hand to touch it and it can read the, actually the site for them. Um, in, uh, in different ways, whether with voice or uh, by a specific language on these devices and so on. And because you're a government agency or a medical company, you are obligated to be 508 compliant. That means your website has to be accessible, not only for people who can see 2020. <laughs> so even if you don't see very well or not at all, you are required by law to have your uh, site being accessible and pass a certification. But now with test complete, for instance, that will take us a few minutes to find out if our test, if our page or our website is 508 compliant or not. 
so let's go ahead and do it right now i have a web test right now against the comparison but if i right click on it i can add another item to it and this time instead of being a web comparison i'm going to make it a web accessibility and let's go ahead and say for instance smart bear uh, sb and we'll say accessibility accessibility you can call it anything you want again but I'm going to add this item and this item will also require which page you want to go to. So maybe I want to do this on the home page. You can type in the object for the page or the alias for the page or use the object spy all the way at the right to save you some time. Click on it, drag it and wait till you see any red rectangle. It doesn't matter which object it is. It will return the entire page anyway. So don't waste your time trying to figure out which red rectangle should I choose. It will just return the page itself. And these are the things that it will ask for. I mean, we're not going to get too deep into the 508 compliance. But again, alternative attributes around header, section, and images are you are obligated to put them. You know that there's a lot of companies that are not medical companies and are not government companies. Uh, organizations for instance and they don't care to pass the 508 so they will notice all their HTML for the images does not have an alternative attribute alternative attribute means if I'm putting an IMG image for instance somewhere on the side I am I need to put an alt equal so that if the image cannot be seen and at least somebody can see the text representation of what the image is supposed to be this alt attribute can be available on section, on headers, and a lot of different places as well, but mainly on images. And if you are not going to have alt attributes on images or sections or headers, you are not going to pass the 508 compliance test. The mail too as well is required for you to actually have that tag available for the webmaster for the application for the, uh, for the page as well. Image sizes. A lot of companies do not do this one, which is every single image has to have a width equal and a height equal. But a lot of companies punt on that. They say, well, it's not needed because I just need to load the image as is. So if the image is 300 by 200, for instance, on disk, if I don't give you the width and height, guess what you're going to do? You're going to just bring it in as is, 300 by 200. But to pass the 508, again, you have to put in the width and the height no matter what, even if you want it identical to what it is on disk as well. The title one is a funny one. How many times have you been to a web page and it says all the way at the top in Chrome or Edge or Firefox, untitled page? It means in the header section of the page, they forgot to put a title for the page. The page will still work, but it's really bad. And without a title to, to the page, you will not pass the 508 um, compliance testing as well. The tab indexes, this is probably the biggest culprit in our industry, and nobody cares to do it. Uh, a lot of people think tab indexes about going from right to left and left to right and in the order and how it reads. It's actually not. Tab indexes is about the Z index. It means what's in the front and what's in the back. Can you imagine if you are uh, somebody who has problem with vision, for instance, or completely blind, um, and you are not specifying the tab indexes and you have a thousand objects and you have some layover things that were supposed to be in the front and then you gray out in the back but you didn't give me the tab indexes that means the device that they're using can no way find out what exactly is supposed to be in front of, uh, of the screen for you to see so it would be a total mess so tab indexes is extremely important about the depth of the page what's in the front what's hidden behind it and so on and so forth make sense the next one is the link accessibility. That is probably the most used one in all of them. I use it all the time and I don't need a lot of the times to use it for 508 compliance testing. I use it because if your website or your web page has, let's say, 80 or 90 different hyperlinks that is supposed to take me to somewhere, instead of me having to do all the testing to find out this is not a broken link, which is a 404, we call it 404 because if you click on the link that was misspelled or that page is not there, you're going to get a 404, that's a broken link. When you check actually link accessibility, it will check every single link on the page because you cannot pa pass the 508 accessibility test if you have any broken links on the page. So I actually use it not even for 508. It's a good idea to know that I don't have any broken links on the page. So it's a good test to have as well. The next three are very similar. For 508, they said no, no for ActiveX controls, no, no for Java applets, and no, no for multimedia links. You cannot have those on a page if you want to pass the 508 um, compliance testing. Okay. 
The last one is check server side images. Again, these are about images that get created on the fly on the server. And instead of streaming it in as a PNG or a GIF or a JPEG, they want to make sure that you bring it in as a map coordinates. So you're not fabricating an image, you're telling the user that this is a, an image that is being created uh, on the fly as a map coordinates as well. In this case in here, I'm going to turn them all on just to see if the Smart Bear homepage can pass or not. Remember, Smart Bear is not a medical company and it's not a government agency. So they don't have a reason for them to pass the 508. But it would be nice to run this test. I am pretty sure Smart Bear homepage will not pass this test and they don't need to. But if the in the future, if they ever decide, hey, we have to have Smart Bear compliant, I will get a full report about every single thing that needs to happen on this page for our R&D team in Smart Bear, for instance, to fix it. So that's a good thing. So that's what you should do also on your page. Whether they decided to do a 508 uh, compliance or not, you should have a report because it's going to take you less than a few minutes and then have a report in your system that says if we ever need to pass the 508 compliance testing, these are the things we need to do on our homepage to pass. Does that make sense, everybody? Let's go ahead and save all that. And now I'm going to go back to my web testing uh, script in Python and in here, We'll go ahead and create a new function. We'll say define. We'll say uh, accessibility page. Accessibility page. You can again call it whatever you want. And inside of here, we'll say web testing again. Web testing dot. And hopefully, we'll see the new one for SB accessibility. Let's click on that dot. And we will actually do a check against it, like that. And inside of there, we will use exactly the same page that we used in the previous alias. So instead of typing it, I'm going to steal it from the previous line and we'll put it right in, inside of here. Sounds good. Let's go ahead and run it. And it might take a, a, a few, uh, it might take a minute, minute and a half. And the reason for that is there is one of the tests that takes forever, but all the rest are very fast. Can anybody guess which one of the maybe 10 tests takes the most amount of time? is the link accessibility because it has to click on every single one of the 80 or 90 links and it has to wait until it comes back saying it's a 404 or not. So you see it's doing that right now. If you notice the top right of the screen is clicking on every single one of these HTTPS links available on that page and it's waiting to see if this is a broken link or not. So I'm going to stop the video recording. I'll come back in a minute or minute and a half and we'll see the result. And there we go. It's a red X. That means this test did not pass. And now I have a full report. I can copy and paste this entire report and put it in a, in a bug report and tell it to, to R&D, hey, we might not need it, but let's go ahead and save it anyway in case in the future we need to pass. So you will notice the Smart Bear homepage doesn't have any of the alt attributes, for instance, for images or sections or headers. They are all missing, but each and every single one of them will be in here. So you need to go, somebody in R&D will need to go and fix the alt attributes. And if I go down a little bit, the width and height is missing everywhere on the images as well. Let's keep going. Tab indexes. They didn't do anything about the Z order of uh, in the front or in the back. So all of these are thousands. There is pretty much almost about a thousand errors <laughs> inside of here, but somebody will need to fix them later on as well and again at the end the images um, having to do with the uh, attributes and so on is not good so these are it's a full report on how to make that page succeed if we need to in the future but remember smart bear does not have to fix these it's not a government agency and it's not a medical company here in the united states for instance make sense another feature that has been added a couple of years ago into test complete is an excellent feature which uh, comes from Google actually It's called Lighthouse to be able to show you the performance of your website and specific pages on the website as well. So let me go ahead and open it up first of all if you'd like to get more information just go ahead and open up your browser I'm going to open up another tab in here and we will go look for Google Lighthouse. If you go there, yeah, the first uh, one that will come up would be the Lighthouse in here. And there will be a lot of information that you probably can read in here about what Lighthouse can do for you. And you don't need to do it actually the way they are talking about in here because it's already integrated inside of Test Complete for web testing automatically. If you'd like just to take a look really quickly, just push F12 on your keyboard. Uh, when you have actually Chrome uh, installed on your machine, push F12 and notice one of the tabs in here is called Lighthouse. Okay, 
Uh, you're probably not going to be on the on that tab when you first come in here but click on the lighthouse and you will notice that you can actually set it for mode which is the default would be navigation or you can set the mode to time span or snapshot you can test the quality and the performance of your page whether it's uh, running on a desktop like i'm going to do right now or you can do it also for mobile whether you have android or iPhones or, or and stuff like that and you want to find out if there is a difference between the performance of your pages whether it's on desktop or mobile these are the five categories lighthouse will track for you the performance of the page the accessibility for the page this is the 508 compliance test that we did earlier you don't need to actually do the web accessibility anymore it's already built into lighthouse you can see best practices that's regarding minifying your file uh, bundling files all the stuff that you need to do to make make sure the site is as fast as possible also for marketing folks on the team they might be interested to find out what lighthouse says about the seo how you created the title the keywords the description all the different seo it will give you a percentage uh, uh, passing or failing marks as well and finally uh, pwas which is the progressive web app in case you would like to run the app locally on your device like iPhones and Android and so on and see for instance if you can save uh, information on the device for caching so PWS can be extremely valuable for service uh, applications and so on you can even add an extra plugin for publisher ads if you're doing that if you're having some publisher ads to see how they perform on the page as well but I'm not going to do it actually from Lighthouse itself I want to show you how to do this from inside of Test Complete itself so I'm going to close this down and I am going to actually shut down this completely and what I'd like to do is to open up Test Complete at this point and we will do it on this page which is the home page of the Smart Bear website so I'm going to open up uh, Test Complete we'll go ahead and create a brand new um, uh, function we'll say define and we'll say um, web audit lighthouse you can call it again whatever you want of course and inside of here you will notice i don't have to write the code like i did with the previous ones i can just go ahead and click on the plus sign with the check mark to bring up the wizard for checkpoints let's click on that and you'll notice uh, this has been added called web metrics in there so if i click on the web metrics first of all it's going to ask you what is the website that you're interested in we we know in our case will be https and that will be uh, smartbear.com that is the home page okay and then you're going to go ahead and set in test complete itself what would be acceptable to you using lighthouse whether you want to pass or fail each one of the five categories that we've seen in lighthouse for instance the performance is 90 percent a successful rate it's from zero to 100 so maybe maybe 90 is too much maybe i'll say if i score 80 percent on the performance i'm going to call this a success and i will pass the test for accessibility it all depends of course if you are a government agency or a medical company and you are required to be 508 compliant then maybe 100 <laughs> will be the, the number otherwise maybe you can turn it off and say it's not important for my site but I'm going to leave it on just to see what it gives us as well best practices again it could be 90 it could be 80 it could be 70 it all depends what happens in that meeting on the whiteboard between r d and qa and the management to decide what we're going to uh, consider to be acceptable as far as best practices for lighthouse for our website and the main page for the website same thing for the seo for search engine optimization for google and bing and yahoo we get to set this and this is very important for the marketing team so they want to make sure that they're doing the best job possible so again you can set the percentage for passing however you'd like and I'm going to do the same thing with PWA and some companies do not implement it at all so they will end up turning it off because they're not going to check it I'm going to leave it just so you can see what it looks like when you run something like this usually you're going to run this test twice once for desktop and then you create another test and run it just for mobile so you can see if there is a difference in the performance and the best practices and everything between the two so let me go ahead and do it for the desktop right now I'm going to say finish and like we always used to in python the code will be written for you i just need to copy it and i'm going to put it in my function so i'll come in here we'll say Control v and we'll paste it and you will notice the line of code in here very easy to remember hopefully is the web artist that's the name of the object inside of test complete that talks to lighthouse and we'll say web artist 4 and you'll pass it the uh, the page 
This means that we're going after the homepage for smartbear.com. And then every single one of the five different categories with a percentage in, uh, in the function itself. So SEO, 90%. PWA is 90%. That's the number I'm looking for. And then if we go down, uh, down that line, let me just go ahead and show you. That is the best practice, 90%. Performance, 80%. Uh, and so on so I, I know the line is too long but actually it makes total sense it's every one of the categories with a percentage in the uh, in between the parentheses and then at the end dot check and you got yourself a line of code and you don't even have to write that line of, of code in python the wizard will write it for you and then you can come back here and change that number manually inside of the function itself if you would like does that make sense? All right, let's go ahead and give it a shot. I'm going to right click in here and I'm going to say run this routine and we'll sit back and relax. Remember that test takes a while. It's going to have to run so many different things on different five categories. And when it comes back, I should get a full report on each and every single one of these categories. How did the web page, the main home page of SmartBear, and of course you can run this on your own application and your own websites. Um, whether it's internal or public, to be able to find out, um, you can get automatically some information from the system uh, right away. So we'll leave it here running for a couple of minutes. It will take a couple of minutes and I'll come back when it's done. And there we go. It took a couple of minutes. As expected, it did fail because we did not meet the percentage for the threshold score that we set up. And you can see really quickly here in Test Complete itself, you don't have to leave Test Complete. You don't have to go to Lighthouse and Google to find out what's going on. So the accessibility, for instance, we scored 83% and we set the threshold for 90. So we're pretty close. We probably want to take a look what exactly we need to fix to bring it over the 90%. Best practice is at 79%, okay? So we are also pretty close. Maybe we can get some hints from the report to, to, um, to make it pass the 90%. Performance is at 11%. Well, um, the threshold is 80%, but we're gonna find out why it says that. And sometimes for performance, it all depends on the run itself. So that's why sometimes we feel like we have to run it multiple times to find the average because uh, for your bad luck, maybe there was something wrong on the internet latency or something like that. So it took too long to bring back the first uh, byte, for instance, from the site. So you got dinged up about that. But you have to run it multiple times to find out what is the uh, number as well. I also find sometimes you'll get different numbers if you run it from inside of Test Complete or you leave Test Complete and write light, uh, run Lighthouse on its own inside of Google itself. It was a little bit weird to find out that a lot of times the numbers are not the same. So be careful. Sometimes you want to actually prove to yourself that you are reporting correct numbers. So run it both ways from inside of Test Complete and also from Lighthouse as well. PWA is 26 because they don't have much on the website for PWAs. SEO is 82%. We're pretty close. Maybe the marketing team would like to see the report to be able to fix it if they can. So where is that report? I mean, this is good enough here just for my one mile high to find out how we scored, but I want more info. So if you click here, see a complete report, let's click on that. And then it will open up the report from your hard drive. This is where the HTML report that got created uh, by Lighthouse, notice from the uh, all the way at the top, it happens inside of the uh, project in Test Complete itself. And we will have a Lighthouse with the date, for instance, it's called dot report HTML. So I will see the five categories that you can see here at the top, all right? And we will see why we scored 11% in performance. You will see first contentful paint. Uh, how long did it take to, to start painting the first renderer in the page itself? It's 4.3 seconds. That's not acceptable. That is way too long. We do not want our customers, when they hit the site, to wait 4.3 seconds to start seeing anything on the page. That's not good. Um, that's not really the case, <laughs> to be honest with you, just something happened on, during that time. The speed index, the largest contentful uh, paint, time to interact so that people can actually start clicking on things. How long do they have? 20.6 seconds. That's why we scored very badly. So obviously something happened on the latency on that page for, for my luck on this one. Total blocking time is half a second. Uh, that means you will not be able to interact with the page while it's rendering uh, because there is a blocking um, uh, information on the page itself, okay? Um, anyway, so you can come in here and it will take some screenshots of the, of the page and what have been rendered. Notice these two white ones in here, nothing in them. That means there is a wait. Something was happening and no painting is taking place at all. So these took 4.3 seconds, these two, before we start seeing anything. And then it will give you some uh, hints on what you need to do 
um, to, to actually make things better, to, to make it way less seconds and milliseconds if you would like. So the first of all, remove unused JavaScript. That's a big one. I'm actually disappointed that they did not do that on the main site of, of, uh, of Test Complete, which is taking actually 2.15 seconds. That's eternity, okay? And what happens in here is that uh, a lot of times when people build websites, they start by using a lot of different JavaScript and with time they decide to change their mind and they remove some functionality, but they forget to remove the JavaScript from uh, the pages themselves. And you'll end up with two or three JavaScript files that you are not using at all. But guess what? They are still going to be loaded on the page. So you're wasting so much time loading these JavaScript files, even though you decided not to use them in any of your components or any of your animations or anything like that. So be careful with that so that tool will uh, will definitely let you know if you are loading JavaScript that is never uh, used on the page itself not good so if I open up this for instance you'll be able to see what they are so you don't have to guess and you'll see the amount of kilobytes or sometimes megabytes of these files that are actually causing all that problem okay Properly sized images. So this is a, another thing. It will give you all the names and the location of every single image on the home page, for instance, their size. And you will see, for instance, uh, there are no uh, properly sized images for these. And that will cause a problem because it will, it will force the browser to have to guess by going back and finding out what is the width and height of the image. So... Uh, that's another thing that uh, that can uh, take some time so any anyway i want you to go down that list eliminate render blocking resources for instance this is taking almost a second and you will see all the different ones in here that means you're not doing a defer on javascript coming in from somewhere else it means you're blocking nothing will happen on the page until that javascript file or files are being loaded Server images in next-gen formats, pre-connect to require origins, remove unused CSS, same thing like JavaScript. You ended up using multiple CSS files, but with time you decided not to use some of them, but you never removed the style sheets from your, from your page. So you're loading them anyway, even though you're not using them. So that's a waste. Not a big deal. It's just 0.16 seconds, but still they can add up. Okay, so take a look at that and try to fix them one by one so that you can actually gain, see, quarter of a second here, quarter of a second there. You can actually fix these things and automatically get back a couple of seconds or three sec seconds out of the 4.3 seconds. And all of a su sudden, the, uh, the performance of your home page is much, much faster. Make sense? Another thing is diagnostics, reduce the impact of third-party code. So that also will, it tells you that third-party code is taking almost half a second, 400 millisecond right there. And it will show you all the different JavaScript that is being brought in from Cloudflare, Google Analytics, Tag Manager, Crazy Egg, Drift, a lot of Facebook. Um, so instead of actually going to them and getting that from their own CDN, maybe you want to actually bring it to your own uh, CDN or actually include it in the site itself. Uh, that's the impact of the third party. You're under the mercy of the latency and the speed of whatever CDN or whatever third party you're bringing this in from. I just want to let you know. I don't think this is a bad thing. Actually, CDNs are a great thing as long, of course, you're getting a reputable, reputable one. Um, to be able to have CDNs all around the world. So your customers, no matter where they are in the world, they will always get these files from the closest location to them instead of having to go all the way across the, uh, the world to get these files and it will take more time for latency and so on. Okay. Again, we are not really going to spend a lot of time talking. This is another course altogether to talk about how to make websites very fast. But this lighthouse will teach you a lot about what might be wrong with your site. And you might want to actually take that report as is and put it into a bug report to just notify your R&D team, hey, I ran Lighthouse from inside of Test Complete. That is the report we get. And they need to make a decision with management whether we want to take some time to fix these things and maybe fix some this quarter, we fix some more in the next quarter. So you schedule how you're going to make it better and better. You don't have to, to fix everything uh, right away before shipping or going uh, beta uh, or a preview for your customers and so on. Accessibility, we've done this before, but now it's built in. I don't have to do much. It will tell you if you're um, not using title, if you're not entering the width and height on images and sections and headers, the alternative attributes, everything we talked about before. And you'll notice because uh, Smart Bear is not a medical company or a government agency, they are having a lot of issues, but it's okay. I mean, if they ever decide, this report will help them fix all these issues right away. Make sense? Uh, pay attention to the best practices. This is an incredibly good one in here. 
Um, and this is about JavaScript and CSS and unloading listeners and all that kind of stuff. So open up each and every single one and it will tell you, for instance, uh, jQuery 331 uh, has a bug in it. So they need to upgrade to the newest one. So anything that has a vulnerability and you can get this information, Lighthouse gets this because it reads into um, the latest and greatest about what vulner vulnerability security issues are available. So the highest security is medium. So they need to definitely up uh, update this to a newer version so that they can actually pass. And I think if they just do this alone, they will be over the 80% right away. Also for the uh, unload listener, uh, usually when you listen in on a specific event happening, you have to unregister yourself. Otherwise, um, you're leaving that connection open for no reason as well. So a lot of people do not pay attention to these things, but it does affect the speed uh, of the site as well. Browser errors were logged to the console. So again, uh, if there are er errors that are happening coming in from a JavaScript file, whatever, uh, fail to load the resource, something 404, try to fix those. And people fail, feel like, why is this a ba best, um, um, best practice to actually care about a JavaScript file that causes a 404. Remember, when you hit a page that causes a 404 because it couldn't download an image or a CSS or a JavaScript, that takes a toll on the loading of the page itself because it has to go back, get the console back uh, information about the 404 error itself. So that time being taken by the browser to log the error is taking time. So try to actually fix that problem so that you can actually maybe shave maybe uh, um, um, a quarter of a second here or even less than that sometimes but remember if you have a lot of javascript files even if you're not using them anymore but you left them there they're causing an error not only are you paying the price of loading them you're actually paying the price of any errors they're causing because you're going to actually have to wait more time for logging a 404 errors for instance so there are two delays happening at this point make sense the marketing team will be interested in this 82% for SEO. So again, marketing team can get the report and will see exactly links do not have descriptive text. So you'll have to have every time you have a, an A tag, like a hyperlink, you need to have a descriptive uh, text associated with it so that SEOs can pick up these things right away. For instance, their community, the smartbear.com does not have a description. So that will, uh, will cause a ding in the SEO percentage right away. Also, image elements do not have alt attributes. Not only it's an issue for accessibility, the 508, but also it will cause a problem for SEO because SEO will automatically be able to, to, um, to give you a score based on doing this the right way with alternative attributes, okay? And then finally is the uh, PWA and they scored here pretty much nothing because they, didn't, they did not implement it at all. If you're interested in a progressive web app for mobile devices, to run it locally on the mobile devices for your website, read this and try to understand what you need to do. And this is a decision that your R&D team will have to make with management. It's like we will support PWA. Most companies will say no. Website is good. I have already a native app on the on the uh, Android and on uh, on iPhone, and that's good enough. We do not want our website to be progressive web app. On the device. So that's a decision to be made. And then at the end, you will have the runtime setting to tell you which page we uh, we loaded, when did you do it, the device, if there is a device, uh, network uh, throttling. Uh, this is important to find out, for instance, what was the throughput. The CPU throttling is uh, four times slowdown, simulated. Uh, you can change the throttling, by the way. You can go into um, the browser and you can change the throttling saying, I would like to use as if I'm using a modem very, very slow and find out what it will work or a T1 line or a DSL or a cable. So you can actually see throttle to a specific um, speed and we see what other people in the world will, will be suffering if they're using our website, but they don't have as much bandwidth and speed like we have. Uh, very important as well. Makes sense, everybody? So this is the report and it will be built into the project and you just have to run it. There is really not much else you need to do and you will get uh, uh, very good results, hopefully, and you can share it with the rest of your team. All right, folks, let's go ahead and spend some time uh, recording a session in Python in one of the websites, for instance. But I've been using Chrome a lot. I don't, I don't want to give you the impression that only Chrome will work. So you can use Firefox, you can use Edge, all of them will actually work uh, with no problem as well. So let me go ahead and open up Edge on my machine in here. There we go. That is the latest version of Edge on my machine as of the recording of this video. And I'm going to look for something called test complete. Um, we'll say web order sample. 
because there is a website that in case you don't have something to test with you can always look for this and it's available right away for um, for test complete it's called web order basic sample and it, it's not even a test complete sample but it's available from smart bear this is the link i want you to get see even if it says test complete 11 it has been the same orders everybody is using as a tutorial for test complete but of course if you have a website or a web application in your company that you would like to test with you can use exactly the same idea of what i'm doing in here on your own website that will be, not be a problem let me go ahead and click on this guy and now we'll end up with this app i'm going to close the other tabs in here i'm going to only leave one tab in edge running and i would like to actually read this it says okay uh, just for testing we'll give you the username and password for how to log in as tester and password test and we can actually start recording a session in a web order application make sense all right let's go ahead now back to uh, to test complete let me go ahead and create a brand new script file we'll say plus next to script and we'll call this one let's say web store for instance or you can call it whatever you want all right so now our, we get ourselves a brand new unit in python called web store and i'm ready to start recording so make sure you go all the way to the top and make sure you record in, in python script we'll say record in script and it will ask you which unit would you like to uh, to record this in i'm going to say the web store i just created we'll say okay now test complete will minimize itself and i will be ready to go and start clicking and logging in and entering text and do whatever i want and that will be recorded automatically in test complete and again i'm doing this with edge try it with firefox try it with uh, with chrome it will work just fine i'm going to click in here inside of the username and we know it's called tester okay and because i have to make this go away i'm going to click somewhere outside so i'm going to click in here just to make it go away i'm going to click again in the password and now i'm going to say test uh, with lowercase okay now let's go ahead and click on login and let's see what happens there is a navigation that is going to happen it's going to went from login.espx to a new page called default.espx and now i have a grid so maybe let's pick one of these uh, items in the grid let's click on edit next to it on the right side and let's see what it will do for us and that will uh, will pretty much have to open up another uh, page in here and i can go maybe for the quantity of two or delete that and say three now it says total 40 but if i calculate again it will be 60 okay that sounds good let's go ahead and update this guy so we can see i can do data entry on all of those and i want you to spend some time maybe doing some lab work to add more and change more uh, data on the data screen but for this one i just want to prove the point of what exactly we are trying to do all right let's go ahead and say stop right there all the way at the top and let's see what this uh, complete got, was able to record for us in python script there's a lot of things in here okay don't worry we're going to explain every single line so you can feel very comfortable with what's going on inside of there also don't forget that the test visualizer was with us every step of the way every time i took an action whether clicking on something or typing text in some some uh, text box or clicking on a button for instance it, it took a screenshot of that object and it put a red a red rectangle around it right away so i can easily move this almost like a small movie to be able to see what my session is all about so i can see exactly what i'm going to be accomplishing uh, running this test all right let's go back all the way at the top that is the function that got created for me called test one first of all i always like to change the name to make it more meaningful so we'll say for instance uh, uh web order uh, test okay <laughs> okay so we'll leave it with like that and then in the web order test the first thing that will happen is that it noticed that i jumped into edge the the browser so there is a new object for the last maybe four or five years this has not been available for all 22 years of the life of test complete which is a great thing they have a, an internal object now called browsers in the old days it would have actually hard coded everything against edge so if i want to run this test even though it was recorded in edge but i want to run it in chrome or in firefox i have to go to the name mapping first and i have to change a lot of things to actually tell the test that the application i'm testing is not edge anymore but now it is so much easier i can record in edge and i can use the browser object and the only thing i have to change is this bt edge bt stands for browser type so notice for instance if i go after the t put the cursor there and on the keyboard they control space 
If you do a control space, it will show you all the four different uh, browsers that have been certified to use inside of browser types inside of Test Complete. So BT Chrome, BT Edge, BT Firefox, and BT uh, IE Explorer. Okay, so you can use any of them. So even if you recorded in one, you can still run the test in another one because they will all uh, support what we call the asset technology. And asset technology means that all of them are obligated to render the HTML exactly the same way so that they can get the certification of asset technology. It's not like the old days when IE6 used to render the HTML different than how Chrome and Firefox and it used to be a mess for testers. No, now these four now have signed the agreement for asset that they will actually render the HTML the same way so we can run the same test with the same objects in memory uh, expecting them to be the same between all of them. Make sense? And then the uh, the item for the uh, for the Edge browser is going to navigate to a specific page, and that is the page where we clicked on from the sample from web orders, and it will take us to the login screen. Make sense? After that, I'm going to create my own variable, and my own variable is pointing to the browser alias uh, automatically available from the name mapping. So right now we're pointing to this browser instance running in our Edge. All right. Another thing that Test Complete likes to do is like to minimize the browser window on the screen. You can delete that line if you want to, or you can let it maximize it as well. That's not a problem. And after that, the page itself has a title. So the, it got to it by name mapping it and using the name, the title of the page, Web Page Order Login. And there is a form because it's an ASP.NET. It could be done in any other language, but they decided to do it here in the .NET using C Sharp, for instance. And then inside of that form, there are uh, three different objects. There is a text box username. There is also a text box password. And there is a button to submit the, uh, the login information, username and password. So all these three, we need to go through them one by one. So the first one, it was able to find out where the text box username is. Uh, I clicked inside of it. And again, if you remember from previous videos, do you think this click is important? And the answer to that is no. You are more than welcome to leave it. It's not going to hurt anything, but you can delete it and it will still work just fine. The reason for that is even if the text box does not have focus right now, when you say text box dot set text tester, even if the text box is not focused, it will still find the object and set the text inside of it to tester. But of course, when we are recording, we don't have that luxury. We have to use the tab key or the mouse to, to give it focus. Uh, I usually do not like to leave anything that is not needed. But again, it will not hurt anything if you leave that line, it will still do it. And if you remember earlier, we used to click somewhere and there will be two X and Y coordinates, like uh, 25 comma 17, for instance. And that's the pixel inside of the text box itself of where we clicked. So why did the uh, test complete not put where I clicked inside of the text box? Well, if you remember from an er earlier video as well, for the web, it likes not to put that uh, and allows it to calculate where the middle of the text box is. So when you say click and don't pass an X and Y coordinates, that means it will find out what the width and the height and do the calculation to click right in the middle. So if it's 200 by 100, it will click at 150. So that's the X and Y coordinates. So you don't have to pass something. It will find it by itself. All right. And now after that, it will find the... Uh, the, the the click anybody remember what this click here means if you remember correctly when i entered tester uh, a pop-up came up and i wanted to make it go away so i actually clicked somewhere outside of the whole thing in the green area of the screen to make it go away do i need this line and the answer is no you do not need that line because i'm going to get to the password by object so you can leave it it's fine or you can actually delete it, it will not affect the test at all. I just want you to think about what exactly is going on behind the scene, what is mandatory and what actually the recorder had to do, but I don't, I don't really need it in the test anymore. Same thing with password. Now I am actually focusing on the password box. The click in here is to make sure it has focus. Can I delete this line, folks? Absolutely, because I'm getting to the pass password box by uh, by uh, by name and the uh, object in memory. So I don't need the click, but I'm going to leave it. It's fine. It's not going to hurt anything. And because the input type is called type equal password, test complete is very smart. And this is a new feature actually from about a year, year and a half ago. So instead of just saying tester and the password is test, instead of hard coding it, it found out that the input type is of type password. So it said, I really do not want to show you the password right here in the, in the Python script. So let me go ahead and create a, a project variable for you. 
and we'll give it a name called password one you're more than welcome to change the name to whatever you want but it will be at the 01 tc course project level Alrighty, so that's a little bit better instead of just keeping passwords right here in the Python code, every single developer on the team will be able to see it. And maybe not everybody have access to the project variables, but everybody have access to the Python code. So think about it this way as well. Can I delete this project variables password one and just hard code it and say double quote test? Of course you can, it will still work as well. Make sense? And then now that I have the, the username and the password, the recorder actually submitted the button by clicking on the button that says login. Okay. Once you've done that, it's going to a different page and the title of that page was page default. So again, you can change that in the name mapping to give it a better name, but it is the name of the page. So there is really um, um, a navigation going on in here. We went from the login.aspx page to the default.aspx page. So if I go to the image button and I actually start finding object, I might fail. Why? Because this code in here will run very fast. One line after the other, tuck, 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 really fast. Okay. So my worry is that I might cause a navigation on line 14 and then on line 16, I am trying to find an object. What if something happens and that page is actually taking, let's say, two or three seconds, God forbid, it's a slow site. And the page has not rendered yet the one I'm navigating to. That, that line number 16 is going to fire up anyway. So it might cause a problem. It might actually say, I can't find the object that you're telling me about. I'm going to fail. But the nice thing in here, the recorder understands that there is a navigation going on between 14 and 16. So it put a page.wait. What does page.wait mean, folks? Page.wait means do not run any code after this wait until the page that I'm waiting on finish rendering because edge will receive a notification saying i finished rendering the page and once the page gets this notification then the wait can continue but the question is that how long is wait going to wait for is it going to wait forever no it's not going to wait forever so the wait in test complete is um is defaulted to 10 seconds which is 10,000 milliseconds and if you ever want to find out what is the really time out of wait go to tools all the way at the top there and we'll say default project properties click on that or the current project properties that's the default for everything or just the one that you're working on right now for this project we'll say current project properties for instance and if you open this up um, we will go to properties right there at the bottom the tab that says properties notice the password one has been added automatically to my variables which is great and then on the left side of the properties of the project itself i want to go and take a look at playback see the one that says playback let me put a red circle around this guy so everybody can see it right there this is a very important tab in here let's click on playback there we go and there are a lot of things and we will talk about a lot of them uh, over the course but the one i'm interested in right now is the one right here it says automatic uh, wait timeout in millisecond so the default in test complete is to wait for 10 seconds and that's it all right and it can wait in a lot of different places on that so let me go ahead and take it back to web store again so if i say just wait that means i'm gonna wait for 10 seconds okay the nice thing about wait is that what happens if this page loads in only one second well that means wait is gonna only wait for one second it's not gonna wait for 10 seconds but if the page one time waits for six seconds uh, it does not show up for instance this page does not load for six seconds then wait will wait for six seconds and not a second more and then it will run number line number 16. if you make the mistake in coming in here for instance which i've seen a lot of people do and will say delay like this and inside of there we'll say 3000 okay what does that mean folks that means i am trying to do a navigation but blindly i'm going to wait for three seconds uh, having no idea what am i waiting for i'm just doing a delay for three seconds okay that means nothing after line 15 will run for three seconds total after the three seconds then line number 16 will kick in i don't like running delays so if you ever see code written in test complete that says delay something just rest assured that there is the, the person that wrote that code is not really 100% knowledgeable about how test complete works. This is a really bad, lazy way of waiting on something without actually knowing what you are waiting on. Even though wait sometimes takes a little bit longer to set up, it is the right way to do it to write better code. Delay is just waiting on something blindly without having any clue what you are waiting on. So it's not good. Alrighty. So I'm going to say wait in here. Let's uh, W, by the way, is 
uh, capital and I will leave it empty in here so what happens folks if I don't want to wait 10 seconds remember when you don't pass anything at all that means you're going to wait on whatever the current project project is defaulted to and as you can see from the tools current project properties the playback says it is 10 seconds 10,000 millisecond can I actually come back in here with say 10,000 in here like this of course you can but that would be redundant you don't need to do that all right because that's the default so it makes no sense at all to enter it again so that's why people will leave it empty also you will see sometimes something like minus one what does minus one mean inside of test complete and you will see this in a lot of places minus one means the default all right so there are three ways to mean exactly the same thing you can say wait open and close parentheses that means 10 seconds wait minus one that also means wait 10 seconds and there is wait 10,000 and that also means wait 10 seconds so uh, of course I like it not to pass anything and lead, let the default work right away some people do not want to wait for 10 seconds so they want to actually override the number of uh, milliseconds so I will come in here with say for instance 4,000 that means only for this instance alone I am only going to wait a maximum of four seconds and after that I'm going to move forward so if it does not happen within four seconds I'm going to cause an error and I'm going to actually let line 16 start running as well but it will remind you in the log saying by the way I waited more than four seconds and it did not happen so I went I went for it I just want to let you know that this was an error your object was not found it was not available within the four seconds that you told me about does that make sense everybody so hopefully you understand what wait is all about all right and now I get into the uh, the new form now that I know that has uh, loaded already I clicked on something Do you remember what this click is this is the image button edit on the first record that said Paul all the way at the right side there was a button for edit this is it this is the edit button and then when I clicked on that the page had to refresh again I again I don't know how long this will take maybe a second half a second two seconds for our bad luck three seconds so I don't want to jump into line number 19 and start doing things inside of there automatically I want to wait how long will this wait take a maximum of 10 seconds but if it's very fast half a second it will only wait half a second if it happens and this page is loaded we're, we're good to go make sense everybody and then I'm going to get into the, uh, the text box I'm going to click inside of it I'm going to set the text to three remember the quantity was two now is three and then finally I'm going to click on the calculate button and um, at the end I'm going to end up uh, doing um, I think this is the update button and this one main content uh, we clicked on something else again that's why I don't like these names because these are the memory names so there might be a chance for you to go to name mapping and rename these things to something much much better to understand what you're clicking on if I want to find out really what this link CTL main content is go to the test visualizer all the way up the end and I think this is the red button all the way at the bottom in here so the one for calculate is right there and then the last one is the okay uh, in here okay so these are the difference between the last two so this is what my session is all about all right let's go ahead and give it a shot I'm going to go back to IE in here and I'm going to say log out you see the log out all the way at the, bottom, at the top there we'll say log out and we're back on this page or I can actually be on a different page I don't have to be here I can still run the test and it will navigate just because my first line if you remember all the way at the top there it is taking me to uh, to the page for the login the only thing that you have to be aware of is that uh, edge has to be running the browsers at item bt edge will not start edge how edge has to be running we will see later on how to do tested applications and cause edge to start we can actually do that as well okay so I'm going to close down this test visualizer let's give it a shot by right clicking in here and let's see if it will do the job I'm going to right click we'll say run this routine now let's kick back sit down leave the mouse and the, and the keyboard and take a look at the screen and see if it will do exactly what I expected to do so now edge will come to the front and it will start doing everything I told it to do by navigating clicking on the text box entering tester right now this is the system is doing that for us there's the word test log in it is going to log us in it's waiting for the page uh, object right now let's give it another second in here to uh, to navigate remember it has a maximum of 10 seconds to be able to do that oh it failed something went wrong 
So we want to find out, hopefully, from the error message that came in, and this could, could have been caused because of a delay or something went wrong in the application or latency or the network was down. Something happened that made this not work. So I want to find out what it is. And sometimes these things happen. You lost connectivity or Wi-Fi or something like that. Uh, that is fine. Okay, so it says the alias for the browser page default was not found so maybe the title have changed on the fly let's go ahead and give it another run in here just to make sure we'll right click and we'll say run this current routine and we'll uh, we'll wait for it and we'll see if this was just a glitch we'll run this one more time and again it will have to navigate yet again to the page for the login and enter tester and test coming in from the project variable there you go tester and then it will put test from the variable and we'll click on login and waiting for the page default object we'll wait for it it looks like it's gonna fail again so maybe this page actually is dynamic and it keeps changing its title every time we uh, we deal with this it's gonna give us an error again and I'm glad these things are happening to find out how we're gonna deal with this how we're gonna fix that problem so let's go ahead and take a look after this test finishes and give us the same error it says page default is not happening so we'll uh, we'll go ahead and wait for that page let's wait for it to finish there we go and it said the object page default does not exist it was not able to find that page so let me go ahead and take a look at uh, why that is so it looks like the button was clicked with the left mouse button which is the login button and right after that it did not take us to the page default so it could not actually uh, wait on anything because we didn't move away from the login why do you think that might be if you remember what i've done actually i went uh, let me go back to edge in here for a second I entered tester and then I clicked on here and I said test T-E-S-T -E alrighty and it looks like a window came up and I clicked on login alrighty the problem is that if there is a window in front of it and I immediately go into login that first click is just gonna make that dialog go away so actually we did not click on the login we just clicked on the window in front of it so this might be a problem thing so again it might be a good idea to do what we did with tester which is after we enter something click somewhere in the green area just to make the dialog go away and then click on the login otherwise the first click you think that you're clicking on login it might be just clicking on that window that popped up and it's causing you a problem so how do i cheat and make this happen so if i go back to my web store in here you will notice there is a click somewhere in here to make it uh, go away uh, let's see yeah this one this line number nine when i enter tester before i go to the password i just click somewhere in the green area so let's do a control c on this line and then uh, after i entered the password there i want to actually paste that line again so before i click on the uh, login button i want to make sure that that this line in here for the form asp.net form dot click somewhere on the, on the window has clicked once just to make sure that any pop-up that came up in uh, in edge or firefox or chrome will go away uh, so that the login button gets the the focus and the click um, on it immediately okay let's go back in here and i'll do this so 9 and 13 are identical lines just to trick the system into uh, making it go away okay let's go ahead and give it another shot i'm going to right click we'll say run this routine and let's see if this will actually fix the problem hopefully you can see from what i'm doing it in here that sometimes the recorder will record something and might you might be getting annoyed that uh, running the recording is not working 100 percent as long as you understand what's going on we can work with the python code that got created by the recorder we can actually fix it so that's the first one clicking away there is a second one clicking away now when i click on login it worked and now we're trying to find out where the edit button it clicked on it and then it put three calculate and update and we are done and the test is 100 percent successful what i'm trying to show you here is that not everything is perfect especially for web browsing for web browsers like chrome and edge there are always things going on especially people now have things like uh, last pass and uh, and one password and things will keep popping up from the browser telling you do you want to save this into your chain for path 
And you have to really understand that sometimes during the test, these things will pop up and you have to make them go away. And we do not want to affect the test itself. So be very careful with that as well. The good news is it did exactly what I told it to do. And it was able to get us to exactly where we want it to be. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about organizing of your test. If I go back to my web store in here, you will notice that I have way too much stuff going on. And this might be okay for you, but for a lot of people, uh, especially when you work in a team environment, you're actually doing too much in here. That means, first of all, you're logging in and continuation of your logging in, you're clicking on edit, moving between pages and doing a lot of stuff. And that might be too much. If another members of the team need, need to test something in the app, they also have to log in. But you didn't give them a chance to just borrow your login uh, function because you have it included with a lot of other stuff. So try to always be very atomic. That means everything you're trying to accomplish in your test, make it into a function just by itself. So other members of the team can call into it without having to get too much baggage that comes with it. So that means now I need to refactor that test. So one of the things I like to do, you will notice that I never create my scripts like this all the way at the root of the script project item. I always create folders. And that's usually how you start the organization of your test. So I'm going to go under script and here we'll right click on this guy and we'll say add. And instead of adding a new script, I'm going to say add a new folder. And instead of this folder, I'm going to go ahead and rename it. We'll call it, for instance, uh, web store. We'll say web store. Again, you can call it whatever you want. And instead of this web store, I'm going to move this web store file into that folder. So drag it and drop it and put it inside of there. Excellent. And now instead of this web store, I would like to create another, um, we'll come in here, we'll say right click, add a new item. And I would like to create a brand new file in here and we'll call this one login, login. All right. So in this login file that just got created, it's going to be completely empty. What I can do now is actually I can cheat a little bit and move some of the code from the web store into that login file. So let's go to web store one more time like that. And then I will go grab maybe this piece all the way to the click button. This one, we'll say Control X. Alrighty, I'm going to move it into the clipboard, cut it there, and I'm going to go to the login. Let's go double click on this guy. There you go. And in here we'll say def, we'll say login. That's the name of the function for me. And I'm going to be pasting that code in here. Whoever has access to the function called login in the unit called login, they can borrow that code and that will allow them to navigate to the page, enter tester and test, and we are in good shape. It will work. But there is nothing else I'm doing it in here. Sounds good? If I go back to the web store, right now this web, web store test might be a different kind of function. Maybe the one that says uh, edit and calculate. So I'm going to change the name of it. We'll say edit calculate and update okay that's a very long name but that's okay because we're editing the quantity three clicking on calculate and finally with updating the whole record but this will not work by the way this will not work if i don't uh, have the login happening so if i run this function as is right now it's going to fail why because I did not log into the application. But the nice thing about it is that I can go all the way to the top in here and I can run the function login that is available in my script units. And uh, that will be completely separated from the rest of the, uh, the unit. Does that make sense? All right, great. So the name of the unit here is called login. And if I click on it, the name of the function is called login. Uh, I'm going to change it so you don't get confused. I'm going to call this one log me in. Okay, so the function will be different than the unit. So the unit is called login and the function is called log me in. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Let me save all that. Let's go back to the web store. How can I actually in Python being able to use the log me in? Well, it's not in the same unit, so it cannot see it. So I will need to import that. So I'm going to go all the way to the top and we will go ahead and say import. Let me go ahead and do import in, uh, in Python and we'll put the name of the unit. You don't have to worry about the folder for web store. This is just visual. The web store here is visual, okay? As far as Python is concerned, still all the files are at the same uh, place under script. This is just visually to be able to separate where um, the references to these units are. So I'm going to come in here with say login like this, and that will automatically allow me 
to import the login. Now when I go inside of a function inside of my web store, I can use the name, let's say login dot, and I should be able to get access to all my functions. We'll say log me in. What happens, folks, if the login contains like a uh, 100 different functions? And I don't want to bring in import all of them. I just want to import uh, just maybe some of them. So I can actually change this import login. I can say from uh, login import log me in. That means I only need you to bring in log me in. OK, but for right now, I'm going to bring everything as well. Or you can actually say from uh, log, uh, login import star. It means bring in the kitchen sink. Everything in the login file, bring it in. Alrighty. Uh, but again, if you would like to make it very, very specific, you can actually bring in just the log me in by saying from login uh, import log me in. And that's the only thing that will be imported into web store. So there is a lot of different ways to do it. Import the kitchen sink, import it from star, which is the same thing, or from the file, import a specific function if you would like. Make sense? So now when I just add the log me in, if I run now the function called web order um, uh, edit calculate update, the first thing it will do, it will run all the code in my login function, and after that it will continue to do that work in here right away. Isn't that cool? Let's go ahead and give it a shot. We'll right click in here and we'll say run this routine. I will sit back and relax and it should do exactly the same thing again. It should navigate to the login page and do exactly what I told it to do again. So we'll, uh, we'll wait for, uh, for the edge to come up and then it will navigate us to the login page and it will do the same thing. There it is. Tester, click away. Test, click away and then click on login. And now, oops, what did I do? Um, name error browser is not defined. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the browser object in here is actually being defined in the other uh, function. So that's not going to work. So we will need to fix that as well. Make sense? All right. So how can I fix that problem? Because the first I'm going to say browser dot page default is not going to have any clue which browser you're talking about because it's not local or not available inside of this unit at all. Let's go back to login. And now if I would like to reuse that browser object instead of declaring it like this locally inside of here, maybe what I can do can make this a project variable as well. So every single thing, including a scripts and keyword testing, can have access to it as well. Excellent. Let's go back now into my 01 TC course. Let's go ahead and double click on this guy. And I'm going to go to the variables tab all the way at the bottom. And let's go ahead and create a brand new item. We'll say add a variable. And in here, this variable, we'll call it, for instance, browser. All righty. And instead of being a string, I'm going to make it an object because we will contain an object inside of there. So let me bring this down and we'll find object there it is i don't need to give it a default value is fine and let's save this file all right and now let's go back again into my login and instead of actually creating a variable in here what i'm going to do i'm going to assign the value i'm going to say project dot variables dot and hopefully we'll see the new one that's called browser that i just created right there go down say browser and that will equal to the aliases the browser so now i'm gonna not gonna save the browser object into um, my uh, local variable i'm actually putting it at the project level does that make sense and now in here um, i'm gonna have to use the same thing over and over again let's say control c this guy every time i see a browser i'm gonna actually try to use the browser um, the browser dot browser window maximize and then this browser as well i'm going to actually do this uh, one of the things that you probably could have done is creating a browser local make it equal to this guy so you don't have to change it everywhere so let me do that is better i'm going to actually uh, clean up all the stuff and we will leave this as browser like that and then the previous line we can actually create a, a browser variable and that one will be equal to the project um, project dot variables dot browser there you go do you see what i did here folks otherwise you'll have to change the word browser everywhere in here and maybe that's just uh, time consuming just create a brand new variable but this time it's pointing to where the browser is um, um, inside of there does that make sense so uh, hopefully that makes sense to everybody 
well, maybe I didn't get my coffee this morning. It's actually the other way around. So let me let me go ahead and fix this code because that's not how I want to do it. I want to actually uh, still have that code. Control X, this guy. And after the first assignment of the browser, after this line, I just want to be able to do uh, this equals to the browser. Hopefully that makes more sense. So now I will still use the word browser everywhere, but I'm also going to keep a copy of that browser object and I leave it at the project level in here as well. And I can continue to use the browser everywhere in here is fine. But if I save this and I go to my web store, whenever I need to use the browser object, now I need to get it from the uh, variable of the course itself from the project, not the browser because it doesn't know anything about this guy. Does that make sense? So I can actually put here project.variables.browser or I can just assign it in here after I log in. I'm going to say browser equal and we'll say project dot variable variables dot browser. There we go. And then I don't have to change anything in the code. It will still get it from there and hopefully it will keep us going. Does that make sense, everybody? You're with me? All right. Let me go ahead and right click in here and say run this routine and let's see if this one will work. So the first thing we'll do, we'll, we'll run the login function. It will navigate us to the login page. It will enter the username and the password and click on the button for login. And if we've done our job right, it should continue with the object for the browser itself and continue doing that. There is tester and then there is test and then the login. And now it's going to click on the edit and notice that we are passing now between different units. We're passing the browser object between them using the uh, project variable. And we should be in pretty good shape. Um, and it finished. See, it's in the green all the way at the bottom. It's a green and we are successful. And then everything will, will show up correctly. Let's wait for it to, uh, to show up the test. It's writing out the XML file for the lock test right now. And there it is. All of it is successful. But now we can actually end up having maybe two, three, four or five different atomic functions and they can all call each other. Like I'm done with the web store in here, but it's atomic. It means if anybody else on the team needs to log in, they shouldn't be wasting their time and do exactly what I did. Just call my functions could log me in inside of the login unit and then move on with life, <laughs> right? So, and if they need to change something, maybe they need to call web store and then they can continue from there. So the, the team can build on each other's work instead of ignoring everybody else's work and start over every time you're trying to do something. So being atomic like this, now you have almost like a Lego project. So you can actually use the pieces. There is like 20, 30 different functions available. Just borrow from them and, and just add the piece that you need for your test and move on from there. Does that make sense? All right, let's do something a little bit extra. So far, we've been very lucky when we ran this, especially with the login, for instance. It worked because Edge was running already. So if I go back to Edge in here, let's open it up. I'm going to go ahead and close Edge. Okay, so now Edge is not running on my machine. What do you think will happen if I run the log me in? If I right click in here, we say run this routine. What I'm telling it is actually to go ahead and use Edge instance for the browsers and navigate. And actually, test complete is going to wait for 10 seconds, hoping that uh, BT Edge will start looking or, or showing up on my screen. Uh, but notice actually here, it will uh, um, it will actually uh, start up another instance of Microsoft Edge and, in, and it will start. That used to not happen before, by the way. Sometimes we had to call it ourselves, not to count on the Edge will start right away. So. Uh, even though this is going to end up working for us, don't count on it um, because some other browsers might not be able to start automatically if they do not exist. So this is a good thing. This has actually changed over the years. And now even if Edge or Firefox or Chrome are not running, it will try to find it and run it for you. One of the things I usually like to do is that before this line in here, just to make sure that I can do it myself, I will say browsers.item dot item like this and I will pass the BT um, edge right there there you go and then I will use something called oops there's too many brackets there let me <laughs> remove this guy and then I will say dot and there is a function here called run all right 
and I don't need to do anything. I just need to call run. That means before you navigate to a specific page, I want you to run the browser. But now in test complete starting, I believe test complete 14, we are right now at 15.5 and even in the future, even if you don't do this run, if Navigates finds out that BT Edge is not available, it will try to start it. And if you don't have Edge installed on your machine at all, this will cause an error. Alrighty, but it would be a good idea for you to do the run yourself to bring it up. There is another way to do this as well. So if I put a comment on this guy, let's go ahead and do that. There is another way to actually uh, bring up Edge on the machine and that's called tested applications. It's not available in the project right now. If I go right click on the TC course, the name of the project will say add new item. It will bring a list of all the project items that have not been added yet to the project. And one of them is at the bottom here called tested applications. If I double click on it, it will add a brand new project item called tested application over here on the left side at the bottom. We'll give it, give it a second here. There it is. And now I can go to the tested apps and I can actually add a brand new app, for instance. So now I will go, for instance, and, uh, and find out from my hard drive what is um, the place where the IE executable is at. So this could be a Windows application, a mobile application, a Java application, 32 or 64 bit, Adobe Air, Click Once, Microsoft Windows Store application, BitBar, local Appium application, iOS or Android, they're all available in here as well. Now these are legacy, you should always use mobile web app anyway. But IE Edge is a Windows application. So I'm gonna click on the first one in here. Alrighty. And then we will go ahead and find out from my hard drive where is IE or uh, um, uh, edge.exe, for instance, the name of the executable for Edge. So I'm going to click on this guy and let's go ahead and find out where it is on my machine. There we are. I believe it's under program files 86. We'll say uh, C colon backslash. Let's go all the way to the root of the C drive. And there is my program files x86 we will look for something called microsoft in here let's find it there is microsoft and then under microsoft there will be edge there it is edge all righty and then under application let's double click on this guy and i'm hoping for ms edge.exe that is the executable for edge on my machine let's double click on that if I would like to pass in a command line parameter, or maybe I want to put in where the folder is, which is the application folder, I can put it. I don't need to, this will work right away. I'm going to say finish. But notice now that under tested app apps on the left side, there would be a brand new item underneath it for MS Edge in here. Let's give it a second to do that. MS Edge right there. And every time I'm going to uh, uh, spawn it or launch it, it's going to actually create one instance of MS Edge on, on your machine. What does that mean for us? That means if I go back to my web store, instead of actually doing an item btedge.run, um, which is a very special thing for browsers only, you cannot do this with a regular application, but browsers are special, so you can do browsers.item btedge. If this is with Notepad or Word or Excel or PowerPoint or something like that, you can do this, of course. You have to do it the way I'm doing it with the tested apps. So I can come in here, we'll use the tested apps object there it is if i push enter notice it's blue that means test complete knows what a tested app is we'll say da and then hopefully we'll see the ms edge here somewhere there it is there is the ms edge that's the object i added we'll say dot and look at the options that i have i have one in here called run okay that will run the application on your machine there is another one called launch and i want you to really to understand the difference between the two run in here folks will will cause edge to start but it will not run any other code after that line until um, until edge uh, comes up and tells test complete i finished loading you can keep going all righty so that's a good thing all righty that's the one that you should always use if i say launch it doesn't wait for anything launch means yes start edge but don't wait for me to tell you that i started start running the code underneath it so the bad news about launch is that you might launch an app that might take two or three seconds, you're running other code underneath it, and it starts getting errors because you are trying to navigate, trying to click, but Edge did not even start yet. It took two, three seconds for the application to start. Sometimes it's necessary, especially when you use like Active Directory or Azure Active Directory login for credentials, another window will come up. So you'll have to do a launch to be able to continue entering your username and password somewhere else. 
If you do a run and a dialogue comes up for you to, to, to log in, <laughs> you are stuck. We are not going to move to run that code until actually uh, Edge finishes loading. So you are now between a, a rock and a hard place. So that's why launch sometimes is expected whenever you have to log in into Active Directory or a different kind of um, over authorization or authentication. Make sense? So for us here, we'll say just run and that will be more than enough. Usually you will never see code like this for browsers. I just, uh, I'm giving you an example, but mostly tested apps, dot, notepad, word, Excel, a Windows application, not a browser. And a browser usually is done with the first line. So I'm gonna remove this guy from here. All right, so we'll bring in the, uh, the browser in here, say BT Edge, BT Chrome, BT Firefox, IE, and then you'll say dot run, and that will guarantee us that before we start doing the navigation, it will automatically launch it if it's not available. The good news um, that even if we don't have this line, when you first try to navigate on, a, on an item for BT Edge or Chrome or Firefox, if it does not find this in memory, instead of giving you an error, it will launch the instance in memory and you will get a BT Edge. Of course, you have to have the application installed on your machine. If you don't have Edge on your machine, this is not gonna do anything for you. It's just gonna error out after 10 seconds because it's gonna wait for 10 seconds. That's the timeout. Hopefully that makes sense, everybody. Let's go ahead and take a look at the name mapping so far, folks, that we did on this project. Just reminding you that when I created that project, I told the system I want to use XPath and CSS selectors. I do not want to use name mapping for the web. So when I go to the name mapping here and double click on this guy, I know we have been working on this with a lot of different videos. So there will be multiple applications from Notepad to the orders application to the browser. So under system in here, we'll have a lot of different applications you can see in here, right? The one I'm interested in in here is to take a look a little bit about the browser object. So let's go ahead and open up the browser object. And there is the browser window. There is the main page for Smart Bear. There is the login application as well. And here, and there is another login that happened. So let me just go ahead and maybe uh, take a look at the web uh, order page. So the, the orders login, the one that has the username and, and password and also the login button, they're all in here. There is a form, there is a submit button, there is a, a text box for the username, and there is a password in here as well. So if I go, for instance, to the username, if I click on this guy, notice here it does not have a regular name mapping. It's using XPath. That means it's using an input element and it's using an add ID. I mean, you have to know XPath, of course, and CSS selectors. But again, uh, there are multiple ways. It doesn't give you, give you one way because some things might change. But the first thing he's going to try to do is an XPath saying, I'm looking for an input element. It could be a button. It could be a text box. But in that element in here, I'm going to use an ID. It has a label in it and the value dot equal is the value is called username. Okay. So it's going to actually try to, to do this in here for you to try to find it. What happens if something changes and the value is not called username anymore? Maybe R&D changed it. This will fail. So instead of failing miserably completely and giving you an error, there are two other chances it's going to try to do. It's going to try to actually find it by CSS selector. So it's going to try to find a selector. That's the, the hashtag in here. It's called CTL00 uh, underscore main content underscore username. That is the CSS associated with that specific element as well. Hopefully there is only one of them that is called, has a class called um, CSS, uh, class equals, and that's the name for the username. If you have two different uh, input elements and both of them have a class that has the same exact name, that would be a problem as well. We, this has to be unique on the page, okay? If both of them actually fail, alrighty, there is another thing it's going to try to do. And that's a very weak one, which is it's going to use an X pass to find an input element, like a text box, of type text. Well, that's not a good thing. Because our username and password, both of them, this would be correct too. So we don't want it to get to that last one because now it's going to be really problematic for me. So hopefully the first one will always work. If not, the second one will work. But hopefully we do not get any further than that. Usually I will go delete that. I will click on the third one. We'll say remove. And I can add my own. Maybe I know how to use XPath and CSS selectors. And I can add five, six, ten different things saying, if this fails, do this. If this fails, do this. But I know a lot of attributes like inner text, inner HTML, outer HTML, outer text. Remember, there is 120 properties. I can use XPath and CSS selectors really to find the one that never changes on the page. So I can find it exactly the same way. If this is dynamic 
and maybe you're using something like React or Angular or Vue, some of these frameworks, and it's never CTL00 main content underscore username. Every time you refresh the page that is dynamic, it will create a completely different name and number. That means this will never be useful for us except once, and after that it will not work again. So try to add, click on add in here, and then go ahead and use the X pass and add a selector, click in here, and then go ahead and, and, uh, and put whatever selector. And there are a lot of tools out there that will show you how to create this slash slash input or whatever. So you don't have to remember. Of course, if you've been using X pass and CSS selector, uh, that uh, will be a good thing. So you can don't have to count on a third party product to tell you what the X path or the CSS selector mean. Make sense? But it's not using the mapping for that whatsoever. And there is a price to pay, to be honest with you, if you are not using name mapping, which, by the way, I think is the right thing to do for web testing. This is the right way, XPath and CSS. I, For the last few years, I don't use name mapping for web testing at all. This is a much better way. But there is a little bit of a price to pay for that. Let me show you what it is. If I click on the object browser in here, folks, let's take a look at the page that I have in I, uh, in. Uh, in edge itself so it's going to load from memory all my objects like we did in the first chapter let's give it a second to load all that stuff there we go there is edge right there and inside of edge if i open it up i should see one tab that is open inside that's the page for secure smart bear blah 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 it's all over there right there makes sense so what happens for instance if i open this guy up there is my form and there are a couple of panels and a table zero in here let me open up the table zero to see what's inside of it there is a cell and notice there is a screenshot in here that shows you exactly what's going on alrighty so I'm going to actually use the other cell that contains multiple panels and we'll open up uh, panel zero there is a text node this is the one that says log log out for the welcome tester let's open up the panel one maybe that's better for us let's go ahead and click on that All right, so now I have a lot of different things inside of there. Let's go ahead and click on panel two and see from the image what panel two is all about. There you go, this is the part I want. So if I open up panel two, for instance, I will have access to the table, which is the order grid, and every single cell will be inside of here. What is the problem with something like this? This is using name mapping, okay? So if I right click, for instance, on one of the cells, let's click on this cell, for instance, 05, and it, 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 the one that says street. I can right click on it and would say highlight this on the screen so notice it highlights it in red just to show you what this is but the important thing is i can only go one way i can go from here to the application what if i want to use an object spy remember the object spy is going to try to use the x pass and the css selector so if i click on the object spy in here to go the other way like we've done before on the first chapter for the object spy let's go ahead and click on this guy And there is our object spy and now let's go ahead and drag this object spy and let's say for instance i want to go for the las vegas nevada and let's wait till we see a red rectangle around it let's click on that and now the system is going to try to find it but look at that it's not using name mapping because remember in the beginning of creation of my project i told it not to use name mapping use x pass and css selector what does that mean for us it means I can go the other way around. Remember that button all the way at the top right that I told you about? This is the tree view to show it in the object browser. What happens if I say, show me that Las Vegas in the object browser? Let's click on this guy. And now we can actually close down this window. Once that's complete, comes back up again. I'm going to shut it down. But you will be disappointed to know that the system will not be able to figure it out because it's not using name mapping. It's using a find element, which is an X pass way of doing things. So we wait for it to actually load. And once it loads, I'm going to go ahead and say close this guy. And it did find it. All right. So this <laughs> used to not work. But now it's actually working. And before, this is based on name mapping. And it actually, um, they fixed it, I believe, in 1550, um, which is great for us. Because it automatically switched from the name mapping way inside of here automatically to show you that as well. Before, we can only go one way from here to the highlighting in the application. But because the application was created with XPath and CSS, we were not able to use the object by. So this is great news for all of us. So I'm glad in 1550 this is working. Now you can actually go even from find element, which is XPath. You can still find the element in here that says Las Vegas and it will work either way. So that's, that's very, very good news. So hopefully I learned something with you today. So this is excellent. 
but I also wanted to show you how we can create another project that is based on name mapping instead of defined element for the XPath and CSS, just in case this is something that you're inheriting from a legacy project that are using name mapping, how you can continue working with that. So let's do that in the next video. All right, so in this video, I need to create another project. So I'm going to actually collapse the 01T course and I'm going to go right click on the project suite itself. Let's go ahead and click on that. And I'm going to say I'd like to add a brand new item. That means a brand new project in here. And we'll call this one 02TC course. How about that? Sounds good. So I'm going to say 02TC course. There we go. And I'm going to use also Python. And remember, because this is a separate project in the project suite, I can use a different language. I do not have to make it Python because the other one is Python. But inside of the 01TC course, I don't have a choice. Everything inside of it has to be Python. I cannot mix and match languages. So I'm going to leave it as Python for this one as well. Generate the default content. And this time, remember not to choose the XPath and CSS selectors. Even though that's my preferred way of doing it, just to prove the point, I'm going to actually check it uh, off and we'll say OK there. And now a brand new project is being created and it's going to be called 02TC course. Let's give it a second here to load itself. And there we go, the 02 TC course. And notice it's not highlighted in black like the uh, the first one. That means the, the default is still 01 TC course. If you'd like to change and make the 02 TC courses your default project inside of this project suite, right click on it and actually choose to make this as a default project for the project suite. So we click on that and now this will be highlighted. So you can tell visually which one is the default project that we're working with at this point. Make sense? So let's go back to unit one here inside of there. And I would like to record again inside of here. So I'm going to click on the record, for instance. And we will go to the uh, IE or, or the Edge, Microsoft Edge in here. And let's say, for instance, we're going to say uh, check all. That's all I wanted to do. We'll say check all and then we'll say stop. All right. That it automatically caused the name mapping to happen for us automatically. It is not using XPath and it's not using... Um, a CSS selector at this point. So we'll, uh, we'll choose it to stop and then we will see what the code that we uh, that got generated for me in Python will be available in test complete. We'll give it a second to finish creating the code and we'll take a look at it. All right, so the first thing it will look at, it will say the default items, project items, you don't have name mapping. I should add one. Would you like me to create a name mapping? We'll say yes, please go ahead and do that. We'll say okay there. So name mapping as a project item will be created. And then we will have the code generated in the unit one for us here in a second. Awesome. That got created. That is my browser item BT Edge. We know all the stuff already. The part that I wanted to show you in here is the name mapping piece on the second project. Let's double click on this guy. And you'll notice I only have in this project only the browser. Let me go ahead and open up the browser. That is the page. That is the form. That is the, ta the table, the cell. The panel but I wanted to show you something in here notice there are no X pass and there are no CSS selector it's using the old way of doing name mapping that means I can go for instance to the link check all which is a check mark if I double click on it it will open up the name mapping window right it will not actually use X pass and CSS selector it will still work but sometimes it requires a lot more work because it shows you all the properties available and which one you want to actually check against Let's say, for instance, this specific uh, check checkbox have a hundred different properties. Test complete is not going to use them all to find out if that object exists or not. It's going to use whatever got moved from available to the left side using these uh, buttons in here. So only it's going to check two things: that you are a link, which is a hyperlink, and the contents text has to say check all. If these two things are correct, we'll find you. The problem with that is, like I said in the name mapping chapter. Uh, if there is two checkboxes on the screen and both of them have the words check all, this will fail because name mapping requires that whatever you're selecting will come back as only a unique one item only. If there are multiple objects in memory that have the same exact properties of the selected properties, it will fail. It will say ambiguous call. So you'll have to come back in here and move some more stuff from the right side to the left side to make it unique. Alrighty, but hopefully on our page, we only have one checkbox that says check all. 
But if you have more than one, no go. <laughs> so that's what you have to understand about name mapping. I don't use name mapping anymore in web testing. I use it for desktop application and so on. But for the web XPath and CSS selector is a much, much better way like we have seen in the previous video to do that. I just wanted to show you the difference between choosing name mapping uh, or you can just leave it as the default, which is XPath and CSS selector, which is a much better way. All right, folks, in this chapter, I'm going to have multiple videos regarding project management. Think of it as tips and tricks, really, for project management that I really want you to concentrate on. I'm going to go back to my unit one that I created all the way in the beginning of the course. Remember when we had two function test one and test two, one of them actually ended up uh, opening up notepad and typing good morning in it. And the other one just changed the value inside of there from, uh, from good morning to be able to say Lino was here, for instance. So instead of test one and test two, let's go ahead and change the name for that. We'll say uh, write to notepad. That's the name of my function. Sounds good. And then test number two in here will say uh, change to Lino was here. That's the name of the function as well. Let's do a, do a control S to save this file. And what I would like to do at this point is to show you that uh, I can actually use something called the execution plan. Probably you wondered for the whole course so far, what is this project item all the way at the beginning? Let me put a red circle around it so you can see it. What is this execution plan right there? Well, execution plan means that instead of right-clicking inside of a function, I'll say run this routine, or using, for instance, uh, right-clicking on the unit one in the Project Explorer and say run, and then choose the name of the function that you'd like to run. Uh, of course, I misspelled change. <laughs> Let me go ahead and do it again. All righty. Uh, how can I actually run this at midnight when I'm asleep? I'm not going to have somebody right-clicking and saying run this routine or whatever. I just need it to run by itself. So obviously, we will need to go to the project itself, which is 01TC course, and there is something called execution plan. Let's double click on this project item and let's take a look what's going on. Right now, it's empty. That means this button all the way at the top, see this one that says play here from the toolbar? It's not going to work. If you try to click on it right now, it will find out that your execution plan is empty and it was going to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. There are no items for me to run. So you really need to go into every single one of your units or your keyword testing and run them one by one manually. And of course, at midnight, while we're asleep, that's not going to be the case. So how can I create an execution plan? Well, go into that white space in there, right click and we'll say new test item. You don't have to do it based on a pop-up menu. Always the toolbar will say new test item as well. Like we said before, there are a lot of different ways of doing exactly the same thing inside of Test Complete. So I'm going to say new test item. And once I do that, it will create a brand new item. You can call it whatever you want. This is up to you. So I'm going to click inside of it. We'll say, for instance, notepad uh, writing. Maybe I just want to write the good morning in it or something like that. So that's the name of it. So I can remember what this is. It is going to be a test case. And then what is the execution entity? So if we click on the ellipses button inside of there, we'll show you every single keyword test and also every single script. See the keyword test and the scripts are available in here. I'm going to click on unit one. And these are my two functions, write to notepad. And there is another one called change to Lino was here. The, the, the names of the functions I created inside of that unit one. So I'm going to go to the uh, write to notepad, double click on that. And that will add this specific execution entity in here. And then the count will be one. That means when I click on the green button all the way at the top to run the project or at midnight when somebody runs uh, from a command line, for instance, test complete or test execute, like we're going to see later on. Uh, the first thing is going to find out in here is there is one item called notepad writing that is going to execute a function in unit one called write to notepad. Execute it once. If I say two or three, it will run three times right after each other. Sometimes we want to do that. We want to run the same function three times. You're more than welcome to do that. I'm going to just keep it at one for right now. Timeout here is in minutes zero. What does it mean? That means you need to wait for as long as the application needs for Notepad running to be ready to run. Because sometimes there is a startup code that you're going to have to write in events and so on. And it might not be ready for maybe 30 seconds or a minute because it needs to create a database. It needs to do something. 
So you might want to come and say one or two minutes and that is the timeout. That means I'm going to wait for two minutes and after that hopefully everything is, is in place. I'm going to go ahead and run my function. In general, I'm going to leave it at zero. It means do not start, um, do not wait for anything. Uh, just go ahead um, and wait forever until everything else is ran and then run the function called write in a notepad. Make sense? These are the most important things to know for right now. Um, uh, and if you need to pass a parameter, for instance, to this function, you will need to go ahead and pass it in here in parameters. Right now, this function write to notepad doesn't take any parameters, so I don't need to do anything like that. And then we will talk a little bit later, maybe in the next video, about on errors, what, what the system need to do on errors and so on. So I'll come back to this. But for right now, this is what I want the system to do. If I right click in here and I say I'd like to create another item after this, and maybe this one will be um, notepad, uh, we'll say change. For instance, that's the name of the item, and I keep misspelling change. Alrighty. And then I'm going to come in here, we'll use the ellipses again, and this time from unit 1, I'm going to tell it to run the second function. We'll double click on this one, and we'll leave it at 1 and 0 as well. And I can keep going like this, folks. So I can actually have maybe 10, 15, or even 100 different uh, items in my execution plan. Now, when somebody in the middle of the night says, hey, 01 TC course, run or execute yourself, it will respect whatever we have in this one by one in sequential order. That means write to notepad will run first and then change to Lino was here will run second. So let's go ahead and give it a shot and see if it will work. I'm going to, I have notepad running on my machine right now. So there it is. Okay. And now I'm going to go ahead and click on the green button all the way at the top. So I'm not really specifying which one is supposed to run. I'm just going to say run the entire project. So we'll click on run project and we'll sit back and relax and we'll see what test complete will do at this point. At this point, it will actually run the indicator at the top right of the screen, as you can see and it will come uh, run one by one in that order and then it will give me a full report on the entire run for that specific uh, project so there is the good morning that i told it to do with an enter key at the end and then it's going to change the value in the good morning to say lino was here we'll give it a second here to run the second one anybody could guess why it cannot find it <laughs> It cannot find the second function because I told it that it will be untitled probably all the way at the top. That's why I couldn't find it, which is good. We can fix that problem as well. So we can figure out how to, uh, to do that. We'll wait for the XML to be written out with the error and we'll come back here when it's finished. All right, there it is. The test execution summary. There are two runs. One of them failed and one of them passed. So this is the full report. You don't get that report if you're just going to right click on a function and say run this routine. You only get that report if you're running the entire project. So this is another good feature that you can actually have as well by running the entire project using the execution plan. So for the notepad writing, uh, that was successful and it took 18 seconds to run. And the notepad change, the one that I'm trying to do, the, the Lino was here, that failed for us. Uh, and it took 16 seconds to fail. If you forgot, for instance, why the second one failed, let me go back to unit one to show you. The first one here for the good morning was successful. The second one, I am actually telling the rich, uh, the, the, the main window of the notepad that it says untitled. Uh, so it worked on the first one, but in the second one, once I wrote the word good morning, the untitled have changed. So I need to go to the name mapping in here. Let's double click on this guy. And I'm going to go to Notepad. There it is. There is Notepad. And there is my Notepad main window. And there is the window class for both. That's good. And then the text box in here. Text box is going to be finding it by that. And the rich text editor, rich edit right there as well. I think I remember. And by the way, when you get an error like this, go ahead and click on the Notepad change and it will read you exactly what the error is coming from. So that will remind me. It says, unable to find object W and D notepad. Ah, I remember what the problem was now. I did change actually W and D notepad to say notepad main window, but in my code in unit one, I'm still actually hard coding it to W and D notepad. That's why the second one did not work. Let's go ahead and fix that. I'm gonna re remove the W and D notepad. We'll do a control space on the keyboard. And I believe I called it Notepad Main Window. Let's make sure. Notepad Main Window. Yep, that is the name that I changed in here. And now everything else will work the same way. All right, let's go ahead and save this file. Let's go back to the execution plan. 
and let's go ahead and um, clean up the notepad I'm going to delete everything from inside of there and we'll go ahead and tell it to go for it so I'm going to say run this one more time we'll uh, we'll sit back and relax and take a look at the screen what exactly is it trying to do for us at this point and right now notepad will come in the front we'll run the first function and we'll say good morning and then we'll push enter there it is we'll say good morning and then we'll push enter and now it will actually change by running the second function that would say Lino was here and it will be written out to the entire W text value of that we still got an error so let's see what happened in here maybe we can debug it together and find out what the problem is and as you can see the error this time it did find the main window but this time unable to find the object rich edit d2 dpt i probably i name renamed it so instead of wasting time let's open up name mapping and go to notepad and find out what we call them our uh, look at that uh, we called it notepad test e editor so we we moved it from rich edit okay so we'll we'll do this right this time i promise so instead of this rich edit we'll go ahead and delete it and then we'll say control space and we will use notepad text editor remember the original name was correct but i changed it in name mapping and i'm getting to it by aliasing so it will have to be the new name let's go ahead and do a control s and maybe this time we'll <laughs> we'll be lucky enough not to have to get an error so let's delete that go to the execution plan one more time and let's go ahead and run and i have a pretty good feeling this time we're going to be successful and each one in sequence between the two functions in the execution plan will probably work there is the first one and then Lino was here and notice you will get a green check mark at the bottom of my T1 uh, my 01 TC course and it's green and it's successful now the full um, run in here for the, the TC course will say that everything was in the green and I can go take a look at the summary notice two runs two pass no failures and no warnings and both of them are green uh, and I can go into the log details and take a look at each and every single one the first function there it is click on that and then you can click on the second one and take a look at uh, everything that was done so sometimes you'll have hundreds of different functions that ran instead of 01 tc course and you'll have each and every single one of them and if any of them have warnings or errors you can click on it and see what the error is or from a mile high you can read the entire summary of all the execution that passed did not pass failed or warnings and so on make sense now let's go ahead a little bit further and take a look at parameters so i'm going to double click on unit one so this function here this is called uh, change to lino was here i'm hard coding the value for lino was here but maybe i want to actually pass it as a parameter so i'll stay str for instance okay you can call it anything you want and that will be just the name of a parameter that you'd like to pass it to it and instead of hard coding all the stuff to Lino is here I will say str that means I'm telling the system that I cannot call it I cannot I cannot right click and say run this routine this will be grayed out as you can see because I did not pass the parameter for the string or the str or whatever name you gave it that means when I go back to my execution pen let me save this file I'm going to open up the execution plan right there notice now when I go to my function in here notice str is zero that means I have to pass it something I cannot I cannot just say run this this will not be enough I need to actually have a parameter so I'm going to open up the ellipses button in here under parameters and there is my string let's double click on the unassigned value and it could be a variant that means it can accept anything or I can actually make it a little bit more stringent we'll say string it has to be a string and in the value in here for instance Lino was here okay same thing we'll say okay there and now this is the value that will be passed into the str parameter when I run the function of course if I want to leave it empty that means I have to go back to my code and I'll have to say str equals Lino was here that means this is going to be a default parameter so if I don't pass anything the default will be Lino was here but I can override it by passing something from the execution plan like we've seen in a previous chapter as well but it you will have to do that from the parameters in here as well does that make sense the next one is a big deal for me and that is uh, what happens in the execution of test complete when something goes wrong this is something very dear to my heart by the way because it's not the correct default in test complete in my opinion so let me show you what I mean I'm going to go to the unit one in here 
and I'm going to create another function. Let's go ahead, for instance, in here, and we'll say define, and we'll say cause problem. All right, you can call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it uh, cause a problem. And then I'm going to come in here, and we'll say log. Remember when we said log dot and we said log dot a message? Remember, you can log a warning, you can log an event, you can log a, an error. So in my case in here, I'm going to log an error, okay? That means something bad is going to happen. So if I come in here, we'll say kaboom, <laughs> all righty? That's a technical word, <laughs> all right? And right after the kaboom in here, I want to log a message. We'll say log dot message and we'll say hello like this and then I'm going to copy that line and I'm going to be pasting it a couple of times all right there we go let's do this and instead of hello I will say hello and goodbye good bye okay what do you think folks will happen when I run this function I mean it could be in the execution plan or it could be just by right clicking and saying run this routine do you think it will lock three things? The first one will be a red X, it says kaboom, and then there will be a hello and a goodbye. Do you believe that this will be the case? And the default in test complete is no, that will not be the case. As soon as uh, test complete sees a problem, sees a red X, sees an error, because this error in here on line number 12 will cause a red X automatically, okay? It will bail out, it will get out of test complete and it will stop the execution. It means we will never get hello and goodbye. In my opinion, that's not a good default. I mean, I, I understand why they do this in test complete, just because a lot of people spend time running like the way I'm running it right now. And if there is a problem, I don't want to spend an hour going through other things. I want to go ahead and fix that problem first. But in reality, in real life, always think about your test that they will be running at midnight while you're asleep. And sometimes you'll have a thousand functions that will be running at the middle of the night, and it might take six or seven hours. The worst thing that can happen to you is that when you wake up in the morning and go to work and you look at your test results and find out that you started the execution at midnight and at 12.05 <laughs> an error occurs and it did not run any other test in your 1000 functions whatsoever. You will be very annoyed by that. What I want to tell test complete is that if you encounter an error, do not bail out continue just log it the error let me know what happened but don't stop keep going run the other test as well and the way to do that in test complete you'll have to go to tools and we'll say for instance current project properties on the project i'm working on right now and you will notice if we go under properties here at the bottom there is the playback which is one of the most important tabs in the project properties i'm going to click on playback in here and let's uh, find out where exactly is the default in test complete um, on error this one is the culprit right there this one it says on error right there and the default in test complete out of the box is to stop the current item not a good thing that's i would love for you to learn today if you learn something today looking at this is that the first thing i want you to change in test complete do not choose the stop current item which is the default Come in here and say continue running. Do not stop the project or the current test from running. So always say continue running. Does that make sense? I guess the best thing is to leave it as the default first just to show you what the problem is. I will leave it at uh, stop current item, okay? And we'll say save and let's go back to unit one. And I'm going to run this uh, function called cause problem. I'm going to right click in here and we'll say run this routine. Look what happens, folks, out of the box inside of test complete. I'm going to get a red X in the test log. I understand that. That's exactly what I'm telling it to do, is to error out. But hello and goodbye will never get a chance to execute. And that's not a good thing in my opinion. So let's give it another second here to run. And there is a red X, as you can see here at the bottom. There is a red X. It is an error. But you will notice all the way in the description of every single um, line in my function, Let's give it another second here to load the XML file that has the, uh, the results. There we go. It will say kaboom. Notice the word hello and goodbye are nowhere to be found. Alrighty. It bailed out on us as soon as it encountered an error in the execution. Not a good idea in my opinion. Let's go ahead and fix it. I'm going to go now to my um, tools. We'll say current project properties. We'll go back on error. And I would love for all of you to change it to continue running. Do not ever stop for anything. If it's an error, great. Log it and keep going. 
all right i'm going to say save this guy and now let's go back to unit one again and let's run the cause problem one more time we'll say run this routine uh, remember i'm going to still error out there will be a red x because I, I don't care how many times there was success inside of that function if one of them is an error it is a red x so there is if there is 10 different lines nine are successful and one is an error you're going to get an error <laughs> so it is still a red x but hopefully in my test result now i will see that the first line is a kaboom but hello and goodbye will be um, will be ran as well so i will be in a pretty good shape let's wait for it to run the uh, to load the xml file and there we go it's coming up and there is kaboom it's a red x hello and goodbye are successful and we did not bail out very important piece to understand uh, how to do that okay all right bear with me here in this video because this is a part that a lot of people get confused about instead of test complete and that is in the execution plan itself so far i've shown you uh, adding two functions right on top of each other in here but there is something very weird here it's called new child test item what is the difference between creating a test item or multiple of them and all of a sudden start creating new child item inside of there so let's go ahead and create another item we'll say uh, new test item and we'll call this one for instance uh, we'll say error out okay that's the name of my function is error out okay and then i'm going to go for the ellipses and i'm going to choose the third function in unit one that i just created which was called cause a problem we'll say okay there all right and i'm going to actually drag it and i'll put it all the way to the top in here i'm just i'd like to uh, actually instead of dragging now they have these arrows on the side in the toolbar i'll say move up and move up all right and i'm going to have it right there what happens now if i want to create a new child item or actually choose one of these functions to be indented it means i wanted to make it a child so click on notepad writing for instance and you see this arrow that will make it a child item of the error out let's click on this guy and now it will be a child i could also come in and, and come in here and say new child item and it will create another child of the child so you can have as many children as you want i'm not going to do that for right now i'm just going to go ahead and delete this guy we'll say delete this one it's fine and i just wanted to ask you if you would like to give it a shot what is the difference between having the three functions all at the same level or one of them is indented like this becoming a child of the error out what does that mean in test complete pause uh, pause the video maybe for a for a few seconds and i want you to think about that and the the confusing part is the way test complete is defaulted there will be no difference whatsoever because error out will run and it might succeed it might not succeed we don't care it will still go to the one right after it and it will succeed or will not succeed and then it will go to the next one whether this was a child or not have no bearing on how test complete is going to behave so people actually usually get very confused as i have no idea what's going on in here what's the difference between having this notepad writing as a child or unindenting it like this and make it uh, at the same level well folks this guy in here for the notepad writing for instance because it's a child element i will not get into it um, i can tell the system unless error out is successful only anything else i want you to bypass it so let's go to error out in here and by default it says on error use project on error property if i bring it down there would be multiple choices um, co continue running stop project stop current item use project on error property stop on error um, uh, property as well so in here if i say uh, use projects on error property there is something called on exception stop current item for instance and there are two different things there is the on error and there is the um on exception on error that's an error that's happening in test complete on exception that is a, an error that's happening in the application you are testing so sometimes test complete is happy but there is a, an exception or a divide by zero or a, a completely access violation in the application that you're testing that happened it will end up causing an error later on i'm sure but sometimes we want to find out where the error occurred first does that make sense so again it is important to remember you can overwrite whatever is happening under tools current project properties when i went to playback you can set it for everything or you can set it just for this one item only so i can say okay i want to respect whatever we have on the project on error property in my case i said continue or for this one only i'm going to say stop current item or stop the entire project 
Or I, if I say continue running, it will be the same thing because I already set it on the on the project level says continue running. Alrighty. So this is very, very important to understand. Okay. So what I'm saying right now, folks, is that because this is a child element, if error out actually causes an error, which will, it will, there will be a red X on the error out. Because it's a child, it will not run notepad writing. No children of a failed step will run. That means it will jump from error out and it will go run the notepad change in here. But notepad writing will not run. When will notepad writing uh, execute? Only when error out is, is in the green. It causes a green check mark. It means there are no errors caused by the error out. Then it will go into the children. Because for instance, let's say the error out is a function that is supposed to actually access a SQL Server database. And then I have four or five functions, children, one to do a select statement on the database, one to do an update, one is to do a delete, and so on and so forth. If the first one trying to establish a connection string with the database failed, okay, don't waste your time 10 seconds each to run five functions that you know are never going to work. If the connection string did not work, don't try to do a select or delete or update. None of them are going to work. So what I can do, I can make them children saying, if the connection string of the database fails, just bypass all of them. Don't do any of the children because there is no way they're going to work. Just go to the next item, which is the notepad change and keep going from there. And sometimes, actually, it's a lot more grave <laughs> situation. That means if error out um, causes a problem, it's not successful. Not only do I want to pass bypass all the children, I want to bypass all the functions, even the ones at the same level in here. So I can actually come in here and we'll say stop the project completely. That means uh, do not run anything in the project, just bail out. This is not going to work because every single function I have in here is based on a connection to the database. So instead of actually going to children or even sibling functions, if the connection string did not work, just bail out. Just get out of there. This is not going to work. Does that make sense, everybody? Very important to understanding what is this indentation in here. Indentation means if an error occurs on the parent, none of the children will run. It will just jump to the next one or it will bail out completely outside of this project. It's all based on what you do on the error in here. Make sense? Alrighty, in this chapter, we would like to spend some time talking about uh, low-level procedures. And when would you actually ever want to use low-level procedures inside of Test Complete? The answer to that is sometimes the mouse movement on the screen are important to you. Uh, and that require uh, uh, coordinates like X and Y coordinates, which we try to stay away from inside of any testing tool because with different resolutions, that will probably not work anymore. So we try to base everything on object, but sometimes you don't have that luxury. Let me go ahead and show you, for instance, what would it take to actually require mouse movement and clicking up and down on the mouse and so on that it will actually cause it not to work. So I'm going to go ahead and start, for instance, an application here on my screen that comes with Windows 11 and also Windows 10, of course, and that is the MS Paint application, okay? So there we go, we started MS Paint uh, from Windows. And what I would like to do right now is I'd like to record a session and in that session, I would really like to sign my name, the word Lino on the screen. And I'd like to see what out of the box, what is Test Complete going to really do for me? All right, let's go back to Test Complete. I'm going to create a brand new file in here, uh, a new unit, and we'll call this one Low Level uh, Procedure. You can call it anything you want, of course. We're going to call it Low Level Procedure. All right. And now I'm ready. So let's go ahead and uh, start um, recording in in python and we will click on the red button and that will minimize test complete for us but first it will ask me which unit would you like to record in i'm going to say the low level procedure one we'll say okay there and then test complete will minimize itself all right i'll give it a second here to, for the engine to start this is the first time this morning to uh, to bring it up so and now i'm going to go straight into ms paint and look what I'm going to do. I'm going to push the mouse down and then I'm going to start writing the word Lino in here. Even though it's not writing, it is happening. I'm going to even put the dot all the way at the top. That's fine with me. And then when I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and say stop. And let's see what exactly got created in Test Complete itself. 
is going to create a test one probably for the low level procedure and there we go there is a uh, a function for called test one and it was able to find out for instance a specific window all right and inside of this specific window it's actually doing some clicks and oh okay so uh, right now i'm using the recorder so it actually recorded that as well but i'm going to remove the couple of lines in here you shouldn't have seen that but that is uh the recorder that I'm using to make that video itself but in reality if you take a look at these two screens I actually I'm going to an application called MS Paint that's the process and then it has a main window called WND MS Paint app and then inside of there there is a view and then finally there is a um, an MFC window in C++ that's the word AFX for those of you that write um, uh, code for a living you probably know that AFX that, that tells us automatically how they wrote MS Paint MS Paint is an MFC C++ application from Microsoft uh, because of that. First of all, it found out that there is a horizontal and a vertical scroll bar. It doesn't um, know if it's going to be used or not, but it actually documented that they are at position zero, both of them. I can remove that. That is not important. But again, um, it actually um, put that inside of the script as well in Python. Also, there are two different drag operations that happen on the mouse. There are two X and Y coordinates in here, dragging from the starting point to the end, and then another one. If you remember what I did, I actually wrote the word Lino, and then I released the mouse, and then I, I went and put the dot on top of the I for Lino. So as a matter of fact, the first drag operation in here has the first mouse down and the last mouse up. To just do the Lino without the dot on the eye and then the final dot on the eye this is where I started and this is where I ended for the X and Y coordinates for that so if you read this code you're probably not gonna really have a lot of experience with this to be able to tell there is no way with only four different X and Y coordinates I will be able to write the word Lino on the screen so I wonder what exactly is uh, test complete doing in here so let's go ahead and open up MS Paint again and I'm gonna say file uh, new so that we can actually not save whatever it did and I would like to actually make it do this test one again So we'll right click and we'll say run this routine and let's sit back and relax and let's see what exactly is test complete gonna do for us by running this test Test complete will uh, probably bring in the MS paint to the front and it's gonna actually come in here and uh, it did exactly what I expected to do. And you'll notice it's in the green. We have a green check mark. It means test complete is very happy with itself. It says I did exactly what you told me to do. But in reality, it is very far from what I'm expecting it. So if I bring it MS Paint, there are two things that happen. This one in here, the first dot, that is the beginning of the word Lino, okay? And then it did not record anything at all. And then the last dot is the end of the uh, O, okay? And then because MS Paint is supposed to join the two together, it actually went from the beginning of the L to the final O, and it put a line. And then there is this little piece of black in here, and that is actually the, uh, the dot that I placed. Again, there are two different X and Y coordinates in here, the beginning and the end of what I did to put the DAW. But this is exactly what Test Complete recorded. Nothing in between during the mouse movement was recorded at all. Obviously, that is not what we want. So I'm going to go ahead and say new, and we will not save that. What I would like to do right now, I'd like to ask, ask Test Complete to do a real low level procedure for us to make this happen correctly. So, how do we do that? Well, First of all, there is a project item here in my, uh, my 01 TC course in here that is missing, that is specific to low-level procedures. I can actually add it to the project by hand. We can right-click on the project like we did before, and we'll say Add, we'll say New Item. Now it will show you a dialog that contains all the missing project items that are currently not showing in the project itself. So I'm going to take a look in here until I find something called Low-Level Procedure Collection. Let's click on this guy. And then from this point, I'm going to say OK. And you can call it whatever you want. By default, it's called LL Collection 1, but you can call it anything you want if you'd like. And that will add the capability of you doing low-level procedure uh, inside of your project. And there it is. OK. Now I can actually go ahead and start another one. So I'm going to click on Record again, exactly like we did before. And we'll tell it to go ahead and do it in the low-level procedure again. That's fine. That unit is good. We'll say OK. Test complete will minimize itself. But don't, don't run too fast to start writing the word Lino in here. There is one more step now we need to do. If you go take a look at the recorder all the way at the top, 
the button all the way at the end before the last button it's called test type if I bring this down you will notice there is two different uh, there are two different kinds of low-level procedure recording one that is called window coordinates and one is called screen coordinates folks I'm gonna actually give you an advice forget that this word exists the screen coordinates don't ever use that that is for backward compatibility from almost a decade ago this is not for backward compatibility when you see screen coordinates that means it's going to look at your screen and the zero zero point will be all the way to the top left of your screen. That is not a very good way of testing low level procedures. The reason for that is if the if the top uh, left dot of the entire screen is the one that we are referencing. That means even if you move your window to the right or the left, it will automatically mess up the entire test. So I don't like to do that. And that's only for backward compatibility from the old test complete. The one that you should always use is the low level procedure window coordinates. So instead of the zero zero being all the way at the top left of the screen, it will be the top left of whatever window you are actually testing like the MS Paint window, for instance. So even if you use the MS Paint window right, left, and you have a different resolution on whatever machine you're testing on, it doesn't really matter. It will just find the top left corner of the window. So it will be relative to the window you're testing, not to the screen itself. All right, let's go ahead and say I'd like to use the window coordinates. We'll click on that. And now it's going to probably ask me a couple of questions. Let's wait for the dialogue. Right now it's starting the engine for the low-level procedure to ask me a couple of questions. There is the first one in here would say, what is the name of the low level procedure? If I didn't add the LL collection one project item and I did this, it would have asked me a question before this one. It will say, hey, you do not have a low level procedure a project item. Would you like me to create one for you? And I would have said yes, but I did this manually, which the way you should organize your test beforehand, that would be a good idea. And then you're going to give a name to the procedure itself. In my case, I'm trying to write the word Lino. So I'm going to call it, for instance, Lino Signature. Okay. Oops. Let me go ahead and click in here first. <laughs> there you go. Lino Signature. Okay. You can call it anything you want, of course, but hopefully it's meaningful enough for our uh, test. We'll say okay there. And now you see the, the mouse moving right and left. Believe it or not, that is being recorded right now. So I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to go Lino one more time. There is Lino like that. And the reason, by the way, it is not working on the first one. That's because of the video driver, because I'm recording. So there is actually a screen capturing going on. In your case, this will work just fine. But for me, whenever I have something like Zoom or um, or Teams recording or using Camtasia or anything like that for video recording, it definitely conflicts with being able to see the first click on that. But it's still recorded it. Believe me, it's no problem. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and say stop right now. And let's see what test complete this time ended up recording. So if I go, for instance, in here to my uh, low level procedure, let's go there and let's see what it get create. Look at that completely different type of test. It created a test called uh, test number two in Python and it did an LL collection one. That's the name of the project item we created for that dot. And then it will create the Lino signature step that I created. And then it's executing something against the OBS 64, which is uh, not actually the correct window, but that's OK. What I'm trying to do in here is that I'm trying to show you what's going on exactly inside of this Lino signature. So let's double click on this Lino signature here. You will find out there is mouse movement galore going on. All righty. Every single mouse movement on the screen with its own X and Y coordinates and how many milliseconds did I stay at that specific pixel on the screen. So if I go down all the way at the end, there are tons of them. To write Lino on the screen, it looks like it took 1,030 different mouse movement on the screen with its own X and Y coordinates and its own millisecond to show you how much time did I stay on each and every single one. Does that make sense, everybody? So in reality, if I run this test again inside of the low level procedure, if I say test to go ahead and run, what it needs to do, it needs to go ahead and rerun all 1030 mouse movement, including the first mouse up and mouse down so that it can write the whole word Lino, not like before when we did the two drag operations and here that will not work. So this is the one it will actually end up working at this point. 
Another thing you need to be aware of, it did the execution against the alias, again, the OBS, that's the, the name of the program I'm using for recording this video. And like I said, there is always a conflict between the two. That will not be the case for you because when you're running this code on your machine, um, you will not have something like Zoom or Camtasia or OBS or anything like that running, so you'll be okay. So I'm going to have to cheat a little bit. I'm going to take this uh, this window right there, uh, the AFX for the alias for MS Paint, we'll say Control uh, C to copy it in the clipboard, and I'm going to make it not be the OBS, I'm going to make it the AFX. So uh, what do you expect to, uh, to happen now? Let me go ahead and say I would like to create a brand new file to make the canvas clean again. And I'm going to actually click on Test Complete, and then I'm going to go ahead and right click on the Test 2, and I would like it to go ahead and run. Before I, I click on that Run This Routine, I want you to think about it very much. What exactly is going to happen with that one line of code? I know you probably think it's going to run 10, uh, 1,030 different uh, pieces uh, of information for mouse movement and so on. But you might be very shocked about what's going to happen right now. It will do the job, but not exactly what you thought it would happen. So let me go ahead and click on this guy. I'm leaving the mouse and the keyboard. I'm just looking at the screen with you right now. And let's see what exactly is going to happen. And you will notice right now the test is running. And take a look at my mouse. See the mouse? The mouse is moving and right now it's writing the word Lino. Look at that on the screen. And it's putting the dot on top of the eye. And it's finished. And it will be totally in the green. And it will say, I am very happy with myself. I just ran 1,030 different steps in my collection. And I did exactly what you told me to do. And I'm going to stop the test and I will pass the test. Even though when I go to MS Paint, there will be nothing there. Alrighty? So the, the thing that a lot of people miss sometimes, they think because I actually have the aliases that MS Paint and, and so on as a parameter being passed, that everything will happen in MS Paint. And that is not the case at all because test complete is in the way. All right, I'm just running 1,030 different um, instructions, really, to tell the mouse what to do. So notice this is in the green, folks, okay? And everything I told it to do happened. Every single element in this Lino signature, which is 1,030 different mouse movement, was, uh, was definitely executed. But if I go to MS Paint, you'll be disappointed Lino was not written in here, okay? So how can we fix this problem? The fix this problem is that before you run this line, and this is something the recorder is not going to do for you, you need to add an extra line of code. You're going to have to write it in Python to tell the system before you execute my, uh, my, uh, my 1,030 different instructions, I would like you to make sure to bring in the main window of uh, MS Paint to the front. So you do it on the, on the window itself. That means this guy in here, aliases.mspaint.msPaintApp, uh, the main window. So I'm going to say Control-C for this guy. And I'm going to go in here and I'm hoping that Test Complete has a built-in function to bring a window to the front to make it focus. And there is one. So I'm going to actually say in here, we'll, we'll come in and we'll say uh, uh, aliases dot uh, Paint dot WND MS Paint app dot. And then there is a function built into Test Complete called activate. This activate window in here will bring in the window to the front. And then I can run my LL collection for the Lino signature and execute the 1030. And then they will happen on the window that has the focus to the front itself. Let's go ahead and try this now. We'll say run this routine. Let's sit back and relax. And let's see if it's going to be writing the word Lino only after the main window of MS Paint is activated. Yes, it is activated. Um, again, the, the X and Y coordinates happened uh, <laughs> according to the OBS application, not according to the, uh, to the uh, MS Paint one. But okay, but at least uh, you will be able to run this on your screen. Um, I won't be able to do this unless I, uh, I do it without actually recording, <laughs> which, will be, uh, which will be impossible to show you the video for that. But when you do that yourself without having OBS or Camtasia or anything that takes advantage of uh, or a hold of the video driver on my machine this will work just fine does that make sense everybody so that's the important part uh, don't worry about it that it didn't work because of the obs there is not much i can do i tried a lot of different things and it happens on all of them obs uh, uh, stream labs uh, camtasia all the recorders out there it will do exactly the same thing but uh, believe me as long as you understood the idea that you need to activate the window first and then when you execute it on that window 
you will be able to write that the x and y coordinates on the screen according to that as well make sense again i'm not going to spend more more time on that just because it's not really heavily used in test complete and because of the reason i mentioned before which is um, we do not like to use x and y coordinates for our test it's a weak test okay but sometimes you don't have a choice there is no other way to get to the object for instance because it's being painted on the screen maybe it's a website that has a map and you're trying to pinpoint a house on the map for instance and the html or the desktop application doesn't have an object behind it so you have to use x and y coordinates to get to that point so that's a weak test but again you can do it with test complete using low level procedures all right, in this chapter, I would like to talk to you about using user forms inside of Test Complete. And user form means I would like to use Test Complete as a development environment to allow me to create dialogues with components in them so that I can fill them up during the run itself. So I have to, to give you a warning. Uh, these are things that are going to run at midnight while you're asleep. Remember, that's what a functional automated testing is all about. So if you're ever going to bring up a dialogue in the middle of the night to ask the user to enter something, you have to think about this twice. Is this the right thing to do? So usually in software testing, I wouldn't recommend it. You do not want a test to be interrupted by a dialogue that is waiting for input from a tester because that tester is asleep at the middle of the night. So you want it to be self-sufficient and run it on its own. But sometimes people are using test complete for things that are not software based. Maybe it's a hardware that you are testing. And there is a technician on a conveyor belt, for instance, that they will need to look at a device and make sure if, let's say, it's a diabetic meter instead of a Johnson & Johnson company. And they need to actually say if it's a good one or a bad one and then get rid of it if it's outside of the range of acceptance. So there are a lot of things that dialogues could be useful. But in my opinion, it's not really for software testing. It's more for a quality of, uh, of hardware or food or something like that, but not software. Just put that in mind as well. Let me go ahead and create a brand new Python script in here. We'll say plus next to script. And I'm going to create a unit. We'll call it, for instance, uh, using dialogues. All right. We can call it anything you want, of course. And inside of this uh, using dialog i would like to create a function we'll call it for instance uh, define and we'll say create dialog you can again call it whatever you want if you spell it correctly that would be even better <laughs> all right let's go ahead and say uh, remove that r from here all right that's good enough all right and i'm gonna go indent it once in here and i'd like to actually see first of all how can i create a dialogue and for what reason for instance so i'm gonna actually have to fake something that is not really um, something i would do but i just wanted to give you an example let's see for a notepad for instance your manager comes and says lino i would i do not want your test from unit one the one that wrote lino was here I do not want you to be able to write to Notepad unless you log in to Notepad first. So you'll have to enter the correct username and password to Notepad and then you can write to it. If not, the test should not be able to write to it. I will tell my manager, but wait a second, <laughs> Notepad in Windows does not have a requirement for username and password. There is no dialogue in Notepad for entering username and password. If you're in Windows, you're going to be able to use Notepad no matter what. So what are you talking about? It's like, well, I don't know. Find a way that we're going to introduce a dialogue that will require a good username and password. And without the credentials being correct, you should not be able to write into Notepad. At this point, unfortunately, I'm going to have to invent my own dialogue because I don't have this built into Notepad anyway. So where do we start? First of all, the ability to create dialogues inside of Test Complete is not automatically available in your projects. You'll have to add that project item. So I'm going to go into my project like we did before. We'll click on it and we'll say right click, add new item. And one of the project items that are available for you is called user forms. You see that? That is the feature in Test Complete to allow you to create dialogues it's called user forms. We'll click on that and we'll give it a name. We can leave it as the default user forms is fine. We'll say OK. And from that point on, now we have the ability to create dialogues inside of Test Complete. Let's go ahead and create one for Notepad. I'm going to right click on the user forms and we'll say add new item. And here we'll call it, for instance, Notepad login. Okay. You can give it whatever name you want and we'll say okay there. And look what happens in Test Complete at this point. 
Test Complete now is going to transform itself into a development environment like Visual Studio and Eclipse and all of these guys. So now I have a canvas right in front of me that I can make, make bigger or smaller, however I want, okay? And then I would have tons of different components and widgets on the left side and their properties will be on the right side of the screen. So now I can actually go this components tab and here have editors like you can see list boxes and text boxes and currency and date and time and so on. There's another tab for helpers like labels and panels and uh, group boxes and shapes and bevels and stuff like that. Extras will have radio groups, check boxes, images and progress bars. Dialogues will have open dialogue, save dialogue, select directory dialogue, select object property dialogue. And also at the end there will be a button because every uh, dialogue will always need a button, right? So let's go ahead and bring this button in. I'm going to click on it or drag it. You can do both. If I click on it and put it right there, there is the button. All right. Once you have the button chosen, all right, with these eight different uh, markers on it, uh, if it's highlighted, all the properties of the button will be here on the right side. So if I want to change the caption for the button from saying CX button one, find something that says caption. There is the property for caption. And inside of there will say login, for instance. You can type in whatever property. And notice I just changed the value on the button. Now let's go back to the editors. And I want two different editors, one for the username and password. So let's click on the this one. I'm going to put it right here. There is my... Uh, my first one and then I'll click on it again and we'll do another one and we'll put it right underneath it in here and I don't like to see the CX text edit one so I'm going to make them empty so find a property in here hopefully it's called text right there and I'm going to delete the value and push enter do the same thing with the other one find the text property and delete this value the only thing left is to hopefully make it professional and put two labels that explain this is the username and this is the password so let's go to helpers and there is my label. Let's click on that, put one all the way at the top and then we'll do it again for the, the one at the bottom in here. And there we go. And I will actually align them to look nice. And then if I click on CX label one, notice this one has a caption as well. And I'm going to say username. Okay. And then the second one in here, if I click on it, I can change it to say password. Password. Okay. There we go. So do you see what's happening in here, folks? And I can actually try different things. And I would encourage you to play a little bit with all these components, but you hopefully get the idea. I can change the font, the color, the left, the top, the margins, whatever you want on every single one of those to make it look exactly how you want it. I can even click on the form itself. Let's click on the form. Even the form have its own properties and I can change the caption. For instance, I can say notepad login screen, for instance like that and that will show up in the caption of the form notepad login screen does that make sense so right now uh, i'm going to stop the video just by showing you how to bring up the dialogue and then i'm going to finish it up in the second video but for right now i just want you to know that you can create these forms and in python using my uh, my script called using dialogues i can write code in here to bring it up how do you bring up a dialogue in the middle of your script in python you're going to use the, the keyword inside of test complete itself called user forms. So we'll say user forms. And there it is. Just double click on it. Notice it changes into blue. That means test complete knows what a user forms is. We'll put a dot. And hopefully we'll see our notepad login. There it is. That's the one I just created, notepad login. And if I put a dot after that, you will notice there are a lot of properties, a lot of functions, a lot of events happening on that notepad login. So I'm going to go down, notice the CX button and the labels that I've created and the edit controls. But I am looking for functions at this point that will help me out. Ah, look at that. Now there is something called show and there is another one called show modal. It's important to understand the difference between the two. Show, that means go ahead and show me the dialogue, but run everything after that line anyway. But show modal means show me the dialogue and stop execution. Do not run any of the code after line number two in here until the user actually clicks on OK or cancel. Somehow they need to shut down the dialogue before you run all the code. So you can see there is a big difference between the two. Guess which one is the most used one? Show modal is the most used one because I have code right after line number two that I do not want to execute until the user chooses something inside of these dialogues and then say OK or cancel or whatever. So I want to keep the lines from being executed until the dialogue goes away. 
So I'm going to say show model and it's a function and that's it. So in this video, I just want to run it to show you what will happen. So if I come in here, right click and say run this uh, routine, for instance, let's sit back and relax. And you will notice that the, the, the dialogue will show up on the screen. Let's give it a second here to compile this and run it. And you will notice my notepad dialogue will come up. But I also want you to notice something else once the dialogue comes up. That is the dialogue. And you let me bring it into the middle of the screen in here so you can see it. Okay. Notice that test complete is still running. All right. And it will still running forever because somebody needs to make that dialogue go away. So, so right now, even if I come in here and say blah, 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 and password, blah, 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 for instance, if I click on login, no, nothing is going on because I didn't tell this login to dismiss the dialogue. So as a matter of fact, the only way I can finish this test and allow it to complete is I can uh, click on this X in here at the top right of the screen. Okay, so I'm going to click on it and that will allow test complete to finish because there is no other code and we are in good shape and it will move on. And right now the test will be successful. I'm waiting for the green X, uh, uh, the green check mark in here to tell me that the test complete was successful. And there it is. It is successful. And right now we'll, uh, we'll, there will be no logs whatsoever because I didn't log anything. I just brought up a dialogue and make it go away. So everything will be okay. So we'll wait for it to show up. And then in the next video, I just want to show you how we can we interact between the values inside of the dialogue and our test itself. So I'll do that once this is completed. There you go. There are no messages and it's a successful test. All right. Let's go back to our dialogue again. And now I'd like to change this login button uh, so that when I click on it, I want to do something in Windows called modal result. I would like to create an action on the modal result. Let's click on the login button and take a look at the properties in here. One of them is called modal result. This is not a test complete thing. This is a Windows thing. There are about 13 different modal results like MR none and MR stands for modal result. Okay. It could be none, okay, cancel, abort. Usually whenever you see dialogue popping up in Windows, usually they have an okay and cancel button. Sometimes it has a retry or an abort or ignore, yes and no. They are all part of the modal result in here. It means any of them will cause the dialogue to go away except one. And that one is the N MR none. And right now the default is MR none. That's why when I clicked on login, it didn't do anything. So I'm going to change it to make it MR OK. It means when I click on this button now, that will dismiss the dialogue and pass to the caller uh, one. One means OK. Zero means none. Two means cancel. Three means abort. And you probably can see what's going on in here. As long as you understand, it starts with zero. Zero is MR none. It's MR OK, which is one. That is the one that will uh, will dismiss it. Also cancel, which is two, will dismiss it as well, but it will send a, a negative. That means it's a no, it's a cancel. I do not move forward, okay? So let's leave it as, as MR OK, which is the number one in that, uh, in all the 13's uh, uh, MRs, the model results. And I wanna set, find out, for instance, now when I run this, uh, how is it gonna behave? So now that this is an MR OK, let's go back and do this again. We'll say, run this routine. And you will notice now when I click on the login button, that will actually fire up an MR OK and it will cause the dialogue to dismiss, not like before when it was MR none. So I'll wait for the dialogue to come up. There it is. I can type blah, 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 blah in here in the password as well. Look what happens when I click on login. The dialogue will go away. Oh, it's not working because I didn't save. Shame on me. I have to save. Otherwise, it will not know about that change that I made. Let me go ahead and fix that really quickly. All right. Go back to the login. It is MR OK. OK. And don't forget to save. You have to save. Otherwise, it will not know what you're talking about. OK, let's go ahead and run it again. And this time, hopefully, it will work. Right click and we'll say run this routine. All right, I'm going to go in here for the username and say blah, blah, blah. And for password, la, la, la. Look what happens when I click on login. Yep, that dismisses the dialogue and it's going to be successful and will come back with no problem at this point as well. All right. Now let's go ahead and borrow some code from unit one. Remember that one line that we actually ended up writing to the notepad text editor. So I'm going to borrow this line for the W text. We'll say control C and let's go back to the using dialogues in here. And I would like to use it in here, but I would like to check the value of the show model, whether it's an MROK or cancel or something else. So we will put the whole thing inside of an if statement. 
will say if the user forms that notepad login that show model and we use the equal equal sign because we're asking if this is true or false and we'll say mr okay see all the mr values are right there i'm going to use mr okay and if that is the case put the colon for the if statement and then tap and then we will put that line that line that we just got from the uh, the clipboard will say alias notepad blah 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 and in here we'll say uh, dialogue well, let me put a double quotes in here we'll say dialogue uh, is correct for instance that's what I want to type inside of uh, notepad all right uh, or I can come in here and say else like we've done before in the beginning when we talked about Python and I can do something else in case uh, the MR is cancel or something like that so I'm gonna say else in here and I'm gonna say for instance uh, log dot message dot message and I'm going to say something like I uh, would we'll say um, uh, mr cancel was uh, returned mr cancel was returned okay that's good enough for me so you see what I've done here folks so that means only when MROK is chosen, which is the button for the login, I'm going to type this dialog is correct. But if I click on the red X all the way at the top, that returns an MR cancel. Okay, so the else will, will run. So let me go ahead and run it one more time and see if that will work. All right, so I'm going to go to the username and say blah, 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 and the password is blah, blah, blah. Look now what happens when I click on the X, not the login. That will return an MR cancel. So if I cancel this, a log message should say MR cancel was returned. Nothing will be written out in Notepad whatsoever. So we'll, there it is. It's a green check mark. That means it was successful. And I should see a message that says uh, MR cancel um, was written. We'll give it a second in here. There we go. MR cancel was returned. We are in the green and everything is good. I'll run it one more time, but this time we'll use the login. So we'll right click and we'll say run this routine. All right, we'll bring it here in the middle of the screen so you can see it better. And we hear blah, blah, blah. And the password is blah, blah, blah. Look what happens when I say login now. Notice notepad will come up and we will set the value of the W text of the uh, editor to say dialogue is correct. So we will wait for notepad uh, to finish. And then always this will be a green check mark as well. But notice if I bring up notepad at this point, it says dialogue is correct. It did work. I would not have been able to actually write anything into Notepad unless the MROK for the login is correct. Of course, I can put some extra code to check if the username and password are correct. Maybe I'll go to against a database and find out if this will work or not and so on and so forth. Make sense, everybody? So this is an important piece. The last thing I wanted to show you in this specific chapter about uh, user dialogues is that how can I access some of the values inside of the dialog inside of here uh, uh, automatically. So I will say, for instance, not only it's enough to say if MR OK, but I want to have another if statement. And I do not want to write to it until unless, uh, for instance, the, the username and password is correct. So I can come in here, for instance, uh, and I can do another if statement. But you probably got the idea what an if statement is all about. So in reality, instead of hard coding it to dialogue is correct, I would like to put the username that I put into the text box itself. How can I access the value inside of the user forms notepad login? So in here, I'm going to type in in the W text of the notepad editor. I'm going to say user forms dot notepad login. There you go. And we'll say dot. And now I'll have access to everything. Remember, I didn't change its name. It's still called CX Text Edit One. Maybe it's a good idea to go change its name to something more useful. But I'm going to use the CX TX. That's the username one. The CX Text Edit Two is the password. And I'm going to say dot. And this one by itself has tons of different properties. One of them is the text value. There it is, text. Let's go ahead and choose that. And now whatever I chose inside of the username is the one that will be written out in. Um, in the notepad w text property as well isn't that cool let's go ahead and give it a shot we'll say right click run this routine and that will be the last thing about user forms in case you want to use it uh, it's very easy as you can see to create whatever you want and also you have access to all the values of whatever you chose during the execution and you can use it in your own script by accessing every single object and its property this way all right let me bring this in in here i'm going to say for instance lino Tadros is my username and then the password will say blah 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 and I click on login 
and now that will create Linotadros will be written out inside of Notepad at this point. And if I bring up Notepad, Linotadros has been written out as I told it to using the code as well. And now this will finish and it will be in the green 100% successful as well. Make sense? And now we get to one of my favorite and most powerful chapters of the course itself. And that's how to intercept events inside of Test Complete. To be able to deal with events in Test Complete, the first thing you want to do is to add the project item responsible for implementing events. Right now, out of the box, our course, let's say the Project 01 TC course, will not be able to implement events. Let's go ahead and right click on it like we've done before several times. And I'm going to go ahead and add a new item. And you will notice actually in the list when the wizard comes up, you will notice there is one of them called events, the second one from the top. Let's click on that. And I'm going to go ahead and oh, it's okay to call it events. You can actually change its name if you would like to see something different in the project items in the, in the Explorer. We're going to say okay. And now events has been added. All right. So now for the last few years, uh, the events implementation have changed a little bit in Test Complete. Now you can have multiple implementers. So if I go on events in here, right click on it and we'll say I'd like to add my first implementation, we'll say new item, and then I can give it whatever name I want. This is the event control, okay? By default, it will be called event control one, which is not a very good name. Let's go ahead and call it, for instance, course events. Alrighty, we'll call it course events and we'll push enter for okay. So now my first implementation, you can have multiple, you can have a lot more. There is the events project item and then the course events happening right underneath there to control a set of events. Once you click on this course events on the, uh, in the workspace itself, there will be five different available events in your test complete that you can deal with. Uh, in not a specific uh, order or anything like that. The first one is the Flash events. If you're dealing with um, Adobe products or Adobe Flash, for instance, and you'd like to implement on action script exception, you can actually do that. Very rarely used nowadays, but it's available if you're doing a lot of Adobe Air, for instance, or something like that. The most used in my mind is the general events. If you open this one up, these are all the events that you can listen to and do something. You pretty much you're subscribing to an event when it happens. You would like to run some Python code, for instance, in our course in here. So every time the system is trying to log a checkpoint, whether it's a property, a region, a file, whatever it is, you can do something during the logging of that checkpoint. When somebody actually closes a node inside of the log result. So everything that has the word log in it, just remember anything that has the word log in test complete, it is pretty much about the log results all the way at the bottom in here. So it has to do with the results coming up. The one important one that I use all the time is this one in here. Let me put a red circle around it to show you what that is. Well, that's a very nice circle. There you go. <laughs> and it's called on log error. It means I would like the system to tell me, hey, Lino, I'm about to log an error. Is there anything you would like to do uh, before or after that error is being logged? So if I implement this event, test complete will give me the con, will tell me, okay, I'm about to log an error. Is there anything you'd like to do? And then my code can run in Python to do that. Same thing with logging an event, logging a file, logging a link, a message, a picture. And then we will talk later on about some really nifty ones like on overlapping window, on timeout, and we will see an example also of on unexpected window to explain how all the stuff works as well. The next one is the network suite event. If you're using networking inside of Test Complete, so uh, based on jobs or, or tasks, or net variable changes or net suite uh, state changes that if you're doing any network and that um, the network uh, suites actually have been deprecated inside of test complete but it's available for backward compatibility at this point the test engine itself this could be extremely powerful which is you might write some code on start test that will guarantee whatever code you have written will run before any test will run Alrighty. Also, when you stop a test, it will call the code that you have written in that event to execute whenever uh, a test has been uh, stopped. They've also added in the last year uh, on start test case and on stop test case. So one is for the entire test and one is only for one test case, which will be passing it as a parameter inside of there as well. Make sense? The last one is the web testing event, and this could be very handy which is on uh, web before navigate. So you can run some code before you issue a navigate. 
So you will see, for instance, in our web testing uh, chapter, we will see some of the videos are going saying browser.btchrome.navigate, for instance. And the navigate, uh, you're trying to go to a specific uh, web page, but I might write some code in here uh, inside of the before navigate that will fire automatically once test complete tells me, hey, I'm about to do a navigate. Anybody listening on that event? And if I say, yes, I have an on web before navigate, that means you're guaranteed the code that you have written in Python in this event will fire before the navigation navigation happens in your code in Python. Make sense? On web download, uh, finished, started, downloaded, on web quit. So when you close, for instance, your instance of Chrome or Firefox or Edge or IE, you can run some code for cleaning up or doing whatever you need to do. All these events are available for you as well. So this is enough for this video, I believe, just to explain all the different events. And from the next video, we'll start implementing some new events as well. Let's go ahead and implement our first event. We'll go to general events. And like I said before, one of the most interesting events that I use a lot is the onlog error. So if I click on onlog error, double click on it, you will notice on the right side, uh, it will explain which one you have chosen from the available events. And now you are ready to implement the general events for onlog error. So you will see all of them, the ones that are available on the left side. But when you double click on one of them, it will move to the right side to tell you if there is already a function uh, that is available or a procedure that is implementing on log error. So you see on log error is available, but the event handler is empty. That means even though we chose on log error, there is no code in anywhere in my 01 TC course that implements the on log error. So for me to be able to handle that, go ahead and click on the new. You see the new hyperlink all the way at the right side there. We click on it. And that will allow us to bring up a dialogue. First of all, it will ask me, where do you want to implement this specific um, uh, event? Okay, it could be in unit one, it could be in uh, any of them. Or you can actually create a specific script unit just for all your event, which I recommend for you not to put them in any other um, units with other code. Just put all your, uh, your event handling in a specific unit. So I'm going to click here to add a new specific um, uh, one, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. And let's give it a good name. You can go ahead and say, for instance, event interception. Okay, again, you can call it anything you want, but it's a good name that will remind me where that is. And then the test name itself, by default, test complete is going to help out. It will take the control name, which is course events underscore, and then it will put the name of the event, which is on log error. Okay, you can delete that and call it foo. It doesn't really care, but that will be the event name that will be associated with the specific on log error inside of test complete. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click on OK on that. And notice uh, in the event interception unit, it will create a function or a procedure that takes two parameters. Okay, so that is the definition of the function in Python course events underscore on log error. And you will notice two different parameters have been passed to it. The first one is sender, and that means who's responsible for causing this event to happen. Okay. And the second one is a log params. And the log params is what we call in programming a variant. That means it's a 16 block of memory, okay? And this uh, 16 block of, uh, of bytes, pretty much, will know what it has when the event um, executes. So right now at design time, while writing this code, we have no idea what log params is because it's just a block of 16 bytes that nobody knows about. Once the event happens, it will be passed to it and we will know exactly what the log params is. The reason why I'm saying that because a lot of people usually go into the function and will say log params dot and they are waiting for the dialog to come up that helped us out with code completion. And there is no way to do that in test complete because we don't know what log params is yet. It's a variant, okay? It's a 16 byte block that we will only find out what it is once it gets called. All right, remember the word pass that we used before in multiple chapters in the beginning to explain in Python whether it's an if statement or something else that you do not want to implement right now, just to make it a legal function, we'll just say pass. Because if I remove pass, this is not a complete um, event or function or a procedure. So we'll say pass. Now it's up to you to come in here and remove this pass and write some code. And you are guaranteed that this code will run or get executed when an on log error happens in test complete. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's go ahead and find out one other unit here in the project. Let's say unit one, for instance, that we worked with very early on. And I would like to run this, um, which is called cause a problem. 
So this log error will, will run. And the first thing it will do, it will cause an error called kaboom. Okay. And then it will do a message hello and a message goodbye. No problem. So I want you to think about it with me regarding what exactly happens behind the scene. If I run this function right now called cause a problem, the first line when it says log.error, as soon as it finds out that it's logging an error, before even it actually trying to do anything with the word kaboom, just the fact that the log object is logging an error is going to scream out loud and it's going to say, hey, I am about to log an error. Anybody listening on an event like this? And because I have the uh, the event interception, I have code in here that says onlog error, which is a pointer that is uh, pointing to the onlog error event inside of test complete for this specific course. It will raise its hands like, yes, me, 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 please call me. I have to get called when something like this happens. So whatever code I'm going to be writing in here right now instead of pass will get called on my behalf. That means I cannot call this function. And you will notice also when I right click inside of this uh, of this uh, uh, Python function, the run this routine will be turned off. It will be grayed out. And a lot of people always ask on the forums for uh, for test complete, why is my event cannot be run? And this, because it's not for you to run. You will never be able to, to uh, execute a function yourself that is an event. That means this event is available, just needs to make itself available, and it's up to test complete when it calls it on your behalf, but you cannot call it. All right, that's about all the events inside of Test Complete. All right, let's go ahead in here and I'm going to remove the word pass and I'm going to say log.message and we will say, for instance, something bad happened. <laughs> all righty, so let's do it something like this. Well, in English would be much better. There you go. Something bad happened. All right. So because I cannot run this function and it's always going to be grayed out to run this routine, I'm expecting in unit one, if I run this function called cause a problem, the first line will end up causing that event to, uh, to run. So I want you to think about it this way. If I right click with here in the cause problem and I say run this routine, what do you expect to see in the log? Obviously, because we're logging an error, we all have to agree there will be a red X in here. Okay, it will cause an error, even if hello and goodbye will be successful. If one of the lines of code causes an error, it is a red X right away and that's complete. But the issue here, probably you're with me, the word kaboom will have to be written out. But also, there is another message that will have to be written out as well. And that message will be, uh, let's go back to this guy and it will say something bad happened. The question that I have for you, what is the order? Is it going to say kaboom first because the log error has to happen first and then this event will get called something bad happened and then hello and then uh, goodbye. These are the four logs that will happen. Are you with me on that? But in reality, you'll be shocked maybe in the first time you do this to find out that something bad happened will trigger first before the kaboom. That means when the test complete finds out that you are trying to log an error before it executes that error, which is kaboom, immediately the event will fire. So that means the events are way, way faster than the causing event. That means something bad happened will trigger first and then kaboom and then hello and then goodbye. And that's always going to be the case in test complete. Every event, whatever you implemented, the causer of the event will always trigger first. Okay. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. I'm going to go to the unit one in here. Let's right click on the cause problem and run this routine and sit back and relax and see what happens. And look at that. We just got a red X in here and it's right now writing the XML out. And if I was right, it should say something bad happened, then kaboom, then hello, then goodbye. And let's wait for the XML to be saved to the disk and then we will see the test result here in a second. And look at that. Something bad happened, kaboom, hello, and goodbye. Hopefully it makes sense to everybody what exactly the reason for the order it happens because a lot of people I know when I train on this class, they expect kaboom to happen first because that's the first line that will be executed, but it is not. Actually, the event will trigger first and then the kaboom for the error will, will take place. And please try it out, write some code, especially write some code that will, uh, will continue successfully after the error and you will be able to see exactly how the whole thing works. It's excellent and this could be very useful. Why is this a very useful thing for instance? Maybe you, you can't see really the, uh, the goal here. The goal here, I am going to be running this in the middle of the night for like six or seven hours. My question to you and please pay attention to what I'm saying next because it's extremely important in test complete. 
when do these logs get written out to disk alrighty so we just failed right now but I'm running a test that will take like a few seconds it's not a big deal but sometime your test that you're running have a thousand function and it will take six to seven hours from midnight to six o'clock in the morning while you're asleep so what happens for instance if at one o'clock in the morning an error occurs when are we going to be able to have access to the log to see this All right listen to this it's going to happen at six o'clock in the morning not at one o'clock in the morning the log files in test complete do not get written out until the entire test completes and that could be a problem because if i know for instance the database is not uh, the connection to the database is, uh, is bad now i have to wait six hours to find out that uh, six hours ago we found out that the connection is bad and that's not a good idea sometimes i want to find out a lot earlier maybe i want to get a, an sms message on my phone or slack or microsoft teams or something to remind me hey we have a major issue we do not have um, access to the database and now we're going to waste six hours worth of testing so that's why this could be an extremely powerful thing so if i go for instance back to the event interception in here so this is easy i'm just doing a log message so you can see it but in reality instead of doing something like this i can use one of the built-in functions inside of test complete like sending a mail so i can say built in that it is built in that's the name of the object inside of test complete dot and one of the functions is called send mail that it is uh, and inside of this open and close parentheses, you will notice, unfortunately, they named them pretty bad, so you cannot tell which one is which. It's param 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, all the way till 7. But uh, in reality, usually people will click on F1 for the help. So you push F1, and it will tell you what all the things that needs to be passed to send mail. So I just pushed F1, and it happened here on a, not, on a different uh, monitor. Let me go ahead and, uh, and bring it in from the other monitor in here there it is all right so i just clicked on f1 it took me automatically to send mail method so click on that in the documentation and you will see the param one two three four all the way till seven what exactly are they and the first one is the two address so i can send it to lino at uh, whatever gmail.com and then from host from name from address the subject the body and if you'd like to attach files as well it could be in here the result of the function send mail is a boolean whether it was successful or not true or false if it was able to be sent and you can read the parameters in here one by one to find out exactly how to do it and there is an example for sending mail from script so i can click on that and in the documentation i can see exactly what it will look like so uh, this send mail in here for instance i can actually say clear and clear um, jeffersoncorp.com and then the host and then the name and then the email address and then everything else including files and so on to attach and i'm going to put an if statement let's do it in python in here so you can see it better that is a dev test if send mail pass all the information and if it's successful that means send mail will return true that the if statement will run the log message if it's not successful it will log a warning mail was not sent but this is how you would do it for instance in there so this could be extremely valuable thing to do is to be able to send the mail why is this a valuable thing because this will not wait for the six hours to finish this immediately happened so even if at 12 30 at midnight half an hour into the test uh, an error occurred i'm gonna get an email right away which is really awesome okay you can also import some uh, some uh, uh, python libraries for instance like uh, verizon sms or at&t sms so not only is send mail this is built into test complete but if i want to send an sms on verizon you can import uh, that and be able to send me to a phone number and then they will get it as an sms on their phone i can also import uh, slack um, libraries for instance for python and so on and so forth so uh, the power is extremely powerful to say what you can do built into uh, uh, test complete itself or if you are going to bring in outside ways of accessing microsoft teams slack uh, verizon sms at and sms and so on and so forth to be able to play with that make sense very very powerful and you don't have to wait six hours to find out that something bad happened and which is a very important thing as well all right all right in the next video what i'm going to show you is how to actually cause this error not to propagate that means i won't get a red x and this will be a very interesting part so let's leave it to a, a video by itself and we'll be back with you in the next one shortly this is uh, gonna get a lot more fun now to actually play with the log params in here 
So instead of actually just logging in my own message or sending an email or something like that, like we've seen in the previous one, what if I would like to find out about what's going on with the log params? So if I come in here to a new line, we'll say log params dot, notice like I promised you, nothing will pop up. There is no, uh, we don't know what's inside of this log param. So even control space will not work in here because nothing will pop up. We don't know what it is. So that means you'll have to spend some time pushing the F1 key to be able to see what the documentation is saying. What are the properties of the log param? So let's go ahead and do that with an F1. And I'm going to come in here, bring it into this monitor. It keeps going with my other monitor. That's okay. And this is the log param object. Let's click in this for, for the reference. And this is all the information in uh, test complete documentation about log params. I'm interested in the properties of the log params itself, which we will be found out what they are at runtime only. So there are a lot of different ones in here. Some of them are obsolete. I mean, in the, in the last 22 years, we were using something called STR and STREX. These are obsolete. This is only for backward compatibility, but don't use them anymore. Try, if you're doing this brand new into your test complete instance, do not use STR and STREX, even though they work. They have changed those. STR became message text and STREX became additional text. It means what is the message that was sent in the error itself that I want to propagate into my event itself. And we're going to see what that means in a second. So message text is important. Additional text is important. Not only that, because it's a log, see it has the word log in it, it has to do with the test result. It means I can change its color, uh, the font color, the font style. And then there is one property in here that is extremely important. And it's called locked. In my opinion, that's the most important one in all of them. But let's start slowly in this video. What I would like to do is to use uh, like color and font color, additional text and message text and so on. So I'm going to actually go ahead and minimize this guy. And now what I'm going to say, I would like to uh, lock params dot color and we'll call it. And the way, by the way, you assign a color in, in test complete, it will start with the letters CL for color. And if you do uh, control uh, space, you can see all the different colors in here. So I'm going to say blue, for instance. There you go. That will be the background color in the log and the test results will be blue. And then I'm going to say log params dot font color. So instead of being the background, I can do CL red, for instance, we'll say CL red. So that will be red font on a blue background. Um, OK, and then I can actually do also log dot message and this time oops log dot message let me fix that and inside of there i'm going to actually instead of saying something bad happened i want to propagate the word that was actually sent to me or the error that was sent to me from the log dot error itself remember kaboom so i'm going to say log params dot and this will be message text and you have to know how to spell it because you're not going to get help from test complete because we don't know that log params will have a message text. We just have to look at the documentation, copy and paste the word message text and put it after the dot for that as well. Make sense? So let's go ahead and, and run it and see if this will work. So if I go again, I cannot run this. I have to run it from unit one to cause an error. So we'll run this guy again. We'll say run this routine and let's sit back and relax and see what exactly is going to show up now inside of the test result itself. And there we go. We still get a red X, of course, because an error occurred somewhere in the test. But if you take a look, something bad happened. The event triggered first. And then there is a kaboom. And this first kaboom in here, by the way, is coming directly from, um, from the, uh, the, uh, the log params. And then there is the kaboom that happened inside of the error itself. And there is the hello and the goodbye. So these two kabooms, one is coming from the error, which is the one in red. And the other one is coming from the log params. So the log params happened in there automatically because that had to run first. Okay, so everything in the event will happen first. To so log param, when I said log dot message, log params dot message text, that is the one that is not an error. This is just passing that automatically. But at the end of the day, because we have one red X, everything will fail. Red X will be on the entire test right away. Very important to understand that. Are you with me? The last thing I wanted to show you in this specific video. If now when I go back to the event interception, uh, is it possible for me to fix that error during the unlock error so that the error does not propagate? Can I actually make this not a red X, but make it a green check mark saying I was able to pass it? 
Sometimes when the object is not found on a website, for instance, it's going to cause an error. But if you have it implemented on unlock error, you're going to get in here and maybe you're going to try other things, maybe trying to find other objects. And if you find them, maybe you do not want the error to propagate. I want you to, to tell me about it. I want you to log a message saying, by the way, at midnight, I could not find the object, but I was found another object in the log unlock error and I was able to keep going. I made the test successful, but I just want to let you know that I had to do a little bit extra work for you on here. Okay. How do you t to tell test complete not to propagate the error and stop it from going? So the way to do that, we'll say log params.locked equals to true. And this is probably the the uh, the best one. And by the way, true has to be with a capital T. Otherwise, Python does not know, know what a true with a small t means. So be very careful with that as well. Once you lock um, a parameter, it means you're telling test complete. I know an error occurred, but I'm taking it from here. Just go away. I'm going to fix it. And then the next few lines, okay, you just create whatever lines, do if statements, do whatever you need to do to try other objects to find an object on the screen in a website or a desktop application. And if you are successful and you were able to find the object and you were able to find this inside of an unlock error, that means locked will continue to be true, it will finish and we'll move on, we'll get a red X. If you try multiple things in here and none of them work, we are still in an error state. And you would like to not propagate this you just wanted to go back and say okay well we failed so we need to show it as an error don't don't forget to come at the end and we'll say log params dot locked uh, equals to false with a capital f when you do that that means okay i failed trying to fix it and then i'm going to set locked equals to false so the test complete can do its thing and show me a red x in here but for right now just to show you the point by the way this is extremely powerful to be able to do something like this I'm going to comment it out and I'm going to leave it locked. Okay. We'll say locked equal to true. So I'm going to go back to unit one right now and I'm going to right click in here and we'll say run this routine and let's sit back and relax. And I'm expecting to get a green check mark in here, even though we are an error, we are in the middle of an error. So it's very weird that we're getting a red, uh, a green check mark, but because I locked it and I was able to fix it somewhere in the code, it will work. Look at this beauty. We are in the middle of an error. Something bad happened. Kaboom. Hello and goodbye. So the only one that did not propagate in here is the red um, kaboom. Only the, the kaboom that's coming in from the lock params of message text propagated. And I ended up getting a green check mark and we were able to finish no problem. But it did tell me something bad happened. So I can see actually from my logs that uh, test complete actually did some work on my behalf in my events to be able to clean this mess up and make it successful. So just remember, this is extremely, extremely powerful to be able to um, intercept an error and still cause it to succeed by having a chance to fix it right in the middle of the event of unlock error. You can do that. Last thing I wanted to show you before I end this video is that if I go back to my event interception and I go ahead and set it to false, that means I tried everything, but unfortunately I could not fix it. So I'm going to bring back the lock to false as it was before and we'll say control s for saving this file and now i'm going to go back to my unit one now when i run this now uh, the error will propagate and will finish up so let's go ahead and run it one last time i will get a red x and it will show me the red x for kaboom as well inside of there and voila we get a red x as you can see in here it is a failure even though i locked it equal to true i tried things didn't work out i locked it again equals to false to bring back everything and allow it to propagate and i'm getting my kaboom in here coming in from the error itself as well make sense all right let's go ahead and do one more that is very interesting as well uh, for these events so if i go to general events we've done the log uh, unlock error you can try out all the other ones they work very very similar it's just they get executed and um, and ask for in different times okay but i want to take a look at the ones at the bottom in here like on unexpected window or on overlapping window and so on these could be very very handy as well and it will allow us to explain some of the things how parameters are being passed to events as well so let's go ahead and get started i have um, spend a few minutes in visual studio i'm not going to bother you with that but i created a small application here it's a winforms application in c sharp it doesn't really matter whether this is java or 
dot net vb c sharp c plus plus it has no um, preference at all Alrighty, or well, what I created is um, three different text boxes. So the first number in here, if I come and say 10, for instance, and then in the second number, let's say two. And if I click on this number, it's gonna divide these two numbers together and give me the result in this text box. Let's do that, and that is five. See, that's some of my best work ever, <laughs> right? Sounds good. So uh, what I would like to do right now is to record a session in here and see how this complete will do that. And then when I run it, I want to cause a problem in this application. So let me go ahead and start the recording. I'm going to click in here and we'll say uh, record in the script. It's going to ask me which unit do I want to put the script in. Let's go ahead and put it in unit one is fine with me. We'll say OK there. And then test complete will minimize itself. And then at this point, I can go to the application. It's recording right now. I'm going to push 10 in here. And then in the second number, we'll say two. And then I'm going to go ahead and click on the number five will show up in here and um, i'm even going to try to click somewhere in the application here. let's go ahead and click inside of the second number just click there for a second okay i'll show you why i did that if i'm going to go ahead and say stop right now i want to take a look at the python code that got created for me and it will probably create a test one automatically and it will put the code inside of unit one so we'll give it a second here and then we will see the code in unit one once the python code has been generated and there it is there is the test one notice there is an application running in memory called tc course exception that's the c sharp application i've created and then it has an object called form one that's the main form and notice at the bottom the test visualizer took uh, screenshots of every single action including the last one which is very important okay and let me minimize this for now it's good and then if you remember, I said the dot click with the X and Y coordinates, you can leave them. They will not affect anything. I usually like to take them out because they are not needed because I'm getting to the object by object name in memory, not by its location on the screen. So this is redundant, really. It's just a waste of time <laughs> to do this click. But the recorder had no choice. It had no idea why I had to click at a specific place uh, inside of that text box. All right. So if you take a look here, I'm going to leave the last one because the last one is important for me. Even though I can remove the 15 comma 9, I can just leave it empty and it will try to click in the middle of that text box. If I run this test again right now, it will work just fine, I promise. Let's go ahead and right click in here and we'll say run this routine. And you will see the indicator will show up at the top right of the screen. The application will come to the front. 10 will be entered in the first text box. 2 will be entered in the second and then the button will be clicked. And after 5 is showing up, notice it also clicked in the text box 2 one more time. So even if I go to the application while it's writing the XML out, notice it's blinking right there in the 2. Even though I clicked on the button, it should have been not focused. But my click actually showed it that it's focused. And it's in the green, as you can see in here. If I open up the, uh, the test. All right, it's flickering because my recorder is running at the same time. The video driver doesn't like it when Zoom or... Um, or uh, Microsoft Teams recording or OBS or something is running uh, at the same time while I'm actually doing this. But that's okay. We'll give it another few seconds and it hopefully will show us a test result. And there we go. And you can see the log messages. 10 was entered, 2 were entered, the button was clicked. And then finally the window in the text box 2 was clicked as well. Uh, as you can see in here at 15, 9, the X and Y coordinates were there. Excellent. This is all good and dandy at this point. So what happens now if I go to the code and I would like to make one simple change in my code. I do not want to divide by two. I want to change this to make it a division by zero. So let's go ahead and click in here. We'll say zero, for instance, like that. And now I'm going to go ahead and run this code. So let's save this code and right click and say run this routine. Now I want to see how is it going to click at 15 comma nine. So we'll sit back and relax right there and we will see what test complete will do because there will be a modal dialogue which is the exception itself see this is the exception that happens in net when you try to divide by zero but you will notice that the test finished anyway all right that was not the case actually maybe two years ago inside of test complete this is a latest uh, uh, way of how the engine and test complete deals with these but um, this was not the case a couple of years ago as well so i just wanted to let you know we'll wait until the xml is written out but i'm pretty sure this is going to be a red x all the way at the bottom over there so we will wait to see a red x oh look at that it actually gave it a green check mark so that means it was able to do everything in here hmm 
How is that possible? Let me go ahead and, and do it again. I want you to see what's going to happen. This application right now, when I click, when I divide by zero, look what the dialog will show up. If I click on it, I'm not recording right now. I'm just trying, out, trying it out. It actually showed up on the screen and I can still see the, the edit one. So if I want to actually make this really better, bring the dialog a little bit down and let's do it again. I'm going to go ahead and click on this button again. Notice right now I cannot click on the text box too because this dialog is in the way. So it's an overlapping window. It should have been an un unexpected window as well because there is something modal in, in the way. So both of them should be hitting right now. But because of a change in test complete, it's only on the overlapping window that it will be able uh, to bring it up. But uh, I did that by just moving the window a little bit so that when the exception comes, I cannot click in the text box. Okay, let's go ahead and say continue there. And I'm going to go ahead and run the code again. Let's go to unit one. This time it's not going to be all in the green just because it cannot get to the text box too. So let's go back in here in, in unit one, double click on this guy. Let me minimize the test visualizer. And I'm going to run this one more time. And let's see what happens this time. Run this routine. Let's sit back and relax. And the, uh, the dialogue will come up as an exception. But this time it's going to take a little bit longer because the system is going to wait 10 seconds like I said, the 10,000 millisecond, that's the, def the default timeout. See, the dialogue is up and test complete this time is not shutting it down. It cannot get to that final click, the 15 comma 9. So it's going to wait for 10 seconds and then it's going to actually um, force the, the test to finish. And we will see what kind of error. See, there is a red X all the way at the bottom left there. So I'm actually curious to find out what exactly the, the, the system is going to tell me about this. Obviously, it was not able to click. So the, that final click failed it did not work i could not get to it because this is a modal dialogue and it's right in front of it as well so i'm going to say continue for right now waiting for the test to finish to show me the test result and there it is the 10 was entered the zero was entered the button was clicked to divide the two together and then now there is an error saying the window is overlapped by test complete sample to divide two numbers together window that's the caption of the window and then there was an attempt to perform an action at point 13.7, which is overlapped by another window. I couldn't do it. So the, the test complete is telling you exactly what happened there. So how can I work around something like that? Well, let's go back to our uh, events. Remember, we created for the unlock error, we created something core, course events. I'm going to double click on this guy. And let's go ahead. I deleted the error. Okay, I just wanted to focus on just one. I'm going to do the unexpected window. So let's double click on the unexpected window that will move it in here on the right side for the events to handle. And now I'm going to go create a brand new procedure. Let's go right and click on new choose where I would like to implement it. I'm going to implement it in a unit called event interception that I created earlier. If you remember, um, and inside of there, I could choose the, the name or leave it as is. This is a suggestion by test complete called course events underscore on unexpected window. That's good enough for me. I'm going to say OK. And now if I go back to the code, you'll notice in the event reception, it created a brand new event called course events underscore on unexpected window. But now there are not just two parameters, sender and lock params that you are now familiar with, hopefully from the previous video. But now there is another one called window that will show up inside of there. Does that make sense? As a matter of fact, I would like to implement the other one as well so we can see it because actually the error that I got was not an unexpected window. It's an overlapping window. So I'm going to go come back to the course event. Let's go ahead and see where my overlapping window. Let's double click on it. There it is on, level, on, leveling, uh, on overlapping window. I click on new. I will also put it in the event interception and I will leave the name even though I can call it whatever I want. I'm going to say OK. And now we have two of them. But the on overlapping window not only takes three parameters, but now it's four parameters. You are familiar with sender, you're familiar with log params, but now there are two windows. The window you are supposed to get to, that's the window, and the overlapping window is the window, which is in our case the exception window, that is keeping you from trying to actually get to that window. So you'll have both of them being passed to you. So in my case, I know which window it is, but a lot of times you don't know which window. Maybe, maybe you have Zoom, and you remember Zoom is always topmost. Zoom is on your screen, and you're testing something, and Zoom always is topmost. So if your button or your text box is behind Zoom, your application doesn't go to the front. 
you will never be able to click on that button or uh, set text to that specific text box because Zoom is a topmost window, for instance. Does that make sense? So I need to implement something like this to be able to tell it, go away, move right, move left, top, bottom, just get out of the way so I can do that. Does that make sense, everybody? So instead of the pass in here, I would like to do something. So once it happens, automatically test complete is going to say, hey, I cannot click on that 15,9 because there is an overlapping window in my way. What do you want me to do? So I can come in here and I can actually say, take a picture of that window. I want to see it. Okay. So we'll say, for instance, log dot. Remember, we used to do a log dot error and log dot message. But this time I'm going to say log dot picture. So I want you to take a picture. And if I open up the open and close parentheses, notice it's almost the same exact parameters being passed like before, like the message and the detail and the priority and attributes and all that. But there is a new one here all the way in the beginning. That's the handle of the image itself. What is the object that you would like to take a picture of? In my case, that's the overlapping window itself. So if I come in here, we'll say overlapping window. There it is. That's the parameter being passed. And I can actually even give it a message text so people know what that is. We'll say, for instance, uh, the problem window, okay? So that we can know what we're talking about, all right? Again, this is not something that I can run myself. I cannot right click in here and say run this routine. This can only be called by test complete itself when a, an action like a click, double click, middle click, whatever, cannot be done because there is a window in the way. That's an overlapping window. So now I'm going to take a picture and go ahead and, and show it to you when you come in the morning after running all the stuff in the middle of the night. So let's go back to unit one and I'd like to do it one more time. We'll say run this routine. And the only reason why I'm getting into that because I have that last click. If I remove that last click, there is no overlapping window. It will click on the button. It will just uh, finish correctly and there is nothing keeping it from doing anything it's just because of the last click that uh, definitely test complete cannot finish the job because there is a window in the way and there it is so now i the on uh, um, uh, overlapping window is hit and now a picture was taken i wonder what picture was taken and this is something else that changed over the years as well with test complete in a previous window of test complete, when I say take the, the picture of the overlapping window, this entire red uh, uh, window, which is the form of the exception itself, is going to be taken. Now, uh, in the latest 1550, for instance, uh, it does not take a picture of the entire window, only the object inside of that window that is hiding the text box too, not the entire window. Alrighty, whether that's good or bad, we don't know. <laughs> so, but you just see, need to know that this is happening. I'm gonna say okay in here, and let's see, for instance, uh, what it is. You see, the exception occurred, and it called into on on my um, uh, uh, on overlapping window. So, if I click on the problem window, which I give it a name, this is the second parameter. Notice in here there are no details, but if I go click on picture in here, it took a picture of something. It took a picture of the entire dialog. That's a good thing. Sometimes, actually, when you say, I would like to take an overlapping window, it will only take the unhandled exception has occurred, this label in here, and that's it. It doesn't take anything else. So sometimes you'll have to actually take a picture of the overlapping window dot parent. It all depends on which framework you're working with, because this label that has all the text in it, the parent of that is the form completely, which is the exception window itself. So you'll have to play around based on the framework, whether it's Java, .NET, C++, and there is a little bit of experimentation to find out when an exception happens in that framework or that language, uh, what is the overlapping window? Is it just the control inside of the dialogue or is it the entire dialogue? So there is a little bit of finagling that you'll have to do to, fi to figure it out, but it's not that big of a deal, okay? So let's go ahead now, and I want to get some more information. So let's go ahead and double click on unit one, for instance. And I would like to run this code again, but this time when the event interception happens, not only do I want to uh, um, log the picture itself with the word the problem window, remember the third parameter will be the details of the picture itself. So the first one is the window I want to take a picture of. The second one is the subject that will go into the log. And the third one is any details. So let me cause the exception one more time and show you something really cool about that. I'm going to go ahead and open up the app and let's get into uh, causing the exception. And now if I take a look at this in memory by going to the object of browser, I want to dissect this dialogue a little bit. 
So I'm going to say refresh in here. Let's go ahead and refresh this and we will wait for it for a second to re read everything again from memory. And I'm expecting my process in here, uh, what it will be called. Uh, let's go ahead and, and actually cause it to refresh. This is an older application that I have. Uh, we'll just wait a little bit more until it does the refresh. All right, it's rereading. See that dialogue? Let me move this guy a little bit to the side so it's out of our way. And uh, it's rereading the, everything from memory. And then when we come back, we'll see what's available for us. And voila, it is done. So where is my application? There it is. The process is called TC Course Exception. That is the name of the process running in memory. This is the one I wrote in Visual Studio using C Sharp just to uh, create this application for you. If I open this guy up and I will end up seeing the main form. And also, there is an exception window that is owned by this process. So there are two of them. There is the WinForm object. That's the, the main form itself. I can open it up. I can see there is a label, two, three, text result, text uh, second number, uh, text first number. And then there is the button that says button divide. That is the names of the object that I created in my app. But now there is an exception on the screen. Look what happened when I open up the exception window. So we click on this arrow right next to it to bring it down. Let's do that. And you will notice inside of the exception right now, it's still loading from memory, everything. Notice it found several buttons. There is the detail button, there is the continue button, and there is the quit button. They're all right here. Also, there is the label. This is the one that says unhand unhandled exception has occurred, blah, 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 all the way to attempt to divide by zero. All that is the text caption of the label itself. Even the red X here, which is the logo, it's available as a picture box in WinForms objects coming in from the .NET framework in .NET. Does that make sense? So everything you see in front of you in here is right there. There is one thing that, again, this is uh, changed in the .NET uh, framework 6.0 and 7.0. It used to not be like that, which is the detail. When I click on the detail button, I will get the entire just-in-time debugging information. So there is a lot of information in here, folks, okay? But unfortunately, now in .NET 6 and 7, it's not like in before when we used .NET 4.7 and 4.8. Whether you have this clicked or not, the, the value of the text is still inside of the memory and I can see it. That is no longer the case. This will not be created until you click on the detail button. So notice that the text is not available right now in memory. So I have to click on details and now I have this. And to be able to see this, I'll have to refresh my object browser. So I click on refresh and hopefully within a couple of seconds, it's refreshing the entire hierarchy right now. We should be able to get a brand new object called WinForms object uh, text box. And the text box will contain all the information of the JIT debugger inside of there. See, it's updating the object tree right now. Keep focusing on this and you will notice that object will be updated inside of there to show us the text box for this guy. Let's give it here another couple of seconds to refresh this and hopefully we will see where the text box is. Oh, there it is. You see, there is the WinForms object text box. It was able to be captured in memory. And if I click on it, see, there is, I can find out by right clicking on it like I've done before in the object spy chapter. We can right click on it. We'll say highlight on the screen and the entire text box will flash in red three times. So I know exactly what this is. The problem is I cannot write code against it unless I click on this button first that says um, uh, details. And if you take a look, it has an N percent before the D. All right. Even though there is no underscore under the D, but you have to know that in the uh, in the .NET framework, uh, whether it's details, continues or quit, there is an N percent before the Q and the C and the D. That means it should have an underscore or uh, um, uh, an underscore be before the first letter as well. The WinForms object itself will take two parameters, the type, which is button, and the second one is the caption. And you do, cannot forget this and, for instance. So how am I going to actually make this work for me right now? Let's go back. We'll say continue in here. And I'm going to go back to uh, the code. And I'm going to go to this code in here. All right. So now that I'm going to take a picture of the problem that occurred, okay, I would like to go after this line like that. And I'm going to say... Uh, I would like you to take the overlapping window, the one that came in, and now I know what it is. It's going to be an exception in .NET, and you'll have to do some study on Java and .NET and C++, which framework you're working with, because they're all going to use the same exact 
um, exception dialog for every single exception. So once you know that your application is written in .NET, for instance, you just have to study the .NET exception window. If it's Java, you just have to study the exception window in Java, and that's it. And C++ is the same, is the same way. In my case, it's .NET, so I'm going to say overlapping window. Um, in here, we'll say dot. And what I would like to get at this point is the object inside of there. I just want to make sure you understand what I'm saying in here. So if I go back to the object browser, you see this name that says uh, win forms object thread exception dialog test complete sample to divide two numbers together comma one you don't have to do this line anymore guess what the new name of that window is it's called overlapping window so i can say overlapping window or i can actually put the entire name like this it would be fine but sometimes i don't know what the caption is going to be right so I need to actually get to that exception window by using overlapping window, and then I can get to the win forms objects, uh, whichever button or label or picture box or whatever happening inside of there. All right, so let's go ahead and say win forms object. And then I'm going to say this is a button. So we'll say button with a capital B. And the second parameter will be uh, and percent, and we'll say details, okay? Oops, n percent, sorry, not a, an add percent. So let's do this and we'll put an n percent right there. Okay, so what am I going to do with the overlapping window dot and get to the button that says detail? I want to click on it so I can open it up. So we'll say click like this, all right? And now that will do, what we'll do, that will open up the window, but at the same time, it will bring the text box that contains the JIT compiler into memory. So now I have access to it. Wouldn't that be great? Alrighty, so that means now that I can pass the second parameter or the third parameter for this uh, log dot picture that contains the entire content of the text box itself. I couldn't do that on this line because that button has not been clipped, all right? Been clicked. So I'm going to take this line like that, Control X, like this, and I'm going to put it right after this guy. And this time I can come in right after that and make the detail and I would like to get the content of that detail window. So I'm going to say overlapping window dot, we'll say win forms object. And this one is going to be called text box, text box with a capital B as well. Okay. Uh, and it does not have any caption in it. And then we will close this guy, all righty. And then the property that I'm trying to read, if you remember, it used to be called W text. Every text box has a W text, and W is a lower W, not a capital W. If you take a look at my code right now, folks, what I'm trying to say is take a picture of the overlapping window and call it the problem window in the log. And then also in the detail, go ahead and get all that mumbo jumbo uh, JIT compiler debugger information and put it right there so I can send it to my R&D team and let them know that I, I was able to extract not only a picture of the exception, all the JIT uh, just-in-time debugger information to tell us exactly why we failed. So that would be excellent to be able to do something like that. Does that make sense? Let's give it a shot and see if it will work. We'll control C and uh, hopefully this just gives you an idea of how you can actually handle these events, especially the ones that take multiple parameters. Also, I can actually come and say overlapping window dot left equals overlapping window plus 300. That means I'm going to move it 300 pixels to the left. Hopefully, that will get it away from my text box so I can click on it and we can finish the job. Does that make sense? Let's go back to the unit one, for instance, in here, and I'm going to run this one more time. Let's go ahead and say run the routine. And we'll sit back and relax and we'll see if this time the button will be clicked programmatically and we'll take a picture and we'll be able to retrieve the entire JIT uh, just-in-time debugger information available in the text box in the exception and log it into my uh, picture as well. There it is. It's going to try to do something. It's going to fail for 10 seconds, which is the automatic timeout and test complete. And if we've done our job right, it should actually click on the button. So now we'll, we'll see a detail. Ah, there it is. It clicked on it. And now the text box is available in memory. So now it's going to get all that text. It's still not going to succeed because notice the text box 2 is, not, uh, is, is still hidden. I will not be able to do it. But I want to show you the exception that, got, that took a picture of has a lot more information now. Let's go ahead and say continue. 
there and go back and wait for the result to show up and hopefully you will be pretty proud <laughs> that we were able to get all this information from uh, the exception while it was on the screen Uh, and there it is look at that it still was not able to get to the text box but i want you to see what happened with the problem window let's click on the problem window right there and if i go take a look at the picture for instance let's click on picture see it took a picture of this whole thing and if you go to details Let's see if it was able to get the JIT information. It doesn't look like it. it. looks like I failed before I got to that point. So maybe we'll need to do something to make sure. Maybe I misspelled it. WinForms object. Oh, yeah, I forgot the S. It's WinForms object. All right, so you have to be careful with that. That's why it did not capture that. I'm going to go back to my event interception again. And WinForms object. Yep, WinForms object. Put an S in there and that will fix it. All right, sounds good. All right, let's go back in here and we'll run it one more time. And this time, not only will it take the picture and name it the problem window, for instance, but the entire content of the, uh, the uh, just-in-time debugger information will be put as the details of that log picture. So we'll give it here another 10 seconds. There we go. It will have to wait for the automatic timeout for... Uh, for test complete and then it will click on the detail button will open up and will make the text the text box show up in memory at this point so i will have full access to it and i'm pretty sure this time we will get details inside of the system it will still not fix the problem because the the uh, the, uh, the text box 2 is still hidden behind that dialog so i'm going to say okay for right now let's go ahead and wait for the uh, the xml file to be written out and hopefully once it's done, I will get a lot more valuable information that I can report back to R&D regarding what I found in the middle of the night when something went wrong. And there we go. This is much better. You see, there is no errors before the problem window. So when I click on the problem window in here, folks, and I can go to the picture, for instance, I will be able to see the picture. There it is. But if I go to details, look what happened. This is the fun part that I like. The entire JIT debugger information that was inside of that text box, I was able to capture it and make it a detail for the problem window. So now I can go down and I read the entire GAC um, assemblies in .NET that are actually have been loaded and I can tell my R&D exactly why we crashed and uh, why it did not work, for instance, or uh, why the exception occurred, which is divide by zero in my case. Does that make sense, folks? Uh, hopefully you have a pretty good idea now how to intercept events, whether it's on log error or on unexpected window or on overlapping window, and also how to get into these parameters and what the each and every single one mean. Window is the window of the application itself. And the overlapping window is the weird window that showed up in the middle of the night that keeps me from uh, doing visual things in the app. All right, because it's a moral dialogue and the exception is a moral dialogue. So I can actually, can I actually go after this line for the log picture? Can I say overlapping window dot informs object button, but this time say and continue dot click. Maybe I will actually make the dialog go away by clicking on the continue button myself. And now I can actually finish the job. Does that make sense? Because it's going to be going away. And now I can go ahead and, and do anything visual in the app if I want to. Hopefully that makes sense and you have a pretty good idea of how to intercept events. And I wish you best of luck with this feature because it's extremely powerful instead of test complete to deal with that.